Introductory Preface of the Psychology of Alcoholism This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kurt Walton The Psychology of Alcoholism by George Barton Cuton Introductory Preface The Study of Alcoholism from the Psychological Point of View which the author now brings before the public may be said, I think, to have considerable scientific value. And no one interested in the humanity will be inclined to dispute the value of whatever practical suggestions may be derived from the same study of the relief of the victims of this physical, mental, and moral disease. In even larger measure than most pathological conditions, the phenomena of alcoholism suggest lines for investigating almost all the inquiries which concern the general relations of body and mind. They also raise and illustrate certain more specific problems connected with the mental life of memory, imagination, and the emotions. With regard to the physiological and psychophysical conditions and laws of the first two of these three classes of psychosis, little that is suggestive of the new views seem to be connected with the study which Dr. Cuton has made of the subject. In a word, the effects of the excessive use of alcohol upon memory and imagination through the histological and functional changes which it works in the central nervous system are in the main such as might be a priori anticipated. In respect to the emotional peculiarities of the victims of alcoholism, however, the case seems to me not to be precisely the same. This study contributes something of importance towards establishing the truth that disturbs central conditions are the determining causes of the changes which occur in the habitual feelings of the alcoholic patient, and that the reverberations of the peripheral organism, such as are brought about by a degenerate musculator, disordered centers of the sympathetic system, etc., are of only secondary, although real importance. From the physiological, as well as from the more purely psychological point of view than the profound nature of the disturbances which alcoholism affects in all the emotional life, higher and lower, passions and affections, and also moral, artistic, and religious sentiments, is more readily comprehensible. The poison is subduing the physical citadel of the higher life and of those motives which inspire, elevate, and sustain the spiritual nature in its struggle against the lower animal nature. Turning now for a moment to the more practical side of this investigation, it is no surprise to find that the suggestions looking toward the relief of the sufferer from alcoholism are almost entirely of the psychological order. General sanitation is, without doubt, here as everywhere else in the field of pathological conditions, of great and indisputable value but it is doubtful whether the beneficial effect of administering drugs is not chiefly, if not even wholly, due to their psychological rather than their primary physiological value. Almost certainly the same must be said, and said a fortiori, of all hypnotic practice in the case of alcoholic patients. And really, from every point of view, theoretical and practical, physiological and psychological, the most interesting and astonishing of all the phenomena are those connected with the cure of alcoholism by religious conversion. The indubitable facts of experience upon which Dr. Cuton dwells in some of these chapters, and which show the remarkable results that follow from abrupt and decided changes in the life of feeling through religious ideas and influences, are deserving of an even more detailed and critical treatment than he has been able to give them in this book. The confessions and actual performances of reformed alcoholic debauchees require and are worthy of a much more thorough discussion from the point of view of psychology and by the methods of the trained psychologist than they have as yet ever received. It is for these and other reasons which have regard both to the advancement of science and to the improved welfare of humanity that I take pleasure in introducing Dr. Keaton's investigation to the entire public of readers. George Trumbull Ladd, Yale University, New Haven. End of introductory preface. Preface of the Psychology of Alcoholism by George Barton Cuton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 
Preface. In 1902 there was presented to Yale University by the writer in partial fulfillment for the degree of Doctor of Philosophy, the thesis under the title of The Psychology of Alcoholism. Portions of chapters 2, 3, 5, 6, 8, and 11 of this work were there included. The following year, in partial fulfillment for the degree of Bachelor of Divinity at the same university, chapter 10 of this work was presented as a thesis in very nearly its present form. In July 1902, the former thesis was among those selected for publication in 1903 by a committee of the faculty appointed for that purpose. Owing to some interruptions, the enlarged study was unfinished at that time, and it was thought best to defer publication until it was more nearly complete. The pathological study is now presented to the public in the hope of its filling a need among thoughtful men and women who wish to know the relation between the use of alcohol and mental states. The preparation of this work, willing and valuable assistance, has been rendered by Professors Ladd, Ferris, Mendel, and Drs. McAllister, Deftendorf, Ailing, and St. John, all of Yale University, and Dr. T. D. Crothers and Mr. Fred L. Emmons, as well as many others, to all of whom indebtedness is acknowledged and gratitude expressed. I also wish to tender my thanks to the authors and publishers who have so kindly allowed me the use of illustrations for this volume. GBC, January 1907. End of preface. The Psychology of Alcoholism. Chapter 1. Introduction. The use of alcoholism is universal, and it is coeval with the history of the race. The earliest Egyptian, Babylonian, and Hebrew writings show drunkenness to have been common and from this we infer that it existed long before the art of writing was known. Some form of intoxication has always been found by investigators of the most primitive people, and it was also discovered that the early races were excessive and violent drinkers. Their debauches, accompanied by uncontrolled excitement, rather than steady and habitual imbibers. The warnings found in early Egyptian and Hebrew writings show that the danger of drunkenness was apparent over 3,000 years ago. With the boasted wisdom and intelligence of our advanced civilization, when we clearly recognize the ever-increasing danger, we seem as powerless as they to prevent the increase of the use of alcohol. In addition to the increase of its consumption, the effects upon the body seem to be getting more injurious and to be developing new forms and types. Moderate drinking has rarely been carried out successfully, for it almost inevitably develops into excess. But today there appears to be less and less control, the moderate drinker passing very quickly into the impulsive, violent consumer. It has been stated, evidently on sufficient historical basis, that the nations which have the longest used alcoholic drink have become partially immune to their effects. The Jews and the nations of southern Europe being pertinent examples, it seems hardly necessary and certainly not profitable for any people which is seeking its own highest development to go through this process in order to be able to drink alcohol with comparative impunity. What the solution of the problem will be is uncertain, but with the safety we may predict that with the great number of men and women now devoting thought and energy to the subject, some lessening of the abuse must come, especially when we consider that it is a battle for the highest good of both individual and race. The proportionate increase of drunkenness seems to be the greatest among women, and England has the disgrace of furnishing the greatest proportion of female inebriates of any country in the world. There the women drunkards equal or exceed the men in numbers. In America, the drinking is largely confined to males. The proportion in continental countries falls somewhere between these extremes. The Committee of 50 computes that in America not more than 20% are abstainers, and on the other hand, the percentage of excessive drinkers is only placed at 5. The latter figure is not too large. Within the past few years, there has been a great awakening on the subject, and the reasons for this awakening we wish to consider in the remainder of this chapter the nature of the attack upon alcohol was formerly a religious character. 
drunkenness was regarded as a sin and dealt with from that standpoint only so the clergymen the more religious of the church members and those who suffered most from its effects the wives and children of the drunkards were the principal opponents the character of this movement was largely of an emotional nature gross and exaggerated statements being made which were easily refuted the more recent allies have contributed much of the scientific and solid nature many very prominent physicians and other able investigators adding valuable knowledge concerning the subject it has not been on account of any particular principle at stake or to uphold any theory that these men have assembled to the anti-alcoholic cause but because their observations showed them the injury which alcohol is doing and their scientific desire for the sway of truth compelled them to warn the people and in other ways endeavor to increase the use of alcohol as a beverage the attitude of the physician has changed so greatly that it is especially noticeable in the days of dr ford in england alcohol was almost universally prescribed for every disease today the bill for alcoholic liquors at some hospitals is almost zero and it is difficult to find a physician who orders it to his patients to any great extent the british medical temperance association numbers about 600 and in addition over 400 students belong this is evidence of the awakening among the physicians the international medical manifesto on alcohol would have been an impossibility a few years ago but it met with the encouragement of every hand with scarcely a dissenting voice to be heard the physician should be as he is the greatest enemy of alcohol because he more than any other comes in contact with its disastrous and physical and mental effects as sir victor horsley so well says we think that the british nation ought to refrain from spending 179 million pounds per annum on drink the medical profession more than any other sees the working of that expenditure of 179 million pounds it sees more than any other profession the working of physical laws and conditions on the morals and on the welfare of the nation but whether under one guise or the other the medical profession knows well that it is a potent cause of disease crime poverty and death the significant words of dr lorenz the eminent austrian surgeon when declining wine at a banquet tendered to him in new york would indicate the position of many physicians i cannot say that i am a temperance agitator but i am a surgeon my success depends upon my brain being clear my muscles firm and my nerves steady no one can take alcohol liquors without blunting these physical powers which i must always keep on edge as a surgeon i must not drink viewed from the standpoint of a half century ago one of the wonders of the 20th century was the 11th international anti-alcoholic congress held at budapest in september 1905 which was attended by 1400 members composed of some of the greatest scientists most noted physicians and men and women of repute from all the countries of europe and america the anti-alcoholic congress of france which convened in paris during january 1904 is another example of the awakening attending this were about 500 representatives including pastors and priests officers in the army university and lycee professors judges physicians and others from the leading and influential circles with a place for the sale of liquor for every 81 inhabitants france has become aroused and it is the purpose of this congress to educate the people to the dangers as well as to restrict the sale by legislation professor fowlett of lille began a scheme of education by posting large placards all over his town to warn the people of their danger and to acquaint them with the scientific facts concerning the action of alcohol on the body when the writer was in paris in 1903 the same scheme was in evidence there large placards on all the bill posting boards were very conspicuous and must have inevitably attracted the attention of all classes some danish physicians have lately formed a total abstinence society and posted warning notices 
in railway stations and other public places so that they can be read by everyone. It is not only the men of science, but also the legislators who are awakened on the subject. And in all countries you find political parties or sections of parties endeavoring to restrict or prohibit the manufacture and sale of alcoholic liquors. In the Anti-Alcoholic Congress of France, just referred to, the Social Democrats participated with the pronounced statement that they owed it to the welfare of the working man. In some sections, a prohibitory law has been enacted and has been enforced for years, and not petty politicians, but leaders in legislation are considering the question of alcohol. Note the forceful words of Lord Rosebery. I view the uncontrolled condition of the liquor traffic as a serious danger. No one can deny that there is a great deal too much drink in this country, and that much of the crime, much of the pauperism, and almost all the degradation prevalent in this country are attributable to the curse of drink. If the state does not soon control the liquor traffic, the liquor traffic will control the state. The German emperor appointed a commission to inquire into the drinking habits of his subjects. This commission has recently reported to him, and the results of the investigations were a revelation to both Kaiser Wilhelm and the people. The knowledge thus gained will probably be the occasion of restricting legislation. The Russian and other European governments are also aroused. There comes the report that the Imperial Russian Minister of Finance has offered a prize of 50,000 rubles or $25,750 to the person or persons who will invent some way of making alcohol undrinkable. Pamphlets giving the exact requirements governing the competition have been printed in the French language and sent to the Russian consulates in foreign countries. In Canada and Australia, India and Ireland, Europe and America, all over the world there seems to have been a spontaneous awakening. The laws of the land proclaiming the progress which has been made and acting as harbingers of a public restriction of the manufacture, sale, and use of alcoholic beverages. The changed attitude of society during late years concerning alcohol and the alcoholic is another form in which we notice the awakening. No longer is the inebriate tolerated. No longer the admiring onlookers proclaim the staggering drunkard to be as drunk as a lord. While drinking still flourishes, it is with less public encouragement less manifestation of noisy revelry, and with less pride in drinking as an enviable accomplishment than in the days of our fathers. Public sentiment is reflected in the words of King Edward. An officer does me as much honor in drinking my health in water as by using wine. How unthinkable these words would have been a few years ago. For the sake of civilization, we may well be pleased that the man who made his boast that he could drink his companions under the table is a relic of the past, and the society which could tolerate such a man is dead and buried. The excuse of necessity has now been abolished, for experiments in the French army show that under all circumstances the French soldier is 40% more efficient when subjected to a regime of total abstinence. Generals Robert and Kitchener in Africa have made very practical demonstrations of the same fact with the English army. The laboring man who used to feel the necessity of having his dram regularly in order to do his work and do it well now knows that he was formally deceived and that he is the better workman without it. The economic phase of the alcoholic question has attracted much attention and has had a great influence on the recent awakening. Look at the United States, which is far less drunken than some European countries. It was estimated that in 1905 the sum of $1,325,439 and $74 was spent directly for alcoholic beverages. This estimate was made from government excise statistics. But if one adds to this the additional amount which the consumer pays for adulteration, and the product of illicit stills, the amount would probably approach near $1,500,000,000. The indirect expense must also be accounted. It has been computed that 1,500,000 men and women are daily either mentally or physically disabled for work as the result of drinking. In addition to this, 
Let us compute the public expenses for the extra number of the judiciary, the police force, the jails, the prisons, the poorhouses, and the insane asylums. The value of grain wasted and the labor used in the manufacture and sale of alcoholic beverages, although already included in the annual drink bill, should again be added inasmuch as it would increase the wealth of the country if put into some useful business. The total cost of alcohol to the United States, directly and indirectly, cannot be less than $3 billion per year. The commission appointed by the German emperor, which lately reported to him, estimated the annual drink bill of Germany to be 3 billion marks, or $720 billion. This great sum is one-eighth of all the German people earn, and is four times the amount which Germany spends yearly for her immense army and navy, under which the people are supposed to be greatly burdened. Add to this the indirect cost, and we have another great sum. The worst feature of which is that of this amount. There has been a direct increase of 800 million marks during the last five years. Sweden, for defense, spends annually 35 million kroners. For alcoholic beverages, 80 million. Denmark's bill is 17 million kroners. Her alcoholic bill amounts to 63 million 500 thousand kroners. With a population of only 3 million, Switzerland spends 264 million marks per year for liquor. In regard to England, the Reverend John Watson says, it is calculated that an average English working class family spends six shillings per week in drink, or about one quarter of their wages. The drink bill for the United Kingdom for 1905 was computed to be no less than 164,167,941 pounds, or 797,856,193 dollars. Computing the population of the United States at 86 million, Britain's bill is comparatively larger. James D. Wepley's writing in the Saturday Evening Post on the terrible destitution in England says, It is at these times that the terrible evil of drink, the curse of Great Britain, comes predominantly to the fore. The liquor bill of England and Wales amounts to about $22 per capita. It is all incurred, however, by about one half of the population, and over two thirds of the amount by people whose incomes are less than seven hundred and fifty dollars or one hundred and fifty two pounds a year. The enormous sum of money spent for alcohol must inevitably cause much poverty. The amount of drunkenness caused by poverty cannot be estimated, but the amount of poverty caused by drunkenness can approximately. The replies to questions sent to every Almshouse keeper in the United States shows that at least 51% of the inmates of almshouses become paupers through drink. To put this into statistical form, about 1,530,000 persons who have come to poverty through drink are dependent upon the taxpayers of the country. Warden Roberts of the New York Almshouse on Blackwell's Island told the writer that he considered nine-tenths of the inmates, of whom he then had 2,593, came there through drink. Mr. Tudor Trevor says that 70% of the paupers of England cost in the nation 10 million sterling annually as a result of alcoholic drinking. Japan, with practically the same poor laws as Great Britain, has only 24,000 paupers while well, Great Britain, 100,000. A Japanese statesman, being asked to explain this difference in results, replied, The Japanese drink tea, the British drink alcohol. Large business concerns have discovered the danger and economic loss in employing drinking men. This increasing demand for sober and reliable men is destined to be a great reformatory force. Railroads all over America, large railroads, as example given, the Northern Pacific have prohibited the use of alcoholic liquors by their employees at all times. Only a year or two ago, the French governor director of railroads said that the government roads had agreed to discharge all employees who persisted 
and using spirits and wine while on duty. All persons who continue to drink should be dropped from the pension rolls of the company and would not participate in endowment funds in case of accident. Restaurants on the road were forbidden to sell spirits to workmen. The Christian Endeavor world is authority for the statement that the marine insurance companies doing business in New York City now offer a reduction of 5% in rates to ships on which no ardent spirits are drunk during the voyage. It may be the economic loss rather than the physical or moral which will be the occasion of the remedy. Leaving out all other considerations and counting the cost only in dollars and cents, the price we pay for alcohol is astounding. If the alcohol were manufactured and poured into the sea, the world would be much poorer because it was made. But how much better it would be than, in addition, to pay for it in the lives of men, sickness and disease, misery and sorrow. This is the greatest price which we pay. This price which cannot be expressed in terms of money. Matty Hallenius, in a thesis presented to the University of Copenhagen, Denmark, in 1902 as partial fulfillment for a degree of Doctor of Philosophy, estimated that during the last 30 years, 7,500,000 persons died in Europe from alcohol drinking, this number being greater than the total of all who died as a result of wars during the 19th century. He further states that in Denmark, one out of every seven of the men who die between the ages of 35 and 55 die in alcohol drinking. Further computations have been made by him concerning other European countries. He computes the annual number of deaths from alcohol to be as follows. Great Britain, 40,000. Belgium and Holland, 20,000. Russia, 100,000. France, 40,000. Germany, 40,000. Scandinavia and Switzerland, 20,000. For a total of 260,000. Dr. T.D. Crothers computes that 10% of the mortality is due to the abuse of alcohol and 20% of all disease is traceable to this cause. Dr. Carter of Liverpool says that the mortality from almost every disease has fallen in England, but that from alcohol is an exception. The direct death rate has risen from 45 per 100 million of those living in 1878 to 77 per 1 million in 1897. Dr. Charles McPhee of Edinburgh says that there are yearly 60,000 deaths from consumption and the same number from alcoholism. Many place the latter at 100,000 and both of these are preventable complaints. These figures must be largely matters of opinion as their death certificates show only the case where alcohol is the direct cause. As Whitingwell says, half the certificates we write are mere anodynes for the public conscious. The following suggestive figure are taken from Temperance, August 1905. The experience of the Scepter Life Assurance Society Limited for the 20 years from 1884 to 1903 inclusive gives the following figures for abstainers expected deaths 1,440, actual deaths 792, being 55% of the expected non-abstainers expected death 2,730, actual deaths 1,880 or 79% of the expected. The experience of the Scottish Temperance Life Assurance Company Limited for the 20 years from 1883 to 1902 inclusive gives the following figures. Abstainers expected death 936, actual deaths 420 or 45% of the expected. Non-abstainers expected deaths 319, actual deaths 225, or 71% of the expected. In another company they have kept the figures for over 60 years and the results are as follows. Non-abstainers, male lives. Total number of years of exposure to risk, all ages. 466,943. Expected death by OM table, 8,911. Actual deaths, 8,947. Percent of actual to be expected, 100.4.
male lives, abstainers, whole life policies, transfers to excluded, total number of years of exposure to risk, 398,010, expected death by OM table, 6,899, actual deaths, 5,124, percent of actual to be expected, 74.3, the non-abstainers are not all drunkards, but include all persons who take alcohol in any quantity. The evil effects are shown in disease as well as in death, both in the drunkard and his offspring. This Oliver Wendell Holmes expressed a number of years ago as follows. When nature has made up her mind that she has had enough of a particular stock and that its room is better than its company, the work of patching up the constitutions of its offspring and keeping them sober is one of the most desperate tasks assigned to the healers of men. So many men think that there is no harm in drinking so long as they never get drunk. The businessman at the close of the day must have his bitters and thinks that only good comes from his temperate indulgence. But Dr. W. H. Riley has made the statement that he has seen scores of cases of paralysis caused by alcohol in those who never became intoxicated. Man does not need to be so intoxicated as to dethrone his reason in order to have the drug do him harm. It is well known that injuries, which to other people would be but slight, are apt to prove serious even in moderate drinkers, and the risk of death is much greater in surgical operations. The direct relation of alcohol to disease can be seen in the words of Dr. Alexander Lambert when he said, Of the 24,300 patients in Bellevue Hospital, New York, in 1900, over one quarter went through the alcoholic wards. Indirectly, we know the very close relation which alcohol bears to the fatal cases of consumption, pneumonia, and many other diseases. It has been found that out of 100 alcoholics attacked by pneumonia, 70 die while one of every 100 non-alcoholics so attacked, only 23 die. In addition to these facts already mentioned, the great prevalence of crime and insanity as a result of alcohol drinking has contributed to the awakening. On account of the awakening concerning alcohol, of which we have just been speaking, and the interest in the subject as a result of this, it was thought that a treaty on the relation between alcohol and the mental states would be beneficial, especially as nothing of this kind has come to the notice of the writer, and no author has treated this subject except in an incidental way. In this work only the more permanent mental effects have been treated, and hence only the effects of a continued use of alcohol. In using the title, The Psychology of Alcoholism, we mean it to be an account of the mental changes brought about by the continuous and excessive use of alcohol in an attempted explanation of the changes. Added to this, in the latter part of the book, will be found two chapters on the effect of the mind upon this condition, as far as cure is concerned. In treating the mental effects, it is necessary to approach through the physical and examine the effect upon the brain. To this, chapter 2 is devoted. The whole of this chapter may not be perfectly clear to the lay mind, but an attempt has been made to put it in form so that it might be comprehensible. It is difficult to find terms which will convey the idea without using technical ones. Chapter 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7 deal with the more strictly psychological aspects of the subject with attempted explanations based on the results found in Chapter 2. Chapter 8 and 9 dealing with the psychological morals and insanity, while necessarily using some technical terms, have been made as popular as possible. The last two chapters, 10 and 11, deal with the psychological cures. In the following chapter, the writer has endeavored to take an unbiased position, sifting the testimony, and when two sides are presented to give both. End of chapter 1. Two of the Psychology of Alcoholism by George Barton Cuton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 2 Physiology In the examination of the psychology of alcoholism, 
we are necessarily led into the physiological psychology because the mind is affected indirectly by the action of a chemical substance upon the brain and directly by the change condition of the brain. Throughout this work, the discussion will be confined as much as possible to the physiological aspect, but it is necessary to speak, at least briefly, upon the physiological import. We immediately meet the controversy concerning the relation between the mind and the brain. It is not our intention to enter into this discussion, but simply to state our position. Considering the facts as we now have them, it is impossible for us to agree with the idealist in his attempt to minimize the importance of the brain and its influence upon the mind. It is equally difficult for us to depreciate the value of the mind as the distinct entity and its power over the brain, and hence over the whole body. Thus, we are also forced to differ from the materialist. Our position is the medium one. We recognize the truth in both, but accept neither one to the exclusion of the other. The interaction of the mind and the brain is hard to doubt, and is equally difficult to explain. At most we know very little of the true relationship, but we do know that there is a real reciprocal action, pathological cases, some of which we will discuss proving this. Since our subject deals almost exclusively with the influence of the brain over the mind, it seems necessary to state our position in the controversy, especially as many of the publications on alcoholism have been contributed by men who have been able to accept only the view of a one-sided relationship. As we are dealing with the continued effects of alcoholism on the mind, the physiology of acute alcoholism will not be treated, except insofar as it may throw light upon the chronic effects. For we know that a single action, if repeated, tends to change the organism so that it will remain permanently in the same condition as that brought about the temporary effects of the single action. Many volumes have been written upon the physiological aspects of alcoholism, but it is obvious that in a work on psychology we can give only an epitome of the results of the investigations in physiology. For a long time it has been known that an elective affinity existed between the nervous tissue and narcotics, including of course alcohol, but it remained for E. Overton and H. Meyer to define more clearly the nature of this affinity. It has been noticed that all substances which are soluble in fats and do not injure animal tissue are narcotics. The action of these narcoticizing substances is shown most plainly where fatty tissue predominates, and this tissue is most affected by narcotics. The power of a narcotic is noticed to bear a direct relation to its affinity for fats and an indirect relation to its affinity for water. By testing the relative solubility of olive oil and water with any narcotic, the exact narcotic effect can be calculated. Thus, ether, which is not readily soluble in water, but is speedily soluble in fatty substances, is a quick and powerful narcotic. Alcohol, on the contrary, while soluble in fat, is also soluble in water and therefore its narcoticizing effect is slower and less powerful than that of ether. When we consider the proportion of every nerve cell, which is made up of fatty substances, we can see the bearing of these observations upon the affinity of alcohol and other related narcotics for nervous tissue. The narcotic is taken into the blood and must reach the nerve cell through this medium. If there is comparatively a greater affinity for the blood than for the nerve cell, for the water than the oil, comparatively less the narcotic enters the cell than if the contrary is the case, and hence the narcotization is slower in its action. We naturally ask how these substances act on nervous tissue. It was formerly considered that the narcotic exerted its effect because the fatty substances were soluble in the narcotic, and that the narcotic dissolved these fatty substances, and thus the nervous tissue was for a time more or less devoid of fatty material. This theory had to be discarded in view of the fact that large amounts of fatty substances exist in the neuron, and if these were dissolved, such speedy recovery as is experienced with most narcotics would be impossible. Footnote. Neuron, on account of the frequent use of this term in this chapter, it is thought best to have it defined. Formerly it was thought that the nervous factors, cell, 
nerves, and dendrites were separate parts, but now the neuron has become the nervous unit. It consists of the cell body, dendrites, and axis cylinder process, which are considered to be only different parts of the one structure. The part known as the nerve is now looked upon as the axis cylinder process of the cell, as much a part of the cell as the dendrites. The diagrammatic drawing on the following page gives a comprehensive idea of the neuron and its constituent parts. Figure 1. Scheme of lower motor neuron from Barker, the nervous system, page 41. The opposite theory accords best with the facts, and is now most commonly accepted, viz. that the narcotic is dissolved in the fatty substances, and the change is caused thereby in some way stop interaction between the neurons and interfere with the conduction of impulses. This is true of all narcotics, but each narcotic has special symptoms and an excess use causes a distinct set of injuries. Why alcohol selects a certain set of cells we do not know, but as has been contended by Nissel, each poison gives rise to special lesions because it affects certain kinds of cells to the exclusion of others. There remains much yet to be accomplished in the chemistry of the nervous system, for here is hidden the secret of the nervous processes. Not only is there a difference in opinion regarding the chemical action of alcohol, but the exact physiological action caused by the chemical changes is disputed by the devotees of different theories, divided for the most part into two classes. Up to the last century it was thought that alcohol was a powerful stimulant, quickening and strengthening all mental and physical action, very much as the popular mind today views its effects. The view of the stimulating power of alcohol is still held, notably by C. Binns. He affirms that alcohol stimulates the nerve cells before it induces depression of function, but in this opinion he has comparatively few followers. Schmeinerberg suggested that the facts do not carry out this view, and that alcohol is devoid of stimulating power, its whole effect being that of a powerful paralyzer. Instead of stimulating the mental powers, it paralyzes the regulative apparatus of the mind, so that the subject is not able to judge correctly, or to discern his real weakness. Schmeinerberg has been reported in his theory by Bung, Mitscherlich, Finley, and Krapelin, the last proving by experiment that the stimulation was only apparent, because the work, both mental and bodily, was lessened under the influence of alcohol. This theory is probably the one most widely accepted among specialists on the subject, and even Binns leaves room for the same, although he does not support it. He says, The stimulating effects which small doses of alcohol produce in different parts of the body may, here and there, possibly be due to the paralysis of the inhibitory apparatus. This is a point, however, about which we know nothing. In a recent address, one of the supporters of this theory spoke as follows. An acceleration of motion may be due to increased power of the engine stimulation or to the brakes being raised, paralysis. And it may be very difficult for an onlooker to determine which is the true explanation. The apparent evidence of increased mental activity under alcohol, however, has proved for the most part illusory when carefully investigated. One argument against the stimulant action of alcohol is the narrow limits to which it is confined. Alcohol, on the other hand, appears to have only a depressant action on the nervous tissues, except in the human cerebrum. But when the excitement stage is more closely investigated, it becomes apparent that all the cerebral functions are not facilitated by alcohol. It is common knowledge that under the influence of alcohol, an individual may be more brilliant in conversation, more witty, more social, more generous in sentiment, but that he is not so careful in his statements, and has not the consideration for his own position or that of others, which he usually manifests. He loses his self-control and self-restraint, and thereby often proves more entertaining and social than in ordinary life, but he also loses sense of responsibility and his power of discriminating between the trivial and the important, or between the merely plausible and the actually proved. In a word, it is generally recognized that some of the highest functions of the brain are thrown out of action by alcohol administered in quantities which induce 
the phase of exhilaration. The further question is, what functions are actually increased in activity and how far is this increase dependent upon the reduced activity of the processes which are depressed by alcohol? The question is, of course, a psychological one, which can be answered only by a psychological analysis, which is as yet very far from complete. But it is obvious to everyone that the exhilarations may be due to a loosening of the associations which ordinarily control our actions and feelings. Lately there have appeared those who oppose this view and again uphold the stimulation theory. They do not claim for it what was formerly asserted, viz. that alcohol is a general stimulant of great power. But while admitting the facts of recent experiments which prove that less and a poor quality of mental and bodily work is done under the influence of alcohol, they present the stimulation theory in a new light. They say that alcohol is not a depressant, but a stimulant. It is selective in its stimulation, affecting principally the inhibitory mechanism and not the motor, hence the apparent paralyzing effect. The flushing of the skin under the influence of alcohol is accordingly not due to the paralysis of the vasoconstrictor nerves, but to the stimulation of the vasodilator nerves. An adherent of this theory says, Alcohol favors the irritability of the inhibitory mechanisms. I do not doubt in the least that alcohol stimulates also motor sensory nerves or the organs of activity in general. I only suggest that it is a certain dilution and at a certain stage, alcohol, when in contact with the nerve cells, either directly stimulates, preferably some of the normal inhibitory mechanisms of the body or increases their irritability. As a consequence of the stimulation, the perception for finer differences becomes decreased. The reaction time is prolonged. The formation of associations and the irradiation of stimuli within the central nervous system become restricted, and also the tonicity of all the muscles is reduced and the execution of motor is rendered difficult. Strychnine is a stimulant, and alcohol is a stimulant, but strychnine stimulates both preferably the motor or active mechanisms, while alcohol stimulates preferably the inhibitory mechanisms. Between these two principal theories, we have nothing to choose, since they both admit the facts, and this is of greatest importance. These facts will form the basis of the discussion which follow on the psychology of alcoholism, and either theory may provisionally be accepted. The paralysis theory is more widely recognized and has more influence in its favor. And since the final effect appears to be that of paralysis, and to coincide with general paresis, it seems natural to attribute the initial form to that of paralysis also, rather than to that of inhibitory stimulation. This consistency is not necessary, however, for we have the example of other substances, which in small doses and initial effects give results the reverse of those obtained from large doses and continued use. Not only is it true that alcohol has an elective affinity for nervous tissue, but its effects upon the various parts of the nervous system differ both in manner and degree. Further, we shall see later, even the different portions of the individual neuron are affected in a variety of ways and with more or less destructive results. The part of the nervous system to be injured first is the cerebrum, which ministers to the highest mental functions. Following this, the cerebellum, the part of the system which controls coordination is impaired. The spinal cord neck suffers, and thus many reflex movements are interfered with. Finally, the medulla oblongata is affected. It is through the paralysis of the medulla that alcohol directly causes death, for in the spinal bulb are contained the respiratory and cardiac centers, the cerebrum may be so affected by alcohol that a person is unconscious, or the cerebellum so influenced that walking is impossible. But respiration and circulation continue, and life does not cease provided that the medulla is not seriously affected. As soon as the respiratory and cardiac centers are injured, death immediately follows. Alcohol seldom causes death directly. In example, through its effect upon the medulla oblongata, but usually indirectly by interfering with the other vital functions. Of course, it will be recognized that when we speak of a regular consequence 
of the effect of alcohol upon the different portions of the nervous system, we do not mean that the first portion is totally destroyed before the second part is affected. Example given, that the functions of the cerebrum are destroyed before the cerebellum is affected at all, but rather that this is the order in which the effects of alcohol are noticed. The degeneration continues in each part after it begins, and proceeds simultaneously in the portions already affected, probably more rapidly in those parts in which the injury first appears. While alcohol affects the nervous system most injuriously, there are set up in other portions of the body, as the alimentary tract and the liver, structural changes which indirectly cause further injury to the neurons. The degenerating effects of alcohol upon the nervous system may be classed under three heads. First, injury to the neurons. Second, change in the vascular system. Third, pathological growth. These will be discussed in order. 1. Injury to the neurons. During the last few years, much valuable histological work has been done in the post-mortem examinations of the brains of persons who have died directly or indirectly from the effects of alcohol. There has also been some careful work done in the comparative histology, where animals have died from the effects of alcohol systematically administered for a greater or less period of time, ranging from a few hours to a year or more. From the results of these investigations, we know some of the disastrous effects of alcohol on the nerve cells and their processes. Footnote. No poison except the virus of syphilis plays so extensive a role in the morbid affections and degenerations of the tissues, nervous or non-nervous. Yet as regards its effects on the nervous system, it is possible to trace its march with a fair degree of accuracy. W. B. Lewis, Textbook of Mental Diseases, page 327, forward. End footnote. How far all the lesions in the following description are due to chronic alcoholic excess is doubtful, but the more serious ones, such as the destruction of the cells, undoubtedly are attributable to this cause. The lesser injuries may be traced to the acute effects. Concerning this point, Professor W. H. Welch says, Two different kinds of lesions of the nerve cells have been found. The former designated as moniliform change, the other designated as chromatolysis. There is reason to think that these changes belong, even in the chronic cases, to the more immediate acute effects of alcoholic poisoning. For in Friedenwald's experiments, they were often absent in animals which did not die, but were killed in the course of the experiments, and they were not observed in animals allowed to live a few days after the alcohol was stopped. Dr. J. H. Kellogg gives further evidence along this line. Kleefeld has shown that the retardation of the cell branches and the development of a beaded and varicose appearance is the immediate result of the presence of alcohol in the blood. Appearing within 15 minutes after alcohol has been introduced into the circulation of the animals, showing that the condition which is found permanent in the habitual drunkard exists temporarily in a man or in an animal subjected to the influence of this drug. In examining the condition of the neurons in their different locations, it is in order to begin with those of the cerebral cortex. Here, even in cases showing the greatest degeneration, not all the cells are injured, but probably the most of them are. The exact proportion is difficult to determine. Of those injured, more are found in the deepest layers, some cases showing no morbid indications in the uppermost layers. Why particular kinds of cells are selected for an attack by alcohol and others are immune, we do not know at present. Neither is the significance of the selection clear. The dendrites are the first parts of the cell visibly affected. The change here being quite startling, the thorns or twigs on which are situated the contact granules soften and swell at first slightly so as to give the mere appearance of roughness. Concomitant with the smallest tumefaction or swelling, there seems to be a decrease in the number of buds, and as the swelling increases, these gemmules become less and less in number until they entirely disappear. The swellings enlarge and spread rapidly, soon covering the entire dendrite, and forming rough botroidal masses or bunches, 
which resembled a fungus growth called black knot, seen upon diseased plum trees. With the swelling comes softening and dissolution, the outermost branches disintegrating. These degenerative changes continue until all that is left is a gnarled, knotted stump, deprived of nearly every branch, and lacking in gemules. See Figure 2. Explanation of Figure 2. Label 6. Advanced monoliform tumefaction of apical dendrites at 560 magnification. Label 7. Small irregular nerve cell from the outer portion of the second cell layer with advanced monoliform swellings of all the principal dendrites and roughening of the cell corpus at 560 magnification. Label 8. A medium-sized pyramidal cell showing disappearance of the long dendrites and great roughening of the thicker stems, as well as complete loss of the gemulae. The cell body has a very irregular contour and is shrunken. The axon is intact at 560 magnification. Label 9 and 10 exhibit similar phenomena. From H. J. Berkeley, studies on the lesions produced by the action of certain poisons on the cortical nerve cell. 1. Alcohol, Brain, Volume 18, page 496. A, B, C, D, E, and F. Terminal tufts and endings of the protoplasmic apical processes in the first layer, human brain cortex, showing bead-like and monoliform swellings, coalescence of the fine miliary granules in place and loss of fine granulation in the most affected parts. The dotted line marks the limit between the first and second layers, alcoholic insanity, from W. L. Andreessen on some of the newer aspects of the pathology of insanity. Brain, volume 17, page 669. End of explanation of figure 2. Finally, the apical processes entirely disappear, together with most of the bacillar ones, leaving only one or two enlarged branchless stumps. See figure 3. Figure 3. Four nerve cells from the human brain cortex. Occipital region, situated in the deeper part. Polymorphic layer, and showing various stages of disintegration. Alcoholic insanity. From W. L. Andreessen, on some of the newer aspects of the pathology of insanity. Brain, 17, page 670. End of figure 3. In cases where degeneration is advanced, the cell body shows signs of decay and disintegration. But before this, even before the least swelling or symptom of decay in any part of the neuron, the cell shows a lack of nutriment. The coagulating albumin thickens and clogs the cell membrane, thereby hindering endosmosis and the assimilation of nutrient materials on the one hand, and exosmosis, or excretion of broken down aphite products on the other. After the formation of this cell wall, so formed to healthy nerve cells, a considerable amount of pigment is deposited between this and the shrunken protoplasm, making the center tough and giving it a wasted appearance. Following the degeneration of the dendrites, the cell body becomes irregularly shrunken and also begins to waste away. The side of the cell decays until a vacuole is formed in the cell, near which is usually found a mass of debris. Nor is the disintegration confined to one place. Frequently it will begin at several different parts at once, destroying almost the entire interior of the cell, so that nothing is left except perhaps a small crescent and fragments of waste matter. See Figure 3. Sometimes the total remains of the cell body are mere shell, the decay starting from within and working outward. But however the disintegration may start, the cell outline becomes very irregular and ragged, and especially where the decay starts from within. Considerable areas of the cell become transparent. Not only this, but some cells after becoming vacuolated undergo fatty degeneration and entirely disappear. Among those which remain, a a distinct diminution from shrinkage apart from the decay is noticed in some. Degeneration is also very apparent 
when histological stains are applied to the cells. These show a disappearance of reserved nutriment, pigment granules being substituted for the protoplasm. The chromatic network does not stain easily, and the chromatic bodies are either granular, absent, or indistinct, showing chromatolysis unmistakably. See figure 10. A further and very serious abnormality is the diffuse staining of the achromatic. In the general destruction and dissolution of the cell, the nucleus does not escape. Frequently it is contracted and granular in appearance. When the process of decay is advanced, the nucleus becomes eccentric, and later when the cell is further destroyed, may even protrude beyond the cell membrane. The nucleolus stains deeply. The outline is rough, with elongated processes projecting from its surface. Further along, in the disintegration, it becomes enlarged and spongy, and finally disappears. See Figure 5. Figure 5. Nuclei of normal parietal cells of the rabbit's cortex showing the nucleoli smooth and sharply defined at 1100 magnification. 2. Nuclei of the pyramidal cells of the alcoholic rabbit's cortex showing the nuclei roughened and enlarged. The outline of the nucleus is also more irregular than in the normal cell at 1100 magnification. From H.J. Berkeley, studies on the lesions produced by the action of certain poisons on the cortical nerve 1. Alcohol, Brain, Volume 18, page 496. End of Figure 5. End Figure 4. Granular degeneration of the nerve cell in fifth layer motor cortex and proliferations of pericellular and perivascular nuclei of a case of chronic alcoholic insanity at 210 magnification. From W. B. Lewis, Textbook of Mental Diseases, page 584. A. Small angular cells of fourth layer. B. Perivascular nuclei. C. Perivascular nuclei. D. Motor nerve cell and its nutrient vessel. E. Degeneration of apex process. F. Nerve cell undergoing granular degeneration. G. Diseased arterial. End of figure 4. The access cylinder processes apparently remain intact the longest, with the exception of some of its collaterals, which soon degenerate. The protection of the access cylinder process by the medullary sheath probably accounts for this, but finally the sheath becomes granular and wrinkled with here and there small irregular swellings of a fatty nature. In other portions, the mylian is greatly attenuated and the access is exposed. The sheath may also become much altered by connective tissue invasion. The neural core shows an internal pathological change by uneven staining, and the degeneration is further evidenced by its being greatly swollen and fusiform as in other cases of inflammation of the nerve fibers or senile decay. As has already been noted, the upper layers of the cortex are comparatively less injured. The degeneration described above being mostly of the motor cells of the fifth layer of the cortex and the large pyramidal cells. The spindle cells of the sixth layer also show effects of an injurious nature, apparently chiefly due to the spider or scavenger cells found in such large quantities in this layer in alcoholism. These spider cells act as phagocytes and destroy the spindle nerve cells so that we find them comparatively few, where they should be most abundant. Many nuclear proliferations are seen surrounding the spindle cells, and some of the cells are undergoing pigmentary degeneration. See Figure 7. Figure 6. Diagram A. A. Scavenger element, spider cells, in peripheral zone of first layer of the cortex human brain at 240 magnification. A. Spider cells following vascular tract. B. Spider cells with long, delicate fibrils. C. Coarser vascular branches of spider cell. And D. Plexus of finer fibrils. B. Of figure 6. Aneurysmal dilation of paravascular sac. General paralysis at 210 times magnification. Diagram C of figure 6. Degeneration of nerve cells and cortex with proliferation of the spider or scavenger cells. Section from fifth cortical layer and motor region at 210 
times magnification. A. Swollen degenerative nerve cell. B. Vascular process of spider cell. C. Venous extensions from vascular walls. D. Degenerating nerve cells attacked by spider cells. E. Spider cell with its vascular process. F. Arterial surrounded by spider elements. From W. B. Lewis, Textbook of Mental Diseases, page 584, 588, and 592. End of figure 6. End figure 7. Changes in deepest or spindle cell layer of human cortex. Chronic alcoholic insanity at 180 times magnification. A. Spider cells proliferating. B. Degenerating nerve cell devoid of nucleus. C. Proliferation of nuclei on fusiform cells. D. Paravascular nuclei crowding upon walls of blood vessel. That is from W. B. Lewis, Textbook of Mental Diseases, page 585. End of figure 7. In advanced cases, a change in the neurogula elements is noticed consisting of a vacuolation of the cell protoplasm with pigmentation of the cell body, swelling of the processes, and the abundant formation of so-called colloidal bodies in the brain. See figure 8. Figure 8. Two protoplasmic neurogula cells of the human brain showing two stages of change. A. Commencing beaded swelling of the protoplasm and B. A more advanced stage, the protoplasm in coarse irregularly beaded botroidal masses with a loss of mossy granulation. Alcoholic insanity from W. L. Andreessen on some of the newer aspects of the pathology of insanity. Brain, volume 17, page 684. End of figure 8. In the cerebellum, the degeneration is equally apparent. Proportionately more of the cells of the Purkinjini are injured than of the cells of cerebral cortex. The lesions are very noticeable, both in regard to the disintegration and the tumefaction of the dendrites. See figure 9. Figure 9. Section shown the degeneration of dendrites throughout moniliform swellings from H.J. Berkeley. Studies on the lesions produced by the action of certain poisons on the cortical cells. 1. Alcohol, brain, volume 18, page is 496 forward. End of figure 9. And the change is shown by staining. The cell body undergoes decay and the protoplasm loses its characteristic structure. Chromatolysis is apparent. See figure 10. Figure 10 shows cells that become enlarged and darker with increased exposure to alcohol. End of figure 10. The chromatic bodies are thin, ragged, granular, or absent, and the network has changed to granules. The normally achromatic portions stain deeply, thereby showing degeneration. The nucleus becomes altered in shape, and both the nucleus and nucleolus are much shrunken. The detrimental effects in the spinal cord are not so consistent as in the higher centers of the brain. There may be very serious evidences of degeneration apparent, or Again, little or no effect is noticed. The same tracts are not always affected or the same sections of particular tracts. The degeneration may be unilateral or general. The spinal ganglia may or may not be affected and corneal changes are not infrequent. This being true, it is difficult to give any but the most general description of the lesions. We find here chronic myelitis and meningitis and systematic sclerosis, the last probably being the chief lesion. This frequently affects the whole sections of the cord and in connection with scavenger cells is very injurious. Various forms of chromatolysis are observed both in the cord and the spinal ganglia. See figure 10. But this occurs rather irregularly, especially in the ganglia. There come to be very few chromatic bodies and a noticeable decrease in the number of chromophile granules is characteristic. The spinal stichochromes show extreme chromatolysis, and these together with the spinal and sympathetic ganglion cells show besides chromatolysis lesions described as homogeneous swellings distributed in an irregular manner. Under the consideration of the spinal cord, we must speak of the peripheral nerves, 
for these are axis cylinder processes of the spinal cells and ganglia. They seem to be acted on directly as well as through changes in the centers, for neuritis has been repeatedly observed ending in local paralysis. Usually these nerves do not show symptoms of injury until after the higher centers have been affected, and frequently not so serious degeneration takes place as in the higher centers. D. Cerna, who made experiments on frogs to ascertain the effects of alcohol upon the peripheral nerves, say that in frogs killed by the administration of large doses of alcohol, the nerves responded to electric stimulation very slightly or none at all. The observed change in the nerve begins near the peripheral distribution. The greatest alteration is noticed in the intramuscular branches of the motor nerves. Some have opined that the spinal alterations are due to the changes in the peripheral nerves, but it is probable that these are coincident affections. S. Martin has described the change as follows. First, at one or more of the spots on the nerve fiber, the medullary sheath disappears entirely. The remainder of the sheath above and below still staining with osmic acid. The axis cylinder in the affected part becomes attenuated and finally ruptures. The part of the nerve fiber between the rupture and the muscle now undergoes Wallerian degeneration. The changes in the neuron which have been mentioned are not all peculiar to alcoholism. They may be brought about by the continuous influence of many different toxic agents, but not all by any one other agent. 2. Changes in the vascular system. The vascular lesions are very serious and form a principal part of the trouble caused by alcoholic excess. No single factor contributes so largely to disease of the blood vessels as much as the chronic use of alcohol poison, especially well defined in the blood vessels of the cortex, is the widespreading hardening and thickening of the arteries, known as arterial sclerosis or atheromatous degeneration. Here vessels are also found unequally and considerably distended by well developed aneurysmal dilations. See figure six B. Figure 6b shows aneurysmal dilation of paravascular sac and general paralysis at 210 magnification, which latter give rise to a cribriform condition. The usually smooth walls are irregularly shrunken and distended, at times almost botroidal in shape on account of many rough bulgings. Occasionally the vessel is seen to be stopped up. The swollen condition of the different coats narrowing the lumen and it becomes plugged with some thrombosis, possibly a fatty embolus. When this occurs, it is followed by rupture of the walls of the arteries, Berkeley denoting myelary hemorrhages as one of the characteristic lesions of alcoholism. Degeneration is further shown and continued by the presence of scavenger cells following the course of the arteries which they attack. See figure 6. All the walls of the arteries show injury of some kind. In the intima, or inner walls of the artery, a chronic inflammatory state leads to a condition of atheromatous and fatty change. The endothelium cells are swollen and the cell protoplasm undergoes regressive changes. Here, nuclear proliferation is in progress, the nuclei staining deeply. As a result of the endoarteritis and fatty degeneration of the lumen, of the vessel is narrowed, and the result is malnutrition, softening and rupture following as a matter of course. Probably the intima is the first part of the vessel affected, on account of its coming into direct and continual contact with the poisoned blood. The media or muscular layer of the vessel increases in thickness. The muscular protoplasm becomes swollen, staining less deeply than normally. The nuclei are occasionally absent from quite large areas and those which remain are abnormal. The contractile power of this muscular tissue is lost. Resistance being diminished by the dilation in aneurysmal states, and more especially the injury to the vasomotor nerves. Harnack so well says, it should also never be forgotten, that even in small doses, the paralyzing action of alcohol is exercised most rapidly and energetically upon the tonus of the blood vessels. The importance of which tonus for the regularity of the circulation and the cardiac energy is well known. The abnormal action of the vasomotor nerves causes the 
small vessels to dilate, and thereby we find a loss of action and movement in the vessels. When this tonus is lost, there is an accumulation and sluggish movement of the blood in the capillary and venous systems. The adventitial sheath, the outer wall of the vessels, also increases in size on account of fatty degeneration of its elements. Nuclear proliferation is most noticeable in this coat, and the outside is attacked by spider cells. The swelling of the walls enlarges the size of the vessel to some extent, but it also presses inward so that the lumen is decreased or closed. The veins undergo changes similar to the arteries, the walls being frequently ruptured, and the capillaries suffer from the same degeneration which the larger vessels do, the dilations being quite noticeable. See figure 11. Figure 11, diagrammatic representation of two arteries. One normal, two affected by alcoholic excess. One normal. Adventitia or outer wall. B, media, middle or muscular wall showing nuclei of muscle fiber cells. C, intima or inner wall showing nuclei of pavement epithelium. And two, affected by alcoholic excess. A. Lumen nearly closed. B. Intima folded, swollen, and with nuclear proliferation in progress. C. Media irregularly swollen, staining lighter, and decrease in number of nuclei. D. Adventitia irregularly swollen and undergoing nuclear proliferation. E. Leukocytes. F. Fatty detritus. End of figure 11. On account of the degeneration of the vessels, blood is found in the brain substance which has oozed out through the ruptured walls, not only the extravasated blood, but together with it a collection of hematoidin crystals and fat embolisms is sometimes found. Through the dilations of the blood vessels, the walls become weaker, and this allows the exudation of the plasma to be more readily induced, and thus we frequently find an increased diffusion of plasma. The circulation of the blood is interfered with, and its original course perverted. The paravascular spaces become dilated and occasionally contain a few grains of hematoidin debris. Besides the change in the blood circulation, the circulation of the lymph is also deranged. The arterial sclerosis and the chronic thickening of the meninges are evidence of the retardation of the lymph, which has induced cirrhotic changes. Further, the virchow robin lymph spaces are found to be entirely obliterated and the hiss lymph spaces are almost completely closed. The vessels of the cord, as well as those of the brain, are affected. The increase in size of the vessels makes them much more prominent in sections of the cord, and the thickening of the coats, especially the muscularis, decreases the size of the lumen, and the intima thus appears plated when stained. Lewis gives comparative measurements of the lumina of vessels of the cord, both of those affected by alcoholic excess and those devoid of spinal symptoms, showing the decrease in the lumen of the affected ones. In general, the lesions are very similar to those of the cerebral vessels, the posterior portions being more affected than the interior. These defects in the vascular system would be sufficiently serious if the blood itself were normal, but alcohol has also a toxic effect upon the blood. Lewis accepts Dr. Piercy's experiments of 1839 in which he claims to have found alcohol in the brain. His inquiry was suggested by Dr. Kirk and Dr. Ogston, who said in 1830 and 1831 respectively that the blood of the brain of a habitual drunkard when exposed to heat gave off fumes of alcohol and the fluid in the ventricles of drunkards ignited and burned with a characteristic blue flame of alcohol. We discovered nearly four ounces of fluid in the ventricles, having all the physical qualities of alcohol, as proved by the united testimony of two other medical men, who saw the body opened and examined the fluid, are the words of Dr. Ogston. In Dr. Pierce's experiment on men and dogs, he did not rely on the odor and inflammability of the fluid, but he procured a quantity of alcohol by distillation. The writer is not prepared to affirm or deny the truth of these statements or the value of these experiments, since he has been unable to find any confirmation of them in modern experiments or among modern writers, with the exception of the endorsement of Mr. Lewis. 
The effects of alcohol upon the blood cause its nutritive qualities to be impaired, and its oxygenation and circulation retarded. The hemoglobin forms a close union with alcohol and then parts with its oxygen less readily. If present in sufficient amounts, the strong affinity which it has for water leads it to absorb the moisture from the red blood corpuscles, causing them to shrink, harden, change their form, and lose some of their ability to carry oxygen as well as their readiness to part with it. In this shrunken and irregular state of the red blood corpuscles with diminished hemoglobin, when oxyhemoglobin is reduced in the presence of alcohol, it becomes less capable of reoxygenation. The injury is not confined to the red blood corpuscles, but extends also to the colorless ones. When alcohol is present in the circulation, it has the power of repelling leukocytes, greatly diminishing their activity, seriously interfering with them in the performance of their function, and causing their disintegration and death. In the veins, more frequently than in the arteries, are found aggregations of dying polynuclear leukocytes, and where paravascular spaces are present, they contain leukocytes in all stages of disintegration, together with large protoplasmic bodies and quantities of detritus, finely granular in character. It is also noticed that alcohol causes an increased amount of fatty matters in the blood. Usually, in alcoholic poisoning, the contents of the skull are markedly hyperamic, the pie very full of blood, and the sinuses and plexus gorged. 3. Pathological growth. The brain as a whole is affected by cirrhosis. The meninges, especially the pie matter and the arachnoid, are much thickened. But whether this is due to an atrophy of the brain or to other causes, as, for instance, the hindering of the lymph flow and the disturbance of the blood supply, or both, is a matter of controversy. The whole mass of the brain is shrunken. The atrophy and wasting of the convulsions, causing them to be narrow, flattened, and distinctly separate by sulky. The relation of cause and effect, however, between this atrophy of the brain and the excessive growth of connective tissue is uncertain. In some cases are found a thickening of three different meninges, together with an increase in the size of the pachyonian bodies, an excess of subarachnoid fluid. Further signs of chronic meningitis often accompany the above changes, such as the adhesion of the pi matter to the underlying cortex. The dura matter, too, may be abnormally adherent to the cranium, the arachnoid extraordinarily opaque, and the pi arachnoid thickened with tendencies to oedema. When the connective tissue intrudes, the shape of the cells is changed by the crowding which ensues, thus lessening the functional capacity of the neurons. This crowding by intrusion and the compression by the thickening of the envelopes interfere with the blood supply, causing malnutrition and functional incapacity. Another sign of the disintegration by alcohol is that the spider cells greatly increase in number and form cicatricial tissue. The growth does further injury by invading the medullary sheath of the axis cylinder processes and the collaterals. In the cord, the connective tissue growth is not so great as in the brain, but is sufficient to do much injury. The pathological effects footnote have been divided into three classes and treated separately. Footnote W. H. Welch, The Pathological Effects of Alcohol, Physiological Aspects of the Liquor Problem, edited by J. S. Billings, Volume 2, page 370, sums up the pathological effects as follows. The pathological lesions of the brain found with greater or lesser frequency in cases of chronic alcoholism are thickening, opacity, and adhesions of the membranes, chronic hemorrhagic pachymeningitis, transudation of serum, atrophy of the cerebral convolutions, a granular condition of the ependyma, arthromatous arteries, and increase of neuroglia in the superficial layers of the cortex. End footnote. This cannot be done in fact, for there is a constant interaction between these changes. What is the effect in one class may be the immediate cause of some lesion in another. All, of course, are either directly or indirectly caused by alcohol. A change in the vascular system, which has been immediately caused by alcohol in the blood, 
may be the direct cause of the pathological growth, or the degeneration of the neurons. The pathological growth may interfere with the vascular system and hinder the action of the neurons, or the defective neurons may cause the change in the vascular system and the pathological growth. It is impossible to say which is the cause of the total effects in the other. Probably no one is. But we have here a pathological circle, the one diseased part working disastrously upon another, the second part reacting in a detrimental way upon the first, all being interdependent. Footnote, H.J. Berkeley, Studies on the Lesions Produced by the Action of Certain Poisons on the Cortical Nerve Cell, Brain, Volume 18, page 491, says that the nerves are affected as a direct result of the poison of alcohol as well as indirectly through a lack of nutriment in the blood. On the contrary, A.E. Stern, The Effect of Alcohol Upon the Nervous System of the Mind and Hereditary, Quarterly Journal of Inebriety, Volume 25, page 59, says, The effect upon the nerve tissue itself is purely secondary, due, in other words, largely to malnutrition of the nerve elements. W.B. Lewis, Textbook of Mental Diseases, page 583, opines that the vascular lesions are the first in point of time. End footnote. Cells of every kind of tissue usually have the ability to hinder or prevent the entrance within their walls of substances which will injure them. Not so with alcohol and other narcotic poisons, which easily penetrate the walls and attack the protoplasm with toxic effects. In fact, here we have three varieties of poison against which the cells have to struggle that of the alcohol as such, the products of alcohol in uniting with the elements of the blood, and the effete and stagnant matter not eliminated. Thus we see that the whole system is exposed to the toxic changes. The blood supply affects all parts of the body, for the most minute and remote cell has no other source of nourishment, and therefore of life, than the blood. This is especially true of the brain and spinal cord, for on the account of the osseous covering, not only can nourishment be received in no other way, but to a large extent the blood is the only means of injury. Further, with no lesions in the blood and no poisons in the blood, we know that the simple change in the amount of blood has an effect upon the brain, the discontinuance of the supply causing insensibility and almost instantaneously, while the increased supply causes excitation and latter unconsciousness and death. It is thus very important to remember in dealing with alcoholism that the neurons within the nerve centers can be, and often are, very significantly affected by influences dependent upon alterations in the flow of blood and lymph. Nerve cells of the spinal cord, deprived of blood for some six hours, show an almost total lack of chromatic bodies, except a few near the nucleus. We have also noteworthy alterations in the nutritive properties as well as in the flow. The blood itself is impoverished by lack of oxygen, and the changes in the arteries cause either a lack of blood to a particular part or a rupture of the vessel, allowing the contents to be sent into the brain substance. Thus, in every case of alcoholic cerebral degeneration, we have to deal with the part played by the inflammatory exudate, that of alcohol in the exudate, and the combined effects of nutrition and metabolism of the nervous structure. The retardation of the flow of lymph and blood induces cirrhotic changes, giving us a thickening of the meninges and general increase of connective tissue. The quality of the blood also affects the vessels themselves, and by rupturing or closing the lumina, acts upon the nervous and connective tissue. The direct effect of alcohol upon the nervous system, and thus upon the vasomotor nerves, causes much of the disturbance in the vascular system. When these nerves are affected, the vessels dilate and perhaps rupture or else the walls are swollen, the lumen is closed, and degeneration is completed in this way. In addition to this, the nerves, indirectly through the blood, and probably also to some extent directly, exert an influence upon the excessive growth of connective tissue. The connective tissue injures the nerves by invading the sheath of the processes, pressing the cell bodies, changing the shape, and interfering with their function. By pressure upon the vessels, the lumina are made smaller, and thus the supply of blood and lymph is decreased. It must not be supposed that the foregoing description of the effects of alcohol upon the nervous system is the result of an examination of any one individual, 
Of course, no one could survive with all these lesions, a small proportion of them being sufficient to cause death. This account is a resume of all the effects which have been observed, supposed to be caused by alcohol upon different persons, the effects varying with the individual. Nor must we think that these are the observations of any one scientist upon a number of persons. It is rather a composite description of the accounts of different observers, none of whom has probably noticed all the lesions described here. It is only natural at the present stage of investigation regarding histological elements of nervous tissue that there should be differences, not only of opinion but of observed facts according to the personal equation of the observer. The experimental methods and the numerous other circumstances which must necessarily vary in different individuals from small doses of alcohol are taken by the subject, or even in a single or a few intoxications. We also have different effects according to the variety of alcoholic beverage of which the subject partakes. One kind causes him to be keen and quick-witted, another jolly, another morose. At the same period of the intoxication, while different periods of the same intoxication produce as many different moods. These differences, however, are noticed in acute cases, or with small doses, but with these we are not directly concerned. The effect is different when larger doses are taken. The individual participating does not then show his characteristics so much, and the form of the alcohol does not produce such noticeable differences. Finally, when the doses become large and the participation frequent, the individual characteristics in the form of the alcohol make less and less difference. All the appearances of the stimulation cease, and the apparent effect is that of paralysis only. It is only thus that we can pursue our investigation, for if the same differences were noted in chronic alcoholism that are seen in a single intoxication, we should have to confine ourselves to the investigation of the effects of wine or beer or whiskey upon a certain individual rather than the effect of alcohol regardless of its form upon men in general. There are differences, however, which may be likened to different cases of any disease. The physician knows of many symptoms of every disease or form of poisoning, but he rarely finds all the symptoms present in any one case. They will depend on the constitution of the patient. This is equally true regarding alcohol. With one, the effects appear to be largely upon the central nervous system, with another, the peripheral nerves are most seriously affected. Some are able to drink moderately and seldom. Others cannot control themselves, but are continually intoxicated. Between these two extremes can be found individuals to form a gradual scale. There is no more perplexing problem in individual psychology that is presented by the subtle differences of organization which make it possible for one man to drink moderately without danger, while another, apparently as well constituted, and as favorably conditioned, perishes in the presence of alcohol. We know that the effects differ according to the age, footnote 2, sex, footnote 3, profession, footnote 4, hereditary disposition, footnote 5, form of alcohol used, and other factors. Footnote 2, sex. W. B. Lewis, Textbook of Mental Diseases, page 328, says the ages when males are most susceptible to alcohol are from 25 to 30, and from 35 to 40. The explanation which he gives for this is that the former is a period characterized by intellectual advance, and the latter a time when struggle for existence is keenly felt. H. J. Berkeley, Mental Diseases, page 248, says, While chronic alcoholism is found at all ages, it is, its especial predilection seems to be for individuals between 25 and 45 years of age. When the man's activities are at their height, his intellectual development is greatest, and the work and the struggle for a competence at its maximum. And footnote 2. Footnote 3, sex. It has been pointed out by H. Ellis, Man and Woman, page 222, W.B. Lewis, I.B.I.D., page 346, and R. Jones, Quarterly Journal of Inebriety, volume 25, page 270, that alcoholism is more common in men than in women, but Mr. Jones says that Criminality is more common among women inebriates, and Mr. Ellis affirms that affections of the spinal cord and nerves are found more frequently among women. And footnote 3. Footnote 4. Profession. Professions which induce sedentary habits are more disastrous than a more active outdoor life. And footnote 4. And footnote 5. Hereditary disposition. Any form 
of neurotic inheritance tend towards an inebriate life. End footnote 5. Yet in advanced cases, the difference is not so great as to prevent our noticing both physiological and psychological laws which apply to all cases. Three things we may note here in passing. Alcohol appears to affect neurotic persons more than the non-neurotic. Persons already degenerated among nervous lines are more seriously injured. The most highly organized centers are first and more permanently affected than the lower centers. This last point will have an important bearing on the psychology, for the principle holds good psychologically as well as physiologically, that in cells subject to the same amount of alcohol, the suspension of activity begins first with the most complex and proceeds to the most simple. The disagreement of the results of scientific investigation regarding the lesions caused by alcoholism makes our task difficult, and the further uncertainty concerning the importance of the lesions concurred in by all the investigators is an additional drawback. One example will suffice to elucidate the point. Chromatolysis, a lesion reported in alcoholism, is also found in ordinary fatigue, the repair of which is brought about by rest. Post-mortem changes are also shown in this way. Noting this, chromatolysis may not be a very serious lesion, but when it is coupled with fatty and pigmentary degeneration, as is frequently the case in alcoholism, we are justified in positing its pathological nature. The basis of the observations, the science and art of staining, is still very imperfect, and not until this is perfected can we expect more certain results. The uncertainty makes it difficult to establish any certain connection between the physical and the psychical, and it seems venturesome to try. When slight success has crowned the efforts of those who have tried to establish a proportion between morphological alterations and the amount of functional disturbance between the two aspects of the physical, how should one be expected to establish the relation between the morphological alterations and the psychical changes over the unabridged chasm between the physical and the psychical? This and its wider aspect seems impossible, yet in a limited way we are able to apply the principles of physiological psychology, advance into the known and reasonable as far as we can, and leave the rest to the future to the time when the activity of the single neuron in its normal condition shall be more fully understood and when we can better comprehend the pathological cases. This chapter, which must form the basis of our further study, has given us a resume of the chemical and physiological discussions concerning the action of alcohol on the brain. We have seen that the neurons are so injured that in many cases they are entirely destroyed. This degeneration is found in all parts of the nervous system, but is most disastrous in the cerebrum. The arteries are hardened and filled up so that they are not capable of performing their normal functions, and the blood is deficient both in quantity and quality. The pathological growths crowd and deform the cells so as to interfere with the best work, and at times assist in the destruction of the nerve elements. All these different lesions are related and prove both cause and effect in the pathological circle. While we find the effects of different kinds of alcoholic beverages vary when taken in small doses and as an occasional indulgence. When the doses are large and continuous, the same differences are not noticeable. Nevertheless, the various conditions under which the individuals live and the investigations are made add to the difficulties of our problem. In the succeeding pages, the attempt will be made to follow what is known concerning the relation between the physical and the psychical, and to explain how and why alcohol in affecting the brain injures the mind. One principle, one analogy, seems to permeate the whole. The alcoholic is the victim of premature senility, of mind and body, the symptoms of alcoholism and old age being similar. End of chapter 2《ハプテンシュタイムズ・ウェブ・レポート》この録音は公開されています。ここで、ここで、ここで、ここで、ここで、ここで、ここで、ここで、ここで、ここで、ここで、ここで、ここで、ここで、ここで、ここで、ここで、ここで、ここで、ここで、ここで、ここで、ここで、ここで、ここで、ここで、ここで、ここで、ここで、ここで、ここで、ここで、ここで、ここで、ここで、ここで、ここで、ここで、ここで、ここで、ここで、ここで、ここで、ここで、
Our whole subject leads us to discuss the relation of the psychological to the physical, which is difficult to discover and quite impossible to explain. The memory gives us the best clue to this relationship, as it is without doubt the physiological factor whose dependence we can most clearly trace to the physical processes, and as such has a claim to the first place in this discussion. It is fundamental as a faculty of mind, because all other faculties are more or less dependent upon it. Our knowledge is based on memory, and without it experience would be useless and reasoning impossible. The self shrinks with the memory, and every thought and action are based on it. We must recognize that the mind is so much a unit that we cannot dispense with any portion as useless and go on in life without feeling the need of it. That the mind as a whole is dependent upon every part is true, and yet there is a special sense in which it is dependent upon the memory. Life without memory would be a blank, not to be compared in richness with that of the idiot or insane who has lost some other faculty of mind. Not only would other faculties of the mind be impossible without memory, but they fail as the memory fails, so that if the decline of memory goes beyond a certain point, it will prove to be the destruction of other faculties. Memory is not a faculty separate from all the others, but rather the condition of their activity. It furnishes the material for mental life, and without it there is no content. The other reason why memory should be first discussed is because its impairment is one of the first symptoms of decay and decline in the life of the alcoholic, as in almost all cases of mental degeneration. Footnote. H. Maldsley, Physiology of Mind, page 535, W.B. Lewis, Textbook of Mental Diseases, page 348, says, The memory is specially implicated. Cases compromised in this category, amnesia forms, show the earliest evidence of the structural change due to the prolonged use of alcohol. They are of most serious moment, as they indicate that the borderland between disordered function and real structural change has been passed. End footnote. Sometimes it may be the only symptom. Footnote. J. Dreshfield on Alcoholic Paralysis. Brain, Volume 8, page 437 and page 444. Gives two classes of which he speaks as follows. The patient complained of loss of memory, but otherwise her mental condition was normal. I found the patient irritable, otherwise but little affected, mentally except that he had lost his memory for recent events. End footnote. The slight early affections may be overlooked at first, because of the constant liability to forgetfulness common to normal persons. The decline of the alcoholic's memory may first manifest itself, not in the conscious inability to remember certain things, but in the unconscious effect which it may have upon the other faculties. As the alcoholic has been stricken with premature old age, this symptom so common to the appearance of senility is the first one manifested. Since the memory is fundamental in respect, first, to the explanation of the relationship of mind and brain, second, to the dependence of the faculties upon it, and third, because it is the first symptom of degeneration through excessive indulgence in alcohol, the discussion is placed first. The disturbance of memory due to a single intoxication is not within the range of our subject, save as it may throw light upon the effects of the continued use of alcohol. In single intoxications we find at first an exaltation of memory due to the increased supply of blood to the brain, and later a loss more or less complete until the victim lapses into unconsciousness. The fact that he has had his memory exalted or depressed once or twice or many times is not the reason that the memory may fail in advanced cases of inebriety. But the physical condition which caused these temporary changes in the memory tend to cause also such permanent disorder in the cells of the brain as to interfere with the normal function of the mind as far as the memory is concerned. The disorder of memory most common to the alcoholic is that of progressive amnesia. Footnote. W. B. Lewis, Textbook of Mental Disease, page 348, describes the extent of the disorders when he says, The most notable feature characterized in this class is the peculiar failure of memory, an instantaneous forgetfulness of events which have only just occurred. Every degree is found from slight retentiveness up to a complete and almost immediate abolition of the latest impression. A patient so affected forgets names, dates, and order of sequence, 
to an almost incredible degree. If a name not familiar be repeated over and over again, a moment's conversation will often obliterate its memory, even when told to keep the word as a test word in mind. The recall fails if the attention be momentarily attracted in another direction. End footnote. Sometimes we find also well-defined cases of hyperamnesia and abnormal and excessive paramnesia as solitary symptoms or coupled with amnesia. While forgetfulness is a characteristic symptom of all forms of chronic alcoholism, the loss of memory may be so prominent as to constitute a special form of the disease. Berkeley recognizes this. Footnote. H. J. Berkeley, Mental Diseases, page 274, says of this class, This forgetfulness of names, dates, the order of work, even of meal times, renders the patient unfit to follow the daily pursuits of ordinary life. This incapacity may exist for the simplest procedures. I have, for instance, ordered a patient afflicted with alcoholic amnesia to bring me a glass of water from the hydrant. He would start off with perfect willingness, would perhaps reach the door and then return for further orders with the acknowledgement that he had forgotten for what purpose he had been sent. The scene had been repeated eight or nine times in succession, the patient sometimes very nearly succeeding, at other times hardly reaching the doorway before abandoning the attempt. End footnote. And Lewis has made a division on this line, one form of alcoholism being designated by him as the amnesic type. The patients recognize their mental enfeeblement and strive against it with painful earnestness. Amnesia is not always complete, for often there will be a dim remembrance, or a solitary event or sentence may be retained out of an otherwise amnesic period. Dr. Freud gives two very interesting cases of amnesia brought about by alcoholic excess. His accounts are plenary, so only an epitome of the cases can be presented here. The first patient was a woman 52 years old. She had had both bodily and mental disorders characteristic of alcoholism, including a slight delirium, but from these she had mostly recovered, the chief remaining symptom being a very weak memory. This caused her to be considered feeble-minded, another symptom of which was frequent chattering. Her early memory, such as the birth dates of her brothers and sisters, the names of her teacher and school friends was complete, and many events up to her 30th year were not forgotten. But of occurrences after that, and especially concerning recent events, her memory was largely a blank. At times she knew not the name of her husband, nor the place of her residence. She believed her parents and husband still alive, and thought of her grown-up children as yet uneducated. She estimated her own age correctly, and gave a correct account of her illness. She believed that she had been in her present place of abode only a few days, and mistook the doctor for her old schoolmaster. She did not remember the day of the week, month, year, or even the season. Meal times were most correctly judged, yet a few hours after meals she could not remember whether she had dined, nor could she tell what food she had had. An hour afterwards she forgot that the doctor had given her a close bodily examination, and she replied to the same question she had answered shortly before, not recognizing it. She could only repeat phrases or tunes when they were reiterated or spoken slowly and distinctly. She multiplied correctly, but could not remember the examples. She did not remember a number over a period of conversation. There was no abnormality regarding her writing. The second case was that of a woman of 65 years of age, who after alcoholic excess had isolated epileptic attacks and slight delirium. After a serious attack when admitted to the hospital, her memory became very weak, much like the former patient with symptoms of feeble-mindedness and clouded judgment. The boundary time of memory was her 20th year, after which a few scattered events only were remembered. Of early years, she could recall her place of birth, teachers, school, friends, and church, but she did not know her age, usually saying she was 18. She did not know that she had gray hair, nor did she know that she was in a hospital, but she gave a fair account of her illness. Recollection of simple impressions vanished in a few minutes. She could not remember her bed and similar things. Different from the first case, her power to write was greatly affected. In writing of a spontaneous character, she repeated words and portions of sentences before she could form one letter correctly, and even then it was with great difficulty that she could recall capital letters. 
Letters which she forgot were frequently remembered shortly afterwards. She could write from copy quite correctly when she spelled aloud the words as she wrote them. Her last success was in writing from diction, and in this exercise, accelerating the speed of the diction increased her errors. Frequently, however, she recognized the errors which she made. Her oral spelling was much superior to her written. The following is a case of hyperamnesia. Dr. Godding, in charge of the government hospital for the insane, informs me that he has seen but two instances of hyperamnesia, one in a woman, the other in a man, who suffered from dementia of alcoholic origin. In the earlier stages of his trouble, this man showed surprising memory for the smallest details of his profession, that of chemist, and for minor events and scenes of his previous life. But the augmentation of memory was only transitory, having been replaced by progressive amnesia. Paramnesia is so common in normal subjects that a case seems hardly necessary for description here. The alcoholic experience in this regard is more frequent and more pronounced, causing foolish and unexpected situations for the patient. He is introduced to a stranger whom he recognizes as an old friend, and may be very familiar with completely new surroundings. This exaggerated and continuous paramnesia is more common in alcoholic insanity than in any other form of mental disorder. It is frequently associated with illusions, and may be the result of them at times. The following extract shows the histological evidence and conclusions regarding the alcoholic's memory. Under the law of psychogenesis, we had previously noted that the power of recalling past memories implies a highly involved cortical mental organization, and that it has behind it a nutritive law of deep significance. This capacity depends upon the integrity of the cerebral organization in two regards, viz. A. The integrity of the latest involved in elaborated anatomico-physiological connections or fields of conjunction between the neurons which subserve it, and B. The high nutritive elaboration, the high nerve tension and capacity for spontaneous discharge of the said neurons from time to time. These two, A and B, are not distinct, but will be discussed separately. In what respect does alcohol produce a change in these two above factors? In the normal relation, the dendrites and collaterals of the different cells come into contact, but in the alcoholic, there is a softening and decay of the dendrites as already described. There also comes a change in the collaterals. The dendrites and collaterals form connections, not only between one neuron and another, but between one complete set and another, for example, between nerve centers. With the dendrites and collaterals gone, this connection is impossible. When this happens, we have a diminished capacity of the neuron to be excitable to stimuli, and a diminished permeability in the pathways of the nerve currents issuing from one neuron by its nervous processes and its terminals to another in the cortical area, the psychological counterpart of which would be a slowness in the arousing of associated images and delay in reaction time. The nutritive changes are also important. The physiology of nutrition is in the nerve cell elaborated to a high degree, and each nerve center of this or that part of the central nervous system has its own intrinsic nutritive rhythm. In the alcoholic brain, the earlier and subtler changes affect not merely the field of conjunction, but the trophic or nutritive forms, cell body and nucleus, of each individual neuron. These changes show an increased functional activity and degradation therefrom, evidenced by the softening and alteration of the blue chromatic rods and granules and displacement of yellow pigment. The increase in progress of pigmentation is equivalent of the onset and progress of degradation in the functional activity of the cell. The replacement of living protoplasm by non-living pigmentary product as we see in senile decay. The memory may be divided into three factors, the purely physical retention, the psychophysical reproduction, and the purely psychical recognition. Sometimes there is added to these the factor of localization, but this is rather an elaboration of memory than a real part of it. Insofar as necessary, this factor will be treated under the rubric of recognition. The effects of alcohol on the memory will be shown by its effect upon each one of the factors in turn, 
and thus the total injury can be comprehended. It might be remarked here in passing that the theory of the physical basis of memory, which the writer accepts, can be briefly stated as follows. Memory depends upon a persistent disposition or tendency to movement created in the brain. The prerequisite of memory is an impression made upon and responded to by the mind, of which we shall take perception as the type. It seems unnecessary to say that what is not perceived cannot be remembered, but perhaps it would be less readily accepted if we should say that in proportion, as the perception is less distinct, so the memory of it will be not only less clear, but also less lasting. As we shall see when we come to consider the subject later on, alcohol has a very distinct effect upon the senses. This is especially true of the organs of sight, but also of other special senses, common sensations and the muscular sense. The general affections of the end organs prevent normal perception. The hardening of the brain makes it less susceptible and plastic, while the decay of the cells and fibers, if in process of degeneration at the time, would also prove to be a preventative of a necessary modification. The condition of the body at the time of perception is very important. The question of the energy of the person figures conspicuously. In the previous chapter, when speaking of the histological appearance of the nerve cells in alcoholism, we found that the appearance of the cell when fatigued and when affected by alcohol was quite similar in several respects. We know that when fatigued, we cannot respond to a sensation so well and do not remember so well afterwards because we have not received the required impression and given the required response to make the necessary modification in cells and fibers. In some experiments with persons deprived of sleep, the memory failed in waves and at the end of 90 hours it was very much slower or failed entirely. This showed the effect of a low nervous energy on perception, the impression not being made, and the mind not responding to sensuous stimuli. That the flow of blood is necessary in a normal degree in perception is seen in the fact that we are less bright, as far as perception is concerned, after a meal than before. If the stomach demands an abnormal amount of blood, the brain cannot have its normal quantity. The fresher and more energetic the vital processes, the better may things be learned. For example, the sensuous percepts will leave behind more permanent and deeper traces. Even things perceived in an energetic and cheerful frame of mind are more easily retained. We know that on account of the diseased condition of the blood vessels of the alcoholic, the proper amount of blood cannot reach the brain and so perception is less forceful. The other functions of the brain concerned in perception to make it available to the mind being also affected, the perception, if perfect, cannot be known as such. The element of attention required in all perception is lacking in the alcoholic. The value of attention to memory is shown by the first of a series always being remembered best because it attracts the attention and strikes the organs when fresh and forceful. Some have claimed that the difficulty usually attributed to memory in old age and alcoholism should properly be laid to the door of perception on account of the lack of attention, that the attention degenerates first and not the memory. However true this may be, we know that the power of voluntary attention, as well as what might be called spontaneous attention, is diminished in alcoholics and memory is injured thereby. Voluntary attention is lacking on account of the lack of will. The sensations are also misinterpreted, which makes perception untrustworthy. Many mistakes commonly attributed to recognition may without doubt be due to erroneous perception, and the recognition, at least in some cases, be perfect. Thus, the accusation against the alcoholic of being smooth-tongued, fluent liar may not in all cases be due to his moral degeneration, but to his improper perception. He may tell things different from the way in which they appear to the normal person, and yet his account may be as he saw them or heard them, the trouble being that he did not see or hear them correctly. Supposing the perception to be normal, do we find the retentive power of the memory injured? This is a physical process purely, and if the injury comes through the physical, we would expect the trouble, as far as the memory is concerned, to originate here. This is undoubtedly the case. As soon as the modification is made in the elements, the nourishment provided by the blood must be sufficient to continue the modifications in the original way. 
to allow the cell to produce its kind so as, in the event of its death, to have other cells take its place. The fact that perception received just before sleep, when the cells have immediately afterwards much rest and nourishment, is remembered well, and that the events immediately preceding severe illnesses, such as fevers, cholera, excessive hemorrhages, inveterate syphilis, etc., are not remembered, shows the necessity of nourishment following the perception, if it is to be retained. We find that there is sometimes a permanent loss of memory after lead, mercury, and nicotine poisoning. This might be due as well to the lack of ability to make associations, to the shrinkage of the fibers, for some poisons have the effect of contracting nervous tissue, and a very slight contraction would separate itself from its neighbor and companions in labor. Fatigue or any lack of nervous force after perception causes a lack of retention. The older particles are dying continually, hence new particles must be supplied to keep up the structure, and this is done by the repositing of new matter in the precise form of the old. The physical basis of memory is therefore nutrition. The lack of nutrition is well known in alcoholics, not only on account of the impoverished condition of the blood, but also on account of of the small supply received, due, as we have seen, to embolisms or the closing of the lumen of the arteries. We found that the cells and their dendrites were actually destroyed in some cases, degenerating through the effect of alcohol upon them. Of course, if this is so, the modification cannot remain, and the cell cannot function. Not only the elements directly modified, but those indirectly changed, and upon which the associations depend may be injured. We know that if a single nervous element is destroyed or paralyzed, that suffices. The well-known mechanism of association will explain the rest. A chain is as strong as its weakest link. This applies to the chain of associations, and if one link is gone, the whole thought perishes. As memory is primarily a process of organization, so amnesia is the process of disorganization and dissolution. The basis of memory is not simply a collection of impressions, but an organization of what have been called dynamical associations or habits of the functioning of the various elements of the brain, which respond to appropriate stimuli. Because of the impression made upon the single cell, it functions in a certain manner, but it functions thus in connection with many other cells and fibers to allow us to have memory. Probably never all the cells and fibers of a system are destroyed, but the system is destroyed when one of its factors is. It is not necessary for the tracks of a whole railroad system to be removed in order to prevent traffic. One rail or even one spike, in infinitely small proportion, if removed, wrecks the train and prevents its arriving at its destination. Thus, if one cell loses its power of functioning in a certain way, loses its retention, then the whole thought is destroyed. This disorganization begins with the most unstable systems of neurons, with those which require a large and complicated mechanism. Because it requires so little, such a small retraction of the dendrites, or a small part of the cell incapacitated, to prevent its functioning. Kleefeld found in his experiments that when alcohol is introduced into the circulation, it produced almost instantly a retraction of the minute branches of the neurons, at least of a great number of them. The pathological growth of the brain as a whole and the invasion of connective tissue among the individual cells and fibers so distort the cells as to destroy any modification which they may have had or prevent them from functioning in their usual manner. This growth must also interfere with the complex systems which have elements all through the two hemispheres and prevent the working of the systems as wholes. Thus, in two distinct ways, the growth seriously interfere with the memory. We know the brain of the alcoholic to degenerate in this way. So here again, an additional cause is found for the loss of memory. It is exceedingly difficult, if at all possible, to distinguish between the destruction of the memory as retentive and as reproductive. We know, of course, when we fail to reproduce a thought at one time, and under certain circumstances, and are able to do so at other times, that the fault has been with the reproduction. But when the idea is never reproduced, it is impossible without further data to know where the fault lies. 
What has been said under the head of the destruction of the memory as retentive may also apply to the lack of reproduction. As we found it necessary to have the body as a whole, and the brain in particular in a good state of health, when we acquire any idea in order to remember it, so it is necessary to be in equally good condition when we desire to recall or reproduce anything. In fact, the conditions necessary, both physically and psychically, are very similar in presentation and reproduction. We require nourishment, good blood supply, and well-functioning nervous elements, as well as attention in both. As we found that the alcoholic lacked these conditions in perception, so he lacks them in reproduction. Both involuntary reproduction, or recall, and spontaneous reproduction, the alcoholic is very weak. He has lost the power of will, and as we shall see in a later chapter, hence the lack of voluntary reproduction. The general decline of nervous force and the sluggish flow of thought account for the absence of spontaneity. The feeling of strain, so apparent during voluntary attention, shows that mental work is necessary, and this the alcoholic cannot do well. This inattention, so apparent, not only lessens the extent to which ideas can be taken up and retained in consciousness, but in a still greater degree confuses and deranges the associational connections in what is actually recollected. The associations become very unstable, and referring again to our railroad illustration, the train is easily switched to another track through this lack of attention until a few tracks only are used. The others through disuse, atrophy, and through disease, which would attack the weaker, unused elements, soon decay. The decay of one element not only interferes with the idea directly dependent upon the system to which it belongs, but with the other systems which are dependent upon it. So as we say, a whole train of thought is lost. This happens not because of the lack of retention in the greater part of the physical basis of this train, but because the connecting elements having gone, it is impossible to stimulate the figuratively more distant elements. The physical basis of associations of ideas being destroyed, we have no means of approach. The idea is therefore past recall unless the damaging factor is removed and sufficient nourishment comes to the affected part to allow of the renewing of the association fiber, as is sometimes the case after Wallerian degeneration. Besides attention and association of ideas, other mental states have an effect upon the memory. All varieties of emotion have an influence, as an example given, anger, fright, depression, and joy. The first three are generally detrimental because they lower the nervous force or else divert it. When there is a loss of nervous force, not immediately replaceable, there is a corresponding diminution of memory. In no condition is this better shown than in that of fatigue. Nearly all books dealing with memory giving definite examples of this. There is that example of Sir Henry Holland, who, while in the Hartz Mountains, became very much fatigued as a result of which he was unable to remember a word of German, and therefore could not converse with those who were accompanying him. On becoming rested, a full recollection of all his knowledge of German returned. Assistant Surgeon Woodruff, in a paper published in the Philadelphia Medical Journal, gives several examples of entire lapse of memory among the officers of the United States Army doing duty in the Philippine Islands. The phenomenon took place usually late in the day on account of exhaustion, and not until after a rest, differing in length from an hour to a whole night, was the memory restored. We have all had similar experiences of being unable voluntarily to recall something when we were exhausted and our heads felt tired, while after an interval of repose, when we felt fresh, it was easily recalled. This return of reproductive power is probably due to the renovation of brain tissue and the purification of blood, which has been charged with waste products. If, as is largely the case with the alcoholic, not sufficient blood comes to the affected parts, and what blood does come is surcharged with injurious matter, and if the vascular system is so injured as to prevent the carrying away of the affete matter, whence comes the necessary repair and change? With the alcoholic it never comes, and gradually, through lack of repair, the neurons lose their ability to function. 
sometimes becoming so weak and degenerated that an ordinary stimulus is not sufficiently powerful to affect them. The very presence of alcohol in the blood is detrimental to reproduction because of the effect it has upon the healthy neuron. Experiments with various toxic substances show that when the neurons come in contact with them, they contract. True, it is a very slight contraction, but a slight contraction is sufficient to prevent the transference of stimuli when the connection is not organic and continuous, but by synapse. The interlacing dendrites and collaterals drawing apart an exceedingly short distance prevent the connection, not only between single neurons, but in doing this between different systems. So long as the harmful substance continues in the blood, the process of the memory of many experiences may be hindered. Again, the effects of the pathological growth in the brain may be noticed. By crowding and otherwise injuring whole areas of the brain as well as individual neurons, they prevent the normal functions. They thus hinder reproduction, which requires the healthy condition and normal position of every portion of the brain to do its best work. That retention is much broader than reproduction, that is, that many ideas are retained and normally not reproduced, is shown by some cases of abnormal memory in alcoholics. The exalted memory, or hyperamnesia, is also seen in some cases of fever, as, for example, that classic case of the illiterate serving maid, who, in her delirium, repeated long passages of Greek and Hebrew, which her master had recited when she was about her work in the house which she had scarcely noticed at the time. In some cases of great sorrow, similar phenomena are noticed. In fact, the phenomena is seen in many abnormal conditions which put an additional burden upon the mind. This, however, is only a proof of amnesia, for it shows a disservice of certain groups and systems of neurons which no normal volitional effort can stimulate that the physical basis of these ideas have been previously separated from those of the normal stream of thought. The mechanism of these dissevered tracks may still be preserved in working order, except that it would become weaker through disuse, and when some abnormal condition furnishes an exceedingly strong stimulus, this mechanism again functions, with the result of what is called hyperamnesia. We now come to the characteristic factor of memory, recognition. If the quality most needed in memory were demanded, trustworthiness would be the answer. What is memory if not trustworthy, and how can we have trustworthiness unless there is perfect recognition? Yet in our discussion here, we can probably deal less with recognition than with other factors, because while so characteristic and necessary, it is equally difficult to explain. We know that we do recognize, but why and how we recognize are questions not yet answered. Some have attempted a physical explanation in this way. It is a feeling caused by the brain elements working in the same way as they have previously done. For example, a sensation of repeating a physical action, but we know on introspection that recognition is not such. Most persons who give a totally physical explanation of memory wholly ignore recognition and perhaps not unwisely, for it is a physical factor pure and simple. It is because of this psychical nature that it comes in for so small a part in our consideration here, where we have physical causes and look for physical effects primarily. Although we cannot discover a local basis to examine histologically from which to draw conclusions of a psychical nature, we can examine recognition itself through introspection on account of its very psychical nature. We find that in alcoholism, recognition is at fault at the very point where we desire it to be sound, viz. in its trustworthiness. This is shown in two ways. First, it does not recognize some things which have been perceived before and which are brought before the mind again. And second, things are supposedly recognized which have never before been experienced. Footnote, J. R. Wilson, Drunkenness, pages 37 forward, describes the disorders of recognition as follows. But it is in the process of recognition of allied functions that the most interesting and grotesque mistakes are made by the habitual drunkard. The disordered brain refuses to operate for recognition when it should, and accordingly familiar objects seem strange, and facts brought to his recollection fail to excite conviction. 
or the mechanism for recognition reacts to a wrong stimuli, and he has a sense of familiarity with new surroundings or greets a strange face with assurance of time-honored friendship. Closely allied to these mistakes in identity, there are defects in orientation. In alcoholism, orientation is almost invariably impaired, so that in advanced stages, the patient easily loses himself, mistakes the hospital for home, cannot find his way even by a route that he has traveled daily, and fails to judge intervals of time and to realize the drift of the season. And footnote. The first of these troubles we would speak of as the usual fault in recognition. The second is called paramnesia, and has lately received considerable attention from students being the subject of various and diverse conclusions concerning its cause. It would be impossible for the mind as a whole to degenerate or to have the other factors of memory affected without there being a corresponding effect upon recognition. The fact that the mind as a whole is weakened in alcoholism cannot well be disputed, and some of these faculties of mind, closely allied and necessary to recognition, we find injured. The judgment as a whole is certainly incapacitated, and as far as recognition is a judgment, it is weakened thereby. The self-consciousness is less and confused, and if recognition as applied to memory means not only the considering of a certain experience to be in the past, but to be in the past of the individual experiencing it, then it is necessary, in order to have recognition perform its natural work, to have a clear and well-defined self-consciousness. Time and space relations must be easily and surely grasped in perfect recognition. But here again the alcoholic is deficient. He makes frequent mistakes in orientation as well as in other forms of localization. Sometimes the most familiar articles of dress or persons whom he met frequently and knows well are all strangers to him, and he has to be introduced over and over again to acquaintances. He may, however, be able to recognize them as having seen them before, but when he last saw them, whether yesterday or ten years ago, he is unable to tell. Equally uncertain is he of their place of abode, their relation to him, or anything connected with them. These last cases may be extreme if permanent, but not infrequently does the alcoholic have pronounced temporary attacks of this kind. It is said that women suffering from alcoholic peripheral neuritis lose account of time and are without ordinary knowledge of their whereabouts. But this failure to orient is not peculiar to the female sex or to peripheral neuritis as a result of alcoholic excess, but in other effects of alcoholism we find it as a common symptom. The phenomena of paramnesia is common. Probably everyone has had the experience of viewing a landscape, reading a passage in a book, or being introduced to a new acquaintance with a distinct feeling of having had the same experience before. Not only the landscape look the same, but the same friends were accompanying you. You were dressed the same, the wind was blowing, or the sun was shining exactly the same manner. Not only the passage in the book was the same, but you were reading it in the same room, sitting in the same posture, in the same chair, on a similar day, etc. Everything identical, only it seemed to be distant and hazy, notwithstanding the fact that you seemed to know what was coming next, and concerning which you were not often disappointed. This is sometimes accompanied by a feeling of anxiety and uneasiness. There appear to be no other factors of memory in use except that of recognition, that feeling of familiarity with the whole circumstances. Your reason tells you you could not have had this experience before, yet you feel that you have. This is comparatively common. But the alcoholic has it not only more frequently, it takes a firmer hold upon him. He is taken into entirely new surroundings, which he nevertheless remembers perfectly. Everything is exceedingly familiar to him, even the people who are total strangers. It sometimes becomes ludicrous. Nothing is strange or unknown. Cases of paramnesia have been divided into three classes. First, simple paramnesia, or pseudo-reminiscence. This is where something dreamed or read or pictures of the imagination are thought to be true. Second, Identifying paramnesia, this is the been there before experience described above, which is most frequent in young people and those with a vivid imagination, and at times of fatigue and excitement, but which in the normal person is easily corrected. Third, suggested or associated paramnesia, 
some actual impression suggests an illusion of memory. Now, while the alcoholic without doubt is troubled with all three forms, it is the second form, that of identifying paramnesia, with which he is especially troubled, with the first form next seriously troublesome. The attempted explanations have been many. Usually only the second form, that of identifying paramnesia, is discussed and explained. It is very difficult to discover any theory exactly fitting the facts, but it seems that there is some disaggregation in consciousness from a physical cause. Both the first and second forms of paramnesia are found often in times of fatigue, as well in times of weakness from old age and disease. We have noted before the similarity between the person fatigued and the alcoholic. Both lack in nervous force, and hence the mind does not work quickly and harmoniously, the connections between the different parts being uncertain. In the normal person, paramnesia may be quickly and easily corrected, but when the critical faculty of mind is impaired, it is impossible to say whether a certain presentation has sufficient evidence of familiarity to call it memory, or whether the feeling of familiarity is stronger than the grounds for disbelieving it. Something familiar may have been dreamed, and made to fit the present case, being substituted for the basis of this memory, and while it is usually easy to tell what is remembered, what is dreamed, and what is imagined, there is an uncertain borderland with the most rational and critical individual. This borderland extends in proportion as the reason decreases, until it may cover the whole consciousness. This latter condition becomes more and more the state of the alcoholic, which in part accounts for the abnormal proportion of his states that are tinged with paramnesia. In common with amnesia, generally, the failure of the memory of the alcoholic advances in chronological order. The events most recently occurring are forgotten, while the experiences of childhood or early life are retained. This is the case with senility, with which alcoholism is so closely related in many of its effects. This order of loss is noticeable also in the case of almost all diseases which affect the memory. The events prior to the disease are retained with great tenacity, but those following the illness are quickly forgotten. So, in stating this order of loss of memory in alcoholism, we are saying that this abnormality is perfectly normal as far as the order is concerned. Why the memory of the alcoholic fails has been discussed, but why it fails in this way, why there is this selective failure may take our attention for a short time. The memories of babyhood, for example, prior to six or seven years of age, are very few and uncertain. Of course, the alphabet we learned then, and other similar things which are frequently repeated, are never forgotten, but here specific experiences are referred to. We have some cases, though, of events in the life of children under two years of age being remembered. These recollections were not produced spontaneously, but were recognized when experienced again. The reason for the meagerness of babyhood memories is probably because dynamic associations are not firmly established, and the mental material is in a chaotic state. But just as soon as there is a sufficiently organized basis for associations, then the time for acquiring has come, and the 10 to 20 years following babyhood is the best period for obtaining knowledge, as all readily recognize. The reasons for this are manifold. In children, the cerebral cells are flabby, grayish, and flexible. The sensorial excitement must therefore make an impression upon them more readily since it finds them in the state of vacuity when they will respond easily and quickly. It thus takes much less to impress a child than an older person. Therefore, little things in childhood make a stronger impression and more things are retained. Neither is there the struggle between the different impressions that there is in latter years, for there are fewer things to distract the attention. The number of associations is much less, so that the last event is connected with more of the proceeding, each element in the experience being incorporated into the general association. When latter in life the groups of associations are numerous, the event must be connected only with its appropriate groups and hence is not so liable to recall and repetition as if attached to the whole experience. The tendency of early years is to follow lines already opened, instead of going into bypass where the organization is less complete. 
It is when the brain is growing that a definite direction can be most strongly and persistently given to its structure. When the blood is flowing freely and the whole body is developing, when the cells are multiplying rapidly, each following the bent of its parent, the impressions and modifications are firmly established according to the laws of nutrition already referred to. Because the early impressions are the only stock in trade of the mind, they are repeated over and over again, and all new acquisitions are associated with them. The idea that comes into consciousness and is revived very seldom or never is very unstable, and many such disappear forever. For example, the ordinary events of everyday life, they may be clear and intense at the time, but are not reorganized. Each return, whether voluntary or involuntary, causes a gain in stability, and the tendency to organize is accentuated. Now, such repetition comes to a relatively small number of ideas in child life. Because the number is small, they must be repeated and revived often, and be incorporated in many associations with the new acquisitions. Thus, the childhood experiences not only become firmly established in the growing and developing mind, but because of this, they are the foundations of the adult mental life and are intertwined with mature daily experiences. In some investigations, it was computed that 39% of all associations of adult mental life were those of childhood, and the associations of recent years were very few. While this percentage may be a little large, it gives us some idea of the hold that childhood experiences have upon the adult mental life and the dependence of the latter upon them. With the highly developed state of organization which these childhood experiences have, we can well see why they are retained longer than the more recent ones. In progressive amnesia, such as the alcoholic experiences, during the initial period only partial disorders are manifest. The patient is forgetful only the most recent events, as of those of the past hour or minute. The task interrupted is forgotten. Sent across the room for a book or a pencil, he returns to be told again what he was sent for. The incidents of the day fade away. A resolution made is soon effaced. These things can hardly be considered subjects of memory, for they have not really become a part of the mind's store. The nerve elements, being a prey to atrophy and disease, are no longer capable of the conservation of new impressions, for neither a new modification in the cells nor the formation of new dynamic associations is possible or at least permanent. The anatomical conditions of stability and revivification are wanting. The events which have really been a part of memory soon begin to disappear in the chronological order above referred to. The order of time corresponds to the relative stability, the latter experience is being less stable because less organized, the new and complex perishing before the old and simple. In the forgetting of words, we find those denoting concrete, and individual objects are the first lost, while abstract concepts and relations are remembered better. Therefore, proper names and nouns generally are forgotten before verbs, adjectives, and pronouns. There are other ways of remembering persons than by their names. We can call up the image in some way, so with a city. Thus, these proper names are not so essential and not so commonly recalled. On the other hand, Words are the only traces of the abstract. It has been harder work to acquire the abstract, and we fortify the words with more associations. We find also an order of disappearance in the general content of the mind. Events go first, followed by ideas, then sentiments and affections, and finally actions. Thus the primitive basis upon which the patient has for a long time been able to live begin to crumble away. Intellectual acquisitions disappear little by little. Only recognitions of babyhood may remain, or he forgets the greater part of his language. Those acquisitions are the last to succumb, are almost entirely organic, such as the routine of daily life and habits long contracted. The memory is so far gone in advanced cases that the events of early life and childhood are spoken of as if they happened a few hours before, and even the most intimate acquaintances are not recognized. Thus the alcoholic lives in his past and becomes more and more childish. He may even be able to reason quite correctly about his childhood, while wholly incompetent to do so concerning present experiences. In stating the order of loss, it will be remembered 
that among the last contents of the mind to fade away are the memories of the emotions and the affections. Some have denied that there is a memory of the emotions as such. In the greater number of cases, only the conditions, circumstances, and accessories of the emotion can be recalled. There is only an intellectual memory. There exists an effective type of memory, as there is a visual type. The reviving depends on the cerebral and internal condition more than on the primitive impressions themselves. The above quotations are not incompatible with the expressed order of decline, for while it is very difficult to reproduce the same feeling which we have experienced, we can remember well that we have experienced it. We may not be able to reproduce the pain which we felt on a certain occasion, but we remember clearly that we had it. The feelings truly are much more slowly effaced than the intellectual qualities or faculties. Feelings being innate are much more profound and are concomitant with and tenacious to all forms of mental life. With the amnesia of feeling goes the self, but on the other hand, feeling must be controlled. If our feelings are largely dominant, the life will be inhuman and capricious. Such, however, is the case with the alcoholic. His reason is in abeyance and degenerated. His memories may be those largely of feeling. In the experience of the writer, the earliest memories of life are those of feelings. Four memories of his fifth year are his first distinct recollections, and nothing further is clearly remembered until two years later. The chronology is, of course, obtained from his mother, and he connects these feelings with the circumstances as he has heard them related since the incidents occurred. Many others of his early recollections are of an effective character. Now, if the alcoholic has a similar experience, viz. that his early memories are largely effective, and if the other memories fade before the effective memories do, we would expect him to be what we actually find him, a person largely controlled by his emotions, for they form the principal part of his mental life. While the temperament would have some bearing on the result, still the general principles hold good. Of course, a certain proportion of emotional memories is lost, but this proportion is small compared with that of the intellectual faculties. The far-reaching effects of the loss of memory cannot be well realized without examining each of the faculties separately. The power of abstract reasoning, judgment, imagination, in fact, all the faculties, are seriously affected, and the degeneration of these in turn further injures the memory. The very conception of personality depends quite fully upon the memory. For whom do we know, or why do we speak of ourselves as one person except through the assistance of memory? In single intoxications, we sometimes have phenomena much resembling those of dual or multiple personality. There is the anecdote of the Irish porter who lost the package when drunk. When he became sober, he was unable to remember anything about it, but on getting drunk again, he was able to recall where he had left it. In advanced cases, we find worse abnormalities than this, insomuch that the whole personality seems to be shriveled, degenerated, and decreased almost to the vanishing point, but these will be treated in another chapter. Along with the memory also goes the morals. We will stop here to refer only to one point which has already been hinted at. Above, it has been said that perhaps one reason why the alcoholic is a seeming liar is because he does not perceive correctly, but tells things as he did perceive them. Let us make another excuse for him. He does not remember correctly, or perhaps does not remember at all, and hence another reason for his seeming untruthfulness. But subtract all we can from these two reasons, and it is but just that we should discount from the accusation on these accounts. Yet there is sufficient untruthfulness left to sustain the reputation of the alcoholic as the prince of liars. In trying to cover the ground of the effects of alcohol upon the memory, we have dealt largely with the physical side because we were looking for causes. It seems that any derangement of the memory is inexplicable by the person who refuses to pass from the psychological to the physical. It is necessary to be physiological, but we have tried to escape the error of those who, in treating the derangements of the memory, 
have been physiological only. Further, as the subject of memory leads us so fully into the study of the mind, content-wise, we fully realize, as we have tried to show by a few, perhaps too few, references that the mind must also be viewed from the standpoint of its activity. It is because the mind is not able to function, for example, to be active, that is not able to remember. We have found the disorders of the memory to be of three classes, amnesia, hyperamnesia, and paramnesia. The first of these brings the most common and serious. The conditions under which the various divisions of the memory are most active were noted, and the reasons why alcohol affected each division as well as the memory as a whole were discussed. It was found that in every department of the memory, alcohol was a serious hindrance to proper functioning. Hyperamnesia appears to be only a transient phase, and paramnesia is much exaggerated in some cases. Two laws of degeneration of the memory were posited, that of decline inversely to the chronological order of the occurrence of events, and a loss according to the nature of the events involved. There is no faculty of the mind whose injury carries with it such general mental decline. End of chapter 3 Chapter 4 of The Psychology of Alcoholism by George Barton Cuton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Intellect, not including memory. We wake up for examination in this chapter. The subject of the intellect of the alcoholic with exception of the memory, the treatment of which we have just finished. Included in this will be the distinctively thinking processes. Conception, judgment, and reasoning, and the imagination. The latter will be first taken up on account of its close relation to memory, and because it entails simpler elements on which the thinking powers depend, and with which we deal in the latter part of the chapter. Some of the intellectual factors of the mind are among the highest developed characteristics, especially when associated with the moral nature. Their degeneration means the degradation of the victim. The control of the emotions, imagination, and lower psychic factors is usually assigned to the will, but it is well to remember that this control must be under the direction of the judgment. For example, that will acts accordingly to and in harmony with the laws of the judgment. What we judge to be the right or expedient or profitable course of action, that we will to do according to the ideal which we have judged to be best for us. Our conduct, then, should be the result of our mature judgment as expressed by the way in which we will. If we are unable to judge correctly, if we cannot hold the proposition in suspension until we have light on it from all sides and decide on the reasonable side, then our conduct must inevitably suffer, both from the moral and rational standpoints. This condition we find to be that of the alcoholic, and it is with the intellectual phase of his condition, the imaginative and rational decline and decay, that we have to deal with. In this chapter. Imagination. The imaginative faculties are early affected, and their impairment forms one of the peculiar and constant symptoms through the whole progress of the disease. Imagination does not fail in all particulars, but the higher processes are most affected, while the injury to the lower ones varies, and at times their action may even be augmented. When alcohol is first taken on account of the increased circulation in the brain, which follows, the imagination is usually more active, and some of the wittiest remarks and brightest speeches have followed the first one or two glasses. It is noticeable, however, that the heightened imagery and freedom of utterance are attended with lack of control and imperfect coordination. Not unusually, remarks are made in the after-dinner speech which are of so low a character that if they had come into the mind when the speaker was possessed of normal judgment, they would never have been uttered. It is further to be noticed that what the seeker considers so brilliant a flow of imagery may be insipid and coarse, the diversion from normal not being in the exalted imagination, but in the defect in judgment. Some old hunters cannot begin their tales, some village speech makers are dumb, and even some of the orators of bygone days cannot respond without the accustomed dram. 
It is said that Theodore Hook had to be primed by alcohol before versification was fluent, and Sheridan in his latter days could not make a speech on the floor of the house until after cerebral circulation had been encouraged by whiskey. This is the primary effect of alcohol, to heighten the imagination. As the subject drinks more and more, the dose must be increased to have any effect. And finally, with large doses, the imagination does not reach its normal activity. In the meantime, the quality of the images becomes lower and lower until the mutterings are incoherent, vulgar, or senseless. In some forms of insanity of which alcohol is the cause, the imagination is very active. Especially is this true of delirium tremens, but it is also plain that the imagery is of a low and morbid character. It is the higher aspect of imagination which is destroyed, and that which remains might be called physiological rather than psychological, if such a distinction can be made. The psychophysical mechanism may send into consciousness an elaborate chain of representative images showing very little development of intelligence. We see this very clearly illustrated in the mental life of children, savages, and even the lower animals. This may also be true with the alcoholic, but in the latter case, the lack of connection between the different images is distinctive and at times almost unique. With a few extraordinary exceptions, no examples of the higher use of the imagination are found among common alcoholics. That is, no inventors, artists, poets, or seers, although many real geniuses are known to be dipsomaniacs. The dependence of the imagination upon the other faculties of mind is apparent. The physical basis of the imagination is probably the same as that of perception. The neural process in the former is only a milder degree of the same process which took place when the idea or thing now imagined was first perceived. The renewed feeling makes use of the same parts and in the same manner as the original feeling, the difference being in the intensity and the quality of the feeling rather than in the cerebral locality used. The constructive imagination requires a mind richly stored with material, permanently fixed and easily recalled. This necessitates keen perception and deep impression. In the preceding chapter, the statement was made that the alcoholic could not perceive well, so imagination would suffer on account of this. In its lowest forms, imagination is much like memory with low recognitive energy, and hence the laws governing memory would in a great measure apply to the imagination. It is because of this very close relationship and the plenary treatment already given to memory that the discussion of the imagination requires so little space. Association of ideas is the keynote of both. To have a good imagination requires a mind also endowed with the power of readily reproducing the material supplied by perception, and then the free flow of association of ideas. Memory must be the basis of all imagination, and with memory impaired, as in the case of the alcoholic, it would inevitably have a serious effect upon the imagination. Will cannot create new images. It can only select some which have spontaneously presented themselves and inhibit the useless ones. By fixing attention on the selected images and thereby intensifying them, we may use them as stimuli for other similar ones which association may present. The genius is the man who has the power of bringing forth similar associations to an extreme degree. For example, the genius can usually fix his attention on one thing for a long time, and frequently there is only one subject on which he can fix his attention. On the other hand, the lack of inhibition from any cause results in increase in the rapidity of image making. One can see this illustrated in any form of emotional excitement, the images being more numerous but void of selection. Here we find the alcoholic with will virtually gone, and judgment valueless, unable to fix attention on any particular image except that of drink, and not able to select the best image if he could attend to it. The corresponding process of inhibition of the undesirable images is equally difficult and the exaltation of the lower and uncontrollable emotions in most alcoholics lessens at times any vestige of inhibitory power which might be left. Imagination has been divided into two kinds according to the content, viz. reproductive and productive or creative. In reproductive imagination, similar ideas are brought to consciousness free from the original connections of time and place and elaborated by experience according to the mental development of the individual experiencing them. This depends largely on the memory and fails with it, so the alcoholic is not really strong. The productive 
is the highest form of imagination. It not only augments the reproductive, but it consciously relates the factors and assists their conformity to certain ideals. This requires and is a mark of superior intelligence, and therefore only its lowest forms are seen in the alcoholic. He has vivid dreams which may be creative as well as reproductive, and this is also noticed in the insane wanderings. In neither of these cases is there noticed any construction according to a plan, or any apparent end toward which it is working. These images are chaotic in the extreme. The specialty in this particular, however, is the wonderful fabric he is able to weave about his circumstances and personality, by which he impresses the unwary with his great need for alcohol. His lies are frequently marvelous as works of fiction, and very often are successful in procuring for him the coveted drink. Equally ingenious are the excuses which he gives for his present condition, but on account of his lack of judgment, they are as frequently ludicrous and childlike. He may become very suspicious, and in addition to misinterpreting the actions of his family and friends, may construct a series of incidents which to him seem probable, with no other ground for them than a diseased imagination, and then believe them. The images appear to have more of a touch of reality and become more firmly incorporated into the life of the alcoholic than in a normal person, until he is unable at times to distinguish between the actual facts and the result of the activity of his imagination. His present condition is the best proof of his lack of normal imaginative ability. If he could picture the consequences of his acts, if he could imagine his condition in a few years, or even appreciate his present condition, a great incentive to sobriety would be present. In these particulars, he seems to be powerless. In imagination, especially in productive imagination, there is a simultaneous re-excitation of different central structures which have not before cooperated in this way. To allow of this new combination, the brain must have its normal plasticity, of which the alcoholic has been robbed by the more or less hardening process which is carried on under the influence of alcohol in which it is bathed. For the building up of new and previously unused cells and paths for the continued action of the centers which have been used in perception and for the free and uninterrupted activity of the brain as a whole, also necessary to imagination in its highest and best way, a blood supply of both normal quantity and quality must be present. If we refer to the alcoholic's condition as presented in the chapter on physiology, we readily see that the conditions are not fulfilled. In addition to this lack of plasticity and the poor blood supply, we have also to consider the loss of proper function due to the pathological growth and the consequent crowding of the cells. Thinking. The higher intellectual faculties grouped under this one word, thinking, suffer severely in alcoholism, because, more largely perhaps than any other mental process, they need the cooperation of healthy mental activity as a whole, and this in turn is dependent upon a healthy, normally active brain. In acquiring accurate knowledge and in forming correct judgments, consciousness must be unclouded, and the mind should be keenly alive to every detail. On account of the composite character of knowledge, it is necessary for each part to be accurately and carefully obtained. The alcoholic might be described as a man in a state of chronic weak-mindedness. The mental degeneration runs all through a career of alcoholism and ends, if not cut off by premature death, in a loss of thought concentration in the less severe cases, and in insanity in the more severe. The beginning of decline may first be seen in indecision of character. This indecision is exhibited at first in the more important matters, but latter is shown concerning some things of little or no moment, until the alcoholic does not know how to decide about anything, and the decision which he may make is of value for a moment only. A minute later it may be reversed. For a time he attends well to duties of a routine and habitual nature, the duties which require little real thought. Any work of a new character requiring initiative is difficult or impossible for him, except that a vestige of his old spontaneity may be recalled by the fleeting excitation of renewed doses of alcohol. If he does accomplish it, he does it in a circuitous manner, taking twice the time ordinarily required and expending much unnecessary energy. He cannot make his head save his heels. 
After a new piece of work is undertaken, the original plan may be forgotten, for he is easily diverted from his purpose. If every point is carefully explained and he does not forget, he may carry out the plan given to him and finish the work better than as though he undertook to plan it himself. On this account he easily becomes the tool of others, and in complicated crimes laid at his door, he is often innocent, because he is not intellectually able to plan and bring them to a successful culmination. He is the instrument some one back of him is furnishing the mental power. The course of his ideas is sluggish and they become clogged, refusing to operate when they are needed, and their former continuity and force is lacking. Comprehensiveness of grasping ideas is lost, and a difficulty in seizing the relation of one idea to another is experienced. The mind is incapable of long-continued effort and concentration of any subject submitted to it. The mental weakness of the alcoholic is very clearly seen in the judgments which he makes, especially concerning himself. His friends recognize that his condition is serious, but he does not see that he is any different from what he was ten years ago and thinks that his friends are unnecessarily interfering with his private affairs. He does not notice that his relations to his family have changed, does not recognize that he is ill-treating them, and if they remonstrate with him he thinks that someone or something has turned them against him. He judges himself to be a good citizen, considering his ability superior to that of the ordinary man. The writer remembers witnessing a very amusing scene of this character. An intellectual gentleman, a superior businessman, who was lame, was transacting business with some strangers when an alcoholic joined the company. Owing to his inebriated condition, the alcoholic did not understand the business, but thought that the strangers were trying to take advantage of the gentleman because of his being lame, and tried to take the matter out of the gentleman's hands and himself transact it, considering himself the more capable. He believes himself to be much more brilliant than he is, and will frequently laugh at his own jokes when his friends will not be able to discern any joke at all. He is unable to recognize his degradation, which in his eyes is turned into exaltation, and in all things he grossly overestimates his worth. Without the power of judging, he performs acts which to him may seem normal, but to his friends are ridiculous or blameworthy. Kerwell says, he is born headlong on his career of chronic alcoholism, either blind to the dangers which are before him, or, if he sees them at all, beholds them only in a confused, cloudy, indefinable mist which makes no impression on his mind and conveys no sense of peril to him. He can neither comprehend to the full nor discriminate accurately. The pains which might warn him are deadened by alcohol. The diseased and poisoned condition of his organs is unnoticed and he is really unconscious of the destruction which alcohol has wrought on his body. His judgment regarding moral values and acts is affected to an equal or greater extent. He is unable to distinguish between right and wrong so clearly and definitely as when his brain was free from the effects of alcohol, and in most advanced cases right comes to be simply the fulfillment of his craving for alcohol, and all other things must give way to that. He is unable at times to make the distinction between truth and falsehood, and he lives in a world of false impressions. The real to him may be a flight of the diseased imagination or the result of paramnesia. He becomes confused regarding actual events, except those very clearly and definitely fixed in memory. Violence is often committed quite unintentionally by the alcoholic, because he is not able to judge how hard he is striking, and what he intended for a gentle tap may be a stunning blow. In having a book bound, the writer had an experience which illustrates this. The binder apologized for the workmanship, because the gold lettering on the cover had been impressed too deeply. He explained that the man who had performed this piece of work was formerly a splendid workman, but was now an alcoholic, and he was apparently not able to judge the amount of pressure he was putting on the press. The work was either too deeply or not deeply enough impressed, and usually uneven. As he is not able to judge the strength of the blow, he is equally unable to judge the occasion when a blow is appropriate. He cannot see how unfit he is for social intercourse, and when he is most unfit, he is so deceived that he wishes to appear before men. The conventionalities which go so far to make up gentlemanly conduct, he neglects without noticing the fact. He tells his secrets concerning friends, family, and self without recognizing that he is doing anything out of place and vulgar actions may seem exceedingly bright and witty because the sense of propriety regarding the personal conduct becomes obtuse. 
the higher, nobler mental activities are destroyed without his recognizing the loss. However great the offense to guests or host, he never seems conscious of it, and the lack of intelligence on his part is also unnoticed. In vivo veritas does not mean that the alcoholic is always truthful, but that the family secrets and business matters, which a well-balanced judgment would counsel to be hidden from the world, are betrayed during the period when alcohol injures the judgment. The sanguineness of the alcoholic is proverbial. Everything with him is pointing to success, and he is cocksure of every statement. In the clouded mental atmosphere through which he views things, when everything assumes a hazy, contorted appearance, a desire in any direction on his part makes it right, and the result of his imagination becomes truth. He loses himself, he fails to judge time, he cannot strike the balance between probabilities presented to him, and he cannot judge his action to fit the proper time. One thing is clear, namely that the highest possible perfection of the nervous system is only possible with strict total abstinence. It is equally clear that high, virile thinking and keen, unfaltering judgment cannot be the product of a mind which is dependent on an alcoholized brain. In the discussion of the alcoholic question, one observer has proposed a theory which seems to be hardly consistent with the facts correctly interpreted. He holds that man is distinguished from the other animals by an appetite for brain stimulants. The largest brain, and consequently the most highly intellectual and civilized races now living, consume greater quantities and varieties of brain stimulants, especially alcoholic drinks, than do contemporary semi-civilized or barbarian peoples. He recalls the further fact that a greater disparity of excess characterized the ancestors of such brainy races as far back as we have any knowledge of them. An immediate and total disuse of brain stimulants, including alcoholic drinks, is not desirable in consideration of the highest human interests. Declare the drunkard to be just what he is now recognized to be by the intelligent, a man of unsound mind who by reason of infirmity is incapable of performing the full function of citizenship unaided, and who also by reason of inability control his own actions, periodically or continuously is dangerous to society and himself. Inhibition, not prohibition, is the point and keynote of his argument, and he evidently thinks that the highest in mental development can only come through the use of alcohol and other narcotics. The facts which he presents may be true and undoubtedly have a large element of truth, but the conclusion does not follow. The relation of alcohol to the development of the race is accidental, not casual, and probably the truth of the matter might be better expressed if we say that these nations are greater intellectually notwithstanding their use of alcohol rather than because of it. The words of Dr. Baer seem to express the scientific view today rather better than the theory which has just been stated. Undisturbed reflection and quiet comparison, critical regard and deliberate judgment, impartial observation of facts and the weighing of the relationships. Such are the mental processes to which mankind owes the entire treasure of positive knowledge, including the progress of natural science, technique, and industry. Such processes are certainly not promoted by alcohol. A few years ago, the German authorities at Bonn made an investigation upon alcoholism among pupils in primary schools. Of 237 pupils, 7 to 8 years of age, there was not one who had not drunk wine, beer, or whiskey, and 23% of these children were given their glass of whiskey every day by their parents that they might become strong. As a result of these investigations, it was proved that children most accustomed to alcohol showed the least intelligence, and those children who had their morning glass of whiskey, but found no savor in milk, showed great inattention during the morning hour. The experiments of Kraepelin have been very interesting and instructive in showing the effects which alcohol has upon the intellectual powers. He found that the time required for simple reaction and also that required for choice reaction was shortened after small doses of alcohol had been taken. But in harmony with other investigations, he found that large doses of alcohol cause a retardation of the action of all forms of reaction time as well as other mental activities. The result of some experiments on the intellect have been summarized so succinctly that we can do no better than to quote the following. Those processes which involve the reception and mental working up of conceptual material, like the addition of figures, are affected in a detrimental manner from the very first by alcohol. 
In other words, alcohol, according to Kraepelin, exerts a stimulating action on the organ of the mind when it is occupied with sensory intellectual material, but has a depressant action when the mind is engaged on purely receptive or constructive operations. Larger quantities of alcohol, say the equivalent of a bottle of ordinary wine, depress every type of psychical energy from the first. It is not without interest in this connection to cite the testimony of a mastermind, Hemholtz, who declared that the smallest quantity of alcohol sufficed to dispel from his mind every idea of the creative order when he was trying to give form and being to some dimly seen conception. Smith had studied the action of alcohol, when administered for a number of weeks in small doses, in quantities varying from 40 to 80 grams per diem, in its influence on the simpler psychical processes. The investigator found that there was a decrease in the ability to add figures, amounting to 12 days to about 20%, while the power to memorize was diminished by about 70%. The action of alcohol as affecting reaction times and association was also studied. Among the associations, there was a decrease in the number of those classified by Wundt as inner associations and an increase in the number of outer and sensorially disconnected associations. Inner associations are interpreted as a higher form of intellectual operation than the two other classes named. The damaging action of the alcohol was sometimes apparent on the very first day, sometimes only on the second day of the alcohol period. No experiments were made until from 8 to 12 hours after the last administration of alcohol, and the influence of the acute or immediate action of alcohol, as illustrated in Kraepelin's experiments, does not enter into Smith's results. The conclusions are drawn that one half to one bottle of wine, or two to four glasses of beer a day, not only counteract the beneficial effects of practice in any given occupation, but also depress every form of intellectual activity, that every man who, according to his own notions, is only a moderate drinker, places himself by his indulgence on a lower intellectual level, and opposes the full and complete utilization of his intellectual powers. In addition to the experiments conducted by Kraepelin and Smith, which are undoubtedly the most important, we should also take notice of the results of other experiments, some made over a third of a century ago. In 1870, Exner experimented regarding the duration of mental reaction during the influence of 150 grams of alcohol. The dose was undoubtedly excessive, and he found that it retarded mental action. He also discovered and put before the public for the first time the fact that the subject was deceived regarding the result, for he considered that the reaction was quicker. In 1878, Diddle and Wittgen continued the experiments of Exner. They showed that if the dose was not too large, not over 45 grams, it produced some acceleration of the mental processes. When 60 grams were taken, the duration was longer, and 90 grams very quickly caused diminution of mental work. With some experiments on animals in 1883, Danio confirmed these results. He injected into the venous system of a dog a solution of 30 to 45 percent alcohol, the amount being 4 to 6 grams of the solution per kilogram of the animal's weight. He found after the injection that the region of the cerebral cortex, which is concerned with the movements of the dog's limbs, became inexcitable to any current of electricity. Warren used only small doses, administering by the mouth 12 to 15 grams of alcohol in a much diluted solution. In three cases, the alcohol resulted in a pronounced acceleration of mental processes. In one case, it produced a long retardation. Fear added to Smith's results the observation that the renewal of indulgence in alcohol after a period of abstinence showed a depression in mental work on the first day. Destry has shown that the paralysis of the motor centers is manifested in weaker doses than Kraepelin used. It is generally admitted that the primary and immediate effect of alcohol in small doses is that of a quickening and heightening of mental processes. We know that for a little while reaction time is shortened, and there is always a feeling of exuberance after alcohol has been taken. Kraepelin made a personal observation in an intellectual experiment which confirms that of Exner already cited. During this period of acceleration immediately after taking a dose of alcohol, 
he judged that it was much easier to learn by memory twelve places of figures than under normal conditions. When he came to examine the records, he found that instead of having accomplished his task more easily and quickly, it had, as a matter of fact, been accomplished more slowly. Two other investigators in the same laboratory confirmed this result by means of similar experiments on themselves. This is a striking example of the deceptive effects produced by alcohol and the lack of ability to judge when under the influence of a small dose. The higher intellectual centers concerned with judgment are benumbed. We have further testimony along the same line, Bruton says. A celebrated author once told me that if he wrote under the influence of a small quantity of alcohol, he seemed to himself to write very well. But when he came to examine what he had written the next day, after the effect of alcohol had passed off, he found that it would not stand criticism. We have also the following from Professor G. Bung. Intoxicating drinks never make a man brilliant. The prevailing notion that they do is based on self-delusion, is only a symptom of incipient paralysis. In proportion as self-criticism is diminished, self-reprobation rises. What has been termed Dutch courage is the result of defective judgment. It has been observed among some soldiers who were naturally cowardly that after they had partaken of alcoholic beverages they seemed to be brave. But the fact was, they were not in a condition to appreciate the danger and hence they eagerly charged the enemy. The higher faculties were inhibited, and where they might reasonably have feared, they saw no cause for halting. The effect of alcohol on the thinking powers, according to the observation and experiment, is disastrous. And finally, the alcoholic is ruled entirely by the lower mental faculties, and he becomes a machine. We turn now to consider the reason for this. It is difficult to distinguish what are called the higher intellectual faculties from the lower, that is, we cannot draw a sharp line of distinction between thinking and reasoning on one side and perception, imagination, and memory on the other. The latter are always included in the former, but thinking and reasoning are not so restricted as perception and memory, and with them we are able to accomplish much more. The higher constructive, imaginative processes are very closely identified with thinking and reasoning and may even ascend to loftier heights, being in turn freer and less restricted than the thinking powers. The distinguishing difference between thinking and the higher imagination is that while both are representative, thinking is abstract, imagination is pictorial. Now, with this very close relation existing between thinking and these other intellectual factors, it is evident that the higher processes of the intellect must fail if the lower ones do. To be enabled to reason, the mind must be stored with facts of observation or instruction. This presupposes perfect qualities of sensation and perception, which unfortunately the alcoholic does not possess. His store of facts is limited and confined mostly to events of years ago, on which he dwells and which he inserts at every opportunity. He usually has one humorous story, only one, but all his friends are well acquainted with it. One tale of wonderful prowess is also very familiar. His reasoning is circuitous and faulty, usually running in one rut or circle. His deficient memory is a great drawback, because whatever his experience, he is unable to reproduce it, and thus his store of observations and of facts which he has heard is not augmented, and thus his store of observation and of facts which he has heard is not augmented. The imagination, so closely related to some parts and so useful to the thinking processes in all its departments, being obstructed, the thought processes must suffer thereby, and especially the higher reasoning powers. The dependence of thinking upon the will is manifested in two ways. First, and most inclusive, through what is known as voluntary attention, and second, in the inhibition of extraneous elements of consciousness. Purposeful thinking is difficult, entailing as it does long-continued effort in one direction. The holding of one thought in the mind for a time in order that others might be compared with it, analyzing and combining, endeavoring to force or invite contributing thoughts, and using the whole mental power in the most fatiguing manner. Children in lower races of men are incapable of this except in the most rudimentary way. The alcoholic is in similar state. His faculties are so stunted and unfitted for hard work of this kind that he is only able to reason in the most puerile fashion. 
He cannot hold himself to definite object for any length of time on account of his lack of will power, and consequently on account of the loss of ability for concentrated effort. The physical basis of the higher intellectual powers is necessarily complex. We can posit no organ of the higher faculties or no specific localization. In primary intellection, a somewhat relatively prolonged and complex excitement of associated cerebral centers is required. The physiological conditions are fulfilled only when two or more cerebral processes belonging to different areas of the brain are united by spreading over the connecting association tracks and so forming a large unity of combined cerebral excitements. Besides this, it requires the psychophysical conditions necessary to prolong voluntary attention, and on account of the nature of the higher intellectual faculties, Using as they do the other mental powers in all their complexity, there are also required the conditions necessary for the activity of all the different mental factors. If any particular region could be named as a specific physical basis of the higher intellectual qualities, it would be the central tracts of the frontal region of the cortex. But, as we have just said, the whole brain is in use probably more than in any other mental activity. In addition to this, Accompanying the exercise of the higher intellectual powers, there is frequently an innervation of certain muscles, particularly the eye, head, and articulatory apparatus, causing muscular tension, so often the concomitant of voluntary attention. The pathological changes in the brain of the alcoholic are sufficient to prevent the operations of the higher intellectual faculties. The destruction of the nerve cells, which are constantly degenerating, hinders the direct and uninterrupted flow of impulses which form the physical basis of memory and association of ideas in imagination, and the lack of a sufficient quantity of blood of the proper quality is detrimental to the spontaneity which judgment and reasoning require. There cannot be that facility of construction in the mind of the alcoholic so necessary to the mental synthesis which judgment presupposes. The nervous correlation of which would be the explosive state of healthy nerve cells. In the cerebral excitement caused by a fresh indulgence of alcohol, the ideas run wild, all inhibitory influences are removed, and all manner of thoughts are thrown together without any apparent relation or association. This we call a state of drunkenness. But with the alcoholic, the continued use of alcohol seems to paralyze the intellectual powers so that there is a lack of mental activity as a whole, and especially of the higher sort. The mental inefficiency is of inevitable effect of the brain changes, and in chronic cases in which the lesions have been permanent, it may not appear until after years of abstinence. Where indulgences are continued, the breakdown is sure and more rapid, the higher centers being the first attacked and destroyed, the lower ones having control when freed from the inhibitory action of the higher ones. The latest and most highly developed cells first feel the paralyzing toxic effect according to the laws of degeneration, and as the reason and judgment depend upon the cells in this category, we must expect this portion of the mind to feel the effects very early. The reason, being the highest form, would naturally show the earliest decline, for in reason the mind is exerted to make an inference from two judgments already present, a new judgment being the result. Judgment proper follows the next in the order of decline. The judgment is the essential and simple quality uniting things already in consciousness, but of itself adding nothing new. The decline of this synthetic power is the great misfortune of the alcoholic, as far as the intellect is concerned, and this is in reality where we notice the injury most. The stimulus to judgment, which may be nothing more at times than an observed change in our surroundings, is lacking on account of the dull perceptive powers, and on every side we find the foundation for the intellect decaying, so that the loftier part of the structure is soon a complete wreck. We may wonder why some of the intellectual powers act more readily immediately after the indulgence in a small amount of alcohol. The conclusion from Professor Kraepelin's experiments was that alcohol made easy the cortical liberation of movements, the transformation of ideas and memories of movements into deeds, but no real mental power is given. The feeling of power, ability, and accelerated mental action 
is due to the facility for liberation of movements from the cortical areas. The injurious intellectual effects of alcohol last 10 hours, and the continued use of alcohol from day to day at the rate of 60 grams each day gradually decreases mental ability. The consumption of 80 grams of alcohol per day causes the ability for work to deteriorate from fifth day onwards. If the use of alcohol is then discontinued, the intellectual power begins to increase towards its normal condition, but by reverting to its use, the intellectual power begins to decrease more rapidly than before. In this chapter, we notice the same disastrous results of alcoholic indulgence upon the remainder of the intellect, as in the case of the memory. The primary effect upon the imagination appears to be that of stimulation, but the alcoholic is devoid of control. The latter effects make the imagination valueless for any of its higher uses. The drunkard is weak-minded and without initiative. All judgment, especially that of moral character, is more or less invalid, and on account of this he is unfitted for social intercourse. Experiments show that small doses of alcohol at first quicken and heighten mental processes, but the latter effect is retarding and debasing. The inebriate is unable to judge concerning his own faculties, and his reasoning centers around a defense of his indulgence. As an intellectual wreck, he is an object of pity. End of chapter 4Chapter 5 of The Psychology of Alcoholism by George Barton Cuton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Will. The discussion of the will or volition is taken up for consideration next in order because of the recognized importance of this faculty to our subject. No more common comment is made about the alcoholic, both by the careful psychologist and the unlearned observer, than that he has suffered a loss or decay of willpower. He continues to be an alcoholic on this account. We shall probably not be able to see the detailed relation between the abnormal will and the degenerate condition of the nerve elements that we were able to trace in the examination of the memory. Yet we trust that we can accept with some degree of probability, if not certainty, this account of the effect of the continued use of alcohol upon the will, which effect we will find to be of a degenerating character. The connection between mind and body, as far as will is concerned, is vague. Some would say impossible to find. If the will is the power of the mind, the true spiritual self, can we posit for it any dependence upon the brain at all? Does it not transcend the physical action of the molecules of the nerve cells? Is not this point where we can say that the mind rules in a despotic, unconditional manner? These and many other similar questions could be asked to all of which we must reply in the negative. Even if we affirm that we are dealing with the highest factor in man's nature, the most spiritual part, we must hold here, as elsewhere, the interdependence of the mind and the brain. We here meet the ever-present much discussed and misunderstood question of the freedom of the will, and notwithstanding its importance in other discussions, we wish to admit it here, even if we were able to throw any new light upon it. It is irrelevant in this treatment, and it is neither necessary nor pertinent to approach it. Lest some implications might unwittingly or perhaps necessarily be introduced, it might be well to state that while the writer does not believe in the freedom of the will, because this phrase has become meaningless, he believes both from the standpoint of psychology and of ethics in the freedom of the self. We must inevitably have some opinion of the subject and work from that however much we may try to shun the question, and our discussion is unavoidably colored by our opinion. This much having been said, the subject, as far as we are concerned, is dropped. We then turn to examine the abnormal condition of the will of the alcoholic. Almost every writer on the subject of alcoholism deals with this mental degeneration, but usually in general statements. The purpose in this chapter is to investigate the matter with some detail. We shall find that the deviations from the normal are dependent on changed condition of the physical basis. This derangement appears very early in alcoholic degeneration, so early that some have placed it as the first symptom. Footnote A. Gustafson, The Foundation of Death, page 160, says, This power of will is the first stronghold to be attacked by alcoholism. 
If alcohol were a sentient being, it would hardly act with greater apparent intelligence than it does in its insidious sapping and mining of the will. As if it knew that redoubt once carried no further resistance need be feared. In this subjugation of the will, alcohol incidentally but very remarkably defines the distinction between will and intention, so often mistaken for each other, to the moral shipwreck of the mistaking ones. In alcoholism, the will is destroyed. End footnote. The different faculties are so interrelated that it is difficult at times to affirm a chronological order, and as will is dependent upon the intellectual processes, it must follow them very closely in the order of deterioration. The loss or impairment of the will is best understood by comparison with the healthy and developed will, in addition to the description of the abnormality. In comparing the physical differences, we must also compare the brain elements, showing the effect of alcohol on that part which we consider the basis of the will. What is the physical basis of the will? Do we find a will center? It does not seem so, and it is therefore necessary to disagree with those writers who posit a definite seat of voluntary movements. This occasion is differently conceived of as the corpora striata, the frontal lobes, or the outer layer of the cortex. This seems to be carrying the subject of specific localization too far. As we are able to find a special seat of the memory, so we cannot posit a special seat for the will. But as with the memory, the basis of the will is in the center's concern with a special act. Thus, we would say that the seat of will for the motor acts connected with the arm is in these motor centers of the arm movements, and not that a message comes from a seat of will in another portion of the brain commanding these centers to move the arm. The higher voluntary activities are characteristics of man, and because they are acquired to a greater extent than the actions of animals, any injury to the brain causes far more damage to man than to animals. We have seen that the acquired activities are far less stable and more easily destroyed than the instinctive and reflex movements. And not only this, but the latest acquired and the most complex and highly developed activities are the first to suffer deterioration through injury. We must recognize the importance of the will in the mind of man, for it is in the controlling, guiding, enforcing, or inhibiting agency. It is the manly character of man. It is the last stage of evolution, especially when concerned with moral conduct. It is the latest and highest product of social development, and as such being most complex, it is among the first activities to suffer injury and undergo dissolution according to the rule. Last to come is the first to go. First to go is the most to go. First to come is last to go. Last to go is least to go. Footnote. A.D. Waller. The Sense of Effort, in Objective Study, Brain, Volume 14, page 245. Further, to Maudsley, Body and Will, pages 273 forward, remarks, Nowhere is to be found a more miserable specimen of degeneration of moral feeling and impotence of will that is presented by the person who has become the abject slave of either of these pernicious indulgences, alcohol and opium. Alcohol entering the blood is carried by it to the most minute recesses of the brain and acts there injuriously upon the elements of the requisitely delicate structures. So its finest, latest, organized, least stable parts which subserve moral feelings and supreme will are marred. End footnote. In the decline of the motor apparatus of the alcoholic we find this order. Trouble starts with the voluntary movements of the hands while reflex movements are all right. Footnote. In speaking of the alcoholic, to Maudsley, Pathology of Mind, page 486, says, One cannot help feeling sometimes that he could grasp better and make more use of his legs if he would exercise more will. End footnote. The trouble continues with the arms, legs, tongue, and lips, the order being according to the volition necessary, until only the pure reflexes are left. In the mental expression of the will, the incapacity for sustained attention is one of the first symptoms of impairment of the mind, because the highest expression of will is the power of voluntarily holding the attention for a long continued period of time. Voluntary fatigue, as a temporary impairment of the mind, shows the same symptoms as some disorders of permanent nature, 
the fatigued nerve cells exhibiting chromatic phenomena analogous to those of alcoholism. It is found that the cell of higher function is relative to the amount of effort which it can produce, more exhaustible than the cell which is subordinate to it in the cerebromuscular chain, and the will, standing at the pinnacle of organization, is most seriously affected by injury. As the will develops through a certain course, we find it degenerate in inverse order until we have the very lowest form of movement. The will is developed by means of attempts at willing, and it degenerates as the volitional effort becomes more and more difficult. The very lack of attention by the phenomena habit works against the effort being made, and consequently the will is exerted less. As the will is the highest factor of self, and comprehends all the other mental qualities and is dependent upon them, it is obvious that if any of these more fundamental faculties are destroyed or even impaired, it must inevitably affect the work of the will. This is not only true of the will in general, but as each separate volition is the expression of the whole self at the time, and thus of a hierarchical coordination, if any element in the coordination is paralyzed or destroyed, the whole system is thereby injured or entirely ruined. Footnote. T. Ribo, The Disease is of the Will, translated by Snell, page 120. H. Maldley, Physiology of Mind, page 450, says, In addition, the loss of coordinating power of our ideas and feelings in their regular and independent reaction reveals the deterioration of the will. End footnote. We have already seen that in the alcoholic the memory is deficient, or at times almost totally lacking. This comes on in the early stages of alcoholism, and it in turn affects the will, for it is memory which makes the distinction between will and some lower forms of carnation. Instinct presupposes no memory. For example, real conscious memory, but will does, so it is very important in distinguishing factor of will. Perhaps the most important effect of the loss of memory to the will would be in the matter of ideals or ends. The mind and willing must have some end towards which it is working, but the end can only be before the mind through memory. If memory is lacking, we can not have the range of ideas or ends. The catalog of ideas must necessarily be shorter. As it becomes narrowed and more and more, the will is contracted until perhaps only one end comes before the mind, viz. that of being further affected by alcohol, and the will degenerates into an impulse which has only to be suggested to be gratified. Deliberation is impossible without memory, and for a complete and profitable deliberation, it is necessary to have an unimpeded association of ideas, so that the matter may be viewed from every standpoint related to the ideals and presented to the mind. This is necessary to give a valid expression of the self. In will that is unmotivated, where there is no deliberation, memory is still needed. Take, for example, a simple muscular movement. We must have the idea of that movement before we can perform it. These movements are first made reflexly or instinctively, yet consciously for us, and then by remembering them we are able to repeat them voluntarily. When movements, although reflex, have not made themselves felt above the threshold of consciousness, the idea of them is not known, and therefore cannot be remembered. Then the movements are never possible volitionally. Examples of such movements would be those of the intestines or blood vessels. With every movement there must be the idea of the movement remembered, apart from the end in view. There must be a mental conception made up of memory images of certain sensations defining a special act to be accomplished. Of course, we would not contend that every portion of the movement is remembered, but the series as a whole is recalled, and will stimulates the first number of the series, and association and habit finish the work. Thus, not even a simple muscular movement can be performed without memory as one of the chief factors. Dr. D. Hartley has gone so far as to say, all our voluntary powers are of the nature of memory. In morbid affections of the memory, the voluntary actions suffer a light change and imperfection. Agreeing with the last part of the quotation, the first part is undoubtedly too strongly stated, although containing an element of truth. 
In the chapter on memory, it was shown that the memory declined in inverse order to the reception of events. This means that in advanced cases only memories of the younger years were retained, and as will is a matter of development, all the memories present would be those of undeveloped will. The ends set before the mind would be those of childhood, which may account for the puerile actions of the alcoholic. The memory of acts would be of like a period of time, so that we would naturally expect these also to be childish, just as in fact we find them to be. In speaking of the general degeneration of the mind and deterioration of memory, we have been treading familiar ground, and as the preceding discussion has shown these things to be facts, so in showing the relation of will to these in a general way, we feel sure that as our premises are true, so are our conclusions. Let us turn to another relation. We have already found that the intellect is deficient, and by showing the relation of will to the intellect, it will follow that will is lacking here. Footnote, by intellect here, we do not include the memory, for that has already been discussed. By judgment, reasoning, and cognition, etc. And footnote. While will and intellect are reciprocally dependent, we wish now to show only the dependence of the former on the latter. Will has been defined as the act of an intelligent being acting intelligently. Spinoza has told us that the will and the intellect are one and the same thing. Both these expressions set forth the truth, but carry the idea of similarity to an extreme. The intellectual quality separates will from our cognitive phenomena. In volition, besides the use of the intellectual factor in deliberation, there is associated a judgment regarding the attainableness of what is desired. For unless we judge that we can secure what we want, we do not will it, but it remains a wish or a belief. Will is not creative, but only selective and modifying, and so rests on cognition. All choice is judgment put into execution, and any failure to will through hesitation comes from the defective character of the individual, in part on account of abnormal intellectual states. The value of the intellect to volition is further seen in the necessity of adapting means to ends to bring about the action desired. When we find the intellect weak, the impulses are correspondingly strong, and if not a loss, at least an impairment of will ensues. In the growth of the will, we may also see the great value of the intellect, for here there must be a certain development of ideas presupposed, because the extension of will means the extension of ends to be attained. It has been said it is because the alcoholic does not recognize the fact that he is an alcoholic, that he does not will to stop, and as soon as he does realize that he has this enslaving habit, he discontinues the use of alcohol thus laying the full responsibility of the continued destructive indulgence upon the intellect. This is only partially true. Many persons do know that they are alcoholics and deplore the fact bitterly, yet they are unable to use their wills to correct it. The dependence of will on intellect is very apparent, and knowing the latter to be impaired, it necessarily implies the weakness of the will. Let us turn now and in a few words examine the relation of the will to the affective side of life in the abnormal condition of alcoholism. The will depends as much on the feelings as on the intellectual states. Some would say more. The development of will is dependent on the growth of the feelings, for feelings increase desires. Pleasure, pain, and the emotions are springs of action. Not only do they increase the power of the will, they may also weaken it, as example given in fear, anger, and remorse. In fact, the control of the feelings is the supreme test of the power of the will. In alcoholism, we find an exalted condition of the feelings of a certain kind. The feelings and emotions connected with the lower part of man's nature are exaggerated. These consist of the appetites and passions, which, when aroused, are so difficult to control. As the will grows weaker, we find them taking on more of an impulsive nature and controlling the actions of the alcoholic. And why this? We shall see later in the discussion that the feelings, too, are impaired in the inverse order of experience. And as the higher and more manly feelings come only with the developed nature, when these decline, we have left 
only the strong, unreasonable feelings connected with the lower centers, which are the last affected, and are of an instinctive nature, rooted and grounded in our very nature as animals. As these are the only feelings left, and as they are all of one kind, there is no strife of feelings, no higher feelings to assist in the control of the lower ones. These latter have all the strength of the affective nature, and become so impulsive that the enfeebled will has no longer power over them, and after one or two impulses, successes, the way is made clear for an impulsive rather than a volitional rule. Having seen the effect upon the will of the degeneration of the mind as a whole, the memory, intellect, and affective nature, we now turn to the special factors of the will, and notice the effect of the use of alcohol upon them. Will is distinguished from the lower cognitive activities by a conscious end to be attained. This is impossible with the alcoholic, not because there is any particular physical basis for ends, and this is destroyed. But as we have already seen, through the deterioration of the intellectual qualities, without ideas there is no will. In deliberation the alcoholic is especially weak. If he could deliberate, there would be more hope for him, but the control of thoughts is largely lost. He has no ends to set before himself, and all forms of thought concerning any end which may be presented to him lead to the one end or impulse, that of gratification of appetite. Could he calmly think in a deliberate way? His passion might have time to subside and give him more of an opportunity to have ideals come before his mind. It requires an active will to deliberate and being unable to voluntarily attend. Deliberation is conspicuously absent in the life of the alcoholic. The power of attention is very necessary to all normal acts of life. In such simple acts as that of sight, it requires fixed attention for clear vision, and accommodation follows. In all higher acts of life, the necessity for attention is still greater, and any diminution is disastrous to voluntary mental experiences. This lack of control of feelings, impulses, and all mechanical activity is the keynote of the alcoholic's condition as far as will is concerned. It seems to be a special attribute of alcohol to exalt the mechanical activity of the mind, and at the same time, the power of the volitional control is diminished. This is true, not only as far as they are compared with each other, but absolutely. Coleridge is pointed out as a standard example of this effect. In his late years, he had little or no control as far as voluntary attention was concerned. His ideas rambled over the whole universe with no recognizable threat of unity. The whole stimulation seemed to be physical and impulsive. We must recognize that the lack of control is due more to the absence of inhibition than to the exaltation of the impulses. Impulses are always strong in the healthy will, but usually under good control where the individual can say, this far no further. But if the inhibition falters, it is fatal for future volition and control. Footnote. For a comprehensive description of inhibition, the S.J. Meltzer. The role of inhibition in normal and in some of the pathological phenomena of life. Medical record, June 7, 1902. The nature of the impulses must be taken into account. The control develops into the following order. Muscular feelings and ideas. In degeneration, the control of ideas goes first, then the control of feelings. We can see that the most important control is first lost. And when one comes to lose control of ideas and feelings, he is a mere machine. With the control of feelings lacking the mind, deficient and concentrative power is lamentably deranged by any kind of emotional excitement, so far as any volitional effort is concerned. Muscular control is also frequently lacking, and one form of this, tremor, we find as a common symptom in the first stages of alcoholism. This is especially seen in the hands, about the mouth, in the lips, and tongue. This loss of control and exaltation of the impulsive nature may be divided into two classes. First, those who are unconsciously in this condition, and second, those who are consciously afflicted. The latter division corresponds with those who have what we call fixed ideas. There are many alcoholics of the first class, those who can drink or leave it alone, but usually drink, those who can stop drinking whenever they want to, but never want to, 
men who are actually self-deceived. They drink not because they are impelled to, but because they are hot or cold, fortunate or unfortunate, sleepy or insomnious. It matters not what reason is given. It is sufficient oftentimes to satisfy the affected mind of the alcoholic, even if it is unreasonable and incredible to his friends. In these cases, the impulse is sudden and unconsciously followed by execution. The alcoholic does not think of resisting the impulse until it is too late, and then, if questioned concerning the reason why, an excuse is presented, which is reason at least to him. These impulses fit into the lower nature and are thus natural to him. It is similar to a certain idea which comes into consciousness corresponding to the higher self and will, and is frequently not distinguished. The character of the impulse will depend largely on the constitutional tendencies of the individual derived from inheritance and modified by his conditions of life prior to alcoholic excesses, and the effect of alcohol upon him mentally and physically. It is thus independent of will in persons whose control is impaired. Another reason why it is confounded with will is because it is internally stimulated. Although the occasion is not unusually an external stimulation, which it either immediately furthers or inhibits, thus the alcoholic recognizes the contents of a bottle of whiskey, or the building near which he is standing as a saloon. These are occasions for the arising of an unconquerable thirst in the form of an impulse, which is immediately gratified. This impulse has a double reason for its force. Not only is it an object of appetite, which normally is most impulsive, but it is also an object of habit, which apart from all appetite or passion gives a certain impulsive nature to acts within its power. Footnote. M. Kerr, in a page 302, sets forth the hypothesis of an appetite center in the brain, which is deranged by the effects of alcohol. End footnote. Whenever we find such a case, we find also an absence of social and moral considerations which should provide motives and reasons to the controlling, inhibiting power, so that the idea does not come into relation with the whole self which the will requires, but action follows the isolated tendencies. There is not here even a conflict of impulsive tendencies. One impulse has the whole field and keeps it. In the first class, the impulse is unconscious, and deliberation is annihilated. But in the second class of cases, where we have what we are called fixed ideas, there may be some deliberation, but of an external character, and with a conclusion which is inevitable because of a lack of control. When the impulses are strong, but are not entirely beyond control, a partial direction and inhibition may be secured. An impulse of this kind might be called an insistent idea, in contradistinction from a fixed idea. In the first stages of alcoholism, this is common, but later the impulse consciously gets beyond the power of the will. Footnote. C. E. Cowles, Insistent and Fixed Ideas, American Journal of Psychology, Volume 1, pages 226 forward. In regard to this class of alcoholics, A. MacDonald, Abnormal Man, page 113, says, there is a weakness of will to carry out good resolutions, and a consciousness of this leads some to request to be placed in asylums, for they are morally certain in advance that they cannot resist temptation. Thus one has been known to have his daughter carry his wages home, as he could not pass the saloon on the way without going in, if he had any money with him. We have also the following from C. F. Palmer, in a Brady, its source, Prevention and Cure, page 107. Coupled with the loss of truthfulness is that weakening of the will which always accompanies chronic alcoholism. How many of his broken promises are due to a debilitated will, and how many to a decay of his voraciousness? It would be impossible for the victim himself to determine. Doubtless, his intention to break off his evil habit is sometimes honest, and the failure is due to the paralysis of the will. End footnote. What is seen here is the demand for attention in proportion to the insistence of the idea, until finally the alcoholic cannot possibly withhold his attention from the one absorbing idea. viz., that of further indulgence and its consequent effect, which soon gains dominance in consciousness, and is quickly acted upon. The most normal person cannot prevent feelings and impulses 
from arising, nor can he say, Be gone, and be immediately obeyed. But he can direct his attention to other things, and thus escape. This the alcoholic cannot do well. Sometimes the alcoholic is a slave to this impulsive idea. He develops a true mania, as much as any monomaniac. The mania has been called dipsomania, and is irresistible when fully developed. It is but an extension of common experience. Consciously we are carried away by some impulse. It may be in regard to a small, unimportant thing, and are unable to control our course. Stout gives the following statements regarding the reasons for indulgence. He says that the commonest cases of involuntary action are those in which an idea becomes fixed through intense appetite or craving, arising from organic conditions. An example given irresistible craving for alcohol. There are four possible situations. One, indulgence in the drink may be contrary to the man's express volition at the moment when he drinks. This is rare. Two, a performed resolution to refrain from action. But at the moment when he drinks, the impulse is so strong that the volition is temporary in abeyance. Three, action takes place before a voluntary decision has taken place. He acts during deliberation before he knows his mind. 4. Organic craving may be the motive of a genuine volition, but so against his interest, the real self, as to be involuntary. Here there is full deliberation. Footnote. Notice also the following from W. B. Carpenter. Mental Physiology, pages 636 forward. The debasing influence of the continued alcoholic excess is, unfortunately, but too apparent. While weakening the will and exciting the lower propensities, it blunts the moral sense also. Vain is it to recall the motive for a better course of conduct to one who is already familiar with them all, but is destitute of the will to act upon them. End footnote. The first of these four divisions seems out of the range of possibility. He may not intend to get intoxicated. He probably does not once in a hundred times. But as for not willing to take that drink at the moment when he does so, this seems to contradict all psychology of the will. He may not have intended to drink the preceding moment, but how does he do so against distinct volition? There is no true volition in impulsive action. The other three examples are pertinent and agree with what is said above regarding impulse. Footnote, Kerr, Inebriety, pages 302 forward says, Serious as the injuries inflicted by intoxicants on the intellectual faculties, the loss of inhibitive capacity is a hundredfold more detrimental. To these must be added the progressive paralysis of the will. The damage done to the understanding is great, but infinitely more terrible are the decrease of control and the benumbing of volition. Many inebriates, as long as they retain consciousness through all their outbreaks, know what they are doing hate with a perfect hatred their drunken excesses, but are as unable to exert their will as is a terror-stricken animal helpless under the fascination of a boa constrictor. Their moral faculties are even more deadened by the poison than their intellectual. Alcohol is a poison will paralyzer. Such an inebriate is a captive, retaining the possession of his senses, though these are somewhat dulled, and the will is powerless to make an effort at deliverance. Again and again does he resolve to drink no more, but resolution is overborne by the dominating drink impulse or drink crave. The volitional disablement, this palsy of the will, is a direct effect of a pathological degradation. End footnote. We have discussed this subject of self-control under the head of deliberation. For self-control means deliberation and inhibition of impulsive action in order to deliberate. Two aspects of self-control have been discussed, viz. increased power of impulse and decreased power of will. These have been figuratively expressed as follows. The driver may be so weak that he cannot control well-broken horses, or the horse may be so hard-mouthed that no driver can pull them up. With the alcoholic it may be both. The power of self-control varies with the nervous force, fatigue, loss of vigor through overexertion, and ill health caused noticeable loss of self-control. The decline of self-control is one of the earliest symptoms of oncoming senile decay and of mental disease. 
We have before stated that the effects of alcoholism were those of premature senility, and here we have another application of the statement. We can all recognize how the exhaustion of nervous energy lessens inhibitory power in the matter of irritability. When fresh and healthy, we are invariably good-natured, but the tired, overexerted, unhealthy man is very easily irritated, and not infrequently the slightest occasion will throw him into an incontrollable passion. We have clearly seen in discussing the physiology that the nervous energy is lessened and continues to be decreased more and more as the blood vessels are more clogged and are unable to convey nourishment to the brain, and any lack of nourishment affects the higher and latter developed nerve centers, these being less stable than the lower. In control, as in memory, the alcoholic becomes a child, and his natural tendencies are let loose. As the child and the savage are creatures of impulse to a great extent, so we find the alcoholic. Thus we have the saying concerning him. What a man is when he is sober will come out when he is drunk. Because of this utter lack of control, we were able to show when dealing with memory that association, depending upon the connection between the different cells and centers, was interfered with on the account of this connection being destroyed or injured. If will means control, it is through the coordination of all the centers in just proportion to their importance. This, we can see, is impossible if the connection is imperfect. Take an alcoholic, as we find him, there seems to be a total incapacity for deliberation in his degenerative mental condition. A few words will be sufficient to deal with the two factors of the fully developed will, viz. choice and desire. It is enough to say of the former that without deliberation we cannot have choice, for deliberation is its sin qua non. In regard to desire, we either have too much or none at all, according to the standpoint from which we look at it. In the description given above, we might say that the desire is all that there is, but impulse is not desire in its highest form. Desire should suppose a choice, or normal mind, taking a liking to something which agrees with and fits into the whole self. In alcoholism, only one part of the self is considered, so whether we take the view of too much or too little desire, we recognize it as abnormal. If we were able to will, it would lead us astray, for a normal desire could not be carried out. We now turn to the factor par excellence of the will, viz. effort. If a reform is ever to take place in the alcoholic, it must be through effort. If there should be a real desire for departure from alcoholic influence, it requires a great effort to overcome the habit and impulse. And in his weakened condition, the alcoholic cannot well put this forth. Even in normal conditions are will flags and cannot be brought to do what we would like and what we know to be right. If all the faculties were normal except the will, the defect would be very apparent and serious. The term abulia is used for cases of this kind. Footnote. We have the following from E. C. Pitska, Insanity, page 251 forward. The inebriate generally exhibits above all a marked enfeeblement of the will. This enfeeblement of the will is at first manifested in the inability of the inebriate to resist the temptation to drink. Numerous cases are on record where prosperous businessmen and capable men of letters, feeling this abulia, voluntarily went to an asylum for inebriates, and within its walls carried on their labors as well as before they had formed the alcoholic habit. But with the continuance of vice, the volition becomes impaired with regard to other matters as well, and the confirmed and deteriorating inebriate becomes the tool of others. He attends fairly well to duties of a routine character, but is devoid of initiative or, if he has it, is inconstant and easily diverted from his purpose. End footnote. How many drunkards there are who have all the inducements of a good home, a healthy body, a moral life, etc., for a reward of abstinence, who admit all the arguments brought forth, who recognize their duty in the matter, and yet are not able to make the effort. Sometimes the alcoholic claims a great desire for reformed life, yet tells you frankly that he has not the strength to try, and knows that he cannot reform if he does try. A gentleman of high standing and eminence in his profession was brought to the writer for help by his clergyman. He said that 
he wanted to get rid of alcohol. He recognized the danger, saw the effects, but lacked power to stop. He concluded by saying, I'll be honest, though. If there were a glass of whiskey on the table here, as much as I want to stop and know that I should stop for my own sake and that of my family, I would drink it. Examples of this kind could be enumerated without limit. One more will be given. A gentleman prominent on two continents in his profession applied for assistance to the writer. He wanted to stop drinking. It was ruining him for his work. He spoke freely concerning the injury to himself and family, and with tears in his eyes begged for help. But he was unable to make any effort himself in that direction. He would often not even make the effort to come for treatment, notwithstanding his longing for relief. He died at an early age from the effects of alcoholic excess. One of the frequent delusions of the alcoholic is that he has the ability to stop drinking any time he wishes to. The delusion of free will is very common and seems to be a part of the disease. He seldom thinks that he cannot stop, but for some other reason he continues to drink. This delusion of being able to will to stop at any time is encouraged by friends who also believe it to be true and condemn the patient for failure to carry it out. If the work of the person has been carried on for some time by reflexes and impulses, the will does become impotent, especially against strong habits. If a single effort is hard, a continued effort is correspondingly difficult. This is why reform is so difficult to attain. An alcoholic holding an article in his hand, example given, a ball or a jug, will often drop it if he is not fixing his attention on it. The motor brain cells seem to require continuous reinforcement to act for any length of time, there not being sufficient reinforcement in the alcoholic's brain to stop spontaneously. He must force the process by continued attention, and even then prolonged action is impossible for him. A steadily kept resolution is a great manifestation of nervous force, the neural correlation of which is a prolonged tension of one and the same group of cortical elements. If the resolution does not last, and in the alcoholic it is often broken in an hour, it is because there is not in his organism the possibility of repeated work and the center's concern with the volitional effort. Footnote. T. Ribo, The Diseases of the Will, translated by Snell, page 53. Notice also the following from I. Ray, Medical Jurisprudence, page 543. The mind of the inebriate is incapable of long-continued efforts which once were easy and of concentrating the whole force of its faculties on the subject submitted to its examination. End footnote. It is this steadiness or firmness of will which is the essence of will. The physical condition of effort is that of fullness of energy, ready to overflow and a free passage of good blood from one part of the brain to the others. One can well see that the condition of the nervous elements in the brain, pointed out in the discussion of physiology, would seriously interfere with the function of the centers, which are the physical basis of will. On account of the highly developed system which will supposes, the cells could not be in the state of decay and degeneration described without making impossible any delicate movements, such as we must suppose occur in the changes which take place during the performance of acts of will. Not only the degeneration, but the pressure and mishapping due to crowding on account of the pathological growth of connective tissue in the brain must seriously interfere with the process. Footnote. J. F. Wideson, in writing on toxemias and their relation to alcoholism, etc., says, In all cases of inebriety, there is primarily a weakened willpower incidental to unstable nerve equilibrium. This may be due to acquired organic disease or to heredity, or may be peculiar to the individual himself and bear no relation to heredity or disease. Its recognition is important if we would cure the disease. It certainly should be considered in studying the general relation of alcoholism to crime, for it is key to the situation. And footnote. But the basis of all is the blood. On account of the bone receptacle in which the brain is enclosed, the mass of cerebral material must be constant. It is therefore impossible for any great amount of blood to enter or leave the brain very quickly. For the only other element of changeable quantity in the brain is the spinal fluid, which cannot flow quickly and is small in quantity compared to the blood. If one part of the brain requires more blood hurriedly, the other portions must give up their supply. In willing a certain part to function and in putting forth effort in connection with a certain movement, 
More blood is required in the centers concerned with the movement, and the other parts are anemic on account of their sacrifice to the centers functioning. This puts all the effort of the mind upon one portion of the brain, which alone is in a condition for work. We know that attention has the effect of drawing blood to the organs to which we are attending, and that will works largely through the means of voluntary attention. As it is with other parts of the body, so we may expect it to be with the centers of the brain. When attended to, more blood is drawn to them and taken from the neglected parts, making the centers on which attention is concentrated more explosive and the discharge in their direction is more easily made. In the alcoholic brain, the mobility of the blood is seriously impaired so that it cannot quickly move from one center to another, and hence will as a whole and especially effort is retarded. The centers the least used become less easily hyperemic while the blood more easily flows to the centers of habitual action. It is also necessary for the blood to contain nourishment to sustain nervous energy and keep the cells intact. It must be free from any injurious matter and come in normal quantities. The affecting matter must also be taken away so as not to interfere with the metabolism. But none of these conditions do we find adequately fulfilled in the alcoholic brain and notwithstanding our inability to define the exact molecular change which takes place in the individual cell as the concomitant of the effort of will. We can undoubtedly say that these pathological changes do interfere to prevent these molecular changes, so that no effort of will can be made on account of the physical disability. Footnote, W. B. Carpenter, Mental Physiology, pages 636 forward. Speaking concerning the relation of will to physical conditions as follows, there is no class of aberrant mental phenomena which is more deserving of careful scientific study than that which is produced by the introduction into the blood of substances, which have the special property of perverting its normal action on the brain. For in the first place, these phenomena bring into strong relief the contrast between the augmented, augmatic activity of cerebrum, which manifests itself in the rapid succession of thoughts, the vividness of images, and the strong excitement of feelings, and the diminished volitional control of which we have the evidence in the incoherence of thought, the incongruity of the imagery creations, and the extravagance of feelings. And in the second place, it is perfectly clear that this disturbance of purely psychical action, affecting not merely what may be regarded as the functions of the brain, but the exercise of that attribute of man's nature, which seems most strongly indicative of a power beyond and above it, is produced by agencies purely physical. For it is not only that the balance between the automatic activity of the brain and the directing and controlling power of the will is disturbed by the exaltation of the former, so as to give it a predominance over the latter. On the contrary, the absolute weakening of volitional control is clearly a primary effect of these agencies being strongly manifested when the automatic activity, as often happens, is reduced, as when it is augmented. And this weakening is still more obvious when not merely the quality of the blood, but the nutrition of the brain has been deteriorated by the prolonged action of nervine stimulants, the will becoming, as it were, paralyzed, so that the mental powers are not under its command for any exertion whatever while even its controlling power over bodily movements may be greatly diminished. End footnote. Several references have been made in this chapter to the effect produced on the will by fatigue, which shows how a lessened nervous energy causes an impotence of will. Let us consider this further. Remember the histological similarity between fatigue and alcoholic cells. In fatigue, a periodicity of speed is noticeable in voluntary actions, which is generally agreed to be due not to peripheral or muscular, so much as to central fatigue. This is true whether the action is voluntary muscular contraction, such as tapping upon a telegraph key, more purely mental work, such as adding long columns to figures, or voluntary attention, such as listening to a watch placed at such a distance that the ticking can just be heard. The periodicity is not the only phenomena, but finally, sooner or later, according to the individual, the overexerted centers refuse to respond at all. This may be seen in experiments with the ergograph, of which examples will be shown. The reason for this failure is not 
simply because the subject refuses to work on account of pain, but he is positively unable to make an effort. And the time comes when, regardless of the motive, whether physical or mental, example given, pain or fear, there will not be a single contraction in response to the effort. In some experiments made on persons who were deprived of sleep for 90 hours, it was found that the voluntary motor inability decreased in waves according to the time of day and the length of time awake. In some other experiments with tapping, a walk which fatigued the person generally made the voluntary movement slower. And in experiments in control of the reflex wink, the control was lessened after long continued work at the desk. Thus we find in pathological conditions, when a person is weakened by brooding over troubles, he has not strength of will to resist the brooding. But if health can be restored so that the cells have their normal supply of energy, he can turn his attention to other things. The repair of willpower comes through nutrition, while conversely, loss of will is short when the nervous force is lowered. Volition implies an intensive discharge of the nervous elements along a certain definite self-resolved line. In order to accomplish this, every cell must be so nourished as to be explosive when the impulse comes to it. The fatigued and alcoholic cells are not in this condition. Some of the aches and disagreeable feelings about the body, and principally in the head, causing worry and anxiety. The alcoholic is able at first to control by will, but later he loses power to do so, and, then, and they become subjects of delusions. Kraepelin has shown directly that alcohol causes a slower reaction time for discrimination and decision. These statements concerning general fatigue show what we have contended all through this chapter, viz. that a loss of nervous energy affects will, and these experiments regarding voluntary movements, etc., show one of two things. While the voluntary movements of the finger, for example, are inhibited, we are able to will concerning other things. It must be either that the will has a definite seat, and we do will, but the connection between the will centers and these particular motor centers is temporarily incapacitated, or that the physical basis for will is in the motor center concerned with each movement, and as the nervous force of the center is exhausted, the will is correspondingly impaired. It is needless to say that we accept the second hypothesis. Some experiments made by the writer in the Yale Psychological Laboratory show the weakness and peculiarities of the will of the alcoholic probably better than anything else we could say in a purely descriptive way. The apparatus used was that usually employed in registering tap time. A telegraph key furnished the means of breaking a four amp current, which passed through the primary coil of a spark coil. The secondary circuit of the spark coil was connected at one pole with a 100 VD fork used as a marker, and at the other pole with the base of the recording drum. Every tap on the key was registered by a spark on the waving line, drawn by the fork on the drum. The subject was seated at a table in an easy position and told to tap as fast as possible until told to stop. A record was taken of the taps for five seconds at the start, and thereafter not continuously, but for the same length of time at the beginning of every 30 seconds. Usually before the records were finished, the subject was told emphatically, Now, tap just as fast as you possibly can. One record was generally taken after this. Most of the alcoholic subjects were secured through the kindness of Mr. P. C. Butterfield, Superintendent of Calvary Industrial Home of New Haven. With the exception of one, all the alcoholic subjects were sober, and had been so for periods ranging from a month to over a year. With one exception, J. C., they were all mechanics or laborers, persons who worked with their hands. The normals also, with the exception of F. W. M., were of the same walk of life. All the subjects, both alcoholics and normals, were males. Three of the subjects, two alcoholics and one normal, TD, MT, and AF, were not required to spurt, but these records are inserted to show the steady decline in both the average and probable error when no spurt was called for. One other, that of D, is excluded from the comparisons on account of his being under the influence of alcohol at the time of the experiment. Let us now look at the comparison between the alcoholics and the normals. The advantage is obviously with the normals, but as we would expect, does not show itself so much with the younger as with the older men. The ability to will is shown by the decreased average tap time 
when called upon to spurt, while the probable error is an index of uncertainty, for example, lack of control. Compare the two youngest subjects, F, alcoholic, age 29, and W, P, normal, age 35. Both spurt at command, but while W, P lowers the average from 179 to 114, a decrease of 65, F, who has the advantage of age, decreases from 213 to 205, a difference of only 8. In this effort, we also observe a difference in control. During the spurt, WP lowers the probable error from 1.2 to 0 0.8, while F, the uncertainty is increased from 0.9 to 1.5. Both of these men were healthy, strong, and intelligent, in every way comparable, but F had been drinking since he was 14 years of age and when 25 was not able to control himself. W.P. had lived his 33 years without touching liquor. The results of the experiments clearly show the lack of effort and control in the alcoholic. Look further at the rapidity of voluntary movements. The alcoholic's general average is 202. The sober man averages 163, which is a direct contradiction of the results as we would expect them if the two men were judged by their temperaments let us look at others. Take two very much alike, DF alcoholic and FWM normal. They were both 39 years of age and their general average was about the same, DF being 184 and FWM's 183. Their averages kept along very near together and when called upon both spurted about the same and 30 seconds later the fatigue was about the same. Only one difference of importance is noticed and that is in the probable error to the disadvantage of the alcoholic. During the spurt, FWM's probable error decreased from 1.4 to 0 0.9, and 39 seconds later had risen to 1.1. But concerning the alcoholic, we observed that during the time of the spurt, his probable error increased from 1.2 to 1.5, and 30 seconds later it rose to 3.0, showing a great lack of control and stability. The older men show a more striking difference the two oldest alcoholics we have, CC and JC, are 54 and 55 years of age, respectively. The oldest normals, WE and MP, are 61 and 70 years old. Notwithstanding the greatest difference of age, when a few years count so much, the normals make a much better showing. CC, when called upon, fails to spurt at all, but the time is increased from 203 to 217, and the fruitless effort causes the probable error to rise from 1.4 to 3.0. Here we have a total lack of will power exhibited, and with it a great decrease in control. In the case of JC, we have a spurt, but a very great increase in probable error from 0 0.6 to 3.0, and 30 seconds later the probable error rises to 5.4. In the normals, both WE and MP spurt. The latter, let us consider, being respectively 16 and 15 years older than the alcoholics. With WE, the probable error decreases from 0 0.9 to 0 0.8, and after 30 seconds is only 1.0. MP's probable error increases slightly from 1.2 to 1.4, but 30 seconds later is down to 1.1, a marked difference from that of JC or CC. Something further very noticeable here in the former experiments is the way in which the normals keep up their spurt into the next 30 seconds, but the alcoholics fall again. For the normals, WP gives us the best record in this respect. He averages 192 when asked to spurt, and immediately decreases the average to 157, and 30 seconds later is still lower, being 137. JC, alcoholic, gives us the example for the other extreme. Before the spurt, he was at 190. He spurted to 166 and 30 seconds later was at 194, higher than before he spurted. Takes this out of the language of the psychological laboratory. Translate it into a practical case, and what does it mean? The alcoholic is spurted to put forth will in some form. It may be to make and keep a resolution. He makes it, but while he starts well, he is unable to keep it for any time, and before long he is less powerful, as far as will is concerned, than he was before the resolution was made. With the normal, it is not so, but he continues to exercise his will. 
It may even get stronger than before the resolution was made, but is not likely to get weaker. Although it does not directly come under our subject, it is interesting in passing to notice the one case of acute alcoholism of which we have record, that of D. His average is very large. He is not capable of making repeated voluntary efforts very quickly, and, as we would suppose, his control is very weak. His smallest probable error is equal to the largest probable error which we are able to find among all the others. Viz. 5.6, while it goes up to the enormous figure of 16.6. .6. Under the influence of alcohol, he is able to spurt, going from 253 to 221, with a decrease in probable error from 12 to 9.0, but it does not last. 30 seconds later, his average is higher than it was before, 268, and the probable error has risen to 14.7. His case will be referred to later. Another form of experiment was tried with the same subjects, and in designation the same initials will be used. In this, the subjects were tested with the Maso ergograph. Each one was seated comfortably, with his arm resting upon a board to which was strapped. The tape was fastened around his middle finger, and in a given signal he was told to pull as far as he could to the beat of a sounder, which was connected electrically with a clock marking off the seconds. The weight used was three kilograms. Each movement of the weight was recorded on a drum by means of the ergograph pointer. Very much the same results were obtained as with the tap time experiments. We reproduce a few of the records made. In figure 12, the drum was running more rapidly than in the latter records, yet it has the advantage of giving better details. After the subject had been at work long enough to show a considerable shortening of the exertions of the pointer, due to fatigue, an effort was made to increase the length of the exertion by saying, now pull harder, do your best. This corresponds to the spurt and tap time records. The vertical arrows point to the places where the spurt was ordered. In this record we see an utter lack of any increase. The weight is not pulled one bit higher and TD, alcoholic, is apparently not able to put forth any more effort. In the tap time experiments he was not spurted but this record shows the most clearly of any example of the ergograph experiments. The lack of will, for example, power to put forth effort. In figure 13, we have an example of lack of power after a short test. J.C., alcoholic, was not able to move the weight when called upon to spurt. The pointer had made 80 excursions in all, after which he could not move his finger. Compare this with the record of MP, figure 14. MP is normal. It's 15 years, J.C. Sr. And although we notice that he misses one stroke, yet he recovers himself without suggestion. At the next stroke, when commanded to spurt, does so. Only twice does he miss a stroke in his whole record, both times recovering himself well, and at the end of 155 strokes is still able to respond strongly. It is difficult to tell whether or not MC, alcohol, experts here when commanded. True, the weight is raised, but it corresponds to the regular rhythm of fatigue and recovery. Probably we can credit him with a small spurt, but it is very small indeed. Compared with his record when he first began this experiment, the first part of this record is not shown. In the record of F, alcoholic, figure 16 we can notice where his finger was powerless for three or four strokes and in two other places where he was unable to relax his finger showing a lack of control in both ways. At command he spurted, but lost time in doing so, taking the time of about two regular strokes to make the effort, showing that he could not readily control his power or that there was no power immediately available. The record of CC, alcoholic, is quite like that of F. He spurts but loses time in the effort. Twice after that he is not able to relax his finger, and finally he becomes powerless. He is unable to move his finger at 65 strokes. Compare this record with that of MP. The latter was pulling strongly at the end of 155 strokes, and this man, 15 years younger, was powerless at the end of 65 strokes. Compare these two alcoholics, CC and JC, with MP, normal and we will see the advantage that an abstemious old man has over a middle-aged alcoholic. 
We also insert the record of D, who was intoxicated at the time it was taken, but this is not for comparison. The two following records, figure 19 and 20, are examples of normals, and the spurts by which they responded when commanded. By looking over the results of these experiments, we can see how they substantiate what has been said in the descriptive part of this chapter. Both in the results of the tap time investigations and those of the ergograph, we find the alcoholic much inferior to the normal in his command and control of himself, and lacking in ability to put forth effort. The tapping and the ergograph give slightly different results. For the work is different. The tapping is very light work, and only the repeated efforts fatigue one. But lifting three kilograms with one finger is very tiring. Notwithstanding this, the results are quite in agreement. These alcoholic subjects were far from being of the most affected class, for these men had remained sober for some time, none less than one month. It might have been more interesting if the worst class could have been obtained, but as this lowest class is always more or less under the influence of alcohol, the task of arising at the effect of the continued use of alcohol would have been defeated, and we would have records on the effect of the continued use. Added to that of the acute effects, depending upon the amount of alcohol recently taken. We feel that the testimony given by these witnesses has been quite conclusive. We found that the lack of will to be a serious result of the use of alcohol, not only as a whole, but all the factors of will are injured. The alcoholic is devoid of the power to act at the proper time and in the right way, no matter how much he may admit such action to be correct. On the other hand, he is equally powerless to inhibit incorrect action which is in line with his alcoholic craving. He has the delusion of free will and thinks he can stop drinking if he wishes, but on account of a lack of nervous energy, he has not the ability for sustained effort. The blood supply has a powerful influence on the will. The experiments with ergograph and tap time prove graphically what has been so long contended, viz. that the alcoholic has lost the power of putting forth effort. End of chapter 5「Chapter Six of the Psychology of Alcoholism by George Barton Cuton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Emotions. In the study of the emotional nature of the alcoholic, we find a degeneration corresponding in kind as well as degree to that of the intellect and will. The way has been prepared in a small measure for our discussion by references to the emotions in the preceding chapters when discussing the relation of the emotions to the other faculties of mind. The emotions, insofar as they relate to the moral nature of man in general, and the alcoholic in particular, will be reserved for treatment in the chapter on morals. This slightly restricts our discussion, yet this chapter is necessary to our subject, on account of the obvious emotional changes which are brought about by alcoholic indulgence. Considerable discussion has taken place between psychologists on the evolutionary aspects of the emotions. For truly the emotions, notwithstanding their indefinite and changing character, do give scope for study in this direction. It seems that pathological cases similar to the alcoholic should be fruitful fields to explore. For the alcoholic in his lowest and most degraded stage becomes little more than a brute as far as his emotions are concerned. The order of evolution, both regarding the race and the individual, can be traced in a general way by noticing the order of decline, and then changing it to read inversely. Of all the aspects of degeneration through the excessive indulgence of alcohol, there is no one more pitiable, neither is there one that causes more distress, than this change in the emotions. The principle which we have found to apply so well in our discussion, as far as we have proceeded, is also applicable to the emotions. In fact, this is the principle of degeneration in general. It is that the latest evolved most complex and least stable states are those which are the first to be attacked, and the first to be destroyed by any detrimental agent, while the early simple states remain until the last. In addition to this principle we add another. We found in the previous chapters that general bodily health was necessary to the best normal mental activity, but with the emotions, the least change in the organs of the body, 
which may hardly be otherwise perceptible to the individual, may make a great change in the emotions. The reverse is also true. Emotional states cause a great change in the functions of the bodily organs, so great at times as to incapacitate them, or, in relation to the heart, to cause instant death. Serious bodily disturbances may or do occur in all emotional experiences. Bright's disease, heart disease, jaundice, dyspepsia, diarrhea, and other well-known changes in the respiration, involuntary muscles, and secretions, as well as in the voluntary muscles, are sequelae of different emotions. The emotions are evidently correlated with serious nutritional disturbances, especially of the viscera, brought about without doubt by changes in the vasomotor nerves, and hence in the blood supply. The health of the brain has been our chief concern previous to this. We must now also consider the health of the alcoholic's whole body. No one can well doubt the deplorable condition of the alcoholic as far as his emotions are concerned. He is emotional enough, too emotional, but the emotions are of a very low order. Everyone is familiar with the absurdly emotional condition of the man who is intoxicated. Perhaps for the first time, he either wishes to shake hands or to fight. The sentiments are neither worse nor better, but are not controlled. They are let loose and accentuated, and are revealed in their naked truth. To some extent, the same is true with the chronic alcoholic. His emotions are uncontrolled. Footnote. Besides there being an infinite variety of emotions, and an equally great variety of the same emotion, as far as its quality is concerned, we notice also a variety in quantity and method of approach. Thus, emotions may be strong or weak, and many degrees in between. They may come suddenly before we know it, or they may be gradual in appearance, so that we can easily recognize their approach. Again, they may be intermittently strong and weak, or approaching suddenly for a time. Then gradually, the terms sudden and strong, and the terms gradual and weak, being at times more or less synonymous, although the gradually approaching emotion may attain great strength. The emotions which appear gradually are more or less under control, but an emotion wholly under control ceases to be an emotion. One characteristic of the emotion being its impulsive nature. Nevertheless, there is a slight measure of control in the less violent emotions, which is quite easily recognized. And footnote. But they are also deteriorated by continued indulgence, so that only the lowest ones survive. There is commonly a feeling of depression with vague and gloomy feelings, and a continual apprehension of misfortune which is impeding. Footnote. The word feeling is very ambiguous and may be the general term for all affective states. It may be the place here to make a distinction, for at least to call attention to distinctions which are made between different classes of feelings with which we have to deal. An example given, emotion, sentiment, and mood. In a general way, the sentiments are distinguished from emotions by having less response from the bodily organs and by being connected with ideals. The mood is a persistent emotional state with less reference to any particular object, but with the same particular feeling toward all objects. End footnote. His grief may easily become despair, and his lack of hope lead to permanent melancholy. To overcome this, he indulges more freely in the beverages which have provoked it, and these prove temporarily remedial, but only engender further depression. Coupled with this, a morbid irritability of temper is a marked feature. He is peevish and exaggerates his cares and his sufferings. His rage and anger may be persistent and mischievous, or remittent and impotent. In women of weaker mind, the character changes. They become sullen, taciturn sometimes. Very often, on the other hand, they have expansive and even compromising ideas. Occasionally, these two relations alienate. In Huss's well-known experiments, the dogs, to which he gave large doses of alcohol, became very irritable and were easily aroused by other dogs. In Hodge's experiments, where small doses were given, this irritability was not noticed. The alcoholic, whether a victim of large or small doses, is similarly affected in this respect. He is touchy and explosive when crossed in the smallest way. He is exacting, petulant, and hypochondrical. This disagreeable state he shows unmistakably, and that without sufficient cause. The victim of his anger may be the first person 
or object available, regardless of circumstances. Equally unreasonable is his suspicion. This suspicion is characteristic of some forms of alcoholic insanity, but even in his pre-insane days he is extremely suspicious. A conversation which he cannot hear or the expression on the face of another is referred to himself. He is suspicious of others' motives and jealous of his wife, both without cause. Acts of kindness are misconstrued, and he may think that persons are taking advantage of his condition to rob or injure him, and he makes much ado about nothing. Distinct and uncontrollable suspicions are very frequently noticed. His faith in others may be shaken on account of a consciousness of duplicity in his own mind, but it seems rather to be from a lack of judgment and balance, and a failure to perceive the correct relations of things. His selfishness is very noticeable. He is utterly heartless as a general thing, and anything approaching apparent altruism will probably have a selfish motive if examined carefully. His self-indulgence in the face of what he knows to be right and the appeals of friends and family would naturally cultivate this. He is an egoist of the utmost unpleasant, graceless type. He dwells upon his own excellencies and ability, as well as his worries and fears, and is ever encouraging his egotism by constant contemplation of his own exaggerated virtues. For others, he cares nothing. The cries of his wife and children, the claims and entreaties of his parents and friends he hears, but perfectly indifferent to them. The once loving and obedient son strikes and tries to kill his mother. The wife whom he cherished and regarded with the tenderest affection he now loathes and seeks to injure. He looks upon the world and every part of it as fulfilling its duty only when he is provided with alcohol or anything else which he wishes. He has lost all consideration for others and is no longer sympathetic or charitable. His egotism may show itself in another form. He may be very presumptuous and unduly confident of his ability. Frequently he wishes to assist others in any difficult enterprise which they may be endeavoring to accomplish, evidently with the idea that he is far more able than they to bring about a successful culmination. This may even be ludicrous at times. Again, this egoism may be exhibited in the great amount of sympathy which he has for himself and concerning which he talks considerably. He also demands sympathy and consideration from others, and feels injured if he does not receive it. In some experiments made by Partridge, there was a very noticeable change made in the character of the associations after alcohol was administered. The egoistic associations were greatly increased. This was more conspicuous than any other change. There is a noted loss of all the higher and finer emotions. His emotional life is restricted in variety. Motives which might naturally excite the higher emotions are unable to impress the alcoholic, or if they do, it is in a way not expected. The principles of self-abnegation, modesty, love, patience, fortitude, self-criticism, and self-control are lost, and correspondingly, self-sufficiency arises. This self-sufficiency, the feeling which causes the alcoholic to think that he is extremely clever and acute, but his neighbors who see things in their proper relations do not share his opinions. Discomfort, pain, sorrow, anxiety, and fear are deadened and benumbed by every fresh indulgence, and his condition becomes chronically worse. In women there is a diminution or total loss of shame, and in both sexes there is a lack of pride and personal appearance and cleanliness. In Hodge's experiments with kittens, he found that the care of the body soon disappeared. Along with this, all the instincts characteristic of healthy kittens care of coat, cleanliness, etc., were almost wholly annulled. The alcoholic has lost all taste for work of all kinds, and those more elevating emotions which are occasionally felt, even by the least cultivated minds, have entirely deserted his soul. In a word, he shows an utter lack of the higher emotions, those which are the signs by which we distinguish the true man. He is a stranger to true moral or religious emotions, Although he may have periodic spasms of remorse when he cannot get anything more to drink, or is too ill to take any more. He has no sense of the beautiful, and intellectual emotions are very infrequent. All altruistic emotions are gone, and his condition is well summed up in what we have said before, that he is 
the lowest kind of an egoist. There may be in him sudden and persistent perversions of the affections, where love is quickly transformed into hate, and frequently the general emotional content may be altered without any apparent cause. The subject may also alternate between extremes of love and hate. The emotional vagaries of the drunkard take their color according to his inheritance and daily habit. He is usually variable in his views and feelings. One hour easily pleased, happy, and facile, the next discontented, curious, despondent, or obstinate. Frequently he develops a frothy sentimentalism with a fondness for dreamy self-feeling and emotional expression, which relates chiefly to affairs of love or religion. Sometimes a settled gloom sits on the man that may be madness, or a morbid hilarity in which he dwells as in a happy world of his own apart from all misfortune. In some cases the emotional condition sways between the two extremes. The swing of the pendulum spreads over months or years. A kind of folly circulary or the emotional coloring may be of a lighter tinge, so that the moderate man becomes a silly optimist, or dons the darkened spectacles and is unable to see the good that is, much less the good that will be. Perhaps he could do no better than to take one state, which we have not yet discussed, and ask why this one should be excessive, or why it should remain at all. Let us take a very characteristic one, viz. fear. We hope by this examination, the one emotion, to show all the principles of emotional degeneration, and although we use fear as an example, what we say concerning it should be equally applicable to all those emotional states which still remain with the alcoholic. We have one difficulty in dealing with the emotions which we do not find to so great an extent when we consider the other mental faculties. The emotions differ so with different individuals, and differ so much in the same individual that we cannot speak of one emotion, example given, fear as a constant quantity. While all emotions of fear possess the distinctive factor which enables us to class them as fear, yet we cannot say that any one fear is identical either in quantity or quality with other fears which we have experienced. Far less can we say that our fear is like that of any one's else. First, let us say that in cases of simple intoxication, or even when an alcoholic is intoxicated, there appears to be an almost total lack of fear. The coward appears bold and aggressive. We hardly know him. The reason for this is that alcohol, as a paralyzer, does not make a man any more courageous, but deadens fear, if we can make that distinction. His judgment is so impaired that he does not realize the true situation, but rushes in where angels fear to tread. Further, the alcohol, for the time being, causes an increase in the circulation so as to restore temporarily the normal mental condition, or at least to counteract the baneful influence of a decreased amount of blood to the centers of the brain. If it is possible to frighten a person when drunk, the fear has the effect of sobering him, so that if the fright is sufficiently great, the man is immediately sobered. The task, however, is to frighten a drunken man. Fear is useful for the cure of some other ills, chiefly of a nervous character. We all know what a panacea it is when one is afflicted with nervous contractions called hiccoughs. While fear is comparatively absent and impossible in simple intoxications, we find it the chief mental characteristic of delirium tremens and prominent in other alcoholic insanities. This excessive fear is occasioned by visual and auditory hallucinations and illusions brought about by the overwrought nervous condition. Footnote. Notice the following from K. Heilbronner, lecture delivered before the Medical Society of Hale, Germany, January 1901. There is generally a close connection between misuse of alcohol and the appearance of the emotion of fear. It seldom fails to be the initial appearance of those cases of delirium tremens, which later show the typical humorous disposition. Most alcohol psychosis subsides without the excessive fear characteristics. End footnote. The fears of the alcoholic are of a different character from those of the person in delirium. With the alcoholic is largely a matter of mood. It is a chronic condition, only awaiting an occasion to be manifested. It is, however, hardly as prominent a symptom as irritability. 
There is fear of friends and enemies alike. There is no courage to undertake any business enterprise, and moral courage is an unknown factor. A certain amount of fear is as necessary as courage in every normal person. Why is the fear excessive and the courage lacking in the alcoholic? A rule to which we find no exceptions. For explanation, we fall back first upon our old rule of degeneration spoken of above. The latest received, most complex, and least stable acquisitions are first to go, while those acquisitions early developed and simple are the last to suffer from degeneration. Our religious sentiments and emotions, as well as those of aesthetics and the intellect, are of late development. As they are of exceedingly complex nature, they soon disappear. The whole decline is from the higher to the lower. Those which deteriorate are recognized as the higher feelings. In the last chapter we found that the alcoholic did not have many ideas, and without ideals we cannot have these higher emotional states. There may seem to be an exception to our rule among these three sets of higher emotions. We would place the religious emotions the highest of these groups, but these may seem to outlast the others. In our religion there is a selfish factor, it is that of salvation, and this may abide. But as far as true religious emotions, and certainly as far as moral emotions are concerned, they are among the first to disappear. Ribo gives the following order of emotional decline. 1. Disinterested emotions, aesthetic and higher forms of the intellectual. 2. Altruistic, social and moral. 3. Ego altruistic, sexual love and religion. 4. Purely egoistic, anger, fear, nutrition. It all depends on what we mean by religion whether we can agree with this classification. If we are able to understand by the religious emotions thus wrought up by frothy sentimental platitudes with great pity for the alcoholic at the basis, then we agree. Perhaps it should even be placed in the last class. If we mean those emotions which accompany exalted and truly religious experiences, then we would place the religious emotions in the first class. The best solution of the difficulty would be to divide the religious emotions into two classes, those of the higher, exalted, and disinterested character, and those which have connected with them the selfish factor. We can then place the first division in the first class, and the second in the third class, and agree thoroughly with the classification as here given. This brings us right to the heart of the matter. Notice the emotions which we have enumerated as characteristic of the alcoholic, and we find them without exception of an egotistic character. Not only are those very highest emotions all gone, but the altruistic emotions, although attacked later, follow in the same way. The love of wife and children, the gratitude to father and mother, the duties as citizen, or the loyalty to friends are all forgotten. There is nothing considered but self, and that in the lowest and most selfish way. These emotions have disappeared in the inverse order of their acquisition by the individual. There is a broader principle to consider, and one that is important in this question of degeneration, and that is the order of acquiring the emotions by the race. This is where the evolutionary psychology may be of value to us. We have the following order in the general classification of feeling. 1. Feelings which primarily affect the conservation of the organism. 2. Feelings which primarily affect the perpetuation of the race. 3. Feelings which primarily affect the common welfare. 4. Feelings which primarily affect the welfare of others. 5. Feelings which are neither conservative nor destructive. 6. Feelings corresponding with relations between interactions. If we follow this order for the evolution of the race, we find correspondence between individual and race development, and the general agreement of the order of degeneration with the inverse order of development. We can see what is proven here and what the theory of evolution has contended for, viz. the primacy of the egotistic emotions, for these are absolutely necessary for the survival of the individual. While we have called these egotistic emotions, many of them show themselves before a child has any idea of self, such as fear and anger, but they are all connected with selfish manifestations, and as such they appear first and last longest. This, then, is the first reason to give why fear persists 
when other emotions disappear. We now pass on to look for further cause. The second reason we will state in the following way before explaining further. The lack of ability of the nerve cells to obtain proper nourishment causes a general lowering of nervous energy, which in turn causes a mood, of which these emotions are the legitimate fruit. Perhaps here we could use anger to better advantage as an illustration, or better, the two, fear and anger, can be taken along together. It is evident that our emotional life is very much influenced by our bodily constitution. A healthy, strong, well-developed man, all of whose bodily organs perform their functions rightly, must differ widely from a delicate, weak, deformed man with a defective organism. Heart, lungs, gall, liver, circulation of the blood and respiration, even the conformation of the muscle and bone are of influence. So are sex and age, geographical, terrestrial, and cosmic influences. It is evident from this quotation that we should not only consider the cells of the brain, but the whole bodily organism as having influence. If the organs of the body are in bad condition, we must expect that the fact will be shown through the emotions. With the alcoholic, we know that such is the case, for there is perhaps not one organ in the body in a normal and healthy condition. In a normal person, our old example of fatigue, which is temporary in its effects, shows similar phenomena. We quote the following. The essential characteristic of a fatigued nerve is its increased irritability. It reacts to less than the normal stimulus, and hence more or less spasmodically. For example, in a state of fatigue, one is more likely to start at small noises. Furthermore, one's reaction is likely to be ill-directed, uncertain, and prolonged. Let the same cause produce its natural effect in the workings of the intellect, the feelings, and the will and we shall have, among other things, an important group of morbid states. The following may be enumerated as examples. Worry, despondency, bad temper, emotionalism of various kinds, oversensitiveness, lack of decision in small matters, morbid introspection. Among all the causes which produce anger, illness, and pain stand out predominantly. And further, there has been noticed an agreement in the degree of pain and anger. Many children have been punished for a display of anger when they should have had medicine instead, or a rest, for irritability is often totally result of a physical state, and probably very seldom separated from physical causes. If we look at the phenomena of fatigue under the most favorable circumstances, we find the same result. It matters not how pleasurable a stimulus may be. If we continue it long enough, it becomes painful through fatigue, and causes irritability or anger. Huss, in his experiments with dogs, which had received alcohol, already referred to, found them exceedingly irritable, while Hodge, in his experiments, found as a mark which distinguished the alcoholic dogs from others of the same litter, which were non-alcoholic, their excessive fear. Footnote. C. F. Hodge, The Physiology of Alcohol, Popular Science Monthly, Volume 1, Pages 805 and 807 says, It was not until alcohol had been given for nearly two months that it became quite noticeable that tipsy and bum alcoholics were a little quieter than the others. This became gradually more marked. By September they were rather often caught napping in the shade, while Topsy and Nig, normals, were playing actively. They had developed also a cringing, trembling timidity for which nothing either in my treatment of them or in their relation to the other dogs could possibly account. Bum has shown several mild paroxysms of fear, with some evidence also of hallucinations. The tone of sadness, the same as noted in Magnin's dog, is characteristic for tipsy and bum. It can be lightened up at times so as hardly to be recognized, but still it is the prevailing tone. End footnote. The lack of nutriment thus affects animals in the same manner as men, as far as their moods are concerned. To show the gloomy, fearful moods of an alcoholic, the poetry of E. A. Poe is frequently alluded to, for it is well known that he was an excessive drinker of alcoholic beverages. Footnote. W. L. Howard, the pervert, says, Science has changed many of the old views of the order of things in the last decade, but in nothing has she been so gracious as 
in taking the stigma away of drunkenness too long attached to that American genius Poe. Born with intellectual powers beyond the ken of his contemporaries, he also tried to struggle through his physical life, heavily burdened by a physical form of epilepsy, over which he could not possibly have control, and which at intervals held him in its impulsive grasp. Literature always recognized Poe's genius. Science now recognizes his disease. End footnote. Other examples in literature might also be given. The relation between fatigue and lack of nourishment on one side and fear on the other was noticed in the infant daughter of the writer when she was not older than three weeks. When she was just awakened from sleep, had been recently fed and received her bath, she allowed the nurse to handle her without any apparent fear of falling. But when the bath was taken under the similar conditions, when she was tired, sleepy, and hungry, it was impossible to move or turn her without the little hands flying out in an apparent movement to avert a fall. If one wishes any further evidence concerning the relation between nutrition and the emotions, especially the lack of nutrition and the lower emotions, he has only to read himself and notice the daily rise and fall of strength and the concomitant emotions. In the morning, a general good nature and exuberance of spirits exists, gradually diminishing until evening comes with irritability and gloom, which cannot be dispelled until after the night's rest and reoccupation. A man's temper varies with his health. In addition to saying, laugh and grow fat, we should say grow fat and laugh. Mood depends on the nervous system. We trust that we have said enough to make plain that we have stated as the second answer to the inquiry. Why does the alcoholic have the aforesaid emotional states? We will now state and endeavor to elucidate a third answer, viz. the memory of the alcoholic declines so that only the states of his early life are remembered. The emotional states have to share the fate of all other mental factors, and so his emotions come to be those of boyhood. Childhood emotions coincide very closely with those of the alcoholic, and as the memory of the feelings is not lost so quickly as that of events, he is proportionally more emotional. Up to the age of puberty, a child is selfish, and altruistic feelings do not arise to any great extent until there begin the physical and mental changes of that time. In cases of arrested development in children, or those who are degenerates, they are lacking the social, moral, and higher feelings, but they have the lower feelings abnormally developed. Before puberty, a boy is a most complete egotist, and some have thought that but for the adolescent's change, he would always remain so, with the disadvantage of a continued deterioration. It is stated that eunuchs are cowardly, envious, untruthful, deceitful, and devoid of all social feelings. If this is so, and the alcoholic is but a boy in emotion, except that he has not the advantage of the boy's physique, we would expect him to have all the egotistic feelings of a boy, but in the worst form not only in the inferior quality, but in the disproportionate quantity, the alcoholic is excessively emotional. The memory is responsible for this, because the emotions are less easily forgotten than other experiences. Footnote. J. Ross on Memory, Brain, Volume 14, page 47, says that although the emotional experiences may be isolated and devoid of associations, they are remembered easier than some events are often repeated. End footnote. Some personal experiences of the writer are convincing to him, at least, and to show how tenacious the emotions are, compared with other mental states, they will be briefly related. The earliest memories of my life are memories of feeling. For example, they are all of an effective character. The events connected with them all took place when I was four years of age. I remember nothing earlier, and nothing more until about two years later. The events themselves I have no remembrance of but only certain emotional states connected with them. I was living in the city of Halifax, Nova Scotia. At the time of the occurrence of the first three of these four, these three are best remembered. First case. One afternoon I was taken out for a walk in the public gardens by my nurse. I saw my uncle some distance away and wished to go to him. This the nurse agreed to, and I started. Before I could get to him, my uncle moved away, and the nurse had also moved, and I was lost. My weeping attracted the attention of two little girls who took me to their home, reported me to the police, and at nine o'clock in the evening 
My uncle came and took me home. I remember nothing of the circumstances, not the sorrow of being alone or lost, nothing of the little girls in the strange home, nor of my homecoming. But what stands out distinctly and indubitably in my memory is the feeling of satisfaction when nestling down in my uncle's arms when he came to take me home. I try to analyze the feeling, and it resolves itself into one of warmth after being chilly, although this could not be, for it was summer, and the flowers were blooming in the gardens. Second case. After watching my father shaving one morning, I tried to follow his example. I got his razor and went out on the front stoop to make my first shave. The circumstances I do not remember, either the stoop, the razor, or the cut, of which I still carry the scar, but the feeling of pride that I was able to have the razor and shave is still quite easily recalled. Third case. One day when my mother was entertaining visitors, I went to my father's desk in an adjoining room, grasped a piece of paper, which, as it happened, was a note of considerable value, and returning to where my mother was, placed it on the fire in the grate. So the circumstances again have faded away. I have no remembrance of the visitors, the room, the grate, the paper, or the punishment which came later, but I do distinctly remember the feeling of pride connected with placing the paper on the fire before other people. Fourth case. This case... I am not so sure as of the others. It seems like memory to me, but not so clear and distinct. The circumstances happened in a hotel in Amherst, Nova Scotia. I ventured down into the smoking room one day, where I was given a piece of tobacco to chew by someone present. Again, the events have vanished from memory. No remembrance of the room, the recollection, the feeling of nausea as such, but the part which seemed to linger in memory is the feeling of inability to keep my eyes open when being carried to my room, and the great feeling of relief and satisfaction when they closed. This, of course, being a feeling connected with the nausea. Recognizing the danger of interpreting imagination as memory in these early experiences, yet I can say that the first three of these are undoubtedly memory. The last one may be misinterpreted by imagination. We will notice that not only are all these memories of an effective character, but they are also egotistic. Not fear this time, nor anger, but two out of the four are pride, one joy, and the fourth the least clearly remembered, perhaps strictly not to be classed among the motions. If this experience is general, for example, if the emotions are better remembered than other states of childhood, this accounts at least in part for the phenomena of the discipline proportionate amount of emotion in the alcoholic experience. The memory of recent emotion fails, as does the memory of all other mental experiences. Footnote. H. Spencer, Principles of Psychology, Volume 1, pages 235 forward, says that feelings excited when the general circulation is very vigorous are more revivable than usual is a truth that may be variously exemplified. Revivability of feeling excited during a state of feebleness is comparatively small. The effect of depressed circulation, whether produced by disorder or by age, alike shows this. End footnote. The anger, fear, or joy of yesterday may have entirely passed from the mind, and the person whom the alcoholic considered his worst enemy yesterday may be his best friend today, or, on the other hand, some isolated impressions of the experience may last just sufficient to cause an unreasonable, persistent ill-feeling. The latter is not so common, for the alcoholic has not strength of purpose sufficient to carry out even an expression of ill-will against another. In the emotions, as with all mental states, the blood supply has a great influence. Brain, heart, and arm pulsations are immediately changed by the slightest emotion, and the blood supply normal in quantity and quality. With ample provision for a ready transference from one part of the body to another, as well as from one part of the brain to another, is an admitted necessity for normal emotions. The career of an emotion seems to be limited physically, for if the intensity is weak, either through voluntary control or for other reasons, the extensity is greater. But if the emotions are very intense, they are less extensive. The statement has been made that anemia with poor nourishment is the cause of morbid emotions. The general lack of nutrition has been spoken of, but we must remember that the quantity as well as the quality of blood is important. By referring to this first chapter, we will see that in the alcoholic, 
neither quantity nor quality is equal to the standard. If the blood vessels and nerves are out of order, it is impossible that the organic rebound, so necessary in emotional states, should take place. In general, we find that the emotions which have anemia as a concomitant are the ones which remain in the alcoholic. Some might think that there is one great exception, that of anger, but we rarely, if ever, see the hyperanemic form of anger in the alcoholic, except when the circulation is greatly increased by an excessive amount of alcohol. The anger characteristic of the alcoholic is rather the sullen, morose irritation which is present in connection with the anemia. We would not say that emotions requiring hyperanemia are possible, but at least they are not frequent. Emotions can be increased or decreased in intensity by altering either the quantity or quality of the blood. Anger and fear, as well as fatigue, are accompanied by a change in the composition of the blood. Would it be carrying the smile too far to surmise that the change wrought by alcohol may be analogous to that concomitant with anger and fear, and thus these two emotions are assisted? Of the blood supply of the alcoholic we know one thing, and that is that the arteries are so closed by pathological growth as to be unable to deliver the normal supply of blood. This corresponds in effect to contraction of the arteries by the vasoconstrictor nerves. We know further that, in general, fear and sadness are accompanied by vasomotor constriction, while joy and one form of anger are accompanied by dilation. It is not hard, then, to draw the conclusion that the quantity of the blood has its effect upon the emotions in determining which one shall survive. More than any other mental state, the emotions use the whole brain and nervous system. Footnote. In regard to the physical basis of the emotions in the brain, in common with the intellect and will, we do not believe that any particular portion of the brain is a special seat of the emotions, but rather think that the centers in use for other functions have an emotional function also. And footnote. At first, the emotion is only concerned with one set of nerve cells or centers, but the excitement attending spreads to those other centers nearest connected with the first set, and latter over the whole system. In looking for a physical basis, we cannot give it a narrow localization, but rather we would say that the emotion depends on the quantity and quality of the stimulation of the different nerve centers all over the body, together with the mood of the person at the time of the excitation. We see then that both the brain and the various organs of the body have an influence, for while the brain may incite and to a certain degree control the emotions, it is also true that if the organs are in such a condition that they cannot conform to the changes normally required by the emotion, the emotion is thereby hindered or inhibited. Now we come to another question, which we will try to answer in the language of another. The question is this, even if the early emotions are the ones which remain, do we not find among early emotions those of joy as well as sadness? Do we not find emotions of brightness as well as gloom? Why are these not represented in our list? Mr. Spencer assists us here. Pains are more intense than pleasures. Footnote. In common with all feelings, the emotions have a special subjective reference and are generally pleasurable or painful and are so classed. Although the hedonic element is a mixed and sometimes contradictory one, as when, for instance, the pleasure of being angry is spoken of, or the joy of grief. Notwithstanding this hedonic element in the emotions, we find that pain or pleasure of a special sort and emotions are mutually exclusive, that we cannot have one when we are experiencing the other. End footnote. The idea of pain follows its antecedent into consciousness more readily than the idea of pleasure. There is a small number of painful feelings which are strong, a large number of pleasurable feelings that are less strong, and a much larger number of feelings which are but slightly pleasurable. When the nervous pressure is high, the current is forced into less permeable lines, for example, into the slightly pleasurable feelings. But as it gets weaker, it goes only into the most intense lines, and when at its lowest, the content comes to be composed mainly of the aggregate of faintly aroused painful feelings so producing gloom and groundless fear and despair. The energy is low and goes into the most permeable path. Joyous emotions are thereby eliminated, as we truly find them to be of the alcoholic. 
Closely connected with this are other modifications of organs, which may not be in harmony with the expressions of the emotions, and prevent the bodily symptoms which accompany and augment the primary emotional feelings, as the blood both in quantity and quality fails to fulfill the conditions of the emotions which are lacking, and conforms to the conditions of the remaining emotions, so the change wrought in the bodily organs may be antagonistic to the joyous and other absent emotions, and favorable to the gloomy and fearful emotions which remain. For if the bodily organs are set in the opposite way to the customary effect of an emotion, that will in a large measure prevent the appearance of that emotion. The opposite effect should also be noticed. Not only does alcoholism cause a change in the emotions, but changes in the emotions may cause a drinking bout. Men drink on account of their depression and grief, or the exaltation and joy. The emotions more than any other faculty seems to contribute to causes or occasions of drinking. It is the impulsive or emotional men in whom we expect to find the alcoholic or dipsomaniac, and in this we are not often disappointed. Footnote. Notice the following from P.C. Remondandino, a study of the causes and nature of dipsomania, Quarterly Journal of Inebriety, Volume 23, page 136. It is curious to note the retroactive effects of music upon the emotions and the impulses as exemplified among different temperaments. Pathetic music will drive some to drink, and I have seen cases wherein the immediate individual emotional environments became so accentuated by the effect of this form of music as to bring on a sudden suicidal determination, just as the Marseilles spur all the latent belligerency of the French of the South into martial frenzy. As St. Augustine wisely observes, there are perils which we should not attempt to overcome, but wherein discretion is the better part of our valor, and where it is more prudent to flee. An emotional nature, which knows by experience that its poise cannot be disturbed without risks, should by all means avoid all causes of disturbance and not subject itself to any trials in which it will surely be vanquished, so that whatever the bard may say about the man who has no music in his soul, such dipsomaniacal natures had better avoid music that is not of the lightest order. End footnote. The genius or emotionally unbalanced suffer most in this particular, for alcohol provides the accelerating effects which such natures demand. Even if the effect is only temporary, and administers to a more depressed condition later. We have given a description of the emotional states of the alcoholic. We have endeavored to explain the cause for them. We have to look a little further at the relation of these emotional states to the other mental experiences. Perhaps sufficient has been said concerning the specific relations, but in general let us add that not only does general degeneration cause an emotional deterioration, but a derangement of the emotions is more wearing on the nervous system than perhaps any other mental disorder. So all the faculties suffer in a special degree if the emotions do. The emotions must depend upon all the other faculties. Memory will, imagination, intellection, and they will in turn depend upon the emotions. The ideas which produce the emotions are reciprocally acted upon and disturbed, so as to have the train of thought disarranged and disorganized. There is no cognition free from emotion, and no emotion free from cognition. Lote says, The force of ideas, therefore, seems to me to rest on their concatenation with emotions, and if I spoke of their strength, I should use the word merely to express the fact that they are victorious over others, and the understanding that their victory occurs in this way, and no other. This refers to the promotion power of emotion on the thoughts. So the emotions, according to their strength, have either an inhibiting or promoting effect upon the thoughts, and the effects on all the other mental states is far-reaching. We have tried to eliminate all discussions of theories in our treatment, except in so far as they directly concern our subject. We inevitably come in contact with one discussion to which, while we have treated the emotions without direct allusion, we now devote a small amount of space on account of the light which our subject may throw upon it. The discussion is between persons advocating different theories of the emotions. The arguments are centered now, as for the past few years, in the arena in which are placed what might be called, by way of distinction, the physiological and psychological theories. The former is young and strong. It appears in 1884, 
having been brought forth simultaneously independently by C. Lang and W. James. This theory in some form has been accepted by many psychologists, but the opposite theory is now gaining strength, for experimental evidence tends to confirm it. Footnote. In a recent lecture given at Yale University, Professor Sherrington of Liverpool stated that his experiments on animals confirmed the view of Professor Ladd rather than that of Professor James and Lang. End footnote. According to the theory of Professor James, the bodily changes follow directly the perception of the exciting fact, and what we call the emotion is solely the feeling originating in these organs. I now proceed to urge the vital point of my whole theory, which is this. If we fancy some strong emotion and then try to abstract from our consciousness of it all feeling of its bodily symptoms, we find we have nothing left behind. All psychologists will admit that the feeling from the different organs of the body are important factors in the emotion. That is not the dispute. The statement that the emotion consists of nothing, but this is the point where the disagreement arises. The opponents of this theory, chief among whom is Professor Ladd, would deny that because the organic feelings are inseparably connected with the emotion, they are the emotion. In a few words, we will endeavor to present Professor Ladd's theory. The occasion of the emotion may be a presentation, imagination, memory, or thought. Accompanying this is some form of feeling, which for some reason connected with the peculiar disposition of the individual, causes a fixation of the attention, and by the addition of the associated trains of mental images, the effective accompaniment is intensified. The physiological concomitant of this factor is a nerve storm in some limited portion of the brain, which quickly spreads to other centers, gathering intensity both physiologically and psychologically. In addition to the excitement of the brain itself, there is an unorganized surplus which overflows and sweeps down the different paths of exit upon the lower centers and upon the different systems of muscles, upon the vascular and secretive and respiratory systems. And then, from the peripheral parts, return currents sweep backward further to disturb the centers that lie within the brain. When the bodily organs react with special and a confused mass of sensations, a mixed feeling ensues, entailing the bodily organs and augmenting and heightening the original centrally initiated feelings. The emotion comes to be an extremely mixed and complicated state of consciousness and may for the time being occupy the whole field. This bodily resonance or somatic reaction is recognized as an important factor in the emotion, but only a factor and not the total content of feeling, for the feelings which are centrally initiated are also recognized. The discussion concerning these theories has been long and the arguments for and against manifold, but we cannot state them here, only in so far as our subject calls them forth. The contribution which alcoholism makes to the subject is twofold. In the first place, it does not seem that the expenditure of energy, which causes the great cerebral deterioration in alcoholism, is shown by peripheral reflexes and reactions. But to account for this, we must conclude that there is energy disseminated in the brain itself apart from that shown by the effect of the stimulation of the motor nerves. If this is so, it would pave the way for the view of centrally initiated feelings, as well as those feelings for which the periphery is responsible. The method of degeneration gives the other suggestion. Why should one set of emotions decline and not all? It cannot be that the peripheral organs are injured or the peripheral nerves deranged. For if this were so, the emotions as a whole would deteriorate according to both theories, which is not the case. The reason is that the higher centers in the brain are injured. These centers, which when excited, give rise to the feelings of the higher emotions as such. Having degenerated, they cannot entertain the peculiar modifications which are the basis of the emotions which depend on these centers. As will be readily seen, both of these suggestions favor the theory as set forth by Professor Ladd. The emotional degeneration brought about by the use of alcohol corresponds to the decline of the other mental states. The general bodily health influences the emotions more than the other faculties. By encouraging certain moods in the alcoholic, the higher altruistic emotions disappear and the strength of the whole nature goes into the lower selfish ones. 
In examining fear as an example, we found the law which applied to the degeneration as a whole. The decline of the emotions proves to be in inverse order to the acquisition by the race. The early memories are usually emotional ones, but the joyous emotions of youth do not appear with the sad ones. The emotional peculiarities of the individual have a great influence upon the question of continued and uncontrolled drinking. The quantity and quality of the blood, the state of the bodily organs, and other somatic factors have a great effect on the emotions of the alcoholic. The study of alcoholism contributes to the discussion of the theories of the emotions favoring that of centrally initiated feelings. End of chapter 6. Chapter 7 of The Psychology of Alcoholism by George Barton Cuton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Senses. In common with the other parts of the nervous system, the senses are affected by the continued indulgence in alcohol. The importance of the normal function of the senses is obvious. Locke's statement, which omits the activity of the mind, nevertheless contains its grain of truth. Nihil est in intellectu quod fuedit in sensu. If the senses are disorganized and disordered, the mind cannot otherwise perform its proper functions. Without exception, we do find injury to all the senses, and in advanced cases there does not appear to be any clear perception. The impairment is both cerebral and peripheral, sometimes showing itself more plainly in one particular and again in the other. Alcoholic neuritis has its effect upon every special sense, and this in turn may start hallucinations and illusions. The extent of the abnormality in the senses is shown by these more than any other way, for at times they are very persistent. The senses are often exaggerated at first, giving periods of hyperesthesia and hyperalgesia, but this is only temporary. It is soon followed by a deadening of the senses and a misinterpretation of the message which they wish to give. The affections of the eyes are the most common and most troublesome, and for that reason they will be given a more plenary treatment in this chapter. The relation to central disturbances will be given when discussing the injury to the eyes. This is applicable to all the senses, but is not repeated with the discussion of each one. Sight. Of the special senses affected by alcohol, sight suffers the most. This is seen not only in the hallucinations of vision, so common in most cases of alcoholic insanity, but in actual eye affections as the result of continued indulgence, and sometimes in total blindness. It is difficult to posit the specific cause in many cases, and while many investigators lay emphasis on total troubles, others again find the difficulty in central disorders. Footnote. W. L. Andreessen, 1903 Annual Meeting in the British Medical Association. British Medical Temperance Review, Volume 6, page 269. The condition of the chronic alcoholic was due not to changes in the periphery or cord, but in the brain. He had found in post-mortem examinations distinct evidence of changes in the cortex in those who had had visual hallucinations and had been able to confirm these before he knew the history of the case. End footnote. Probably both are right, for the influence of alcohol upon the nervous system both central and peripheral is well known, and this together with vascular disorders accounts for all the abnormalities which we are able definitely to trace. As with so many other disorders, we are not able to show a direct and proportionate relation between the known lesion and the recognized effect, nor in some cases are we able to detect any lesion at all. We will attempt to give some of the recognized physical changes due to alcohol. A very common and most serious change wrought by alcohol is the atrophy of the optic nerve and their terminations. According to a total of 166 cases, atrophy of the optic nerve, gathered by Galizowski, 9% are due to alcoholism. Utah refers most of the changes in vision to this cause. In reference to this, Spitzka reports the case of a gentleman in later years suffering from alcoholic dementia in whom the distinguished ophthalmologist Knapp discovered atrophy of both optic nerves some years before marked mental impairment had set in. This is usually shown in the discs. Sometimes 
in only one or again in both eyes. It commences with simple congestion, uniform redness of the disc with softened edges, gradually passing into neuritis or papillitis with paler discs and slight oedema. This condition of neuritis is found in chronic alcoholism, and in post-mortem examination shows itself in thickened and opaque meninges. Utoff examined a thousand cases of severe alcoholism in inmates of asylums and found that 13.9 of these suffered from pathological whiteness of the temporal half of each disc, with a central scotoma in every case. He found this condition in only one out of every hundred apparently healthy men whom he selected for comparison. Moreover, Moiley has stated that he has detected changes in the optic disc in 15% of the cases of delirium tremens examined by him. When the condition of the nerve has been ascertained by microscopical examination, granular degeneration of the nerve fibers has been found in some cases. Out of seven cases examined, post-mortem by Utoff, two showed interstitial neuritis with marked increase of the connective tissue. The changes were most distinct just back of the globe and did not extend far back. As the trouble progresses, atrophy follows the neuritis. In addition to disease, nerve, and disc, we find that at times there is a pathological condition of the retina. The neuritis may cause some changes to the retina. As example given, white spots, but a few cases of double retinitis have also been noticed in chronic alcoholism. Milder affections of the retina are more common. Dr. Gowers reports one which we quote, in a fatal case of alcoholism, Lawford found during life widespread cloudiness of the retina with normal discs and without any central color scotoma. After death, the retina of one eye was examined by Edmonds himself. There was oedema of the nerve fiber and ganglion cell layers, and in the outer nuclear layer there were spaces filled with a clear effusion between the mullein fibers. Footnote. Acute alcoholism does not often exhibit any eye disorders but Jagger found a case of retinitis in delirium tremens." And footnote. The change in the pupil is quite noticeable, but the descriptions vary, the agreement being that they are not normal. They may be dilated or contracted, and may or may not fail to react to light in accommodation. Footnote. D. H. Took, Alcoholism, Dictionary of Psychological Medicine says, pupils are dilated and do not react well to light changes. T. L. Brutton says, the face and pupil in alcoholic neuritis, British Medical Journal says, I have noticed that the reflex of the pupil to light is rapid and extensive, whereas the contraction of the pupil on accommodation to a near object is slight and sluggish, or entirely wanting. Indeed, in one or two cases I observed a dilation instead of contraction on accommodation. End footnote. Hislop affirms that where there is a failure of reaction to light, Regardless of whether the pupils are dilated or contracted, there is almost invariably a history of syphilis in addition to that of alcohol. Inequality is present in about 40% of the cases, and irregularity of the margin is also comparatively frequent. The inequality of the pupils is not so significant as the failure to react to light. The cornea may also be affected so that its transparency is duller. On account of the appearance of eye catarrh, during delirium tremens, disappearing with a critical termination, some have concluded that the alcoholic poison has an inflammatory effect upon the conjunctiva similar to certain bacterial poisons. The most common disease of alcoholism is called amblyopia, which may precede any ophthalmoscopic change. It is more common in regular than periodic drinkers. It varies in degree from a slight dimness of vision to dullness and defect in the recognition of certain colors. Tobacco amblyopia is well recognized and is so similar that some observers affirm that tobacco is the sole cause, most alcoholics being also users of tobacco. The alcoholic cause, however, seems to be well established now. Galazowski found dyschromatopia for green and violet which he looked upon as a symptom of retinal anesthesia. Before the defect for white light is recognizable, the vision for red may be found defective, extending over that portion of the eye from the fovea centralis to the blind spot. At first, this can only be tested at very short distances. Both the red and green appear as different shades of gray, 
The field of vision may be restricted for a time, but recovery is frequent. It is not on account of a revival of sensitive consciousness that the railroad directors have begun a rather sudden crusade against the use of intoxicating liquors and tobacco by employees engaged in operating trains, but it is the recent recognition of this disease of amblyopia as a result of these indulgences that has been the cause of the strict orders in regard to the use of these things. The central scotoma, which deprives the patient of the recognition of red and green, is disastrous to the railroad employees, for these two colors are the ones most exclusively used in operating trains. So insidious is the appearance of this disease that only an accident may reveal to the engineer that he is unable to recognize the signals. Of course, there are other reasons on the part of the directors for their desire to be rid of drinking men and intoxicating men they will not tolerate. But this one reason is enough to discourage the employment of tipplers. De Schwanitz shows the relative proportion of causes of toxic amblyopia in the following table. Footnote. G. E. de Schwanitz, the toxic amblyopias. See also the toxic amblyopias being a review of some recent literature on the subject. Ophthalmic record, April 1902, where he says, On this point, the statics of Adler are important. Among 100 private patients, he concludes that alcohol was the greatest factor in 86%, but nearly all the patients smoked more or less. Only 4% maintained that they were non-smokers. In 12%, the patients smoked and did not drink. In his hospital practice, there were... 19% of nicotine amblyopias and 81% of alcohol amblyopias, but he frankly admits that the testimony of the patients, insofar as their habits were concerned, was not trustworthy. Utah's examinations of 327 cases of intoxication amblyopia revealed a pure tobacco amblyopia in 41 cases. The remaining 286 were divided about equally into cases of alcohol amblyopia alone or when alcohol was the most potent factor in cases subject to the mixed influence of alcohol and tobacco. End footnote. Table. Alcohol 64, alcohol and tobacco 45, tobacco 23, diabetes 3, the sulfide of carbon 2, lead 1, for a total of 138. We can see how potent alcohol is in the production of this disease which is recognized by all authorities to be followed by such grave consequences. Footnote. See Richet Alcohol's Dictionary de Physiology, Volume 1, page 241, says something or other in French. Notice also the following from Solberg Wells on the diseases of eye, page 449. This toxic effect may be produced by alcohol, tobacco, lead, or quinine. The amblyopia met with in drunkards, amblyopia potatorum, generally recognizes with the appearance of a mist or cloud before the eyes, which more or less surrounds and shrouds the object, rendering it hazy and indistinct. In some cases, the impairment becomes so that only the largest print can be deciphered, but the sight may be completely lost. End footnote. Recently, a number of cases of amaurosis have been reported caused by methyl alcohol. The same effect has been produced by inhalation as by drinking. Of the former method of receiving the blinding effect, most cases concerning which publicly has been given has been in men who have been employed in shellacking beer vats, where the shellac was mixed with Colombian spirits. Ventilation of the vats was almost completely shut off. In one case, the patient was completely blind for one week, then improved so that he could distinguish large objects, when again vision began to fail. Cases of death and blindness are not uncommon, as a result of drinking wood alcohol. In this case, the patient, a woman, drank a bottle of clear alcohol and woke blind after a stupor of several hours. She afterwards partially covered her vision. In many cases of blindness following the drinking of essence of peppermint and Jamaica ginger, it is probable that the effect has been produced by the presence of methyl alcohol in the mixture, substituted by unscrupulous manufacturers on account of its cheapness. No case of amaurosis has been noticed by the writer as a result of drinking ordinary alcoholic beverages, but only the stronger forms, either pure or ethyl alcohol, or some liquid which contains methyl alcohol. Nystagmus has been also observed 
in a few instances of alcoholism, but some doubt if it was caused by alcohol. Berkeley, however, says it is not uncommon, owing to the defective innervation of antagonistic eye muscles. In a reported case of tea intoxication, nystagmus was present in both eyes. In indirect as well as direct ways, the effect of alcohol on the sight of chronic drinkers is seen. Dr. Gould, in a lecture in Cleveland in 1903, says, The enormous waste for alcoholic drinks during the past year can be traced in at least one-tenth of the actual loss to the evil effects of eye strain on the nervous system and digestive organs. The sleepiness and irritation with disturbed digestion, described by the term nervousness, headache, biliousness, is traceable to eye strains. While the effect on the eyes might be considered one of the lesser evil results of alcohol, any disorder caused upon so important and useful an organ as the eye must be recognized as of great moment. Some interest has been taken in the effect of small doses of alcohol upon the sight on persons who do not ordinarily indulge in alcohol, as well as in alcoholics. In some experiments conducted by Ridge, ten subjects were used. They were first tested by noting the distance at which a row of letters could be read with one eye. Then two drachms of alcohol were given in most cases, and experiments made on the same eye of each individual with the letters rearranged. On an average, everyone had to approach near in order to distinguish the same letters, the general average without alcohol being 9.375 feet, and with alcohol 8.538, that is, the distance had to be shortened 9%. In the very thorough experiments made by Kraepelin, with a normal vision would enable him to read letters one half inch long at a distance of 30 feet. One half hour after an ounce of spirits had been given, the distance at which the letters could be read was 18 to 20 feet. That is, the distance had been shortened 35%. In these experiments, more alcohol had been given than in the experiments by Ridge. In Kraepelin's experiments, it was seen that forms and shapes were blurred and indistinct except when seen very near. Colors distinguishable before alcohol was given were found to be obscured or lost altogether afterwards. Red lines had faded away and were totally obliterated, showing effect upon the central part of the eye. In 1895, Rees made some interesting experiments on eye measurements under the influence of alcohol. His apparatus consisted of a strip of wood one meter in length the divisions of which were marked on the opposite side from the observer. A sliding marker was moved until the subject judged the pointer had reached the center of the bar. Equal illumination on both halves and a good light were provided. Ten readings were taken in every trial, the pointer starting alternatively from left and right sides. The mean variable error was computed for every trial. In the normal trials, the mean variance was 0.19 centimeters. Fifteen minutes after, 80 cc's of 95% alcohol, properly diluted and sweetened, were taken. It was found that mean variance was 0.44 centimeters, and one half hour later, the mean variance was 0.4 centimeters. 20 minutes later, a second dose of the same amount was taken. Directly after the second dose, mean variance was 0.46 centimeters, and the latter result was 0.9 centimeters. The trials were discontinued as soon as symptoms of mild intoxication appeared. Further experiments confirmed these results. In some experiments with wine, the error was not increased so much as with the pure alcohol. The experiment showed between normal and alcoholic influence the following differences respectively. Mean variance of 0.1 cm to 0.42 cm and mean variance of 0.1 cm to 0.64 cm and mean variance of 0.2 centimeters to 0.69 centimeters. Abel speaks of the results of alcoholic indulgence which he observed while attending a sportsman's tournament where experts were competing in a live bird match. I was struck with the quick and accurate shooting of a man who, on inquiry, was found to be a shot of national reputation. After this man had not missed the bird in some 20-odd shots, I observed that he laid down his gun and went to the building containing the bar room. I followed and observed him in the act of tossing off a glass of whiskey. Once more, an hour later, he made a trip to the restaurant. The effect of the whiskey was soon shown by numerous misses, and at the close of the day's shooting, this man was fourth on the list. The first prize having been won by a stolid-looking man who had made 
no trips after whiskey. The effects of these disorders are seen in all forms of chronic alcoholism, and in alcoholic insanity we find many more perversions of sight than in other forms of insanity. Hallucinations and illusions of sight are very frequent, being usually fleeting and terrifying. Objects may become confused and colors altered. Musque volitantes, with the clouds and mists accompanying figures, lines, and flying things, strange floating forms at first when the eyes are closed, and afterwards, even when the eyes are open, are the basis of illusions and give rise to delusions. Footnote F.E. Anstey, Alcoholism, Reynolds System of Medicine, Volume 2, page 152, says, Flashes of light are a more serious phenomena in their occurrence at night, just before the patient drops into his first uneasy half-slumber, is frequently the immediate precursor of the more definite visual hallucinations. End footnote. The chapter of insanity will give the reader a better description of the nature of these hallucinations and illusions. In dealing with the disorders of the sense of sight, we have so far been concerned with the end organ only, but undoubtedly the central disturbances are equally great. Although it may be more difficult to localize them from a physical standpoint, we must recognize that no perception can take place, that we cannot see anything without an intellectual element entering into the process. All perception is interpretation, and from partial or mistaken interpretation, all degrees and kinds of hallucinations and illusions result. Any injury to the brain which would affect any portion of the optic centers would certainly affect the perception of things as far as sight is concerned, fully as much as injury to the eye. If the ideas for which the optical images stand have a still different center, and the optical impulses must be carried from this center to the centers for the ideas in general, then any interference with the association fibers connecting these two centers must be disastrous to the visual perception of things, regardless of the condition of the eye. Thus we have what has been called psychic blindness by some writers, in distinction from sensorial blindness the former being some difficulty with the association fibers connecting the optic and ideational centers, so that a sensation cannot be correctly interpreted. The latter, some impairment of the end organ preventing a correct or perfect sensation reaching the optic centers. It is easy to lay too much emphasis upon this distinction, for the two are so closely connected, and sight is not possible without the ideational connection. There are not two kinds of vision corresponding to this division of blindness, but only one, and any attempt to think of vision without the intellectual element is liable to give us a false psychology of sight. And further, in psychic blindness we cannot be sure that the end organs do give us a perfect sensation. In regard to some other defects, we are liable to lay undue emphasis upon the condition of the eyes, forgetting the part which the centers have to play. It is quite as certain that some forms of color blindness have central origin, as that they arise from an abnormal condition of the retina, and on the other hand, some flashes of light, which the patient claims to have seen in his hallucinations, may not be hallucinations, but some internal stimulation of the optic nerve due to the pathological condition of the nerve or the retina. So much of a unit is the whole nervous mechanism and the organ for stimulating it, that it is difficult to say at any time the trouble is here and nowhere else. Knowing as we do the condition of the brain, we can certainly say that the association tracts are not in a normal condition, and also that both the optic center and the ideational center are abnormal. With these physical bases in the brain in a pathological condition, we can posit another reason for abnormal sight. We fall back again on our old example of fatigue. We know that when the retina is fatigued, there are important modifications of the sensations of light and color. The brain cells in alcoholism were found to be similar to the condition of the fatigue cell, and the retina would probably respond to alcohol as the brain cells do. If this is so, we can point out a direct connection between the effect of alcohol disorders of sight and the alcoholized condition of the cells of the retina. The movement of the eyes with tired and lame muscles increases the size of the perceived object. And from what we know of the effect of alcohol upon the capacity of any of the muscles for work, we can say that the eye muscles in common with the others must be in a tired condition. And as paralyzed eye muscles interfere with localization, we must expect some result of the localizing power 
from our knowledge of the effect of alcoholic indulgence upon these muscles. In the inability of the eyes to react to accommodation, we have a further reason for a perversion of sight. The writer well remembers an experience of lack of accommodation. Looking out of the window at a distant object, suddenly he saw an immense bird some distance away of such large proportions that he was startled, but was so reassured a moment later to find that it was a fly which had passed in the line of vision not far from his eyes. Judging from this, the lack of accommodation may be a potent influence in determining the nature of the alcoholic's delusion, or in starting his hallucinations and illusions. The disturbance of the circulation, both central and peripheral, probably has an effect upon the functions so as to give abnormal impressions. We must go still further in our search for a cause for these frequent disorders of sight in the alcoholic. So unified are the mental processes, so dependent is one upon all the others, that no portion of the mind can be affected without its having a corresponding effect upon the others. Thus, as memory, imagination, judgment, feeling, and will are all necessary to correct perception, so any derangement of these parts of the mind affects visual perception. It is hardly necessary to point out the dependence of perception upon memory. We see things, we know them to be certain things, because we remember the idea which a certain sensation conveyed to us before. Further, we are able to see certain distances on account of our memory of former experiences. The element of suggestion is dependent on past memories, and also has in it the element of imagination. We see what we imagine regarding the relations of space. Here the basis of hallucinations and illusions come in, and the basis of normal perception as well. To the work of the judgment we have already referred, in the connection of the optic with the ideational center, every perception is a form of judgment regarding the sensation received. The effect of feeling is indirectly noticed, principally in its relation to attention. Our feelings concerning an object in a measure determine our perception of it or the part of the object which we see. Directly the feelings tend to quicken the perception, sometimes to such an extent as to make it erroneous. By will we exclude the extraneous objects so that we can fix our attention upon the thing which we wish. By the aid of the will we also mix colors, fuse images, make ourselves see things as we know they ought to be, and we find frequently that voluntary attention is necessary for correct accommodation. With visual perception depending upon these other faculties of mind, is it any wonder that the alcoholic cannot see well? We know that he is not normal in any one of these particulars, so we must come to the inevitable conclusion that were his eyes perfect, he would still be unable to see correctly. Hearing. The sense of hearing is interfered with by alcohol as are all the senses, but not so seriously as the sight. Most authorities on alcohol agree that the hearing becomes less acute and that there are minor troubles, but no autologist claim any specific disease which is caused by alcoholism. Some mention the effects of alcohol on sight and hearing as if they were equally serious, but this is not the case. For alcohol is responsible for considerable partial or total blindness, but no deafness at all is caused directly by alcohol. There are, however, some disorders of hearing but they appear to be largely of central origin. At least the end organ is not injured as in the case of the eye. The auditory nerve may be injured, but probably the centers of hearing are more seriously affected. Footnote. N. Kerr, Inebriety, page 98. The sense of hearing is apt to be seriously impaired. The impairment of the various senses usually arises, not so much from the organs of sensation as from the paralysis of the nerve apparatus. And footnote. Special and extraordinary sounds, such as a buzzing or rushing wind in the ears, singing, humming, booming as of distant guns, the chime of half-heard bells, whistling monotones, and inarticulate voices are heard, and if continued may become the basis of hallucinations and illusions, and later of delusions. These sounds are frequently accompanied by a dull, diffuse headache. It seems that hallucinations and illusions of hearing develop in proportion to the diminution of auditory acuteness, and, as will be seen in the chapter of insanity, these illusions and auditory disturbances tend to engender delusions of persecutions, enemies, ghosts, and wild beasts. These hallucinations and illusions are not 
so frequent in acute cases, but when there is a tendency to chronicity, they are relatively more often noticed. There is, however, a more direct effect on the hearing, as can be seen by the two following quotations. In a certain number of cases, inflammation of the middle ear, frequent taking of the stronger alcoholic drinks undiluted, contributes very apparently towards the keeping of the pharyngeal mucous membrane in an irritated condition. If the patient is allowed to continue the habit, the physician will find it an uphill task to cure the oral disease. Those which act most prominently in the latter capacity as exciting causes to chronic catarrh of the middle ear are dietetic excesses and particularly the immoderate use of alcohol and tobacco. It can thus be seen that alcoholic indulgence may act as a contributing cause to certain inflammatory conditions of the middle ear, but apart from these, the effect seems to be almost wholly central. The central disturbance of the vascular system is probably a cause of certain of the noises heard in the ears. Footnote. A. Gustafson, The Foundation of Death, page 133, says, Noises and ringing and buzzing sounds are heard in the head, now suddenly and for brief periods, again for longer or even very long periods of time. The cause of these sounds is simple enough. The arterial tension being reduced, the blood flowing through the internal carotid arteries into the skull through the bony channel called the carotid canal, presses on the walls of the relaxed vessel, dilated under the pressure of the blood, and conveys vibration from the pressure of the blood to the walls of the bony canal. The vibration is communicated direct to the immediately contiguous auditory apparatus, and thus every movement of the blood becomes a murmur of sound, varied in intensity and quality by the varying tension of the artery. End footnote. The hyperemia, the immediate effect of alcohol in the system, causes at times tinnitus and sometimes vertigo, and the anemia, the result of the pathological changes in the blood vessels, produces giddiness or subjective noises, with or without impairment of hearing. With the vascular system in the abnormal condition, which we know it to be, with the constant anemia in some parts and the occasional hyperemia, the various noises seem to be accounted for as far as their initiation is concerned. Meningitis frequently brings on unilateral or bilateral deafness due either to the inflammatory changes in the corresponding nerves in the cranium or to an extension of the inflammatory process to the labyrinth. The meningitis found in the alcoholic may cause the lack of acuity of hearing or the periodic deafness seen in some patients with the disturbance of the central cells and association tracts, which, in regard to deafness, is the most serious trouble. It is not necessary for us to deal for the description of the central influences which has been given in dealing with sight. It is equally applicable here. If the center is diseased, we cannot hope for the correct interpretation of the sensations, no matter how perfect the end organ may be. In the experiments made with small doses of alcohol, we see the same market effect, which was apparent with sight. Kraepelin's experiment showed that where normally the sound of a watch ticking could be heard at 30 or 40 inches from the ear, in a half hour after the alcohol was taken, the watch must be moved to within 10 to 15 inches. Certain sounds could not be distinguished, and certain tones were confused or lost. This was especially true of musical tones. The intoxicated man usually speaks several keys higher than natural, because he is deaf and cannot hear his own voice except by speaking in a higher key. Smell and Taste Perversions of smell and taste are not so common or so oppressive as those of other senses, yet they do occur and are more frequent in alcoholic than in other forms of insanity. They are usually found in the later stages of alcoholism and are considered by some to be very serious symptoms. Winslow says, in all cases of excessive indulgence in alcohol that I have seen, in which the senses of taste and smell are deranged, either in a small degree or by total deprivation of the same, it is a clear indication that the brain itself is affected. There are frequently dietetic delusions on account of these disorders, and the alcoholic may become very fussy concerning his food, or refuse to touch it on account of a strange taste and smell which he may interpret as poison. He may experiment with different kinds of food to minister to a varying appetite, 
as he craves one article of food at one time and then another. Dr. Hislop tells us perversions of taste may arise in many ways and are commonly associated with alcoholism. The perversion may take the form of a morbid exaggeration of all gustatory sensations, but much more frequently the sense of taste is diminished or absent. Paraguza is seen in nearly every form of insanity, and in alcoholism it usually takes the form of complaints that poison or filth is put in the food. Perversions of smell, especially when there is an olfactory stimulation proceeding from a distorted stomach, may take the form of offensive and foul odors, to which false subjective significance is given. Among the total disorders, the abnormal taste and smell form a small part of the trouble, as with the other perversions of sense, central disturbances are an important part of the disorder, although the local effect may also be important. Tea tasters and expert smellers of essences and perfumes find that alcohol incapacitates them for their specific work while it may not interfere with their other duties. It is probable that the local action of the alcohol on the throat and mouth is as much responsible for this as the cerebral effects. In 1851, Frolic made experiments on smell giving 200 cc of 40% solution, which produced narcotizing effects in 10 minutes. When tested 10 minutes after alcohol was taken, the subject could better detect pure odors like musk than when normal but he was not nearly so sensitive to substances which irritated as well as produced an odor as ammonia. An hour after alcohol was taken, the subject found it difficult to differentiate substances with pure odors closely allied, and it required longer to form a judgment regarding a given odor of pure quality. Vapors of ammonia, strong enough to cause frequent sneezing, were hardly noticeable. In the experiments of Kraepelin and others, it was found that the sensation of taste were deranged. The quantity of flavoring substances used in mixtures containing bitters, salts, acids detected by normals had to be increased from one-third to one-half after an ounce of alcohol had been taken. The odor of carbolic acid, which was readily discerned normally, was unrecognized at a short distance and only faintly perceived when brought up closely after alcohol had been taken. The effects on both taste and smell lasted some hours. Touch the skin seems to be affected by alcoholism next seriously to sight. Common cutaneous sensibility and tactile sensibility are both disordered, sometimes to such an extent as to be, like sight, the basis of hallucinations and illusions, and later of delusion. The exaggeration of sensibility seems to be confined to the skin, for none of the other senses show this phenomena to any appreciable extent. This hyperesthesia of the skin or the deep parts, is common at the beginning of chronic alcoholism, and at a more advanced stage, anesthesia is noticed. Sometimes in this hyperesthesia, mere contact will cause a sensation as of burning, or of a sharp cutting edge. And one case is reported where the patient was troubled with what Fisher called polyesthesia, in which one point is recognized as two or three points. In some cases, the hyperesthesia is general. In others, it is distributed indiscriminately in patches over the surface of the body. These patches may also present the phenomena of hyperalgesia. The exaggeration of the sensibility of the skin probably corresponds to the beginning of the vascular disorders, when the presence of the alcoholic poison in the blood and insufficient nourishment irritate the central nerve cells and cause them to overact. Besides this effect upon the central nerve cells, the peripheral nerve cells and their endings may also become particularly sensitive to impressions. When, however, this tingling, burning, and stinging are attributed to the power of electricity and witchcraft, we must consider the lesions to be more especially of a central character. As nutrition is further withheld from the nerve cells, altered metabolism results, and we find anesthesia and analgesia. This is at first temporary, but becomes more permanent rarely becoming complete. It is shown mostly in delayed and imperfect perceptions. Sometimes this is observed in the form of unilateral hemianesthesia, or it may be local or general. There may be a numbness or tingling accompanying this anesthesia, which is found almost entirely in the extremities, especially the legs. 
in addition to the exaggeration and diminution of sensibility, there is frequently noticed perversions of senses such as formications, sensations of cold, hot flushings, feelings of needles and pins, and tingling. Not infrequently, very severe pains and cramps are felt, especially in the extremities, due to neuritis, according to most authorities. Footnote. H. D. Rolleston, Alcoholism, a System of Medicine, all but volume 3, page 855, says concerning the pains that they appear to be neuralgic and gouty rather than the result of definite neuritis. And footnote. Whatever the cause, they are extremely severe and difficult to eliminate. Peripheral neuritis is one of the common disorders of alcoholism, and much of the trouble with the different senses is due to it. It is found more commonly in female alcoholics, some authorities giving the ratio of 3 to 1. The sensations of temperature are also abnormal. The hallucinations and illusions arising in connection with disordered cutaneous sensations are almost characteristic of alcoholics. Waves of goose flesh suggest snakes and itching suggest ants, etc. The central disturbances are as prominent here as in connection with the other senses. In 1851, Lichterfeld's made some experiments giving 40 grams of pure alcohol and 160 cc of water. Ten minutes later he found that the dorsal surface of the forearm could not perceive compass points until they were 55 millimeters apart, which could be distinguished only 34 millimeters apart when normal. One hour after taking alcohol, the points had to be separated 60 millimeters. In 1882, Ridge made some experiments, not using the ordinary as the SCO meter, but a piece of apparatus where the middle point between two others was to be determined by the forefinger, passed through a hole so that the points were invisible. The subject himself moved the central point. A dial was constructed on the opposite side, recording the number of degrees of error. The subjects were normal averaged, with five trials each, 23 degrees of error. After two drachms of alcohol were given, the same subjects with the same number of trials averaged 38 degrees of error. In 1884, E. Kramer made experiments in which he found that on the thighs, the sensitiveness of the skin to compass points fell after alcohol was given from 4.2 to 5.8 centimeters, and on the anterior portions of the leg below the knee from 3.2 to 6 centimeters. Ten minutes after alcohol was given, the lowered sensibility was noticed. In these experiments, we must make some allowance for the flushing of the skin as a result of the alcohol. For hyperemia and anemia of the skin lower its ability to discriminate points. In experiments by Kraepelin and others, the temperature sense was found to be disordered by alcohol. The capacity to distinguish bulbs of hot and cold water placed on the skin was lower, for normally they could be distinguished when only an inch apart, but after taking alcohol, they had to be separated by two or more inches. Rough and smooth surfaces were also confused. Hyperesthesia was found to exist in some cases for the first half hour. Then anesthesia lasted one or two hours. The skin sensations were deranged at much longer time than sight or hearing. Muscular sense. The so-called muscular sense, by which weights are distinguished, comprising a number of different sensations from skin, tendons, muscles, etc., is impaired as are the other varieties and sensations. This may be so severe that the patient is unable to tell his exact attitude, the position of his limbs, or the direction and extent of his movements. A center called kinesthetic is posited by some, and this would naturally be involved in the disorders of the sense. The nature of these sensations is so complex that it forbids any exhaustive treatment of them here. In experiments by Lewis, with Galton's apparatus for testing the discrimination of weights, it was found that there was a distinct impairment of this muscular sense in the alcoholic. In some cases, considerable difference in weights could not be distinguished. In Ridge's experiments in 1882, both small and large doses showed an effect upon the discrimination between weights. The average showed that the sensibility was diminished about one-third by alcoholic indulgence in amounts differing from one-half to four drachms. In 1893 to 1894, Jacob made some experiments in muscular sense and found that small differences in weights were estimated 
more accurately after a small quantity of alcohol than in a normal condition. This he thought was caused by the paralyzing action of alcohol on one of the cerebral processes involved in the final judgment. He affirmed that sensations arising from the tension of tendons have, as such, no influence on the formation of a judgment of the differences between two weights. He assumed that judgment is formed by mental comparison of the amount of innervation expended in the overcoming the resistance offered. With the time that elapses between the moment of the outgoing muscular impulse and the actual occurrence of the resulting movement, when the factor of time reaches a minimum, the ability to distinguish weight ceases. Alcohol prolongs time, and hence makes discrimination more accurate. Large quantities depress mental functions so that discrimination ceases, and one is not able to distinguish differences between weights. In this chapter on the senses, we have found the sight to be most seriously affected. This is exhibited in different cases by atrophy of the optic nerve and its terminations, changes in the pupils, eye catarrh, and other disorders. Amblyopia is the chief disease, but amaurosis and nystagmus are less frequently present. The results of numerous experiments have proved the loss of function by the use of alcohol. The central disturbances are important in the disorders of all the senses. In hearing especially, the central troubles are largely the causes of any abnormality. Perversions of smell and taste are dangerous symptoms and comparatively common in alcoholic cases. Touch and the muscular sense are also found to be affected. Experiments with all the senses show the frequently exaggerated sensibility with small doses of alcohol when first taken, but a deadening and lack of sensitiveness as the indulgence progresses. End of chapter 7 Chapter 8, Part 1 of The Psychology of Alcoholism by George Barton Cuton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Morals In glancing at the title of this chapter, it may seem out of place in a work on psychology. To discuss it fully, it undoubtedly would be, but we wish only to discuss the psychological aspect of the subject in our treatment here. Psychology is concerned with what is, and not what ought to be, so we wish to give not the theory, but the facts of ethics only in so far as they affect our subject. Every person who is developed normally is supposed to be equipped morally, at least that is our supposition in this chapter. He is thereby capable of moral conduct, and if capable, is more or less responsible for his actions. We recognize the development of the moral equipment and must also admit the possibility of degeneration. The latter occurs to such an extent at times that we do not hold persons responsible for their actions. Thus we class together the infant, whose faculties are not developed sufficiently to allow of moral conduct, and the person suffering from senile dementia, whose faculties have degenerated and declined so that he is a child again. Neither of these persons is held responsible for conduct. We also consider incapable of moral conduct the person whose mind is so affected as to be considered insane. He is equally irresponsible. One of the chief questions which will come before us in this chapter is this. Is the alcoholic responsible for his conduct? This will be discussed under two divisions. First, is the alcoholic responsible for his deeds either when drunk or sober? And second, is he responsible for getting intoxicated? The answers to these questions will help us to classify alcoholism, for it has in the past been classed very largely according to the profession or views of the person dealing with it. The clergyman called it a sin, the physician classed it among the diseases, the lawyer said it was a crime, and the social reformer named it a vice. It cannot very well be all of these at once, but it may be a combination of two or even more. Besides the question of responsibility, we wish to treat the general moral condition of the alcoholic, as far as his excesses have caused a change from the normal moral states, endeavoring to assign causes as far as we can. Not even here can we escape the influence of the physical upon the mental, but we find that the general health, as well as the condition of the brain, has much to do with the moral conduct of man. We shall also endeavor to show the influence of the degenerate condition of the other mental faculties upon the moral, as well as the reciprocal action of the defective morals upon them. Let us turn to the facts of the moral life, as they are exhibited in those 
who have indulged in excessive use of alcohol for a prolonged time. It would seem that when dealing with the morals, we were entirely out of the realm of the physical. But here, even in this higher life of man, the influence of the physical not only cannot be ignored, as it is by many writers on moral conduct, but it must take an important part. As has been so well said, it is not enough to say that passion is strengthened and will weaken by indulgence, as a moral effect, that it is so no doubt, but beneath the effect there lies the deeper fact of physical deterioration of the nerve element, for the alcohol and opium enter the blood, are carried by it to the inmost minute recesses of the brain, and act there injuriously upon the elements of the exquisitely delicate structures. So its finest, latest organized, least stable parts, which subserve moral feeling and supreme will, are marred. We might be criticized for saying that most misconduct is the result of pathological states. Probably this is making the statement too strong. If that were so, we would not have so much need of the moralist as of the physician to bring about the ideal life. Let us invert and modify the statement in this way. All pathological bodily states have a tendency to lead, yes, force, the person experiencing them, away from the moral life. Footnote. P.C. Remondino, A Study of the Causes and Nature of Dipsomania, Quarterly Journal of Inebriety, Volume 23, page 137, says, Morality and its offspring, chastity, sobriety, industry, wealth, comfort, and respectability are not, after all, as they are too often represented, such heaven-born attributes as any accidental shifting of our bodily health or physical condition may quickly make or unmake them. An accident or illness may convert the most philanthropic or benign individual into a cruel and rapacious pirate, or a like accident may convert a cruel and vicious debauchee into an evangelist. End footnote. Some of the best persons we know are intense sufferers from somatic diseases, but they are good notwithstanding their ill health rather than because of it. It requires a sound mind for the best moral life. It requires a sound body for the best mental life. It is but stating a fact with which we are all familiar, to say that a poor breakfast, a sore finger, indigestion, and other irritating bodily conditions have an effect upon conduct. Not that they are the exciting causes of crime or immorality, but rather that they influence the person as far as mood is concerned and a very insignificant stimulus is then sufficient to precipitate an immoral action. Investigations recently made on the relation between conduct and the weather show that inclement weather of any kind is concomitant with the marked increase in crime, as provided by the police records, and the conduct of children in the schools. The reserve energy is demanded when the weather is disagreeable and produces a condition similar to that of fatigue. Emotional states are plainly influenced, and as far as they have effect upon the conduct, it is detrimental. In the case of the weather, it is the loss of the reserve energy producing a change in the emotions that to a large extent is the cause of the harmful influence on the conduct. It is noticeable in direct connection with our subject that drunkenness is increased on very cold days, in days when humidity is excessive. High winds also have a great tendency to augment the number of cases of drunkenness. Drunkenness was increased one-third when the temperature was near zero, or when the winds were very high. We might expect this result at the time of very cold weather, on account of the stimulating effect which alcohol produces when first taken, and the paralyzing effect which it has in large quantities. Both results would help the alcoholic to forget the cold. Very many other examples will occur to everyone from his own experience, of the effect of physical states and conditions upon the conduct. So in dealing with the result of the physical condition upon conduct, we are entirely within our sphere. The effects of the deterioration of the different faculties upon the conduct will now be considered. We found a serious deterioration of the memory, especially of recent events, in that an alcoholic was living largely in his remote past, that is, in his childhood. Amnesia, particularly of the feelings, is a great drawback to conduct, for, as with the alcoholic, both the bodily feelings caused by overindulgence, that is, nausea and pain, and those feelings of remorse, which accompany the uncomfortable bodily feelings being forgotten, there is lacking a great incentive to sobriety. This feeling of remorse, let us explain here, is not caused by the moral considerations involved, 
not that he has injured his family or society, not that he has done something that he knows is not right, but he is sorry because he has been sick and is inconvenienced thereby. This remorse invariably follows sickness brought on by overindulgence. These feelings, which would be some incentive to control, being forgotten, and only the ever-present desire for stimulation being present, the alcoholic gets no help as far as the memory of the feelings is concerned. The childhood memories being an important factor in his life, and these not being of a developed moral character, we cannot expect the alcoholic's moral nature to be strong through memory. Children are innocent not because of their exalted characters, but because they are impotent. A person with a man's power and a child's character would be an exceedingly dangerous individual. Slightly modified, this is the alcoholic's condition. The judgment is so affected as to leave the alcoholic in such a condition that he is largely unable to judge right and wrong, or if he is able to judge the end and has will enough to put it into execution, he is not able to judge well the means. About his work, as well as in his morals, he goes the longest way around to accomplish anything. He will not use what judgment he has about particular things. He, in common with all others, admits that it is wrong to get drunk, but he does not intend to get drunk. He only wants one drink, or a second drink. He does not judge regarding this particular drink, or if he does, he judges incorrectly. He wants it to strengthen him, to steady him, or even to give him courage and strength enough to resolve to take no more. His reasoning is not sound, and if you present the most logical arguments, he either draws a wrong conclusion or else admits your conclusion in an uninterested, listless manner. Only a rational being can be moral. One must be able to reason from cause to effect to reach an approximately moral life. The alcoholic does not do this. Perhaps he does not recognize the inevitable conclusion of the life he is leading. He may be led astray by false hopes of a better constitution, not drinking so much, drinking different beverages, or many other circumstances, which separate him from his friend in like distress. These reasons may seem puerile. They are, but not to him. He does not perceive the relations correctly. He must use his judgment to determine the possibility of an action, for we can only be held responsible for conduct which it is possible to accomplish. He judges many things impossible of attainment, simply on account of his own inertia and lack of force. Further, in the earlier stages of judgment, with children or savages, feelings largely, if not wholly, determine the judgment. A judgment is scarcely more than a declaration of feelings. The alcoholic, being childlike, is thus devoid to a great extent of true judgment, being led by his feelings to a further indulgence, regardless of the moral or utilitarian aspect. Being in this condition, we cannot expect him to possess those virtues which come as a result of a sound judgment. In our study of the emotions, we found that they follow the common law of degeneration, the higher developed, more complexly stable ones going first. The higher feelings which tend to assist the moral nature are among the first victims. We also found that all the emotions remaining were of an egotistical character. Some egotistical emotions are necessary to moral life, but the emotions which are left to the alcoholic, and the variety of these egotistic emotions, all go to show that, as far as the feelings are concerned, he is in a low condition morally. He is totally selfish, lacking in all noble and manly emotions. Footnote, H. Maudsley, Pathology of the Mind, page 486, says regarding the moral condition of the alcoholic, his moral sense is blunted or destroyed, so that he loses all the feeling of moral responsibility and becomes cunning, cowardly, untruthful, and untrustworthy. End footnote. These are but the secondary moral emotions. What shall we say concerning the primary moral emotion, the feeling of obligation? This is universal with the race, and all persons feel that they ought to do what they believe to be right. Is it true also of the alcoholic? One further statement regarding the feeling of obligation which can best be given by using a quotation, it should be noticed that the early movements of the feeling of obligation are very frequently strongest in the direction of that which is sensuously painful or expulsive. We may say that, as far as he does retain the feeling of obligation, it is in the degenerated childlike manner. 
He ought to do that which helps him to escape pain or injury. Even a child doesn't act because he knows the failure to accomplish it will result in a flogging. A flogging, sickness, or other painful feelings teach the child what he should do. The pain is interpreted by the alcoholic as a lesson in what he should do, and he has not courage to resist it. He has, as the one pressing obligation, the duty to himself, to rid himself of the painful sensations resulting from abstinence. This is nearer to him than anything else, and he tries to give reasons to substantiate it. He may admit that perhaps he ought not to drink, or he may endeavor to show why he should. If the ought feeling is present in any form, it is weak. He does not drink so much because he ought to, but because he wants to. He drinks now without thinking of the right or wrong of it. He drinks now because he must, whatever may have been his ideas about it in the past. In one mood, he admits everything that is said to him, admits all his obligations and duties. And in another mood, he as quickly and decisively denies all that he has formally admitted. These feelings of remorse cannot be counted on very much. They are of such an egotistical and selfish character. He is therefore in no condition to possess or practice any of these virtues of feeling. Footnote. We have the following from H. Malsley, Body and Will, pages 273 forward. His finest moral sensibilities are extinguished and his least fine blunted. Steadily selfish to his own selfish wants and persistent to gratify them. He is insensible to the feelings and claims of his family, whose dearest interest he sacrifices without real compunction and indifferent to the obligations and responsibilities of his social position. He will often profess to you very fine sentiments and perhaps indulge in the pleasant debauchery of a visionary imagination inspired by an intensely egotistic feeling and stimulated by the drug, but uncontrolled by realities, the disciplinary and disagreeable hold of which the drug has deadened or destroyed. And footnote. We will remember that the emotions which remained were of an immoral character. There seems to be a difference of opinion regarding one feeling which is the cause of immorality, referred to the sexual feeling. Some authorities say that the sexual feeling is annihilated. Others affirm that the feeling is still present and is even exaggerated, but on account of the impotence of the alcoholic, he is unable to gratify it. We know that alcohol, when first taken, has the power of exciting different feelings, but in a person in a condition which we know are subject to be, we think it hardly possible for the sexual feeling to remain in much advanced cases. The divergence of opinion may be due to the fact that one is speaking of a chronic alcoholic in advanced stage, while the other is referring to the single intoxications of one who has not been drinking long. Again, one authority may be speaking of men and another of women. Alcohol may affect the two sexes in different ways sexually. The impotence is admitted by all. Footnote. We have the following from L. G. Robinovich. Infantile Alcoholism. Quarterly Journal of Inebriety. Volume 25, page 231. Probably a direct toxic action is exercised on the reproductive elements. Testicular atrophy has been observed, and in women addicted to alcohol, menstruation ceases prematurely and the ovaries atrophy. And footnote. The will is an important factor in morals. We cannot have a moral act without will, and cannot have a moral character without continued will in one direction. We remember the condition of the will in the alcoholic, as was shown in the chapter on that subject. It flags and after very slight exertion fails altogether. What kind of a moral character can we expect, even supposing that all the other faculties are intact, if the will is defective? If the feeling of obligation demands one course of action, which may be difficult to attain, and the will is weak, can we ever expect its consummation? No, the other faculties are useless without the aid of the will. Bain has gone so far as to say that moral inability is simply a fault of the will, being a weakness of motives, and it can be remedied by the aid of new motives. But moral inability is a matter of degree, and while this may be true of some, and sufficiently strong motives could be devised to influence them, we think that there are others who would be beyond this. It might be said of the latter class that they go beyond the bounds of the moral. This we will have to consider later when we take up the question of responsibility. 
We might say in a general way that we are virtuous in proportion to our self-control. For the virtues of the will are most important, especially with the alcoholic. We found in our discussion of the emotions the alcoholic to be a coward. He is a coward indeed, the lowest kind of a coward. And there is nothing he fears so much as physical pain. If he feared the disapprobation of conscious or friends, the ruin staring him in the face, the displeasure of God or the destruction of his family, there might be some hope for him. But he fears only the pain and discomfort by the abstinence from his regular dram. There is no incentive for the good will here, no motive for reform. The habit of the alcoholic's willing is against him. He has not been in the habit of opposing his appetite, and to exert his will against a lifelong habit is difficult, shall we say impossible. Connected closely with the defects of the will can be noticed an indecision of character in the alcoholic. He has an uncertainty and infirmity of purpose which are very characteristic. One minute or day he chooses a certain line of action, and the next he repudiates it. He knows not what he wants, and is never satisfied with his present circumstances. What is true of his resolutions for reform is characteristic of his whole life. He has not stability enough to carry out any one idea. He is good and bad, innocent and criminal, filled with worthy plans and low ones, all in the same breath. A threat and expression of goodwill are equally possible, and one is puzzled in which to believe. It is safest to believe neither, for both are alike unreliable. The senses have their influence also. It is impossible to judge the relations between actions correctly. If we do not perceive correctly, this has been referred to before when speaking of the alcoholic's lying. He lied, it was said, for two reasons at least. One because he did not perceive correctly, and the other because he did not remember correctly. These are but the minor reasons. Alcoholic excess seems to destroy all shame as far as it is concerned, with the departure from the truth. The learning is not difficult. Everyone is a potential liar. It seems an easy way out of a difficult position at times, and this the alcoholic evidently thinks. He begins to dissemble and deceive, first denying his drinking at all, and later the quantity of which he has partaken. All sorts of deceptions are practiced to hide the fault from family, friends, and society. The lying habit is established and resorted to on all occasions, until he lies even to his own disadvantage and does not recognize the difference between falsehood and error. Of all reference made to the subject, the writer has yet to find one authority who does not speak of the alcoholic in unmistakable terms as a confirmed liar, and from his own testimony it is even difficult to arrive at the facts of his case. Of a goodly number of alcoholics examined by the writer, there is yet to be found one whose friends did not give the same testimony concerning him, and further, not one of them when asked denied that he was a liar, or showed any shame concerning the admission. With truthfulness lacking, we cannot expect a virtuous life, for truth is the basis, the foundation stone of morals. In view of the alcoholic's untruthfulness and his generally criminal record, it seems strange that according to computations, only 26% of the perjurers are alcoholics. The reason for this low percentage has been given that perjury requires motives, and motives are not plentiful with the intellectually degenerate alcoholic. His lying has an effect which we notice in dealing with the emotions. Because he does not tell the truth himself, he is suspicious of others, and does not believe anything that is told him. The distrust is not confined to the verbal statements of his friends, but it soon spreads over all their actions. He does not believe in the fidelity and loyalty of his wife. He distrusts his attendant. His whole life becomes filled with distrust, which soon, through a diseased imagination, leads to hallucinations and illusions of persecutions and acts of violence caused thereby. We may now ask and endeavor to answer the question, why do morals deteriorate so quickly? Some say that they are the first to go. Footnote, H. Malsley, Body and Will, page 273 says, When the mind undergoes degeneration, the moral feeling is the first to show it, as it is the last to be restored when the disorder passes away. The latest and highest gain of mental evolution, it is the first to witness by its impairment to mental dissolution. The first effect of mental degeneration, it is the last to witness to full mental regeneration. End footnote. The development of the highest moral life is the result of the highest development of all the mental faculties. 
intellect, feeling, and will. It is impossible for any of these to degenerate without causing also the degeneration of the moral life. It is no contradiction to say that the memory deteriorates first, and that the morals go first, for the morals would deteriorate as the memory does. The most complex, highly developed, unstable parts of the mind are the first to suffer degeneration. And it is obvious that when the morals are depending upon the proper functioning of every part of the mind, the least trouble would cause a derangement of the moral conduct of the person thus suffering. With the decline of the moral nature, there is one more link broken in the chain which might have drawn the alcoholic out of the danger of ruin and destruction. One more incentive, the chief one, to reform life is lost. It is only fair to say that the alcoholic is not really wicked and vicious. He has not courage and force enough for that. We very seldom know of his committing great crimes, but it almost seems that he has a monopoly of the petty offenses. For prison statistics show that a majority of the inmates are alcoholics. It is said that in Paris, in 1888, 72 percent of the convicted criminals of the year were found to be chronic alcoholics, while in Bern, Canton, the proportion was about 40 percent. Further, it has been estimated that about 70 percent of all perpetrated crimes are directly or indirectly attributable to alcoholism. Principally, the offenses were of the nature of disregard of the rights of others, the contempt of law and order, assault, disturbance of domestic peace, and robbery. For, to all of such crimes, the habitual drunkard seems to be particularly prone. A moment of passion is frequently responsible for these. Lombroso has computed that of 100 crimes, alcoholism is the cause of 50 in France, and 41 in Germany. Sock states that in Germany, fully 50% of all crimes are committed under the influence of alcoholic excesses. In England and America, the percentage is no doubt equally high. We think Dr. Davis has exaggerated the case when he says careful and impartial investigations, both in this country and in Europe, have proved that at least 90% of all criminals who prey upon the person and property of others, as thugs, highway robbers, housebreakers, rioters, and murderers, are made such by the use of alcohol and other narcotic drugs. The Reverend Mr. Horsley says that of the prisoners in Clerkenwell Prison, 75% come there through drink, and of 300 cases of attempted suicide, 172 were attributable to the same cause. In a paper by Dr. W. Westcott, Alcoholic Poisoning in London and Heart Disease as its Fatal Result, the writer shows that alcohol is the most potent cause of crime, suicide, and sudden death in the great city. Inebriety in Scotland, a paper presented to the Society for the Study of Inebriety, in April 1903 by A. Sherwell, speaks of the increase of crime in Scotland. All classes of crime have increased from an average of 344 per 10,000 of population for five years, 1883 to 1887, to 393 in 1897 to 1901. If we take the four principal classes of crime, viz. crime against the person, crimes against property with violence, crimes against property without violence, and malicious injury to property, the figures are much less serious, but even these show a slight increase in 20 years. But it is when we return to the miscellaneous offenses, of which drunkenness and disorder constitute more than two-thirds, that we see where the real increase has been, the figures in this class rising from 295 per 10,000 of the population in the five years 1883 to 1887, to 345 in the five years, 1897 to 1901, an increase of 17 percent. The closeness of the relation between intemperance and crime has become a truism, but it is nowhere more clearly demonstrated than the criminal statistics of Scotland. Take the single fact that out of a total of 179,821 persons charged with criminal offenses in 1900, no fewer than 114,207, or 63.5%, were for offenses directly connected with drinking. This lamentable figure, the commissioners are careful to tell us, is no exaggeration of the charges resulting directly from overindulgence in alcoholic liquor. In the report of the New York State Commission on Prisons, 
for 1903, we find the following suggestive paragraph. During the last year, there were 28,519 commitments to the jails and 3,615 to the penitentiaries for intoxication. These figures do not include many thousand other convictions for the same offense, punished by a fine which was paid before commitment. It would appear that one half of the convictions in the criminal courts of the state are for this single offense. The report for the New York State Reformatory at Elmira for 1903 says that of 1,700 inmates of whom reports had recently been gathered, a total of 1,077 acknowledged drinking, of which 779 were moderate drinkers and 298 drank to excess. The age limit of inmates being 30 years old, we would hardly expect so many excessive drinkers in this situation. Some of the greatest and most successful criminals do not drink. They cannot afford to in their business. Drinking would unfit them for their work and certainly mean an early capture by the police. The drunkard is not fitted mentally for great crimes, and so is not bad in that way. No doubt, though, that the prisons are filled with alcoholics, especially those in the first stages of alcoholism. Alcoholism frequently gives rise to criminal tendencies on account of the perverted moral judgment and general mental degeneration. The alcoholic's crime may take the form of immoral and indecent deeds. This lack of moral sense may often be found among criminals whose parents were both alcoholics, though they themselves have never used alcohol. Lombroso recently tested the effects of alcohol on latent criminal tendencies. The subject of his experiments was a man who had surrendered himself to the police by the avowal that anarchists wished to make him their instrument for assassinating the king of Italy. The man seemed sane, but no corroboration of his story could be obtained. Unexpectedly, after drinking wine, he broke out into anarchist threats. Acting upon this hint, Professor Lambroso administered alcohol to him in carefully measured doses, and discovered that after he drunk a certain amount, he developed violent criminal tendencies. Sometimes a murder which he commits is unintentional on his part. He cannot judge how hard he is striking, and instead of a tap there is given a blow. It shows a lack of judgment regarding the force of the blow. But the chronic alcoholic is not found in serious frays. His anger is vented by less violent means. He scolds, complains, perhaps makes a show of fighting when he thinks there will be no response, and talks of his past fights rather than endeavoring to engage in present or future ones. His immorality is largely of a negative, listless sort, unless forced to what he considers self-defense, through the vividness of his hallucinations, illusions, or suspicions, when he will kill or do anything to protect himself. Footnote. G. R. Wilson, Drunkenness, page 33, says, Violence of a serious kind is rarely met with except during intoxication, or in some of the forms of alcoholic insanity. But impulsive promptings to violent acts are common with nearly all drunkards. Fits of passion are frequent, and trifling provocations evoke a wholly disproportionate expression of the feeling. End footnote. We now pass to the subject which requires most of our attention in this chapter that of the responsibility of the alcoholic. We wish first to ask the question, is the alcoholic responsible for what he does? He acts mostly in an intoxicated condition or semi-intoxicated condition, for alcohol remains in the system for 48 hours after it is taken. He is seldom completely sober, and if so, is not normal. The question really is whether he is abnormal to such degree as to be irresponsible. We do not refer to the dipsomaniac, whose very name shows himself to be considered irresponsible. Nor do we refer to those in the early stages of drunkenness, for these would probably be considered by all as responsible. But we refer to the chronic drunkard. There is no doubt from what we have said in the description given that the chronic drunkard is in a diseased condition, for the brain and whole nervous system is so affected as not to function in a normal and proper manner. What has been said in this chapter shows that the alcoholic does not receive the moral impressions which he otherwise would if his mind were normal. Neither is he able to judge the claims of family, friends, and society. The question still remains as to the extent of the irresponsibility. Before we go further, let us quote the conditions as given by two different persons under which one is responsible. First, responsibility presupposes, one, a justly binding authority. Two, knowledge 
in the agent of the just will of the authority. Three, power either to perform or abstain from this act. If any of these be absent, responsibility in the full sense no longer exists. Second, responsibility presupposes one, one who has in possession his natural powers of mind, two, one who is competent to choose his own course of conduct in relation to himself, society and the law, to approve or disapprove, to follow or refuse to follow certain courses, the decision having been formed in the light of his own reason and free will. Now, most persons would agree that when an alcoholic is intoxicated, he does not come under these conditions, that he is suffering from temporary insanity and hence not responsible. This is in a large measure true, yet there is doubt about the total irresponsibility when intoxicated, providing he is responsible when sober. The drunkard is like the hypnotized person who knows to a certain extent that he is playing a part, and while he has not command of his faculties in the same way as when sober, he is yet in much the same condition as far as his knowledge of right and wrong is concerned, and even in the performance of it. The man who commits a murder in a state of drunken frenzy is responsible for his irresponsibility. Yes, but is that all? All drunkards are equally irresponsible when intoxicated. And according to this statement, all would be alike punishable. But when the person, afraid to commit a crime in his unintoxicated state, becomes intoxicated in order that he may do it, carrying out the plan which he has conceived in his sober moments, he seems to be responsible, not for his irresponsibility, but for his responsibility. This may be the exceptional case, but if it be possible to guide actions during intoxications into criminal, why not also into virtuous channels? Criminal action is to be regarded as but the expression of a long previous course of criminal thought, for which, in so far as he could otherwise have directed it, the individual may legitimately be held responsible just as he is for his actions committed in the state of intoxication, in which he has temporarily lost, by his own voluntary act, the power of self-control. Our claim is that he is responsible for more than being intoxicated, this additional factor in his responsibility being measured by his responsibility when not intoxicated, for responsibility is a matter of degree. The question then comes to us, how far is the alcoholic, if not intoxicated, responsible? If the description which has been given in the preceding pages of the alcoholic in an advanced stage is true, we cannot consider him responsible, even if not under the influence of alcohol. With memory contracted so as not to remember late experiences and mature ideas, with will virtually gone, with his emotional nature confined to only the lower and animal emotions, his moral nature warped or destroyed, we cannot call him a responsible being. So when we make the statement that his responsibility in the intoxicated state depends upon the amount of responsibility we posit for him in his sober moments, we do not put much of a burden upon him, for we consider him in his present state, whether drunk or practically sober, to be irresponsible for his conduct. Anton Cross mentions the case of a patient of a young girl suffering from congested liver and spleen, which, of course, altered the state of her blood and thus for a time modified her constitution. Her moral character was greatly altered by it. She ceased to feel any affection for father or mother. Her temper changed, became capricious and violent. Would we hold this girl blameworthy for her lack of love to her parents or responsible for her conduct, which was clearly the result of physical causes? Assuredly not. No more should we hold the alcoholic, who is diseased in every cell, responsible for his conduct. He is as irresponsible as any person whose mind is diseased. We would say irresponsible, even as far as reform is concerned. The further question comes to us regarding his responsibility. Is he responsible for his present condition? This is the chief question after all. A man is diseased when drunk. But is he diseased when sober and just about to drink, knowing the effects of it, or is he vicious? The voluntary act of taking intoxicants sufficient to induce inebriety or intoxication is a vice for which the individual is morally responsible. 
in the word voluntary is contained the whole question again does voluntarily take it or does it not allow another quotation your remarks are just they are indeed too true but i can no longer resist temptation if a bottle of brandy stood on one hand and the pit of hell yawned at the other and i were convinced that i would be pushed in as soon as i took one glass i could not refrain you are very kind i ought to be very grateful for so many kind good friends but you may spare yourself the trouble of trying to reform me the thing is out of the question we can well see that when a person has gotten to that stage he is not responsible for his drinking we must look further back and ask why should a person drink we are emphasizing heredity less than was formerly done perhaps we are swinging to the other extreme and minimizing its importance in disease the difficulty has been rather in the matter of theory than in the domain of facts there has been a desire too plainly evident to ignore the facts if they do not tend to substantiate the theory in which one is inclined to believe in the case of the alcoholic with those who believe in the old naive theory of heredity there has been no trouble but the followers of Wiseman have had some difficulty in reconciling the theory and the facts which seem so evident. Fortunately, in this case it is not a matter of controversy concerning the transmission of acquired characteristics. For explanations eliminating this discussion have been given, which not only accord better with the facts, but tend to solve the riddle in a more satisfactory manner. While some investigators claim that the question is one of chronic disturbance of nutrition in the alcoholic parent or parents which manifests itself in the sexual nature, and especially in the production of offspring mentally and physically weakened, the hypothesis of which Professor Forel is the principal exponent is steadily gaining ground. The contention of the latter is that in alcoholism we need not concern ourselves with the theories of heredity for here we have a direct poisoning of the germ plasm by means of the alcohol circulating in the blood and thus the delicate cells composing the plasm are prevented from developing into a stable organism the blood and lymph which convey to the sexual organs the nourishment necessary for the development of the germ plasm carry also the poisoning properties of alcohol and on account of the susceptible condition of the plasm during its growth it is retarded in its normal development. The strength of the solution of alcohol may, yes, must make a difference in the injurious effects of the plasm and consequently on the prospective offspring. The healthy contribution of the other parent may tend to overcome the threatened degeneration, but if both parents are likewise affected, the injury is not only uncompensated, but is multiplied. Add to this the alcohol contributed in the fetal life by the mother and degeneration is almost inevitable the question between the direct poisoning of the germ at the time of conception and the progressive poisoning of the germ plasm during development is one between the moderate or occasional drinker and the chronic alcoholic it seems likely that both classes affect their offspring but that the latter would be the most disastrous without doubt on the other hand some facts tend to show that alcohol in the system at the time of conception is not without evil effects modern science is substantiating diogenes in his saying to the stupid boy young man thy father must have been very drunk when thy mother conceived thee dr dom bezola in an address delivered before the vienna anti-alcoholic congress said having at hand within my own community graubunden 68 cases of imbecility of various grades i undertook a preparatory investigation among these and arrived at the astonishing result that one half of their births fell upon days following forty weeks after periods of alcoholic plenty new years the carnival and grape gathering that is to say within an aggregate of fourteen weeks while the remaining half was distributed rather evenly through the remaining thirty-eight weeks of the year it was found also that the number of births was lower than the average during these 14 weeks. A detailed study of imbecile school children throughout all Switzerland confirmed the result of this investigation. End of chapter 8, part 1. Chapter 8, part 2 of The Psychology of Alcoholism by George Barton Cuton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 
This reference to imbecility shows that simple drinking of the parents prior to conception produces an unstable nervous organism in the children. Physical deformities are less frequent results, but it is mental troubles with which we are concerned in our study. Why should the nervous system exhibit most frequent and serious defects? We could give the same reason for this in the germ and embryo as in the adult. The proportion of the germ which shall develop into the nervous system is the latest product of evolution and most intricate in structure. It is therefore less stable and consequently more easily deranged and injured. The nutritive functions may be perfect in the offspring, for they are long established and more firmly set in the line of development. The higher delicately formed, comparatively lately evolved portions, with the lines of development unstable, first give way under the power of the alcoholic poison. When heredity is spoken of in connection with alcoholism, it is generally understood to imply that a person has inherited an unstable nervous system which, after he has begun to drink, causes such a craving for the effects of alcohol as to render it difficult, if not impossible, for the partaker to refrain. We do not mean that a person is born a drunkard, that is, but a figure of speech, but he may become a drunkard on account of his heredity after voluntary indulgence. The altered condition of the nervous system of the children of alcoholics forms a predisposing cause of alcoholism only awaiting the exciting cause to show itself in full force. It should be noticed in distinction from this, we have some reported cases of true inherited alcoholism, which develop during fetal life, at any period from conception to birth. In these cases we find the same effects in the children, who never have drunk as might be expected, in those whose systems have been ruined both physically and mentally by alcohol. Concerning this, we quote the following. The subjects of hereditary alcoholism have symptoms from birth. Their general constitution is feeble. They lack resistive power to infection. They succumb easily to gastroenteritis, bronchitis, meningitis, etc. Some writers think that in large commercial and industrial centers, about 50% of the children die before the end of the third year and convulsions is one of the most frequent causes. Parental alcoholism is the dominating cause of the enormous infantile mortality among the working classes of Russia, Belgium, and France. Those who survive the first few years of life generally show some marked defect, symptoms of digestive, respiratory, or nervous disorders, with consequent liability to some form of disease, such as tuberculosis or meningitis. In some cases of hereditary alcoholism, the more common characteristics of alcoholism may manifest themselves in a child, such as tremor or increased mucus secretion. Later in life, hysteria, neurasthenia, epilepsy, and chorea are very prevalent. In regard to epilepsy, Bourneville has observed that in 163 families in which either the father or mother was addicted to alcohol, 244 children suffered from epilepsy, and Korvalowski has noted 100 epileptics in 60 families. Various forms of mental disease, such as imbecility, idiocy, feeble intellect, and memory are very common, and even some forms of gross cerebral disease, such as malformations, hydrocephalus, microcephalus, etc. observed. Later, some of the more marked forms of mental disease, such as melancholia and mania, have been expected. The most common mental characteristics of such children are feeble memory, inability to learn, and a certain want of perception of the ordinary duties of life. According to Morel, idiocy does not appear until about third or fourth year. Whatever be our theories, the fact seems evident. There is no lack of medical experience to confirm the contention that the children of an alcoholic parent or parents are more liable to indulge in alcoholic excess than the offspring of temperate parents. Further, we have the testimony of some physicians and specialists to the fact that there is actually an acquired taste for alcohol in children, which is accountable only to the supposition of heredity of some form or other. Notice the following statements. A strong intoxication impulse has been manifested at a very early age in some instances. 
Children of four, five, six, or seven have drunk eagerly and to drunkenness on the very first occasion when drink was given to them, while the other children with them have evinced no such eagerness. Children can directly inherit the tendency to drink. Therefore, it happens not infrequently that cases of genuine dipsomania occur at the early age of four or five years. Cohn, Madden, Moreau, and others have recorded cases of alcoholic delirium in children between the ages of five to eight years. Hereditary taint may be traced in a very large proportion of alcoholic cases, it is said in nearly a moiety. The children of drunkards are extremely susceptible to the influence of alcohol, a quantity which would not affect ordinary persons intoxicates them, and produces results not so readily seen in more normal persons. The crave for alcohol seems to be handed down to them, and they take to drink as a duck to water. The matter of environment must also be considered, for where there are inebriate parents, the children undoubtedly will come in frequent or constant contact with alcoholic beverages when they are young. Making all allowance for this factor, the fact of heredity is still quite evident. Let us look at some statistics. Dr. Carruthers, chairman of a committee for the study of heredity and alcoholism, appointed by the Association for the Study and Cure of Inebriety, reported on 1,744 cases, 1,300 of which had come under his personal care and observation. Of the whole number, 1,080 had a distinct history of heredity. The 1,080 were divided as follows. 430, about one quarter of the whole number, were classed as direct heredities, where the drinking of parents or grandparents reappeared in the children. 224, more than one-eighth of the whole number, were classed as indirect heredities. They usually were persons whose grandparents, or one or two generations back, had been moderate or occasional excessive users of spirits. In many instances, the father had a short drink period in early life, and then became an abstainer, or both parents had drunk wine at meals for a certain period, or the mother had been given wine or spirits during pregnancy, lactation, or for some other particular illness. 290, one-sixth the total number, were placed under the classification of psychopathic heredity, in whom some defect of brain or nervous system seems to persist generation after generation. Forty-nine were grouped under epileptoid types of heredity. These cases were marked by sudden unexpected and self-limited drink storms. Dr. C. L. Dana of New York says, Among 350 patients whom I questioned on the subject, I found that drinking habits existed in one or both parents, in all but 10, 97.5%. Father was usually the drinker. In eight cases, both parents drank. In one case, the mother only was an inebriate. The patients were largely of foreign birth and descent, however, and drinking was a natural habit, so that very great importance cannot be attached to this fact. In another series of 210 cases, the percentage was much lower. Among the total, 25% gave a negative hereditary history. Among 30 periodical inebriates, in two-thirds, there was a distinct history of heredity. In 14, the father drank. In 8, both parents drank. Of 600 patients at Fort Hamilton, 265 had inebriate family history, and 38 were descended from families where there had been insanity. Of the cases treated in Dr. Stewart's private asylum, in 44%, one of the parents or grandparents had taken alcohol to excess, and in a large number of the remainder, there was a history of either epilepsy, insanity, or tuberculosis. Dr. Kerr found 50% of his cases had inebriate diathesis. W. Bevan Lewis examined 344 cases, of which 37% showed inebriate or neurotic inheritance and 27% insanity. At Darl Rimple, there were found 134 cases of inebriate inheritance and 26 of insane. Out of one group, 2,905 cases treated in America and England, mentioned by Kerr, no fewer than 1,374 had a family history of previous inebriety. If there is any allowance to be made in these statistics, it must be in favor of the thesis that there is a relation between alcoholism and heredity. 
because it is so difficult to get the facts. The alcoholic not infrequently endeavors to protect his mother's good name and denies her alcoholism, while secret drinking or the simple presence of alcohol at the time of conception may be unknown. One thing to be noticed in the above statistics is the frequent assumption of atavism. It has been the grandparents or great-grandparents who have indulged to excess. Hence, the alcoholism in the offspring. Footnote. Dr. Langrain's investigations on alcoholic inheritance are tabulated as follows. In the first generation from inebriety, the mental and physical degenerates were 77% of all. In the second generation, 96% were defective. In the third generation, not one escaped. All were idiots, insane, hysteric, or epileptic. From the Medical Press, 1903, we quote, The opinion of experts on the subject goes to show that when alcoholism becomes hereditary, the whole family is doomed. Neurosis appearing in the second generation, epilepsy and other forms of mental instability in the third actual imbecility and ultimate extinction in the fourth. End footnote. This would entail some theory of heredity, for the germ poisoning by alcohol would hardly account for this phenomena. Footnote. Some are very outspoken in their opinions concerning the transmission of acquired characteristics, especially as far as alcoholism is concerned. Kerr Inebriety, pages 187 forward, gives the opinions of numerous specialists who uphold this view. End pages 194 forward. He cites cases of transmitted drink craze, perhaps the following from T.B. Hislop, Alcoholic Insanity, A System of Medicine, all but volume 9, page 322, would help to reconcile the two opposed ideas. The majority of drinkers are disposed to drink by heredity. In 100 recent cases of alcoholic insanity admitted at Bethlehem, no less than 67 had a neurotic inheritance, 32 had a family history of alcoholism. In eight cases only, there was a history of alcoholism without insanity in the parents. Alcoholism without insanity and other neurosis in the parents is more rarely followed by alcoholism in the offspring than when other neurosis in the parents are, are contingent factors. Alcoholism in the parents is, however, a common factor in determining the occurrence of other neurosis in the offspring. End footnote. Dr. Solier presents the four following conclusions as a result of his study on heredity. One, between dipsomania heredity insanity on the one hand and alcoholism called acquired on the other hand, there exists an intermediate form of the propensity for alcoholic drink. This intermediate form of alcoholism by heredity, it is certainly more frequent than dipsomania and tends more and more to encroach upon the domain of acquired alcoholism. That is, alcoholism by heredity may be found to have pre-existed in cases heretofore interpreted as simply acquired alcoholism. Two, the heredity of alcoholism may be either by similars or dissimilars. The relative frequency of these forms is as three to four. Three, alcoholism by heredity belongs to the neuropathic family, and more especially to its psychopathic branch. Four, the causes which produce the outbreak of alcoholism in subjects having hereditary taint, and more particularly in the progeny of subjects who themselves have alcoholism, are merely accidental or apparent, and are far from having the influence which have been attributed to them. The only true cause is heredity which creates the predisposition, the impulse, and a condition of intellect and feeling in the subject which render them incapable of resistance. We can further see the abnormal condition of the offspring of alcoholics by noticing the great number of degenerates of different kinds to be found among them. A presiding judge of one of the Chicago courts, among other things, relating to the use of alcoholic drinks, said, of all the boys in the reform school and the various reformatories about the city, 95% are the children of parents who died through drink or became criminals through the same cause. Of the insane and demented cases disposed of here in the court every Thursday, a moderate estimate is that 90% are from the effects of alcohol. The sandbaggers, murderers, and thugs generally today are prosecuted in the police courts and criminal courts are sons of parents who fell victims to drink. I know whereof I speak.
Demi found that the direct posterity of ten families of drunkards amounted to fifty-seven children. Twenty-five died soon after birth. Of the remainder, six were idiots, five dwarfs, five epileptics. One each had chorea, chronic hydrocephalus, hair lip, and club foot. Two of the epileptics became alcoholics. In ten normal families, which he examined for comparison, among sixty-one children, five died soon after birth. Four suffered from curable nervous affections. Two had congenital defects. 81.9% were sound in mind and body during childhood and youth, while in the alcoholic families the percentage was 17.5. Professor Delman's famous study in the hereditary inebriety naturally occurs to us. At a jerk, who died at the beginning of last century, at about 60 years of age, was a drunkard, a thief, and a vagabond. Seventy-five years later, her progeny was found to consist of 834 persons of whom the history of 700 has been studied. Of this number, there have been 106 illegitimate children, 144 mendicants, 64 sustained by charity, 181 prostitutes, and 76 criminals, among whom seven were assassins. In 75 years, this single family has cost in maintenance expenses of imprisonment and interest one and one quarter million dollars. Nothing is so deplorable in all investigation of the pernicious effects of alcohol as the fact that the offspring must suffer so severely for the craving and indulgence of the parents. Footnote. The writer has read Dr. G. A. Reed's most interesting and dogmatic, yet far from convincing treatise, Alcoholism. Even were we prepared to accept Dr. Reed's thesis in toto, it would not in the least change our conclusions regarding the moral responsibility of the drunkard. For whether the alcoholic tendency is inborn or acquired in the parent, if transmitted to the child, the latter is equally responsible in both cases. For a discussion of Dr. Reed's principal points, see W. F. Robertson, Evolutionary Pathology of Chronic Alcoholism, British Journal of Inebriety, 1904. And, footnote. and so frequently we find that the child is injured far more seriously than the parent, on account of the latter's alcoholism. Some time ago, the liquor journal set before us a man of 91 years of age, a farmer living out of doors and working moderately. He had drunk a pint of spirits daily for 60 years and was apparently hale and hearty, never having had any illness. The harmlessness of the continued use of pure whiskey was thereby proven. An investigation brought out these facts. The man was of inferior intelligence, with a large physical frame, and inclined to follow very methodical habits of living. While the effects of his drinking were not prominent in his appearance, they were very evident in his children. Of three children by his first wife, two died in infancy, one became epileptic and died at fifteen. Of four children by his second wife, one is feeble-minded, the second choreic, the third is dissolute and drinks, the fourth is erratic and passionate and a wanderer. All are decidedly inferior, both physically and mentally. Beside the degeneration in alcoholics' children already spoken of, the abnormality of genius is sometimes the result of alcoholic heredity. Among men of letters, Dr. Byron and Poe are two prominent examples. From all departments of life, examples could be given, which, as can readily be seen, show the degenerating effects as clearly as any other abnormality. Footnote. Children of alcoholic parents inherit nervous instability, if nothing else. Often they show great extremes of activity and prostration. While neurotics, they are often brilliant, lead in their classes, and are prematurely developed. All such children show great extremes of energy and exhaustion, with faintness and debility. Their training should be very careful. No tea, coffee, meat, broth, or alcohol should enter the diet. No attempt to treat every symptom of exhaustion with drugs or foods. They are very precarious in their nervous organization, and unless brought up in the most careful manner will become inebriates. Quarterly Journal of Inebriety, Volume 25, page 267. End footnote. While we recognize that predisposition is assured, in some cases, we should also recognize that, by proper treatment, especially in the young, this predisposition can be checked or pointed in other directions. Some persons advocate the removal of the children of alcoholics from their homes because of the detriment 
of adding the power of alcoholic environment to that of heredity. Unfortunately, alcohol does not limit the power of procreation until after the usual period of reproduction, and thoughtless reproduction of degenerates is promoted. We are as yet so fond of the shadow called liberty that all kinds of degenerates marry and throw upon the public ever-increasing multiplication of their kind. Fortunately for the good of the race, alcoholism is found most frequently among the men, because inebriety in the mother, on account of the forty weeks of foetal life over which her organism has uncontrollable influence, is much more disastrous. It has been said that, when the father has been a drunkard, it is rather the moral nature of the offspring which is altered. When the taint is on the mother's side, that the brain and nerves are particularly liable to suffer, the mother's influence is said to be more powerful of the two. Not only do we find that the alcoholic female has more influence over the offspring, but we are told that, in regard to heredity, there appears to be a greater tendency for the female children to be affected by insanity. They break down more rapidly and from slighter causes than the males. Dr. W. C. Sullivan has made some investigations concerning the children of female inebriates. His results show that the maternal alcoholism has surprising effects upon the offspring. The women examined were mostly inmates of the Liverpool prison, 120 of whom had produced 600 children. Of these, 265, 44.2%, lived over two years, and 335, 55.8%, died under two years, or were dead born. In over 60% of the children dying in infancy, the assigned cause of death was convulsions. For comparison, the progeny of sober mothers was also examined. Drunken mothers, 21 cases, gave birth to 125 children, of whom 69, 55.2%, died under two years. Sober mothers, 28 cases, gave birth to 138 children, of whom 33, 23.9%, died under two years. In 80 of the cases, the number of children each family reached or exceeded three. Classing these children in the order of their birth, we can see the progressive death rate in the alcoholic family. This table shows the progressive degeneration of the alcoholic mother, which can only be brought about by the accumulative effects of continued indulgence. The nervous degeneracy in the surviving children was examined only on one point. Of the children in the series, 219 lived beyond infancy, and of these, 4.1% became epileptics. Many of the others counted here as non-epileptic had not reached the age at which epilepsy most commonly appears, but the percentage here given is vastly in the excess of its frequency in the general population. The facts brought out in the investigation leave no room to doubt the effect of alcoholism upon reproduction, and in these statistics the poisoning of the germ and fetus seems to be the cause most readily assignable and acceptable rather than heredity. Regardless of what our theory of the latter may be, many physicians are awakening to the extent of the danger of alcoholic maternity, and the medical journals are sounding a note of warning. The danger is seen not only in chronic alcoholism, but in the habit of alcoholic drinking as a panacea for every pain or ill of pregnancy. Coupled with this, although we recognize that it is not a question of heredity, we have what has been called infantile acquired alcoholism. This is connected with the question of heredity, because it comes under the category of alcoholism, for which the subject is not responsible, and for which he cannot be blamed. We refer to the alcohol acquired through nursing, or directly administered to infants for the supposed medicinal or soothing effect. Some physicians have reported cases of complete intoxication in nursing children through alcohol acquired in the milk and further state that the children of the alcoholic mothers are hardly sober for weeks. The following is descriptive of the acquisition of alcoholism in infants. The most frequent source of acquired alcoholism is lactation. Alcohol is conveyed to the infant with the milk in proportion to the amount taken. The researches of Klingman, Roman, and Niccolo have shown that alcohol passes into the milk, whatever be the quantity consumed. According to Valen, it is common in Paris to give nursing women a liter or more of wine, often of the stronger and more generous kind. Not infrequently, in addition, an unlimited amount of beer is given. 
it is supposed that alcoholic beverages consumed by the nurse impart strength and vigor to the infant whereas the opposite is the case in several countries belgium russia and parts of france it is the custom to soothe the cries of infants by giving them a piece of sugar steeped in kirch eau de vie or gin and tied up in a piece of rag which they can suck sometimes a piece of bread or biscuit steeped in some form of alcohol is given in the same manner in some parts the mothers give the children a teaspoon of grog to put them to sleep wine is regarded as beneficial during dentition and in some parts of austria it is regarded as indispensable for teething children the least indisposition colds colic or headache is regarded by some as calling for alcohol the symptoms of acquired infantile alcoholism differ from those of the adult and the greater intensity of that toxic effect especially on the nervous system footnote l r robinovich infantile alcoholism quarterly journal of inebriety volume 25 pages 232 forward in regard to alcoholism acquired in infancy and later g h mcmichael quarterly journal of inebriety volume 25 page 48 says i am probably well within the mark in saying that for one man who is born with the alcoholic susceptibility there are three who are educated to excessive drinking by their environment and footnote after this discussion of heredity we can well return to the question of responsibility better prepared to answer it if there were a definite reply to the query concerning heredity we could still better place the responsibility at least we must recognize one thing most clearly and that is that the children of alcoholics are in a less favorable condition to resist any strain or any temptation we can all admit that much some though would go to the other extreme and ask questions like the following which imply the answer in themselves where lodges the responsibility for viciousness profligacy or crime in the grandchildren of a drunkard and who would hold that the offspring of an inebriate mother saturated with alcohol before their birth are in any way personally responsible for the nervous or moral diseases that come into the world with them and cling to them through life footnote j d quackenboss hypnotism etc page 84 we also quote the following equally or more extreme views j f leidenson toxemius and their relations to alcoholism narcotic inebriety and intoxication quarterly journal of inebriety volume 25 pages 255 forward says the intolerance manifest concerning inebriety as a physical disease is an illustration of the intellectual reversion of modern dead sea atmosphere which obstructs every advance the moral factor in inebriety bears no more relation to its causation than it does to typhoid fever the moralist who claims that the inebriate willfully took the first drink hence is responsible is as logical as the accusation would be of the typhoid fever patient who voluntarily drank water containing the germs of the disease admitting that in certain cases an insatiable craving for spirits is a result and not the cause of inebriety the physician must accept the conditions as he finds them i ray mental hygiene pages 91 forward says we find it hard to hold a child accountable in any moral point of view for inherited tendency to drunkenness as we should to blame him for inheriting gout or asthma and footnote here not only alcoholism but other defects and crimes are charged to alcoholism there appears to be a pathological circle the alcoholism begetting if not in its kind then epilepsy insanity or some other nervous affliction on the other hand, these nervous troubles in the parent not infrequently predispose the children to alcoholism. Besides, what one may acquire in the way of predisposition, certain diseases and injuries may change the nervous system in such a way as to make a person more liable to drink to excess if once started. Of the 600 at Fort Hamilton, 145 had syphilis, while several had been the subjects of local venereal diseases, and 42 had had some chest disease head and other injuries may work into the same way while alcoholics are found in all occupations it is generally recognized that those who are closely confined indoors are more liable to become alcoholics and that the effect of alcohol upon them is more serious probably there is no cause of alcoholism it is exciting rather than predisposing 
so potent as the desire to forget pain sorrow trouble and distress with which the world is so filled the writer has met only one person who liked the taste of alcohol it is usually distasteful but the exhilarating effect is what is sought the business man is overworked and depressed the laborer is fatigued and discouraged the wanderer is cold and poor none of them may have the nervous energy sufficient to overcome these feelings so they seek relief outside they can all forget their misery for a small sum and be happy for a short time at least these people cannot reach higher pleasures they may have neither the means nor inclination for other kinds of enjoyment this is the panacea for all woes it is the great struggle for existence which depresses so many and those who are least fortunate in the struggle seek for one moment of forgetfulness when pain and strain are pressing upon them alcohol is set before them as presenting the opportunity for relief and their faith in it is unbounded women are often led to drink by neurasthenia brought about by overwork and lack of nutrition dysmenorrhea is also a cause of indulgence and social demands call for something to brace or paralyze people who afterwards become alcoholics frequently have less freedom than others their ideals are bounded by a very narrow horizon intoxication has been held up to them as a supreme joy the obviously criminal population is always largely made up of a class that on account of discouraging environment relatively great susceptibility to impulsive consideration and a low degree of intelligence has on the average a less degree of freedom this can well be said of the drinking class on account of their circumstances they cannot do the things which they often wish to do it is not only the lower classes of which this may be said but many men of genius seem to crave strong excitement which it is possible to acquire by this means they have that craving for intensity of consciousness which accompanies culture and high ideals the other great exciting cause of alcoholism is sociability people start to drink to be social and half of the drinking starts in this way in darimple 147 out of 315 began drinking in this way with dr kerr 46 percent with the cases which the writer has examined 55 percent began drinking socially and closely related to this cause especially among businessmen the drinking customs of business and trade form an important factor in inciting causes footnote in the investigations made by partridge american journal of psychology volume 11 pages 343 forward he found the causes for intoxication as follows the usual motives which lead to intoxication are one a desire for excitement experience and abandon to increase companionship to put off reserve in the presence of others a desire to heighten the social feeling two to kill pain to calm moral distress to overcome fatigue a desire for temporary relief from poverty and monotony to increase courage or overcome self-consciousness to steady the nerves for work or unusual strain and footnote the environment of a man very largely makes his character when a person is brought up where the custom is for everyone to drink the family around him drinking his whole environment saturated with alcohol is he to blame for his indulgences is he responsible if he goes too far he desires to rise above his low plane of feeling he wants an exaltation of his whole nature he wants freedom of mental power he is striving for an ideal the only means he knows of realizing it is through alcohol he drinks he continues to drink he becomes a slave to drink is he responsible some have gone so far as to say that the excessive strain of our 20th century civilization requires stimulants and man as the only animal which uses stimulants has reached the high plane on which he stands by the use of the brain stimulant which puts him above the other animals the races of men which use the most stimulants have developed far more and have outstripped their abstemious brothers in the mental race the use of alcohol is not only a necessity but a virtue the highest man must be the most stimulated man and he must also be the most responsible but do we find it so is he not least responsible because of his indulgence notwithstanding all that has been said about heredity environment and other causes we believe that the person who drinks may be responsible 
responsible for every drink which he takes up to a certain period in his career, when he is unable to stop himself. Then, responsible for having gotten himself in that condition, for a certain time drinking is a vice, and later becomes a disorder. How long a drinker is vicious depends upon the case. It may be until he has finished his first glass, or it may be for years. We cannot class all alcoholics together and say that they are equally responsible, but we must consider the individual. Usually the fault is on the side of blaming the irresponsible, rather than of pitying the responsible. Yet we do not wish to clear all alcoholics with the sweeping proclamation of their irresponsibility. Footnote. In the report of the Committee upon Heredity of Inebriety of the Society for the Study of Inebriety, we find the following. 1. The genesis of inebriety in the individual depends on three essential factors, of which one is inborn and the others acquired. 2. The inborn factor is a capacity for enjoying the sensations evoked by indulgence in alcohol. Without it, men would not drink, for they would not enjoy drinking. 3. The acquired factors are a. A personal experience of the sensations evoked by alcohol. Without this, the acquired knowledge, this memory, no man would crave for the sensations in the sense the inebriate craves. b. The increased delight in drink, which continued indulgence in drink confers, it is an essential factor, for, in Europeans at any rate, a single experience of drink rarely gives rise to a craving for it. G. A. Reed, Alcoholism, page 82, says, All men, of course, start life without craving for alcohol, and, in so far, are equal. But the essential fact remains that they differ vastly with respect to the ease with which the craving may be awakened and the strength it may attain. End footnote. True, we are not so free as we once thought we were. Our course is determined to a certain extent, and by our every choice we are determining it more. There is usually the time in the alcoholic's career when he could stop, when he could prevent the wreck, when he knew the way he was going, but continued. There is also the time when he comes to the point where he cannot stop, however much he may want to. No class of them have better sentiments or feel more constantly the difference between the higher and the lower path in life than the hopeless failure, the sentimentalist, the drunkards, the schemers, the deadbeats, whose life is one long contradiction between knowledge and action and who, with full command of theory, never get to holding their limp characters erect. No one eats of the fruit of the tree of knowledge, as they do, as far as moral insight goes. In comparison with them, the orderly and prosperous Philistines, whom they scandalize, are sucking babes. And yet their moral knowledge, always their grumbling and rumbling in the background, discerning, commenting, protesting, longing, half-resolving, never wholly resolves never gets its voice out of the minor into the major key, or its speech out of the subjunctive into the imperative mood, never breaks the spell, never takes the helm into his hands. As far as the alcoholic is concerned, he never takes the helm into his hands, because he cannot, nor do we believe that he realizes, nearly so well as his friends, the difference between the higher and the lower paths of life. The same writer says, how many excuses does a drunkard find when each new temptation comes? It is a new brand of liquor which the interests of intellectual culture in such matters oblige him to test. Moreover, it is poured out, and it is a sin to waste it, or others are drinking and it would be churlishness to refuse. Or it is but to enable him to sleep, or just to get through this job of work, or it isn't drinking, or it is because he feels cold, or it is Christmas Day, or it is a means of stimulating him to make a more powerful resolution in favor of abstinence than any he has hitherto made, or it is just this once, and once doesn't count, etc., etc., ad libitum. It is, in fact, anything you like except being a drunkard. That is a conception which will not stay before the poor soul's attention, but if he once gets able to pick out that way of conceiving from all the other possible ways of conceiving the various opportunities which occur, if through thick and thin he holds to it that this is being a drunkard and is nothing else, he is not likely to remain one long. These two statements are contradictory, and neither one is wholly correct. He does not realize his true situation, and if he did, he has not power to overcome the habit of years, 
with his broken down mental powers we believe that the alcoholic is responsible in some measure for being in his condition but probably not for staying in his state we believe that every man ought to keep his body in good condition he is responsible for that for upon that depends his mental and moral condition the alcoholic fails here in his duty in partaking of his first drink and correspondingly as the amount of alcohol increases and the libations are more frequent it is not in our province here to discuss the moral import of total abstinence prohibition and other subjects which might be suggested in dealing with the morals of the alcoholic these come under the head of theoretical not psychological ethics we have tried to show the alcoholic's moral position the facts of his moral life and his responsibility for moral conduct with this done however imperfectly we must not be drawn away by the theoretical considerations however great the temptations we have seen very clearly then that the morals of the alcoholic decline as the mental states lose their integrity all the moral qualities suffer but so great is the alcoholic's disregard of the truth that lying has become a recognized symptom of alcoholism as a criminal he is not usually concerned in great crimes except as a tool but commits all manner of lesser crimes the question of the drunkard's responsibility depends on the fraction of responsibility when he is drunk when comparatively sober but diseased and when about to take a drink knowing the consequences these problems largely hinge on the further question of heredity statistics seem to show that there is some transmitted characteristics which causes the child of a drunkard to be less able to control himself as far as his indulgence in alcoholic beverages is concerned very early in life through lactation environment the alcoholic may be taught to drink notwithstanding these considerations there must be posited some responsibility and to that extent the drunkard must be held liable end of chapter eight part two Chapter 9, Part 1 of the Psychology of Alcoholism by George Barton Cuton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Insanity. The whole of this work might be well devoted to this subject, the relation of insanity to alcoholism. For could the dreadful results of alcoholism be known as exhibited in the insane wards, it might have an inhibitory effect upon the drunkard, who was rushing headlong into the destruction which, if life is spared, so often causes a loss of the mind. At most, of course, we will endeavor to deal with the psychological aspects. Contradictory ideas are current concerning the exact relationship between alcoholism and insanity. But in the last analysis, all agree that the facts show an intimate connection. Perhaps nothing shows how close this relationship is so much as the fact, as stated by Kraft Ebbing, that all forms of insanity are found in intoxication. Starting with one form and continuing with the course of the intoxication, we see all varieties of madness. The relation of cause and effect is not infrequently quite confusing. Sometimes insanity is charged to alcoholism, when the latter is but a symptom and not a cause. Allowing for all this uncertainty, we must admit the undoubted connection between the two, alcoholism being the cause in many instances. Some neurologists make the statement that alcoholism is the greatest contributor to insane hospitals, and although superintendents differ in opinions on the subject, the most of them agree in its being a prolific cause. Insane reports vary in the percentage of cases caused by alcoholism, but however much the divergence, the figures are not in all cases absolute differences, only differences in the manner of viewing the cases. Heredity as a direct cause not infrequently means alcoholism as an indirect cause. It has been thought by some that alcohol causes insanity more frequently in the offspring of the person who drinks it than in the drunkard himself. Certainly we find a very large percentage of imbeciles and idiots have an alcoholic diathesis. Alcoholism and insanity seem to interact, for not only do alcoholic parents beget imbecile, epileptic, idiotic, and insanely disposed children, but children of persons whose minds have been deranged are so affected as far as their nervous systems are concerned, 
that if they start drinking, they are most liable to become alcoholics. After considerable experience and thought, Dr. Crothers says that the study of the origin of alcoholism shows that it is itself evidence of more or less unsoundness of mind, being in a large proportion of cases only a sign of slow and insidious brain disease. He further believes that when crime is committed by inebriates, the probability of mental disease is very strong. This opinion of Dr. Crothers would lead us to believe that alcoholism does not cause insanity, but is only a symptom of it. This is only one side of the question. It does not express the facts of some cases where drinking of alcohol and intoxication are but signs of the abnormality, but the other statements regarding the inverse relation are also true. The number of insane persons whose insanity can be directly traced through long continued stages of drinking and debauchery, and also the large number of persons in insane retreats whose parents have been alcoholics, add weight to the belief in this opposite relation. In some asylums, a direct relation is clearly traceable between the amount of liquor consumed in the surrounding country and the number of persons committed to the retreat. We have these figures from the Glamorgan Asylum. During the second half of the year 1871, the admission of male patients was only 24, whereas it was 47 and 73 in the preceding and succeeding half years. During the first quarter of 1873, it was 10 against 21, and 18 in the preceding and succeeding quarters. There was no corresponding difference in the female admission. There was, however, a similar experience at the prison. The production of crime as well as of insanity having diminished in a striking manner. The exceptional periods corresponded exactly with two strikes in the coal and iron industries in which Glamorganshire is extensively engaged. The laborers, therefore, had no money to spend in drinking and debauchery. Examples like this of the effect of alcohol as an exciting cause are not uncommon. There is recognized by all alienness and insanity caused by the too frequent and heavy indulgence in alcohol, and the lesions and changes in the brain recorded in the second chapter would lead us to conclude a priori that insanity must be the result. The description of the different faculties given in extreme cases as dealt with in the preceding chapters shows insanity plainly, a lack of memory and will, and a change in the motions and morals, such as we have described, could result in nothing else. Statistics gathered from both Europe and America, together with the opinions of some specialists, show that alcoholism must be recognized as a cause of insanity, although the exact percentage may differ in the opinions with the observers and in the different institutions. We quote fully a number of these. America, Dr. Howe, who some years ago made a careful examination, says that out of 300 idiots in Massachusetts, 145 had drunken parents. T.A. McNichol of New York reports the results of the examination of a number of children. There were 463 children of drinkers, and of these, 76% suffered from neurosis or organic disease. Of 231 children of abstainers, only 18% were thus afflicted. Dr. C. E. Stanley says, of 996 cases of insanity admitted to the Connecticut Hospital for Insane for the years 1899 and 1900, 16% of the male admissions were due directly to alcohol. Dr. O. Kopp, in 1901, referring to the investigations by the Bureau of Statistics for Labor in Massachusetts, said, Coming to the investigation of the cases of insanity, it was found that about 25% of the commitments of the insane were directly due to their alcoholic beverages used by the patient. I find in looking over the admissions to the institutions for the last year that an assigned cause of insanity was intemperance in more than 15% of the cases, and that more than 10% of them were affected with alcoholic insanity. In 1902, Dr. Stearns of Hartford said that 17% of the admissions to the asylum over which he presides as superintendent were caused by the abuse of alcohol. This corresponds closely to the past history of the institution. In 1902 and 1903 at the Massachusetts State Asylum for the Insane Criminals and Offspring, there were admitted 154 cases. Of these, 62% were hard drinkers, 31% were moderate drinkers, and only 7% being abstainers. 
Thirty-six percent had intemperate fathers and fourteen percent intemperate mothers. What proportion of the cases were here as a direct result of alcohol? It was impossible to say. Dr. Drew, the medical director, continues, Alcoholism in the parent always means examples of mental diseases and weak-mindedness in the children, provided the alcoholic tendency is not acquired somewhat late in life. An inebriate father is certainly a handicap, and an inebriate mother is a greater misfortune. But the offspring of an inebriate father and mother seems almost to be doomed from its birth. Dr. W. H. Welch says, It is important to know that the immoderate drinking of alcoholic liquor may be the first symptom of some disease, which, when later recognized, is erroneously ascribed to alcohol as the cause. It is furthermore established that many of the mental and nervous disorders of alcoholism, while they are attributable to the toxic action of alcohol, are dependent in large measure upon an underlying psychopathic constitution, excessive indulgence in alcohol rarely producing certain of these disorders in persons of normal constitution. Inebriety in the parents or more remote ancestors ranks among the important causes of this inherited instability of the nervous centers. After making the necessary large but not precisely definable allowance for the share of inherited or acquired organic or constitutional defects in the etiology of the nervous manifestations of alcohol. There still remain cases enough in which alcoholic poisoning is the cause of serious disease of the brain, spinal cord, and nerves in persons of previously normal constitution, so far as can be ascertained. In the recent report of the Committee of 50, Dr. Billings has an article on the relation of drink to insanity. He reports on 5,145 cases of insanity, of whom 39.03% were total abstainers. Of those cases reported from insane hospitals, the insanity was considered to be due to the influence of liquor in 1,239 cases, or 24.08%. In commenting on these figures, he says, it is certainly improbable that nearly one quarter of the cases of insanity in this country are due to the use of alcohol drinks. As might be inferred from these figures, and while in a given case of an excessive drinker who becomes insane, the connection between cause and effect may be plausibly made out, it is necessary to take into careful consideration other inherited or acquired abnormalities or weaknesses of the nervous system. Dr. A. W. Dunning says, alcohol is, next to heredity, the most common single cause of insanity. Dr. Frederick Peterson says, we may say of alcohol that it stands foremost after heredity as a single independent cause, 18 to 20 percent in males. Dr. H. J. Berkeley says, I would emphasize the fact that alcohol and heredity are the principal factors we have to look to in searching for the etiology of mental disorders. H. C. Burdett, speaking of Argentina in hospitals and asylums of the world, says, Cases arising from intoxication form one-eighth of the inmates, and this class of cases is met with chiefly among day laborers who form a large proportion of the patients. Great Britain, Dr. Clouston, who has observed the relation of alcoholism and insanity in Scotland for a number of years, reports that for the years 1874 to 1888, an average of 15.5% were alcoholic lunatics. In the years 1889 to 98, the average was 21.5%. In 1899, 22.5%. In 1900 to 01, 24.5%. In 1902, 28%. These averages were for the total admissions. If men alone were counted, the average would be increased about one quarter, making the admissions among men in 1902 about 35 percent. Dr. T. B. Hislop says, out of 100 cases of insanity in which alcohol was an assigned factor of causation, in only 11 could it be said that alcohol was the sole cause. In all other cases, the factors were at work such as syphilis, sexual excesses, bodily diseases, money losses, domestic griefs and worries, injuries to the head, intracranial diseases, or other conditions which were either the cause of the habit or at least as important factors as the alcohol itself in the causation of insanity. In 1900, Dr. R. Piercy Smith, in an address at Charing Cross Hospital, said, 
Next to heredity, alcohol figures most largely in the causes of insanity given in the commissioner's tables, accounting for 22% of the male and 9.1% of the female cases. This refers to the effect of alcohol upon the individual alone and takes no note of alcoholic inheritance as leading to the production of insanity, idiocy, alcoholism, epilepsy, or other neurosis in the offspring, though it is well known to act in this way. Dr. Wigglesworth, in the annual presidential address before the Medico-Psychological Association in 1902, said, Out of the 3,445 cases of insanity, which formed the basis of the foregoing analysis, a definite history of alcoholic excess unassociated with insanity in one or both parents, I have excluded more remote relations, was found in 578 instances, a percentage on the whole number of 16.77. With separating the sexes, we find that the male patients show the higher figures, these amounting to 327, given a percentage of the total number of males of 19.31 while the females, 258 cases, give a percentage of 14.32. These figures do not give so high a percentage of alcoholic excess in parents as has been published by some observers, and in my opinion, they undoubtedly understate the case as regards alcohol. For excessive indulgence in this way by parents of patients is frequently denied when collateral evidence has proved it incontestably. In 1902, Dr. Robert Jones, medical superintendent in Clayberry Lunatic Asylum, London, published a paper in which were the following statistics. There are probably at the present time no less than 110,000 certified insane persons in England and Wales alone, of whom approximately about 50,000 are males and 60,000 females. If the Lunacy Commissioner's Blue Book for England and Wales be consulted, the proportionate percentage of instances in which alcohol has been assigned as the cause of insanity to the yearly average number admitted into asylums in the five years, 1895 to 1900 inclusive, is 21.8 for males and 9.5 for females. The proportion is much higher in Scotland. And after allowing for the deaths of those whose form of insanity is more immediately fatal than those caused by alcohol, there are, I believe, upon the lowest computation remaining in the asylums at the present time no less than 10,900 males and 5,800 females who are mentally decrepit through the effects of alcohol. During the time that the London County Council's asylum at Clayberry has been opened, from 1893 to the end of 1901, a period of less than nine years, 8,493 patients have been admitted of whom 21.2% of the males and 12.6% of the females were definitely ascertained to owe their insanity to drink. A total of over 800 men and 594 women who were thus rendered incapable of productive work through their own acts. For the whole of London, during the period 1893 to 1901, 2,662 men and 1,677 women were received into asylums who owned their insanity to alcoholic intemperance. Dr. Forbes Winslow, writing in the London Daily News in 1903, says, The issue of the 57th report of the Lunacy Commissioners contains appalling and sad news. From it we gather that 32% of lunacy at the present day is caused by drink. During the last five years, the average admitted each year, the assignable cause being drink, is 3,143 by far the highest of all the physical causes. Of the total number of registered lunatics, that is, 113,964, about 36,465, are at the present moment detained as certified lunatics, whose condition has been so brought on by drink. Dr. G. H. Savage of Bethlehem Asylum says, in England, the increase of insanity is generally considered to vary directly as the increase in the consumption of alcohol. The Continent, according to the Journal of Mental Science, the lunatic statistics of Paris for the years 1872 to 85 show a total of admissions due to alcohol as 5,063, being 28% of the men. A. R. Kushni says, 
In Prussia, 886 to 88, 11 percent of the cases admitted to insane asylums were diagnosed as directly due to alcoholic excess, while in one of the Berlin asylums, the enormous percentage of 47.4 of the admissions were found to be addicted to alcohol. Kun Pontopadin, in the Dictionary of Psychological Medicine, gives the statistics at that time, 1892, for all Denmark as 10.2 percent of the insanity caused by inebriety. For Copenhagen, the percentage was 11.5. Professor Hopp of Berlin affirms that in 1899-1900, to 41% of the admissions to an insane asylums in Prussia were chronic alcoholics or children of alcoholic parents. Dr. Jules Mossel, directing physician of the State Asylum for the Insane, Mons, Belgium, in 1900 said, in respect to the proportion of insanity caused by alcohol, one cannot appeal to the statistics of Belgium, which in general do not merit much confidence. French tables mention the proportion of 38% with men and 12% with women. It is evident that this is under the truth, since many cases of alcoholism are not officially mentioned. Not all these insane inebriates figure in statistics but we encounter many of them in prisons, workhouses, etc. Professor A. Forel in 1901 says, about three quarters of the idiots and epileptics at bicentury descend from alcoholic parents. The careful statistics of the Swiss Confederation show that about one third of the male inmates of insane asylums, one third of the male suicides, and one tenth of the men who die at 20 or more, at least in the larger town of Switzerland, are due to the alcoholic drinking of the victim. Professor Kraepelin in 1902 said, It is well known that in the asylums for the insane in the German Empire, 10% of the patients have been committed on account of mental diseases due to alcohol. In some institutions, the number is as high as 30%. And even then, these figures do not include numerous cases in which alcohol has been an exciting and not the primary cause of the trouble. In cases of mania, epilepsy, and paresis, in 1898, in the Heidelberg Clinic, the alcoholics formed more than 13% of the total number of patients. In the men's ward alone, the percentage being 25. When we remember that experience teaches that about one-third of the living children of alcoholic parents suffer from epilepsy. And that, according to Burnville, more than one-half the idiotic children have alcoholic parents. It is readily seen that there is sufficient reason for the state to take up the consideration of the alcoholic question, even if so much misery was not caused in many other directions by this poison. In dealing with insanity in its relation to alcohol, we will endeavor to describe the different forms of mental disorder. In some of our divisions, probably most authorities on insanity would concur but the patients included in other divisions are classed differently by some observers. Many separate classes are formed, and the divisions are made from different standpoints by various authorities. Chronic alcoholism. We need say but a few words concerning our first division, for most of this work is taken up with the description of chronic alcoholism and an endeavor to explain the injury done by it. It is not until it has progressed to its final stages that it comes under the head of insanity. Some very nice distinctions and diagnosis have to be made by examiners in lunacy to determine when the alcoholic is a subject for the insane asylum according to the laws and when not. Many of the symptoms which have been given in the preceding pages would be sufficient for the commitment of an alcoholic as a lunatic. In addition to the physical symptoms with which the reader is already familiar, we might mention marked tremor, especially of the lips, tongue, and hands, arteriosclerosis, liver and kidney diseases, peculiar sensations, headache, and dizziness, chronic alcoholism, and other forms of alcoholic insanity, which have been continued for a number of years, frequently end in dementia. We append a case and illustration. H.J. is a young man of 36 years of age. His maternal uncle died of alcoholic excesses. He attended school until 16 years old, but was rather backward in learning. His work as a mechanic, however, after leaving school, was steady and successful. He was always regarded as rather eccentric, reserved, and egotistical. 
He began alcoholic excesses at an early age, taking mostly beer, but latterly beer and whiskey. At 22, he lost his first position, where he had been employed for six years because of drunkenness. He then worked irregularly with his uncle on an average perhaps four days of the week, but he became so unstable that his father had to keep him under his constant surveillance and so employed him at home as an assistant in his Turkish bath establishment. Here he drank the alcohol used for massage, became a common loafer and was frequently arrested for drunkenness. At 34, he had an attack of delirium tremens. Following this, his excesses became more marked. He abused and assaulted his mother when she attempted to prevent him from drinking, cursed his father when he refused money for liquor, and even begged from patrons of the bath establishment. Finally, he began stealing bath towels, brushes, etc., which he pawned, and when intercepted in this by his parents, became enraged, accused them of using their son like a beggar, and in his anger broke furniture about the house. At this time, he was committed to this asylum. He gave evidence of markedly defective memory. After residence in the hospital for one month, he was unable to tell how long, within a month, he had been in the institution or dates of places of employment within six years. He belittled his drinking habits, was ready with a multitude of excuses for his irregularities in conduct, and failed to exhibit any feelings of shame. He was slovenly in his habits and somewhat careless in his personal appearance. He soiled his bedding in the walls of his room with tobacco and was thoroughly indolent. Physically, he presented a pronounced tremor of the tongue and hands and his arteries, especially the forehead, were tortuous and firm. A residence at the hospital of about two months did not lead to improvement, though he left assuring us that the disgrace of having been sent to an insane hospital had brought him to his senses, and that he would never drink again. His return to the old environment soon brought about excesses even greater than before, with abuse and violence, and he was again committed to the asylum six months later. Alcoholic somnambulism, a rare state called by different names, is found in alcoholism. It is little known and not recognized by the courts because of its infrequent appearance. It is called alcoholic trance, alcoholic hypnotism, alcoholic cerebral automatism, double personality of alcoholism, and alcoholic somnambulism. We have adopted the last name because it seems to be the most descriptive of the state. The attacks differ in length, and the principal characteristic, similar to all cases of so-called double personality, is a complete lapse of memory of the time covered by the attack. The distinguishing characteristics of a double personality are given by Binet as memory and character. The organization of a personality can only be distinguished by these factors, and yet it is very like the normal life. For if we regard consciousness and memory as the essential constituents of an ego, we may boldly say that every man conceals within himself the germs of a second personality. There is an abnormal condition during which the patient acts in an automatic manner and of which he can remember nothing when he awakes. The writer believes in but one personality, so when terms are used in this discussion denoting multiple personalities, they are to be understood to refer to abnormal states concerning which this is a common term. Beside the ordinary amnesia concerning the drunken state, there is sometimes a connected series of memories. We are already familiar with the case of the Irish porter, spoken of in the chapter on memory, who lost a parcel when he was intoxicated and was unable to remember, when he awoke where he had left it. On again becoming intoxicated, he was able to remember the place and went and got the parcel. In addition to this serial memory, we know very well that the character is quite changed. The penurious, miserly person becomes the open-hearted spendthrift. The quite modest neighbor, when intoxicated, is a talkative, boisterous braggart. The kind and tender father is transformed into the cruel, quarreling brute. We can hardly recognize him. The person is so changed. How many wives have repeated to the writer their experience in identical language? He is so kind and good when he is himself, but when he is intoxicated it is impossible to live with him. 
unconsciously stating a real change of personality. This is shown in another way. Not infrequently, the drunken man assumes the character of some one individual or of some class. He may be Napoleon, or simply a general, or perhaps a lawyer, or a clergyman, or some particular pugilist of wonderful prowess. Whatever character he represents himself to be, he acts out very faithfully, without doubt believing himself to be the very character which he represents. This is no more wonderful than the experience of normal consciousness, the dramatic sundering of the ego of some actors during their performances, who afterwards say their experience that they not only pretended to be, but really were the characters which they represented themselves to be for the time. But they did not have the different states severed by memory to such a degree as the drunkard. It is not the single intoxication with which we are dealing here, but rather the state of the chronic drunkard. Why should he assume this somnambulistic state? The continued severing of the consciousness by amnesia in the single intoxication tends inevitably to create a habit of mind and brain of such a character that the experience is divided, and the individual may spend a great part of his life in the second or abnormal state. We find not only that the alcoholism tends to produce a second personality, but conversely, the drinking habit is started and kept up when the person is abnormal so that it may be continued when he again reaches a normal state. It is interesting in this regard to notice what may be an indirect effect of alcoholism. In the case of Emile X, given by Binet, we observe that her father was a drunkard. The explanation of why this disseverance of consciousness comes to the alcoholic will be more fully dealt with when we speak of the reason why an alcoholic is easily hypnotized. Let us turn our attention more particularly to a description of alcoholic somnambulism. It usually comes after a long debauch during which the patient has imbibed much alcohol. It is not ushered in by any particular symptoms. The beginning is usually started when a person comes to himself by saying, the last I remember was, Evidently, the transition from the normal state is sudden and quiet, causing no notice from others and being accompanied by no alarming symptoms. During the attack, the subject does not appear drunk, although he may consume vast quantities of alcoholic liquors. He may seem perfectly normal, talk with friends, travel, transact business, and may attend social functions without attracting any attention. If examined by a person who is well acquainted with him and who was also familiar with hypnotic somnambulism, no doubt the same slight but characteristic changes might be present. As example given, the fixed look, haggard and dim eyes, and immobility of countenance. Usually the state is betrayed by some extraordinary act, not infrequently murder or some other crime. There may be simply strange actions of a puerile nature and an apparent loss of speech or hearing but most frequently crime is a result, or at least we hear most of cases of this kind. A young man, after a few glasses of cider and a drink of gin, wandered aimlessly about and deliberately shot a man. When he recovered, he was entirely unconscious of the occurrence, yet he did not appear drunk when the shooting took place. A merchant, a heavy wine drinker, drank champagne at his club, and his mind became confused. He recovered two weeks later, having married in the meantime and visited several cities. He drank heavily all the time. His mind appeared clear, and nothing unusual was noticed in his manner and conversation, but no memory of the time was retained. Later on another occasion he came to himself on the ocean, having taken passage for Liverpool. The last he remembered was drinking with a friend in Boston. A traveling salesman recovered after a week of which he could remember nothing, during which he attended to his business and nothing unusual was noticed. Lloyd Tucky cites the following case. Alcoholic intoxication is sometimes accompanied by distinct double personality, but this is rarely so well marked as in the case of a farmer referred to by Professor Ball. This man was a dipsomaniac and frequently got drunk while attending the markets. In this state, however, he continued to transact business and apparently with considerable judgment and ability, but on becoming sober, he would be quite unconscious of what had taken place, and his business suffered severely in consequence. He hit upon the idea of keeping a notebook for use during his drunken state, 
and he found that by doing so he was able to preserve a written record of his operations, which supplied the hiatus in his memory. The resume of several cases has been given in order that the general condition might be portrayed. No doubt defenses of amnesia and ignorance are frequently made in the courts when they are not justified by the acts, but this should not debar us from recognizing genuine cases of this nature. Some are inclined to think that when a man appears all right and is able to transact business, etc., the plea of amnesia and consequent abnormality and irresponsibility is but a subterfuge. But we have many cases showing similar phenomena. Post-epileptic states may show the same characteristics, especially that of amnesia. Everyone is familiar with the real somnambulist sleepwalker. He accomplishes feats of strength and skill, solves problems, etc., but of them he is absolutely unconscious when he awakes in the morning. Closely connected with this is the somnambulism of the hypnotic state, and there is reason to think that this alcoholic somnambulism and that of hypnotism are closely allied on account of the suggestibleness frequently found in this condition. The following case clearly illustrates this. P. et. 31. No fixed occupation. Mother died of a fit, said to have been demented some time before her death. A cousin on the maternal side, idiotic. Another committed suicide. A brother suffered convulsions in childhood. Prisoner was always idle and unstable. Lost several engagements through drunkenness. Drinking for over ten years before the crime. Was once convicted summarily for drunkenness. Had had rheumatic fever and syphilis and suffered from mitral disease. Three days before the crime, prisoner took a room in a brothel and went on a steady drinking bout with one of the girls of the house. On the day of the crime, in the afternoon, he went out with this girl. Having had some drink in a tavern, they entered a cab, directing the driver to take them back to the brothel. On arriving there, P. got out of the cab and told the driver that he had killed the girl and that she had asked him to do so. She was stabbed in the heart with a penknife. P. could give no further account of the affair. The woman told him to stab her, and he obeyed as one might in a dream. There is also a case reported by Prosper Despine, where one of the four drunkards who were conversing together suggested the hanging of the most intoxicated of the party, a suggestion promptly carried out, with results which only fail of being fatal through the accident of outside intervention. These attacks may last any length of time, from a few minutes to months, and when the patient awakes, he may be familiar with his surroundings and think no time, or at most a night, has passed, but there is usually a very surprised expression when he comes to himself. Alcoholic Epilepsy Besides aggravating the ordinary forms of epilepsy, alcoholic excess may give rise to epileptic attacks. This is seen in children of alcoholics or those who have unstable nervous systems. After several debauches, the attacks most frequently appear. Berkeley says as high as 8 or 10 percent of alcoholics have eventually epileptic seizures. This state is closely connected with the alcoholic somnambulism as ordinary epilepsy is related to somnambulism. In fact, somnambulism states may be but equivalents of epileptic seizures. It is also connected with delirium tremens, as is shown by the following from Wernicke. Of the complications of delirium tremens, that with epilepsy needs to be especially mentioned. The epileptic seizures of the inebriate are a sign of alcoholic degeneration of the brain, like delirium tremens. According to the experiences in our clinic, they generally occur 36 to 48 hours before the outbreak of the delirium, following in excess, and in case complete abstinence is affected, to be entirely wanting subsequently. At the clinic, alcoholic epileptic seizures most always occur only on the first days following admission. If we have, therefore, as it frequently happens, to constate the consequences of the epileptic seizure, bitten tongue, etc., on admission, we have the task, if possible, to effect total abstinence. Bonhoeffer has referred to this almost uniform relation. Alcoholic amnesia. Some writers lay considerable emphasis upon one form of alcoholic mental disorder which manifests itself 
principally by an almost total lack of memory for recent events. Other investigators deal with this form under the rubric of Korsakow's disease. This usually accompanies polyneuritis, insomnia, loss of appetite, and defective nutrition. It begins suddenly with excitement, the patient being confused, disoriented, restless, and anxious, and having some hallucinations of sight. Only the events of early life are remembered, the events of the day or even the previous minute being forgotten. He asks the same question and relates the same facts over and over again, and knows not whether he has had meals, taken a walk, or received a visitor directly after these things have taken place. He loses all account of time and cannot tell whether an event occurred a week or a year ago, nor can he recall test words after a moment's conversation. Most patients recognize their trouble, and their strife to overcome it is often partially successful. While anxious at first, they may later become quarrelsome and irritable, especially when their inconsistencies are shown to them. Some show a marked indifference, but may improve gradually and are much better after nine months or a year. But the defect of memory persists in most cases. Complete recovery is rare. This may be the only symptom of dementia present, or the attack may terminate apoplexy, epilepsy, hemiplegia, or a simple brain wasting. This is separate from and must not be confused with the alcoholic somnambulism. Dipsomania, clearly to be classed as a form of insanity, and yet seldom found in an insane retreat, are cases of dipsomania. This is a recurrent monomania, which is expressed by an unconquerable thirst for alcohol, and most frequently exhibits itself at regular periods. In the interim between the attacks, alcohol is not desired, and in some cases absolutely abhorred. Spitzka defines it as a form of periodical insanity manifesting itself in a blind craving for stimulant and narcotic beverages. Cases of this kind are distinguished from chronic alcoholism by the fact that in the latter, the desire for alcohol is always present in an intense form, and there is a total lack of shame concerning the drinking. The dipsomaniac knows his weakness and is ashamed of it, while recognizing that he is unable to prevent it. What is called pseudodipsomania is a condition when the patient is always ready to drink and never has the abhorrence for drinking which the dipsomaniac manifests in his periods of abstinence. Circumstances or opportunity regulate the time of the pseudodipsomaniac's excesses. The dipsomaniacal attacks come suddenly, but are usually preceded by some premonitory symptoms differing with the individual. When the storm bursts, the dipsomaniac gives himself up to the unrestrained indulgence, not infrequently accompanied by other vices. This is continued for periods of different lengths and may terminate as suddenly as it began. The causes of dipsomania seem to be apparent in most cases, for the subjects are almost entirely nervous degenerates, and the element of alcohol is more or less an accident and is but one of the varying manifestations of a bad diathesis. The family histories are largely tinctured with nervous disorders. Hysteria, epilepsy, migraine, and insanity are found in the immediate ancestry. Where dipsomania appears, epilepsy is suspected, and some would go so far as to say that dipsomaniacal attack is but the equivalent of an epileptic seizure. Improper physical and psychical conditions which tend to depress the nervous system of those who are already unstable are liable to prove an exciting cause of dipsomania. Such experiences as overwork, shock, prolonged depression, excitement due to political strife, social worries, neurasthenia, and sexual excess frequently excite to indulgence. Sometimes there is a pathological series of diseases of which dipsomania is one. Raymond Dondino reports a case where the series consisted of migraine, dipsomania, and gouty rheumatism. In another case of dipsomania and hemorrhoids, the succeeding trouble taking the place of the preceding ones. In the case of John Kinzel, the series consisted of petite mal, double personality, and dipsomania. Dipsomania and other manias are coexistent in some diseased minds. Kleptomania is the one most frequently associated with dipsomania. And in some cases of alcoholism, 
there is developed a kleptomania which exhibits itself during every intoxication and often takes symptomatic and peculiar forms as when example given an alcoholic will steal only bibles or shoes sometimes these manias may be interchangeable at one attack there will be manifested a dipsomania and in place of this at the next attack may come other monomanias example given pyromania kleptomania erotomania american climate and hurry are more favorable for the development of dipsomania than the milder climate and mode of life of europe not infrequently a change of residence or business will assist in a cure dr march of albany trefined a man who had been an inebriate since he received an injury to his head by a fall after the operation the man felt no further need for desire for alcohol living a total abstainer for the remainder of his life cases of this kind illustrate another cause of the disease and are termed a traumatic dipsomania a great number of remote causes are mentioned by different authors as example given sexual continence and celibates so that it is impossible to mention all the causes but we can safely say that the lesser and exciting causes owe their potency in inducing the disease to an unstable nervous system in some the dipsomaniacal periods differ in length from two days to three or four years and occur with astronomical exactness it may be every 52 days or every 27 days and 12 hours but whatever time has been observed can be counted on in other cases there is not the regularity of the periods but the storms are determined by exciting circumstances in most cases we are ignorant of the causes which determine their length but some patients show quite plainly that such events as the seasons of the year the rhythm of nutrition dietetic conditions and in females menstruation determine the time of the attack with some patients the sober period shorten getting less and less each time but in others the rhythmical period remains constant a great variety of the symptoms are harbingers of the outbreak while they vary largely in different persons they are usually constant in the same person usually nervous depression restlessness irritability insomnia and abhorrence of existing conditions are among the symptoms and many dipsomaniacs easily recognize when an attack is imminent some other symptoms gathered at random are parsimoniousness and fear of impoverishment delusions of benevolence and consequent generosity great activity and mania for work inactivity and distaste for labor insatiable appetite for food distaste for anything to eat and loss of all appetite for food sexual excess hyperesthesia to heat or cold undue excitement over small matters hysterical attacks etc during a period of total abstinence he may be haunted with the idea of drink this is soon followed by a desire for drink which may be strenuously combated but finally becomes irresistible one case might be quoted more fully the subject was a physician of middle age and a bachelor highly gifted mentally and morally liberally educated and except for these attacks in enjoyment of perfect health with him it was no accidental beginning his spells never began by any drinking alcohol was no factor in his disease the psychological processes that brought the irresistible need for that oblivion and subsequent crisis that he found only in heavy drinking came on slowly and from some obscure cause and when fully under the influence of the spell a veritable mental aberration he would begin his preparations for a long and vehement debauch with all the secrecy of a conspirator and with the watchfulness ingenuity and irresistible impulses of a kleptomaniac for days he would cautiously gather his stores of brandy gin and whiskey or whatever other alcoholic beverage he could procure for the coming event and secret his bottles in the most likely places to escape immediate detection his hunting boots hunting case gun case spaces in his bookcases in the rear of his books the sleeves of his coat spaces under or between his mattresses and every conceivable hiding place were well stowed with bottles of the best and strongest liquors before he would allow himself to touch a drop when all was ready his spell of debauch would be inaugurated at nightfall 
but missed at his meals and at his accustomed places by his friends who always feared the cause of his disappearance would be found in his room in a glorious state of intoxication he would walk rigidly with tensely rigid frame hardly able to articulate and his eyes would have a wild fixed unnatural stare and seemed to be more or less protruding it was really pitiful to see this intelligent and proud man now attempt to act the considerate and courtly gentleman that he always was in his moments of intervals of strict sobriety the search for his bottles would then begin but he always managed to profit by past experiences and have some new source of supply from some obscure reserve store hidden away elsewhere and from this and what few small bottles would escape the detection would finish his spell an ending that always came when his stomach refused longer to hold any liquor a week of hard retching vomitings stomach and headache followed with desires to commit suicide with continuing spells of deep contrition and self-reproaches and when able to again take some food and stand on his feet he would depart for a couple of weeks recuperation away from home and be himself until the recurrence of a new attack footnote p c Ramondino, a study of the causes and nature of dipsomania quarterly journal of inebriety volume 23 pages 131 forward and footnote these prominatory symptoms are common with other manias it is during this time that the attack may be averted but after the storm has burst it must run its course the patient will pawn his clothes steal or do anything to obtain alcohol nothing but physical restraint will prevent excessive indulgence as dr skye said years ago he will drink shoe blacking and turpentine hair wash or anything stimulating he is able to imbibe an immense amount of liquor and it requires much more to affect him than an ordinary drunkard in some cases the attack is self-limited and at certain times the craving ceases but more often the debauch is limited only by the finances or the stomach with money all gone or experiencing inability to retain any alcohol the patient a physical and mental wreck for the time being seeks to regain his former standing during the attack criminal and depraved instincts are developed in some cases so that thefts assaults and other misdemeanors are committed and indulgences of licentiousness and unprovoked jealousies which are directly opposed to the conduct and disposition of the individual in his normal state cause him remorse when he recovers the restlessness of the attack is portrayed in a recent work of fiction where the hero says why should i have these fearful horrible outbreaks of nervous depression ending in attacks of dipsomania they will land me in the madhouse prison or grave according to circumstances use your willpower only the most ignorant could give such advice do you tell the epileptic to use his willpower doctor i surmise you have many a time left the trembling disheartened dipsomaniac with the advice not to drink any more just what he was trying to do doctor but he thought that you would help him carry out his fervent desires and also your advice no doctor the study of these cases is beyond you the time will arrive when scientists must recognize the nervous instability of certain individuals which takes the form of dipsomania and be able to distinguish drunkenness vice and immoral habits from a nerve explosion which has wrecked numerous homes and destroyed many brilliant minds when alcohol cannot be obtained during these attacks an abnormal condition is very noticeable among the physical changes are increased pulse rate feverish skin and parched throat restlessness and fear of impending danger changed temper jealousy and chaotic mental states are common physical symptoms one case we quote to show the not unusual development of alcoholic symptoms when alcohol has not been taken during these periods dipsomania if denied alcohol there would be complete loss of appetite and inability to sleep his eyes would become bloodshot his gait staggering his conversation would be voluble silly and incoherent and delusions would often be present in short he would at times present all the phenomena of intoxication without having to my certain knowledge partaken of a single drop of alcohol in the interim between attacks if the patient has not had much experience he may think that he is completely cured sign the pledge and make all efforts to reform 
At this time, alcoholic beverages are usually repulsive. Sometimes, though, he recognizes his disease and looks forward with fear and aversion to the next outbreak, while his friends and family upbraid him for his past failures and plead with him for reform. Dipsomaniacs are not infrequently persons of extraordinary mental ability. Footnote. See C. Lombroso, The Man of Genius, pages 54 forward, for a list of famous alcoholics. And footnote. The genius has one faculty developed at the expense of the others, and insofar is abnormal and subject to more abnormality. Whether he be physician, artist, musician, or literature, he is living at a high nervous tension, his nervous energy is easily exhausted, and his reserve brain power is soon expended. No other class of partaker of alcohol is composed of such bright and intelligent men or men who both by nature and education are better equipped morally. Frequently dipsomaniacs do not drink in company, but imbibe secretly, and a recluse is to be suspected especially among women. When the first symptoms of the attack make their appearance, the outbreak can sometimes be aborted by the use of physical means, correcting and cleansing the digestive organs, or by the psychical means through the use of hypnotism. Usually, though, it takes its course. It will be some advance when dipsomania is clearly diagnosed, not only by physicians, but by the courts, and it is recognized that during the paroxysms, the individual is really insane and irresponsible for his acts. Magnin has made a distinction which is well taken. A dipsomaniac is insane to drink, but a drunkard is insane after he is drunk. In 350 cases of alcoholism studied by Dr. Dana at Bellevue Hospital, the most frequent form was dipsomania, and the next pseudo-dipsomania. End of chapter 9, part 1. Chapter 9, Part 2 of The Psychology of Alcoholism by George Barton Cuton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Delirium Tremens While the onset of delirium tremens is sudden, it is the result of chronic alcoholism and not of acute intoxication. The occasion of the attack may be either excessive indulgence or the sudden withdrawal of alcohol. The immediate cause is not known, but one theory which has gained favor and is supported by not a few facts, is that the condition, which is recognized as a result of poison, is not brought about by the alcohol directly, but by some toxic substance which the alcohol generates and of which the alcohol is an antidote. In a paper read at the 8th International Congress, Vienna, 1901, Professor Jalgeg sets forth this view. The facts cited to substantiate this are the necessity of a chronic alcoholic condition with previous continued excess, which shows that it is not a case of direct alcoholic poisoning. And further, this poison cannot be alcohol, for alcohol lessens its influence in delirium tremens. And after a short abstinence, as in the morning when tremor and nausea are present, the poison has great similarity in its effects to those of bacterial origin, of some infectious diseases, as example given typhoid fever, for it frequently runs a course as these do, and an examination of the blood exhibits similar phenomena. Inflammation of the conjunctiva and irregularity of renal action carry the analogy still further. A paper by Dr. Pritchard confirms the kidney diagnosis and also the indirect poison theory, for his contention is that Delirium tremens is usually connected with acute nephritis, and that the poison which causes delirium tremens is that of uremia. In other words, he would affirm that alcohol affects the kidneys so that they are unable to excrete the poisonous materials, and when this peculiarly alcoholic matter enters the blood, the result is delirium tremens. The seriousness of the attack depends on the condition of the kidneys. This theory could be well assimilated with that of Professor Jogic, but does not explain the further contention of the latter that alcohol is an antidote to this poison. 
This part of the theory is maintained on account of the recognized effects of abstinence and the alleviation of the intensity of the attack. When alcohol is given, while also prolonging it, that is, the poison, no longer held in check by alcohol, spreads through the system and causes delirium. When alcohol is given, delirium is milder, but more poison is generated and the attack is prolonged. For a time it was denied that abstinence occasioned by delirium tremens, but it is being admitted more now. And hence this theory accords with facts as accepted by some investigators. Whether we accept this or not, we recognize that directly or indirectly alcohol is the cause of faulty metabolism, which in turn results in this mental and physical injury of which we are speaking. The general symptoms of delirium tremens are quite constant. Among them are to be noticed tremulousness, limbs, lips, tongue, voice, depression, mental confusion, insomnia, symptoms of motor paresis, hallucinations, restless, delirium, and delusions of fear. Bleeding from nose and gums and convulsions may also be present. The hallucinations and illusions are different with every case, but it is noted that the hallucinations are usually of a visual character, although they may be connected with any of the other senses. Erroneous perceptions give rise to illusions of all kinds of grotesque shapes and terrifying forms, and the hallucinations of creeping things which are so common always posit the creatures in motion. Peripheral disturbances lead the patient to think that ants and bugs are crawling over them, or that his body is full of wounds. He reacts to all his hallucinations, looks under the bed, in the cracks of the floor, into the closet, to follow the movement of the animals which he has recently seen and feared, or he runs to the window to watch the horse which he sees running away, to escape from the objects of hallucinations he may at times do injury to his attendants, or his suspicions may be centered around the attendant, so that he is led to do injury to him from the standpoint of what he considers self-protection. Small animals such as insects, snakes, toads, rats, and spiders are most frequently seen, but occasionally large and mythical animals like dragons are present in hallucinations. The vision of snakes and worms has been accounted for by the distended blood vessels of the eyes. Itching of the skin starts hallucinations of vermin, which are afterwards seen in the room, and the goose flesh, which sweeps cold and wave-like over portions of the body, suggests snakes. The delusions are restless, and the patient is always on the move, so that it is classed as an occupation mania. Thus, if death comes, it is from exhaustion on account of malnutrition, constant movement, and loss of sleep. The longest case of delirium tremens, of which we have read, was one of 51 days, and the attacks vary from that to two days. Very seldom the patients can stand more than a few days' illness. The disease is generally self-limiting, either reaching a favorable or fatal termination in 60 to 100 hours. If the hallucinations of hearing persist after the attack has subsided, doubts of complete mental restoration are greater. It will not be within our sphere to touch on the subject of treatment, except in one particular, and that is whether it is best to continue the use of alcohol in lessening quantities, or to entirely withdraw it, and if necessary substitute other drugs. The latter is much more favored by authorities today. It seems, in one way, to be a matter of choice, by using less and less alcohol, so that it is entirely withdrawn at the end of four or five days. The attack is prolonged, but lessened in intensity. By completely withdrawing alcohol, the attack is made much shorter, but is more intense. In the case of 51 days referred to above, the first four weeks, a physician gave from four to six ounces of whiskey daily. Those who use alcohol in treatment claim that it is cruelty not to do so. Those who do not maintain that they have better results and the extreme agony for a few hours has a salutary effect. In line with the last idea, one army surgeon who was stationed at Fort Vancouver, which at the time had the largest ratio of admissions for drunkenness, 
adopted a plan which he found very successful. When an alcoholic called for him, he immediately placed the patient upon the operating table, introduced the stomach tube, pumped out the stomach, then washed it out, and after he had freed the stomach of all mucus and contents, he gave the patient a bowl of hot essence of capsicum and allowed him to rest for a few hours. This plan was very prompt in relieving the man, and its deterrent influence on the drink habit was also excellent. In his report, he concluded by saying that he never had occasion to administer his treatment to the same patient more than once. Perhaps the rapid, cruel treatment of delirium tremens may be the most humane after all. We append the following typical case. C.L. is a well-developed, well-nourished German, 41 years of age. His father was a chronic alcoholic, and his half-sister was insane. As a young man, he led a dissipated life. He has been addicted to the use of alcoholic beverages for the past 15 years, and during the past two years has frequently been intoxicated. His favorite beverages were gin and cider. He gradually became indolent and indifferent to the wants of the family, and is also said to have deteriorated in memory. While naturally suspicious, he gradually became unkind, quarrelsome, and jealous of his wife accusing her of infidelity. Early in July 1902, he ran into the house quite out of breath and in much fear, saying, Thank God I have escaped from that devil that was after me. This apprehension, which was a touch of the horrors, lasted but a few hours. One month later, after a period of a week or so of indisposition and gastric disturbance, some nausea, vomiting, anorexia, and also muscular tremor in incoordination, he suddenly developed terrifying hallucinations of sight and hearing. He saw devils, eels, and rats passing by him, shook worms from the ends of his fingers, thought his bed was on fire, and tried to put it out, and saw his wife in intercourse with one of his fellow workmen. He became extremely fearful rushed about to escape the animals which were following him, and would leap out of bed in great horror. His consciousness was completely clouded. When at home, he thought himself in a shop, and that those about him were shopmates. His attention was completely absorbed in his numerous hallucinations, and he talked of being executed, asked if he was to be brought to Hartford for burial, and wept for his poor children who were to be orphans. Other delusions were that if his wife was unfaithful, and that some of his children were by other men. His insomnia was extreme, and at first he could not be induced to eat. In the course of fifteen days, while still completely disoriented and suffering from many hallucinations which had lost much of their effect, he would shake the worms from his fingertips quite indifferently and would sit for hours, apparently watching with interest the numerous creeping things about him. He became emotional only when speaking of his wife's behavior. His activity had disappeared and he was quiet and tractable, but reticent and self-absorbed. His muscular tremor continued and his deep reflexes were much exaggerated. At the end of the third week, his hallucinations began to disappear quite rapidly and he became thoroughly conscious. Likewise, all delusions and fear disappeared and by the 25th day he had thoroughly recovered except for some muscular tremor. Pathological inebriety. Wernicke differentiates pathological drunkenness from delirium tremens, the former being distinguished chiefly by a delirium of a few hours only, where delirium tremens last days. Hale Broner has described this condition, pathological inebriety he calls it, quite fully and says that it seldom fails to be the initial parents of those cases of delirium tremens, which later show the typical humorous disposition. He cites some cases and gives symptoms which immediately suggest delirium tremens, as example given, fear, loss of localization, and visual hallucinations. In many cases, he says that the whole course occupies a few minutes, particularly with those in whom the excitation stage sets in during half-sleep. Most cases end in deep sleep. This is called by some a touch of the horrors. 
and is an abortive form of delirium tremens. Mania a patu. Some authorities differentiate mania a patu from delirium tremens, but in most cases it seems hardly necessary to make the distinction. We do so here for the sake of completeness. It is called, besides mania a patu, acute alcoholic mania, delirium, ambrosium, oinomania, and both this and delirium tremens are called acute alcoholic delirium by different writers. The distinction is credited to magnum. This form of disorder usually appears among those who have an inherited tendency to mental instability and excitement, and most frequently among periodic or occasional drinkers. It may follow the indulgence in a very small amount of alcohol, or there may have been abstinence from alcohol for weeks prior to the attack, but the patient may have been nervous, had gastric disturbances and general malaise with irritability and hideous dreams. There may have been some sudden shock to develop the mania, which frequently comes without warning. There is great excitement and the attack is exceedingly violent, but usually brief. Similar to delirium tremens, there are hallucinations and illusions of a variable fleeting nature, and while in delirium tremens, motor symptoms are as prominent as the sensorial, the most notable feature of mania apatu is the prominence of sensorial disturbances. These may show themselves, among other ways, in amblyopia, dyschromatopia, and auditory, olfactory, and gustatory disturbances. It also differs from delirium tremens in an absence of tremor and restlessness, and in the more marked and ungovernable fury. Kerr denies any hallucinations, but most other authorities cite them. The primary effects of medication are good, but one other characteristic of this disorder is the sudden and frequent relapses. These outbursts occur after intervals of apparent convalescence and may come repeatedly without further indulgence in alcohol. Alcoholic delusional insanity. This form of insanity develops as delirium tremens does. Why the apparently same conditions should develop in one person into delusional insanity and in another into delirium tremens is a mystery. Or why at one time a person should have one form of mental trouble and at another time the other has not been explained. The onset is sudden, but unlike delirium tremens, the consciousness is unclouded. Similar to dipsomaniacal attacks, there may be premonitory symptoms such as irritability, headache, dizziness, and insomnia. Sometimes for days after the first noises are heard, the patient may attend to his regular work, but when the attack is further advanced, it attracts the attention of his associates. Sleep is disturbed by strange sounds, which suddenly awaken the patient. The sounds become more definite and finally are resolved into voices, which are heard day and night. The voices become definite words, then phrases and finally sentences, all of which refer to the patient and accuse him of crimes. He hears himself all manner of derogatory names, and the voices predict for him an ignominious fate which he well deserves. He is compelled to listen to his death sentence by the court, or to plans for his assassination or legal execution. Neighbors shout or jeer at him, and all persons seen or thought of seek his life. Sometimes he accuses himself of crimes, and when any patient pretends to be a murderer, it is almost a sure symptom of alcoholism. These delusions of persecution are very characteristic symptoms. Occasionally there may be delusions of exaltation as well as of persecution, but usually they are of the latter character. Sometimes electricity appeals strongly to the imagination of these patients, and they have delusions concerning this. The writer remembers one patient who had a delusion that wires were under the floor, and he was connected electrically with wax figures which his enemies were exhibiting in the town. These figures reproduced every movement of his, and were associated in the exhibition with the figures of noted criminals.
he earnestly appealed for relief from this unbearable condition very seldom any except auditory hallucinations are present sometimes there may be some sight sexual delusions are quite common and much of this supposed injury done to the patient is connected with the sexual organs he is fearful of castration or of other similar operations the patient is extremely egotistical and refers everything to himself he sees in the look of a bystander scorn and reproach or in the movement of an attendant some attempt to do him personal injury he may thus become so much prejudiced against doctor or nurse that when he recovers he is unable to overcome it and ever afterwards entertains a strong personal dislike persons watch him condemn him pursue him and seek to do him harm his whole time is spent in an endeavor to elude his persecutors he becomes suspicious and distrustful of every person and every movement people he thinks are trying to rob him and even the kindly intended acts are misinterpreted he is fearful of consequences and in his desperation may try to escape them by suicide or by killing the person who he thinks has injured him his whole life is conducted according to his delusions accompanying these psychological symptoms are some physiological ones as example given insomnia tremor of hands and tongue impaired appetite and loss of flesh the reflexes are occasionally exaggerated usually the patient recovers in a short time varying from a few weeks to a few months the delusions may persist for a year and in a few cases become chronic this trouble is sometimes called alcoholic mania but we are indebted to professor Kraplin for the designation which we use a case is appended wn is a man of 49 years of age with negative family history an englishman and for many years a stonemason but latterly a painter he had been a moderate drinker five glasses of beer daily until a few months prior to the onset of his psychosis when he began to drink some whiskey in addition at about this time he established himself in business but did not meet with much success this worried him as well as the fact that he had recently passed urinary calculi he left home to visit friends in a neighboring city and the first night drank about three glasses of beer and some whiskey. He awoke about two o'clock in the morning and heard some people in the next room saying that his wife was unfaithful and had had intercourse with her brother. Later he heard his brother-in-law in the hallway attempting to shoot him. He went to the police for protection, became fearful and much agitated. The hallucinations of hearing became more prominent. His wife, other women, friends and strangers were heard talking day and night he believed his wife was having illicit intercourse with attendants in the building and could hear her talking with them and cursing he thought that he had been tricked into the hospital and that the nurses had given him poison etc at the end of three weeks god was talking to him announcing that his sentence had expired his sins had been forgiven etc by this time, his ideas of infidelity had disappeared. He gradually became less restless and agitated, and lost most of his former effect, spending his time playing games and reading papers. In the course of three months, while hallucinations still continued, he began to express delusions of an expansive nature, such as that he had much money to lend and had control of the buying for the institution yet said that he must go to prison and that injury was being done to him his delusions were unsystemized and varied greatly from day to day emotionally he was greatly depressed and upon slight provocation became very irritable about the seventh month of the psychosis he began to develop various somatic delusions such as that he was being played on by the x-rays the apparatus of which was attached to his chest and ankles and this prevented him from talking properly he was teased by machines and was being hammered by ten thousand hammers 
Men got under his pillow at night, teased him, then went through his head. His consciousness remained unclouded and his memory unimpaired. His delusions, however, were more incoherently expressed. Emotionally, he failed to show any reaction to his many delusions. The patient's condition remained unchanged after a duration of two years. Alcoholic Paranoia This mental trouble is differentiated from true paranoia by the symptoms of chronic alcoholism and by lack of system in the delusions. The onset is gradual and starts with suspicions of infidelity in the spouse and married patients. On account of the frequent indulgence in alcohol, there is often an estrangement between husband and wife, and this presents a nucleus about which delusions of jealousy form. Kraft Ebbing thinks that the failing of sex powers may be a factor in inciting the delusions. As soon as these suspicions begin, the patient thinks that the change in the attitude of his wife toward him, really due to his indulgences, is caused by her preference for other men, and he takes note of the most insignificant occurrence, which he interprets into proof of his wife's change of affections. In the partially systematized delusions, very strange circumstances are woven into the fabric. Any act of kindness proffered by a neighbor, the addresses of a friend to the children, the presence of the postman at the door discharging his regular duties, the call of an agent or a peddler, every word, glance, or action of persons passing on the street are positive proofs of his wife's infidelity, and his insane jealousy is intolerable. Hallucinations of hearing or delusions of actual noises are interpreted as signs made by his wife's lover, or as whispered conversation between the two. Hallucinations of smell and taste are the beginnings of delusions of poisoning, of which he accuses his wife or her lover. His hallucinations are not nearly so numerous as in cases of delusional insanity, and in some cases are entirely absent. Scandals are not infrequently circulated concerning the innocent wife, started by the mentally unbalanced husband, who tells his suspicions and gives his proofs, frequently displaying much emotion, but his reasoning concerning these things is weak and absurd. The patient will bemoan his misfortune, but will live peaceably with his wife, whom he thinks is unfaithful, and very seldom will he attempt acts of violence. He, in common with all alcoholics, is always on the defensive, and if he commits an act of violence, it is in self-defense as he supposes. In other respects, his actions are at variance with his delusions. In unmarried patients, quite frequently, religious delusions are present, regardless of the religious fervor of their former lives. These delusions are often connected with the priest. Others, who are unmarried, have their delusions center about the supposed outrage or prostitution of sisters or other members of the family. In cases of alcoholic paranoia, recovery is not probable. The course of the disease is progressive and the delusions seldom disappear. If taken out of home surroundings and put in a place where it is impossible to obtain alcohol, the patient may improve temporarily, but a return home shows how slight the improvement has been. We append a case. McGee is an Irishman, 50 years of age, whose family history is of no special importance, except that his brother suffered from chronic alcoholism. He was a man of limited education, and until 39 was a steady, hard-working mechanic. He had always been a moderate drinker, mostly of beer. At this time, he gave up his regular occupation and purchased a saloon. He then began to drink liquors, mostly whiskey, and temperance increased, and at the end of two years he developed an attack of delirium tremens, from which he fully recovered. In the course of three years it became evident that he was losing his business ability. He trusted irresponsible parties, and in another year was forced to assign. Drinking continued to excess, and the support of family fell upon his wife, who was forced to take boarders. He himself was employed as a day laborer, 
earning only enough to supply himself with liquor. He became negligent of his family, careless of his own appearance, and surly and irritable. Delusions of jealousy gradually appeared. He accused his wife of consorting with her boarders, began to secret himself in order to watch her behavior, and followed her into the street. Once he thought that he had detected evidence of her concealment in a room with a boarder. The fact that his oldest boy was singularly red-headed was taken as evidence of earlier infidelity on her part, and a red-headed cousin of hers who had occasionally visited the family was designated as the father of this boy. He became abusive to his wife, often threatening and at times assaulting her. His memory became faulty, and he lost interest in work of any sort, and when not drinking haunted the house in search of his wife's supposed admirers. His intolerable conduct necessitated his commitment to the hospital at 48. At this time he did not give evidence of hallucinations. His consciousness was clear, but his memory was impaired, especially for recent events, and his delusions of infidelity were fixed. He, however, was reticent in reference to them for several weeks. Emotionally he was depressed by his confinement and sad over his wife's misbehavior. He was orderly in conduct, presented a tidy appearance, and employed himself willingly in small ways, but seemed to have little energy save for reading the paper and talking with fellow patients. There was a pronounced tremor of the hands and some muscular incoordination. Otherwise, he was physically in good condition. After a residence of three months, the patient suddenly developed hallucinations of hearing claiming that he heard his wife telephoning to the attendant to keep him confined in the hospital. She also telephoned to him. The buzzing of the telephone was going on all the time, and he would have it stopped. A few days later, he accused the attendant of attempting to poison him and developed great fear, asking to be allowed to sleep in a single room, as he had heard someone say that he was to be stabbed. This condition disappeared gradually within one and a half months, since which time the patient has remained without change for two years, still maintaining his delusions of infidelity, but never mentioning them unless questioned. His conduct is orderly and he is neat in personal appearance, is helpful in war duties, but spends most of his time in reading newspapers. He frequently importunes for his release, but he is never aggressive in this matter. Mental weakness is apparent also in his desire and willingness to return to his wife and his poor memory for recent events. Alcoholic paresis. This is called at times alcoholic pseudoparesis, as the former type is frequently designated alcoholic pseudoparanoia. Alcoholic paresis is frequently so like general paralysis of the insane that the diagnosis may remain in doubt for some time. In both diseases, the onset is gradual with hallucinations and delusions of persecution and infidelity, progressive impairment of memory and judgment, expansive delusions, a sense of well-being, and mental stupidity. Physically, both diseases are characterized by sensory disturbances, muscular tremor, exaggerated or absent tendon reflexes, disturbances of speech, ataxia, and occasional epileptiform attacks. The differentiation is made in the progress of these two diseases. Alcoholic paresis is not progressive. The course may be protracted, but in a few months or years, the more marked symptoms disappear or remain stationary, usually leaving the patient in a condition of mild dementia with a few expansive or depressive delusions. In general paresis, the course progresses to a fatal termination, and here the patient is less active and forceful. If he has the same delusions as the alcoholic, they are less coherent and logical, and he is more indifferent to and less disturbed by them. Tremor is more general and muscular weakness more marked than in alcoholic paresis. The paretic sleeps better and has inequality of pupils with slowness of reaction, and the changes in reflexes are more marked. Moderate drinkers sometimes come gradually to this state, not recognizing any change but a slow deterioration of the mental faculties is present. 
The history of a case may begin with an attack of cerebritis. Knees bend under him. He becomes degraded in habits and eats ravenously, is sullen or constantly cheerful with exalted ideas. He may burst out in attacks of aggressive excitement, may mutilate himself, and after every exciting attack becomes more and more demented. Alcoholic paresis shows itself as premature senility. Old age comes to the young and middle-aged men. In city sleep, it benumbs the faculties until man comes to have little more than a vegetable existence. All that made him a man has slowly been withdrawn, and the silly, demented wreck marks the place where once a man stood. It is the last step in the alcoholic's march, the last chapter of his life, to which his previous experience, if life lasted, inevitably pointed. Kraft Ebbing found the pathological conditions the same as in general paralysis, except for the absence of the granulations of the ventricles. Different from general paresis, even after year standing, the patient may improve so as to return to his business and home. This is very infrequent. Beside this alcoholic paresis, it should be noted that, next to syphilis, alcohol is the most prominent factor in production and development of general paralysis. A case is appended. D.L. is 43 years of age, a day laborer, married, and the father of six children. For three generations, the family presents, on one or the other side, a history of extreme intemperance, epilepsy, or imbecility. His maternal grandfather was a drunkard, the mother an epileptic, father an intemperate. One sister is both intemperate and an epileptic. Another sister embarked on various matrimonial adventures. One brother is a cider drunkard, and one brother is both intemperate and weak-minded. The patient has one son in a reform school who is a dangerous person, threatening often to shoot, kill, and also burn buildings. The patient attended the district school until he was 16 or 17, was a good farmer, and an irregular attendant at church. He was violent, abusive, and intemperate in his language. His habits since that time have been intemperate. He never refuses any kind of liquor, but has been especially addicted to the use of cider. Last fall, he drank continuously, often one half gallon a day. From this cause, he developed epilepsy at an unknown time and of uncertain type, the patient having no recollection of the fact. He has for some time failed to contribute to the support of his family, his wife taking in washing for the maintenance of her children and husband. The onset of the alcoholic psychosis was sudden. He had done some work up to Friday before his admission, when he became suddenly delirious, imagined that he was driving horses, became vicious and aggressive, swore at and threatened his family, tore up his clothing and the bedclothes, imagined that he was buying horses and sleighs, and called loudly for the assistance of his friends. He was especially noisy at night. During the following weeks, it required two men to care for him during the day and a relief force of two at night. His speech was not affected, but his gait was unsteady for two weeks. On admission, he was emaciated from lack of nourishment for two weeks. His gait was shuffling, suggestive of weakness, as well as in coordination. He was almost completely disoriented, although he recognized that he was not at home. He frequently gathered up his things to return, said that he had been here a year, that his parents formerly occupied the building. He failed to recognize patients as such, did not distinguish doctors or attendants. At ten in the morning he called for his supper, said it was June, but gave the day of the week correctly. He said it was winter, snow came in August or October. He was contented or indifferent, but at times excitable and restless, had no insight, replied to questions with a fair degree of relevance and coherence. His memory was impaired for both recent and remote events. He was 40 or 46 years old, had rented numberless farms. The sole fact about which he was accurate was the amount of cider he habitually consumed per day. He was incessantly occupied in making various passes across his face, over his eyes, and through the intervening space, picking away imaginary threads which got across his eyes, obscuring the field of vision. 
He picked objects from his hair, pulled cobwebs from his clothing, and saw mosquitoes crawling everywhere. They were looking for him. They jumped and grew together and continually bit him. For the first few nights, he shouted and disturbed the entire ward. The pupillary reflexes were normal at this time. In about ten days, the patient's condition had improved and the auditory hallucinations had disappeared. The restlessness and excitement had abated. He became oriented. Consciousness was clear, but he showed a marked inability to figure, to remember or to comprehend errors. The relational element in his mental life had almost disappeared. He was 46 years old, but might be 53 on his next birthday. He gave the names of the owners of seven farms he had rented and the time he had spent on each, but the total was a half more than his entire life. He could neither add nor multiply, knew his six children's names, but bungled hopelessly about their respective ages. He wore a fatuous smile, but was indifferent and took no part in ward life or work and lounged about in slouching and expressionless apathy. His gait was shuffling and ataxic. There was a slight tremor of the tongue and hand, in coordination of the facial muscles and of those of the upper and lower extremities. He failed on the test words. His reading was slurring and often unintelligible, but the pupillary reflexes were normal. There was inequality of pupils. The left was irregular and notched. The patellar reflexes in two weeks' time were nearly abolished. A week after exaggerated, and in an equal length of time again abolished. Throughout his convalescence, they have presented a gradual up and down condition, either markedly increased or nearly abolished. He has complained at intervals of belt like pains extending from the navel, lasting for a week and disappearing from time to time. From the eighth to tenth weeks, he gradually and steadily improved, gaining in weight with improved appetite and becoming one of the most capable and willing ward workers. At the end of this time, his gait was nearly correct. There was some lingual tremor, the same tremor of the fingers, and his speech was very nearly normal. There was inequality of pupils, the right misshapen with notch in the edge, but the ocular reflexes were normal. The patellar reflexes were generally diminished, but at times active. The greatest improvement, however, was in the mental condition. The patient was keen, alert, memory good, reasoned well about his future, discussed his case intelligibly and hopefully, and exhibited a marked improvement in the region of the emotional and moral faculties. Our study of alcoholic insanity shows us that there is a reciprocal relation between alcoholism and insanity, one causing the other. The more serious result is frequently seen in the offspring than in the person who is afflicted with either. Insane parents often produce children who are not able to withstand the ravages of alcohol, and alcoholic parents produce imbecile, idiotic, nervous, and unstable offspring. Some of the types of insanity described in this chapter occur very frequently and are well known. Others occur but seldom and are little known. Dipsomaniacs are quite numerous but are infrequently recognized and are usually not regarded as insane. Men of this class, often of great ability, need special treatment and consideration. By eliminating alcoholic drinking from our social system, one of the most prolific, exciting, and predisposing causes of insanity would be eradicated. End of chapter 9, part 2. Chapter 10, Part 1 of The Psychology of Alcoholism by George Barton Cuton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Religious Conversion as a Cure At one time in its history, alcohol was looked upon as a great blessing, and an occasional intoxication was considered only an accident in the general progress of good. The drunkard was chided for an apparent indiscretion or considered lacking in control. Since men have become better acquainted with the nature of alcohol, and have recognized the danger of its use as a beverage, the attitude toward the alcoholic has changed. And while the preacher may still call alcoholism a sin pure and simple, the men of science who have spent years in investigating the subject look upon it 
as a disease of body and mind, which may or may not have had a beginning in sinful indulgence. No sooner had the intoxication habit reached serious proportions and the condition been considered extremely undesirable, then men began searching for a cure. Governments recognized the baneful influence of drunkenness and made it a crime, punishable by fine and imprisonment, considering that penalty would have a good influence upon the criminal. In a few, very few, cases it had the desired effect, but not infrequently the family of the drunkard suffered, while on account of his selfishness the motive for his reform was still wanting. By some, alcoholism was considered a disease wholly physical, and inebriate silence began to spring up all over this and other countries. Treating the disease from this standpoint only, these were successful to some extent because they combined forced abstinence with the upbuilding of the body, partially repairing the degenerated tissues, thus ministering to the brain directly and indirectly to the mind, and allowing recuperation and thereby control. As a concomitant of this method of cure, one sees a great number of patent medicines and specifics advertised in every paper as a sure cure for this disease which has so stubbornly resisted treatment, and we also notice not a few unskilled and irregular doctors who claim control over this disease. One proof of the inadequacy of drugs and medicines was a cure given in a recent meeting of the New York Academy of Medicine. Here were gathered together a number of specialist doctors of repute in this and other lands, who had had considerable experience with alcoholism. And among these suggested cures, not a drug nor medicine was mentioned. There were only two cures spoken of, and both of these of a psychological rather than physiological nature. They were hypnotism and religious conversion. With hypnotism and other cures, we will deal in the next chapter. But here we will turn our attention to religious conversion as a cure. In the report of the meeting, to which we have just referred, the opinion of one specialist is thus given. Religious influence potent. Dr. Starr, Mr. Allen, thought the physician or the family should be able to control these persons legally. A certain amount of moral suasion seemed to be of much more service than anything in the way of medical treatment. He was of the opinion that any measure of a religious or of a social character that could be brought to bear on these individuals was well worthy of a trial, and he would confess that the only reformed drunkards of whom he had knowledge were those who had been saved, not through medical but through religious influence. Perhaps few would go to the length of excluding all other cures, but certainly most persons would agree with Dr. Starr in positing religious conversion as the most effective of all cures. Who has not among his acquaintances some who have been cured of alcoholism by the power of religion in their lives. He is indeed poor in friends, who is at least not one such. Every church in the land has upon it rolls of men and women who have come into the new life from a drunkard's home, and whose testimony is overpowering in favor of the cure. Most convincing is a visit to a mission in the slums of a city. No one could spend a half hour at the Bowery, Water Street, or Door Street mission New York, without coming away thoroughly satisfied concerning the efficacy of the cure. The services consist of a constant repetition by different speakers of the power of religion in their lives, results in the annihilation of the desire for drink, and the total abstinence from alcohol for periods differing in length from one month to a quarter of a century, and this from men who had previously been considered hopeless inebriates, and whose work causes them still to be placed in circumstances very unfavorable to abstinence. Hundreds of pastors could duplicate a testimony of this kind. Before the meetings were ended, nearly 30 reclaimed drunkards had been received in the Clarendon Street Church. The general opinion was that these men would not stand even to the end of the year. Yet Gordon was able to say some time after, in a Northfield address, of those who have continued their residence with us, all have remained steadfast as consistent, as devoted, and as useful members as we have, a demonstration that God can instantly change a man from the vilest and worst drunkard to one in the way of the highest saintship. Were it desirable, the church could eclipse the patent medicine advertisers with the thousands of testimonials which might be produced by alcoholics 
cured by religious conversion. In speaking of cures, reference is not made to those whose abstinence dates from a month or a year previous, but to those who have been cured for decades, says Professor James. The only radical remedy I know for dipsomania is religiomania, is a saying I have heard quoted from some medical men. The faith of one alcoholic specialist in religious influence was so strong that although not himself a religious man, he insisted on having prayers at his institution every morning, simply as a therapeutic measure. Some statistics have recently been obtained from the missions in New York City, among which were those of Water Street Mission. This mission was started and formally conducted by the celebrated Jerry McCauley, himself a reformed drunkard, and later superintended by Reverend S. H. Hadley, who was converted under the influence of Jerry McCauley. Mr. Hadley, in answering the inquiries of the writer, said that in the previous 17 years during which he had been connected with the mission, about 1,700 alcoholics had been converted there. Of these, 25% never relapsed. They were instantly cured. Of the remaining 75%, 50% were finally reclaimed. And as Mr. Hadley added, many of these make the best workers we have. The ages of the converts range from under 20 to over 70, but the majority are between 30 and 40 years old. These figures were approximate only, but give a general idea of the work. With 62.5% of the patients cured in an experience of over 17 years with 1,700 persons, the encouragement given to this kind of work is great. A record like this might be envied by any inebriate asylum, especially when it is considered that the class of men dealt with has been of the most hopeless kind. Mr. Hadley describes some of the worst cases in a book recently published by him. The New York Christian Home for Intemperate Men formerly situated in New York City, but now in Mont Vernon, New York, gives a similar encouraging report. Answering inquiries of the writer, the Reverend G. S. Avery, the resident manager, says that in the last 27 years, 7,000 men have entered the institution, of whom 5,000 have professed conversion. Of these, 20% have never relapsed, and 40% have relapsed but have been afterwards reclaimed making a total of 60% of cures, about the same proportion as Mr. Hadley reported. In dealing with the subject of religious conversion, its very nature compels us to treat it incompletely. However much we may believe in the divine element in conversion, in the religious life generally, it must remain in unknown quantity and can only be judged by the apparent effects upon the persons experiencing it. It will be the aim in this chapter to examine the effects of the influence upon the individual, the way in which these effects are produced, other contributing causes, and the combined effects of all influences. The divine element itself, however, must remain unanalyzed, undescribed, and unexplained. The nature of our data causes us further difficulty. It is almost impossible to get accurate facts. People are honest and their intentions are good, but so few are able to read their experiences where introspection is required. This is a real difficulty in itself and would be sufficiently serious if uncomplicated. But added to this is an equally insurmountable one. The religious experience of one, five, or ten years standing is related as it should be according to orthodox standards or according to the more striking experiences of others rather than as it really was and this, too, from persons desirous of stating the facts. The testimony of others, as related in meetings, acts in a suggestive way, and in a testimony meeting it will be found that all experiences agree, with the exception of a very few details, and these are more and more eliminated as the speakers listen to each other week after week. In services held by different churches and denominations, it will be found that while the testimonies in one service are in harmony, they may be very different from the concurring testimonies of another service. Eliminating the element of similarity due to expectancy, we still have left a large factor due to subsequent agreement of an unconscious character.
At the outset, three reasons may be posited why religious conversion proves to be such a potent factor in the cure of alcoholics. In the first place, and most important, it stimulates a real desire for reform. A wish to be cured is a sign qua non. It is impossible to succeed, and not worth a trial under any form of treatment if this is lacking. Many institutions refuse to accept a patient unless this condition is fulfilled. For they recognize that failure is inevitable without the cooperation of the patient. Frequently the friends are deceived by a pseudo-desire on the part of the patient, which may take either one or two forms. The alcoholic expresses a desire for the alleviation of the evil effects of the drunkenness. In the morning he may express sorrow for having drunk so much on the day previous. Because of the headache, nausea, or nervous tremor, but he does not regret it on account of the general injury to himself or because of the ethical wrong. He does not wish to alleviate the bad effects sufficiently to forego the pleasure that comes to him by drowning his misery and living in a false optimistic world while under the influence of alcohol. The pleasure of the intoxication is greater to him than the pain of the effects. He wants to reform if reform will annihilate the pain and allow the same pleasure. Again, he may even go so far as to be willing to forego both the pains and pleasures of intoxication. If he can be cured without effort on his part or especially any inconvenience or pain in the process. In answer to the question, would you like to be cured? He will invariably answer yes and truthfully. He is willing to be cured if he can assume a perfectly passive attitude in the matter. But as for with his being active in undergoing the pains frequently attending total abstinence, as well as giving up the exhilaration of intoxication, he absolutely declines. The desire to be cured must be real and strong to form the basis for any remedial effects. Religious influence not only provides the cure, but furnishes the necessary prerequisite for any cure in giving a desire for help. This may well be classed as a part of the process, but the part that is antecedent. In preaching, in our religious teachings, Motives for reform are prominent contents and are very appropriate to this class of people. Doubtless, when there has been waywardness and one has grown habitually sinful, the most efficacious way of rescue is to picture the fate of continuance in sin, to throw the person back on himself, to lead him to the blackness of sin as contrasted with the beauty of holiness, and make the break unavoidable, sharp, and final. In times of remorse and sorrow after a debauch, when the system has refused to receive any more alcohol, the contrast of the alcoholic's misery with the happiness of others comes out vividly, and an ideal of life comes before him. This is strengthened by religious talks and the memory of former religious teaching. Then comes the longing for something better. The distance between the ideal and the real is great and there appear insurmountable barriers between the present misery and the happiness which might be. But the anticipation of better things grows, sometimes consciously, sometimes not, until there is a sudden forsaking of the lower life and an embracing of the higher. And when the ideal becomes the real, what we call conversion takes place. This, then, is one reason why religious conversion is so efficacious because it furnishes the prerequisite necessary to any cure. The second reason is that after conversion, the subjective and objective associations are changed and are of a character to assist him in his new life. Many persons might be permanently cured if, after a short period of total abstinence, they were not thrown back among old associations. Objectively, everything calls on the alcoholic to drink. He has a hearty invitation from old friends, who are so pleased to see him again that they must show their pleasure by inviting him to have a social glass, the saloon which he passes daily, whose doorway is worn by his tread, seems to hold open its doors to him. The waiter at his club or lunchroom places wine glasses before him and inquires if he will have his same old brand, every person and thing, his whole past life seem to conspire in one pressing invitation for him to drink. Too frequently he is unable to resist, and what control he has spent so much in gaining is lost in the first glass. 
With the new convert this is not so. He has an entirely new set of friends and acquaintances who have proved their friendship for him. And with them he spends every spare moment. Their words and lives are a constant source of encouragement and strength to him. The fact of his conversion has come to the ears of his old friends, and some honestly congratulate him on his change of life, and never after invite him to drink. Others chafe him concerning his change, and even this may cause him to hold to his course more strongly. He has not time to think of, nor inclination to go to the saloon, for his leisure is spent either at church or some religious gathering, in an endeavor to assist someone in the Christian life, or in some philanthropic work. All external associations have a tendency to assist rather than to hinder him. Add to this the power of subjective associations. His mind is no longer occupied with the thought of drink, but the events of the new experience fill his thoughts, and his work in and for the church leaves him no time to long for the flesh pots of Egypt. Associations, objective and subjective, are a constant assistance. Another reason why religious conversion is so efficacious as a cure for alcoholism is that it not only destroys the craving, but it provides an emotional substitute, says a social writer. The drink habit is in a very large degree the perversion of one of the most universal human desires. The thirst for exhilaration, recreation, and joy, and to remove the only available means for satisfying this normal craving without providing adequate substitutes, is like blocking the channel where a stream does harm without observing how many new fields the same stream is likely to devastate. While other cures may be deficient in the direction of this criticism, religious conversion is not, and the substitute is of such a character as to better supply the need than alcohol itself. We cannot help recognizing temporary exhilaration and realization of the idea brought about by the accustomed dram of alcohol. The only means some know of realizing their ideas, even for a short time. We know that it is perfectly artificial, and yet for the moment it is real to the individual. There is a similarity in the exhilaration due to intoxication and spiritual ecstasy. The Apostle recognized this when he warned the Ephesians to be not drunk with wine, but to be filled with the Spirit, and he desired his readers to make the distinction. The pleasure due to alcohol is intense in its nature. This is true of the pleasures of the so-called lower passions, because of their being confined to one kind of expression, which is always the same. And in addition to this, the pleasure occupies but a small portion of the life. As far as intensity is concerned, religion or any other form of higher pleasure cannot, except under abnormal conditions, hope to vie with intoxication or lower pleasures. Wherein then does the religious life excel, not in intensity, that is sure, but in an extensity. This is being true of the higher pleasures generally. There is no condition of life in which the religious pleasures cannot be realized, for religious conversions embrace not one set of passions, but the whole man. Body and soul respond. The variation of expression is endless, and all associations of the mind lead to the spiritual life. The idea of religious faculty, or sense, has been abolished, and it should be recognized that there is no experience so comprehensive in its scope as that of religion. This removes a number of objections to religion and religious methods, some of which will be referred to further on. Here we see that the expulsive power of a new affection has its virtue in the fact that even if deficient in intensity as compared with the lower passions, it ministers to the whole man, and thus exceeds any other pleasure in extensity. One other reason why religious conversion stands at the head of the list of the cures of alcoholism might just be mentioned here. While the explanation will be taken up later in connection with another topic, most conversions of alcoholics are of a sudden nature, because the mental condition of the alcoholic causes him to be particularly susceptible to the methods favorable to this variety of religious experience. The types of conversion are many. In fact, every case is a type by itself. While the decision in all cases must be instantaneous, to say that conversion is an instantaneous change in all cases is to pervert the facts. Two general classes may be clearly recognized. 
and these are divided according to the time element in the process. Although the rapidity of the movement is only an index to many other factors which differ in the two classes, as mentioned above, the great majority of the cures of alcoholics by religious conversion have been accomplished by the instantaneous or sudden method, and few, if any, cures are recorded among conversions of the more deliberate type. One can see how the various names of these classes would follow as a matter of course. For instance, Starbuck designates them as follows, and this quotation clearly shows where he would class the converted alcoholic. Two types of conversion. They may be characterized respectively as escape from sin and spiritual illumination. The first type, escape from sin, is more nearly akin to breaking a habit. It is characteristic of all the older persons studied, and of all, regardless of age, who have led wayward lives. It is connected with the feeling of sinfulness proper in which the mental state is negative and attended by dejection and self-abnegation. Escape from sin would be necessarily sudden, while illumination would be a more gradual process, there being no gradual breaking of the alcoholic habit as a rule, and generally only a short time of remorse and sorrow after debauch that desire for reform is entertained by the alcoholic. If, from his standpoint, he is to make a start, it must be a sudden one, and his condition brings it to a sudden culmination. While he continues drinking, it would be entirely unlikely that he could concentrate his mind on the subject and give it sufficient consideration to bring about a gradual or deliberate climax. The good resolutions of the sober or partially sober moments would be killed by the hours of debauch, and speaking from his point of view, it seems very unlikely that it should last. There have been a few cases of the deliberate type met with, but the struggle has been more intense and the cure frequently not so permanent. It might be well to add, in this connection, that there are some cases of sudden cures of alcoholism that have been entirely separate from all religious influence, and although in the narrower sense of the term they cannot be classed as religious conversion, they have been equally effective and permanent. These are comparatively rare and are of an automatic type not traceable to any apparent motive. Conversion has been frequently referred to, and it seems that some definition of the term should be given. Conversion is not a complete experience in itself, but forms a part of a process of which the total religious experience is the whole. It should be noted, especially concerning conversion, that those parts which seem at first to be sudden and instantaneous are but the fructification of a longer or shorter development, more probably of a subconscious nature. This process of conversion is variously defined and explained, as can be seen from the following quotations. Conversion is, in its essence, a change of intention. The regenerate life is a changed life. It is a change marked by the consciousness of the person's own needs, and that Christ's life can satisfy them. At last, the rationalistic fetters off, and the suppressed hypnotic centers explode with immense satisfaction. This is the most important key to the psychology of conversion. The essence of religion is a striving towards being, not toward knowing. In Christianity, the goal of religious life becomes regeneration, by which unification of motives, that is, union with God, when objectively considered, is achieved. The explanation of sudden conversions is no doubt to be sought in some overpowering impression upon the mind, that supplies a new and energetic motive to the will, thereby initiating a new line of conduct. Such changes occasionally happen, but not without terrific struggles, which prove how hard it is to set up the volition of a day against the bent of years. Conversion is suddenly forsaking the lower for the higher self, in terms of the neural basis of consciousness. It is the inhibition of lower channels or nervous discharge through the establishment of higher connections and identification of the ego with the new activities. In theological terminology, it is Christ coming into the heart and the old life being blotted out, the human life being swallowed up in the life of God, to be converted, to be regenerated, to receive grace, to experience religion, to gain an assurance 
are so many phrases which denote the process, gradual or sudden, by which a self hitherto divided and consciously wrong, inferior and unhappy, becomes unified and consciously right, superior and happy, in consequence of its firmer hold upon religious realities. Now there may be great oscillations in the emotional interest, and the hot places may shift before one. Then we have the wavering and divided self, or the focus of excitement and heat. The point of view from which the aim is taken may come to lie permanently within a certain system, and then, if the change be a religious one, we call it conversion, especially if the change be by crisis or sudden. Many more quotations might be given to show the great difference in the definitions and explanations given by different men, or the same men at different times. It is not claimed that any one is wrong, for the variety of expression shows what was stated above, that religious applies to the whole man. The definition of religious conversion would depend upon the standpoint from which it was viewed. The faculty concerning which one was speaking at the time, the faculty thought to be chiefly concerned. The particular type of conversion with which the speaker was most familiar or the interpretation of the facts by the individual. It is because it does not concern the whole man and not one faculty, and there is such a diversity of definition and explanation. Further, some in their definitions might entirely eliminate the human element and speak of it in theological rather than psychological terms as a divine act. So in order to get a correct definition of conversion, we might be able to take the substance of all definitions, and then probably it would not be too comprehensive. The idea of unity, so prominent with some, has this advantage. It comprehends the whole man, but complete unity seems to be rather the ideal ripened experience than the common experience of converts. A glance at the process in the case of alcoholics and an examination of the elements involved may help us to get a clearer view of conversion. One factor very common in cases of conversion of the abrupt type is that of a profound sense of sin from which the new life spontaneously shines forth as a natural reaction. The older form of the presentation of the gospel was that of magnifying sin and the terrible results to the sinner. Salvation came as a rescue from sin rather than the door to the abundant life. Thus, Starbuck says, conversion is the process of struggling away from sin rather than a striving towards righteousness. Whether this is the direct result of the manner of presenting the gospel or something inherent in conversion itself, it is difficult to say but it will be interesting to compare the conversions of the next 20 years when the opposite form of the gospel is more especially presented to see if this will not correspondingly change the nature of conversion from a struggling away from sin to a striving towards righteousness. Now, the alcoholic does not feel a sense of sin as such. Little he cares that he has broken laws. Little he cares that he has injured family and friends and disobeyed God. His whole life is selfish, and all that he cares about is the physical and mental suffering incident to his debauch, or his failure to obtain fresh supply of alcohol. He may suffer even more from a sense of virtue than a sense of sin. Sin itself does not bother him. It is the effect of sin or virtue, or both combined, giving him pain and wretchedness that causes him suffering. Therefore, if the term sin means anything here, it is necessary to disagree with Starbuck when he says, Perhaps the purest type of escape from sin is the case of the conversion of a drunkard, such as found in the autobiography of John B. Gow or H. H. Hadley or other records of a similar nature. What the alcoholic wants is escape from his physical suffering, and it is perfectly immaterial to him whether he goes into more sin or into righteousness to procure it. His moral nature is killed. He is not in a position to appreciate moral distinctions. His mouth is full of foolish excuses and lies to justify himself. And he demands from his friends pity for his condition, rather than blame for his wrongdoing. The drink is necessary to him. It is always one more, and I won't count this time, because it is necessary. He must do it for some reason or other. And what he must do, he cannot be blamed for. 
In moments of remorse he admits certain blame, but this is not really felt. It is maudlin talk, which is not infrequently successful in procuring him another drink to brace him up. It is also necessary to disagree with Luba in making the sense of sin synonymous with physical misery, for this is a misuse of the term and seems rather to be an attempt to have the sense of sin present, whether it really is or not. But in the remainder of the following quotation, he has analyzed the case well. The sense of sin is at times little more than a feeling of physical misery, the anguish of the sickened flesh. In such cases, the expressions regret and desire for relief should properly take the place of remorse and of repentance, which designate experiences modified by specific intellectual considerations ignored by the persons we speak of. This primitive consciousness is especially noticeable in persons addicted to some gross vice. Drunkards, for instance, frequently show no sign of the sense of condemnation, although fully aware of their utter worthlessness. They feel shame at their degradation, but are not conscious of any responsibility towards God for breaking His laws. They do not exclaim, Oh, my sins, my sins, but rather, Oh, cursed wretch that I am. The ideas of punishment, of eternal death, or of damnation make no impression upon them. The realities of their daily life go beyond the pictorial power of imagination. What they want is deliverance, deliverance from the unbearable misery of life. Returning to Starbuck's statement, that cases like those of Go and Hadley present the purest cases of escape from sin, the writer is unable to find any overpowering sense of sin in either case. Go is asked to sign the pledge and immediately promises to on the morrow, and his sense of sin is so great, and his desire for escape from sin is so keen, that he immediately goes and gets another drink. In a number of different accounts of Hadley's conversion, which have been accessible, there is no trace of a sense of sin as such. Deliverance is desired without doubt, but not deliverance from sin, as the innocent passenger in a railroad wreck desires relief from suffering, not because he has sinned, but because he is in great agony. So in regard to the drunkard, in the majority of cases at least, the terms used should be sense of suffering, and escape from suffering, and we should not gratuitously bring the term sin into the discussion just because we are dealing with a religious subject. The writer has sat for hours in the missions in New York, listening to the experiences of men who had been cured of drunkenness by religious conversion, many of whom said they were intoxicated at the time. No doubt there is a tendency to exaggerate the condition of depravity at the time of conversion unintentional, of course. But notwithstanding this, some cases which the writer investigated were found to be true, and there is no reason to think that the others were not equally correct. In answer to an inquiry of the writer concerning the proportion of drunken men converted in the Water Street Mission, Mr. Hadley made the following statement, decidedly more men are converted when drunk than sober, 90 percent at least. A large number have been soundly converted while in the throes of delirium tremens, and never wanted a drink afterwards. Mr. Avery says, Sometimes men are converted when drunk, but not often. It is natural to suppose that not so many men come to the Christian home for intemperate men in a drunken state as would be found in the Water Street Mission. Persons in this condition cannot have much sense of sin or desire to escape from sin, but they do have a desire for relief, and this could well be connected with what was said in the first part of the chapter concerning the desire for help being necessary in all cases of cure. The value of this desire in conversion should not be minimized, but objection is made to its being called by the name of escape from sin, and further there was no doubt concerning the sense of sin in many cases of conversion but very rarely in cases of conversion of alcoholics. Whether from a sense of sin or a sense of suffering, there comes a desire for cure, or perhaps a realization of the necessity for cure. It is followed by the struggle between the higher and lower selves. Thus we have the condition known as the divided self. 
it is the endeavor of the individual to make this new ideal his own contrary to his habit of life for years with the knowledge of the suffering which it may entail and with associations and companions all on the side of his former life he has set before him this hope of release from slavery and suffering and he must meddle it for himself he must answer the question is the change worthwhile with most persons there are a number of sins or vices which come into consideration all of course less violent than the alcoholics and there may be one of them standing out more prominently than the rest but with the alcoholic his resistance is centered in this one sin all of his past associations are gathered around this the associations of the ideal are entirely separated and form a distinct system without any connecting links in this state the struggle misery agony and uncertainty common in some cases is felt together with worry and anger or despair and fear the individual knows not where he will eventually settle and some powers outside of him seem to be contending for possession of him by some this condition is called conviction this may last for days or weeks or only for a moment may appear with varying degrees of intensity and is modified when the climax of the process of conversion takes place although it is probably never eliminated from the Christian life. Professor Coe tells us when dealing with the religion of a mature mind that competition is going on for the mastery of life. You may call it, in theological terms, a struggle between Satan and the Spirit of God, or you may call it, in biological language, an effort to adjust ourselves to environment against unsocialized remnants of the ape and tiger nature. In any case, the contest is a fact that each of us knows for himself, irrespective of catechism and all other theories, whether biological or theological. It is evident that the division of the self is never entirely healed, and unity afterwards accomplished in the process of conversion is only partial. In a subconscious way, if not otherwise, we would naturally expect that the association of years would crop up occasionally. In the conversion process, the natural consequent of the divided self is what has been termed self-surrender. The struggle has continued until the ego seems to be almost rent asunder. One or the other of the contesting factors must give way, and finally the old self, the lower desires, gives up the battle, and sometimes instantaneously, sometimes gradually, the misery, worry, and despair are changed to happiness, trust, and confidence. The unsettled, divided self becomes stable and united. This is the turning point in the process. It sometimes seems to be immediately due to physical causes, at least quite largely. The struggle becomes so great and therefore so wearying that the brain refuses to respond, bringing about temporarily a state of apathy and in exceptional cases, coma. It may be called a surrender of both sides insomuch as neither one shows signs of activity. But when activity again takes place, or in cases of coma, when consciousness appears, the side of the good is dominant. Notice that this breakdown does not always take place, but it may, and more frequently does, in cases of sudden conversion. The alcoholic with diseased brain and weakened mentality is not able to stand much strain, but according to some answers from slum workers, he does not seem to be more than ordinarily subject to such breakdowns. In Mr. Hadley's account of the conversion of Jerry Macaulay, the following statement is given concerning the climax. There was a shock came into the room, something similar to a flash of lightning, which everyone present felt and saw. Jerry fell down on his side, prone on the floor, with tears streaming from his eyes. Oh, Jesus, you did come back. You did come back. Bless your dear name. Jerry's companions were so frightened by what they saw that they sprang from their knees ran out of the house and fled down the street. In a letter received from Mr. Hadley, he speaks as follows, I have never seen a convert so such signs as you speak of, falling to the floor, becoming unconscious, or any abnormal phenomena, since I came here. From the physiological standpoint, the exhaustion is caused by the turning of the energy into new channels and breaking up the associations with the old. If we could speak, in so crass a way concerning processes of which we know little or nothing, 
we might say that the exhaustion is caused by the effort to connect the associations of this new cellular system which is the basis of the ideal with those which form the basis of the vital forces or shall we say that it is exhausting to turn the total vital energy into new courses the same process is experienced in the breaking of any habit but in a limited degree for while the habit may touch a small part of the mental life religion embraces the whole of man end of part one chapter ten chapter ten part two of the psychology of alcoholism by george barton cuton this librivox recording is in the public domain religious conversion as a cure what has been said regarding the physical is but an analogy drawn from the psychical from the state of exhaustion and the evident endeavor to transfer the ego to the side of the forces of the good with the help of additional motives advanced either by friends or by the self consciously or not the transfer is made and once made the devil forces retreat resist the devil and he will flee from you with the weakening and expulsion of the evil forces there comes that unity of the ideals feelings and volitions in fact the whole of life which is a characteristic feeling in the conversion process professor james speaks of the conversion climax as follows let us hereafter in speaking of the hot places in a man's consciousness the group of ideas to which he devotes himself and from which he works call it the habitual center of his personal energy it makes a great difference to a man whether one set of his ideas or another be the center of his energy and it makes a great difference as regards any set of ideas which he may possess whether they become central or remain peripheral in him to say that a man is converted means in these terms that a religious idea previously peripheral in his consciousness now take a central place and that religious aims form the habitual center of his energy now if you ask of psychology just how the excitement shifts in a man's mental system and why aims that were peripheral become at a certain moment central psychology has to reply that although she can give a general description of what happens she is unable in a given case to account accurately for all the single forces at work neither an outside observer nor the subject who undergoes the process can explain fully how particular experiences are able to change one center of energy so decisively or why they so often have to bide their hour to do so the struggle and victory may be toward an end which is distinctly defined or it may be very confused but it is against the old and for the new very clearly and what we call self-surrender of the old may be as well named the acceptance of the new it depends on the standpoint from which we view it it may be further expressed or defined by saying that the desire and affection for the new life or for god or for jesus are so overpowering as to drive out all baser motives or ideas the self-surrender or religious victory is frequently shown first by a desire to proclaim the change which has been experienced in what is called confession or testimony logically following self-surrender is faith this is a condition of mind shown by its attitude towards all truth consistent with its lately formed determination to accept the new life this condition is one of receptivity toward the good while logically these can be separated in reality is difficult indeed impossible to draw the line between them for they are both factors of a process and these factors are so interwoven as to be inseparable faith could be defined as the acceptance of certain elements of the christian life as a belief in salvation as believing that you are saved but is not this the very point in self-surrender accepting the new believing in one's own salvation if they do not coincide the distinction might be made thus self-surrender is the beginning of a process of which faith is the continuance both self-surrender and faith have a large effective element the change effected by this whole process is great whether it has come gradually or suddenly regardless of what mental element may seem to dominate or what is the immediate antecedent of the change relieved of a great burden as some express it 
there is a feeling of peace and happiness in the unity achieved. Although psychologically the process of religious conversion does not stand alone, it is by far the most common of its class, and perhaps on account of this, seems more closely related to normal processes. In everyday life we find mental experiences analogous to each factor of the conversion experience, and sometimes to the whole process. While there may be at times abnormal elements in conversion, it conforms more closely to the experiences of everyday life than one at first supposes. And why not? Are we not being converted more or less every day? Do we not break old habits and receive new revelations of truth that change us daily, making us different persons indeed today from what we were yesterday? Here again the difference should be emphasized. Religious conversion, in contradistinction from other experiences, comprehends the whole mental life. The result of conversion, or perhaps we could better say the final part of the process, differs with different individuals. One experience which is very common is the feeling of newness, and properly so when we consider the change involved. The convert lives in a new world because he sees everything from a new point of view. Everything appears beautiful, and the world calls forth exclamations of admiration. The convert suddenly becomes an optimist of the most pronounced type. He wonders why he did not see the good in every person and thing before and a smile is upon his face because he sees the beautiful significance of all things. This newness brings him joy and freedom, partially because he feels justified, as if his sins were forgiven, and he had come into harmony with God and the world. It is the joy and freedom of the prisoner released from his bonds. He may appear over-joyful, ultra-confident, and super-optimistic, but he is sure that he is normal and wonders why others fail to experience as much joy as he. He feels confident that it will never decrease, that he will always be equally happy. The feelings, no doubt, fluctuate from time to time and become much calmer, but the attitude towards the new life and the old remains constant. Religion thus acts in a double way on the feelings. It does arouse them, but it also aids to calm them. They may become much excited, but there is also, in religion, the motives for control. Luba compares the experience of newness to that felt by the youth who has sung for the first time his love tale to his lady and receives the assurance of requited love. The afflicted one who has walked through a dark passage and suddenly comes to the light, and this is undoubtedly true. To reiterate, conversion is not unlike the experiences of everyday life. Mr. Luba also suggests, as an explanation of this phenomena, changes in the physiological processes, he makes as a conjecture, and no one can do more than conjecture, the following. We might rest content with the explanation that we have to do with an emotional delusion in which the affective state colors external sense impressions, but we can perhaps make another suggestion in this wise. The conversion crisis may be supposed to have for physiological counterpart, a redistribution of energy involving general modifications of the association paths, or an alteration of rhythms, changing the nervous regime. It is natural enough to admit that to a psychic turmoil so intense as that of conversion corresponds a no less considerable physiological commotion setting up a new arrangement of the motor mechanism. We know the alcoholic to be the embodiment of selfishness, but when he is converted, the broadening of his horizon is shown most plainly here, for he comes into close sympathy with the world outside. He is a part of wider life for which he must work and for which he feels a great attachment. He is capable of self-sacrifice which would astonish anyone acquainted with him in his alcoholic days. This element may show itself in connection with the greater freedom of which we speak above. It may really be a great factor in bringing it about. Coupled with this, in what may at first seem to be a contradictory principle, is an awakening of the self. The self-consciousness is magnified, and the convert feels its importance. This does not take 
the old form of trying to make everyone and everything work together to satisfy his petty selfish desires. But he is important in the advancement of the world along the road of righteousness. No longer is he looked down upon. He is a man and recognizes it. No more is he held in bondage. He is free from all men and from himself. He is master where he used to be servant. He is ruler where he was serf. One can easily see that the form of awakening of the self does not minister to selfishness, but rather annihilates it. In no way is the lack of selfishness so noticeable as in the changed attitude towards his family and friends, and this in turn is an assistance to him in his struggle against his enslaving habit. There is a reinforcement of altruistic feelings and impulses, and his natural affections are stirred. The indifference which he formerly showed to the misery and grief of his family has vanished, and he recognizes the claims which the members have upon him. Another motive is hereby furnished for his abstinence and reform, and he becomes a natural husband and father, similar to his pre-alcoholic days. The other natural impulses are revived, such as his duty to the state as a citizen, and this is also an additional reason for his change of habits. All motives, however insignificant they may appear to the onlooker, are of great importance to the person who has to weigh the smallest action in the balance, lest by association or suggestion it may lead him to the bondage which he has so recently escaped. A characteristic of the new life, we might say a part also of the conversion process, is a revival of cheerfulness, courage, and hope. This is closely connected with the feeling of newness, and is especially helpful to the alcoholic. When free from alcohol, when approximately sober, the alcoholic is depressed and discouraged. He sees no future except a drunkard's life in a drunkard's grave. Little use for him to strive and struggle. He could not conquer. He has tried and failed, and he decides not to try again, for there is nothing ahead of him except failure and degradation. His only pleasure is negative. He can down his sorrow and drink, but at conversion he is filled with joy and hope, for he is free and the future is bright and promising. No longer he trudges along with head downcast and heart heavy. No longer he feels the future. He is encouraged and therefore brave. The coward of yesterday is the hero of today. He fears neither men nor demons. He is strong in his newly found love and friendship and unshaken in his determination and hope. This is an important element in the change which comes to him, enabling him to battle against the habit which he has feared and striven against in vain. This encouragement and hope give the alcoholic confidence in himself, and this from a suggestive standpoint is half the battle. He knows now that he can accomplish what before he thought impossible, and going forth with this confidence he is greatly helped. It is a matter in which others can do nothing. It depends upon him, and the expectancy with which he starts out is the harbinger of the result. This confidence which he has in himself is largely due to the expectation of help from God, which help according to his testimony is duly provided. He expects to be guided in a way that shall lead him away from temptation, and to be given strength to overcome the strongest desire for alcohol. To say that this is suggestion is probably true, but to say that it is suggestion only is doing violence to the united testimony of thousands whose evidence is as valuable as any in the land. Of one of the chief consequences of conversion, in what undoubtedly seems the most miraculous one, is complete annulling of the lower temptations, and in the particular case of the alcoholic, the appetite for alcohol which for years was irresistible. The fact is marvelous, but none the less true, and may be shown by references to many cases. We might expect a condition where the man would be strengthened, so that when the appetite was strongest and the craving had returned, he would by a great effort be able to withstand it. But in so many cases it is not this way, the appetite is gone without a trace. In the description of conversion, the feelings and intellect have been referred to, but the will has seemed to play no part. Lest the fact should be misrepresented, let us devote a little space to the discussion 
of the will in conversion, for it is an important factor. Conversion shows very plainly what a great effect a mental crisis has upon an almost totally destroyed will. The will is necessary, and the alcoholic must work as well as pray. As Mr. Stanley says, thus man, by appealing to the rain god, instead of using scientific means to promote rainfall or to supply lack of irrigation, has hindered his development for centuries. So the alcoholic must put forth some effort, however small, to help himself if he wishes external aid. Here again we have a seeming paradox. If self-surrender means anything at all, it certainly means the giving up of the personal will. The convert then has no voice in the matter. He is led, he does not lead. He seems to sink will and all into a more comprehensive mind which bears him resistlessly along. It will be remembered that we had the same apparent paradox in regard to the self, and there he came to himself in the process and felt his importance in self-consciousness. Probably before this in the process, and it may be as the cause of this, we have the awakening of the will, awakening as though from a long sleep, the sleep of years, and thoroughly refreshed, it takes its rightful position and begins to assume control. Of course it is understood that by the will is meant the self as willing. The effort of the will in the direction of the good is felt by all the other mental faculties and gives direction to the turn which the whole self is to take. And consciously, as well as subconsciously, its work is valuable and shows in every part of the process. Ribo evidently does not give the will much credit in the process, for he looks upon it very much like a fixed idea or an irresistible impulse. This seems a little extreme. And although they are undoubtedly allied phenomena in some respects, there is more conscious purpose and definite will displayed in conversion than in the fixed idea, and in the general process there seems a well-defined line of demarcation. Flader gives the place of the will in conversion as follows. Proceeding to ask how the consciousness of redemption is arrived at, we are struck at the outset by a remarkable statement which recurs regularly in the history of religion in connection with such tendencies, viz. that instruction and theoretical reflection do not of themselves suffice to produce religious faith, but that it rests on processes of feeling that reach down to the depths of the soul and point to its mysterious nature and origin. Such practical truths as have power to determine the life and the ideals of life are of this nature, can never be known theoretically only. There may be knowledge about them, even a notional apprehension of their meaning, but they are not known in the full sense of knowledge, so long as they are not experienced as a living power in the heart. This experience may not always be equally profound and clear, but the full decisive experience comes about only when the will lays hold of itself of the truth, by the power of which it feels itself laid hold of, appropriates it, recognizes it, takes it up into the heart as the ruling power and dearest possession of life, in short, where the saving truth is appropriated in living faith. But how can the will come to appropriate a truth which requires of it the abnegation of its own natural and personal desires. The will is not able to take upon itself the pain so long as the activity of its natural desires is productive entirely or predominantly of pleasure. But this is not permanently the case. For this the divine wisdom and justice in the natural and moral world order has sufficiently provided. Gone is the painful sense of sin for the cause of it, the disunion of self-will with the divine will has been removed. The New Testament is not a textbook on psychology, but it is one on religion, and it is worth noticing that it lays considerable emphasis on the work of the will in the process of conversion. The will is a factor, and an important factor, both in passive and active, the positive and negative work required of it. Early in this chapter, it was said that little could be definitely stated concerning the divine element in conversion, 
since by its nature it cannot be scientifically analyzed. But because we cannot analyze it, it does not follow that it is unreasonable to believe it. We can do no better at this point than to present two brief quotations from Professor James. To plead the organic causation of the religious state of mind, then, in refutation of its claims to possess superior spiritual value, it is quite illogical and arbitrary, unless one have already worked out in advance some psychophysical theory connecting spiritual values in general with determinate sorts of physiological change. Otherwise, none of our thoughts and feelings, not even our scientific doctrines, not even our disbeliefs, could retain any value as revelation of the truth. For every one of them, without exception, flows from the state of their possessor's body at the time. Psychology and religion are both in perfect harmony up to this point, since both admit that there are forces seemingly outside of the conscious individual that bring redemption to his life. Nevertheless, psychology, defining these forces as subconscious, and speaking of their effect as due to incubation or cerebration, implies that they do not transcend the individual's personality, and herein she diverges from Christian theology, which insists that they are direct supernatural operations of the deity. The mistake is frequently made of holding that, if we have explained the way in which the mind operates in conversion, we have thereby eliminated the supernatural, or rather we should say, the divine element. As well might we say when we have described the law of nature, we have proved therefore that nature requires no power to operate the elements which conform to this law, simply because we know how it is operated, or that when we know how the machine works, it therefore needs no power to operate it. Flaterer, from the standpoint of philosophy, speaks very decidedly as follows. This wonderful change is not arbitrarily brought about by man himself, but experienced as a thing that has happened to him. It appears to him as the operation of a higher power, as the gift of undeserved divine favor of grace. And is this not in truth the case? Careful thought, in fact, can do nothing but confirm what the believer holds as a truth requiring no proof. Mr. Everett defined religion as a feeling toward a supernatural presence manifesting itself in truth, goodness, and beauty. This makes religion a purely psychological matter, but his subject leads him to do so. If, however, there is a feeling toward a supernatural presence on our part, is it unnatural or unreasonable that that presence should respond to our gropings? The testimony of the individual experiencing the conversion, even admitting that it is not the best, ought to be worth as much, probably more, than the opinion of a person entirely unacquainted with religion. There is in so many cases a feeling of power from without, a testimony of experience directly opposed to the psychological theory, as we may call it. Recognizing the objection which was made at the beginning, of so many persons being unable to read or write their physical experiences, yet there is no testimony to the contrary, and the experience of those who witness concerning it is more valuable than the ideas of those who simply theorize about it. As the last topic in this chapter, the part played by the subconscious will be discussed, and therein the relation of this religious experience to hypnotism and suggestion. There seems to be not the least doubt that the subconscious is an important factor in the process of religious conversion. To say this is only to state a fact, which again confirms one of the main contentions of this chapter, viz. that religious conversion deals with the whole man. But to say that conversion has to deal with the subconscious is only to misrepresent the facts. With like stimuli, it is known that persons react differently on account of the difference in the operation of their mental processes. In their temperament, we say, persons who have sudden conversions have them rather than the gradual ones, not because it just happens that way, but because they are so constituted that the religious influences react in that way. If we know the person, psychologically we can prophesy quite correctly the type of his conversion, whether it be sudden or gradual, quiet or excited. This is simply saying that of conversion we may know scientific facts which admit of classification. The divine element 
is not eliminated because we can do this. This has no bearing on this subject. For whether the power which causes conversion is autonomous or divine, it conforms to one type when it passes through one variety of mold. It is rather an argument for the divine element than it is orderly. Professor Coe, who has made the most exhaustive examination of the subject of which the writer knows, gives three sets of factors favorable to the attainment of a striking, and therefore of a sudden religious transformation. There are as follows, a certain temperament, expectation, and a tendency to automatisms, and passive suggestibility. Given these three known quantities, the unknown type, the type of conversion, can be predicted. In the cases which were thoroughly examined, those who experienced a great transformation, almost without exception, expected the change. Of these, 70% were of such a temperament that sensibility predominated. 12% had intellect in the ascendancy, and 18% will. Further of these, 82% were of sanguine or melancholic temperament. We therefore see from these investigations that the temperament favorable to sudden or striking conversion is sanguine or melancholic, with sensibility predominating. The majority of these has exhibited some automatic phenomena, as example given, hallucinations, and these correspond almost exactly with the passives in hypnotic experiments. Of course, the number of cases examined was small, and necessarily so, on account of the thoroughness of the examination, and although there were too few to warrant us in making too sweeping generalization, they correspond so closely with what we should naturally expect that they must have considerable weight. We can now see why, apart from the fact that if the alcoholic is to be cured, the break with this controlling habit must necessarily be sharp and abrupt. His conversion is a sudden one. We know that his intellect and will are so impaired that he is largely a creature of his feeling and can be classed primarily among those with sensibility predominating. In temperament, so far as one can be arbitrarily classified as belonging to any one temperament, the alcoholic is melancholic. We know alcoholics to be passives, for a class they are more easily hypnotized than the average, and on account of their disease are subject to automatisms, being victims of hallucinations and vivid dreams. This gives all the elements that Professor Coe demands for a sudden and striking conversion, except the expectation. This must be left to the investigation of the individual case, but it would seem that if the alcoholic's hope is an escape from suffering, if he knows anything of the necessity of a sudden break with the habit, and most of them do recognize this, and if he comes under mission preaching, which is a style usually most effective with him, he must therefore expect this sudden and striking change. If this is so, we furnish Professor Coe with another illustration of his classification. With the convert who has come into life in a sudden and abrupt way, the conscious element in the process is undoubtedly large. This is shown by comparative scarcity or absence of the intellectual and volitional element at the time of the climax, and the inability of the convert to give his reasons for the change, the very little self-direction at the time, and the abruptness of the decision with few or no motives. The conscious and the subconscious interact, and in no case of conversion, however deliberate, is the subconscious element eliminated any more than the conscious element is absent in sudden conversion, but the proportion of the two varies. What shows itself as a sudden development in consciousness is undoubtedly the result of a subconscious development which suddenly ripens and thrusts itself into consciousness, apparently ready-made, but of what this process, this development, in the subconscious area is, and of its cause, we are entirely ignorant, and our guesses will depend upon our point of view. Now, it is plain that if God operates in the human mind in conversion, that is, if there is such a thing as a divine element in conversion, it must be largely through the subconscious, and especially is this true in cases of sudden conversion. This being so, we must recognize the similarity between these cases and hypnotism, whether we wish to or not, 
In fact, some persons in relating their conversion experiences necessarily couple with them a hypnotic element, as example given. It seems to me now hypnotic. There has been a great objection to the recognition of this relation among some religious people, not because they were in a position to confute the statement, but because they considered it detrimental to Christianity on account of the ill repute of hypnotism. On the other hand, because some persons, not particularly jealous for the good name of Christianity, have seen a relation between conversion and hypnotism, they have identified the two. The position that appeals to the writer is the mean. He recognizes both the similarity and the difference. True, we recognize the almost total similarity in some revivals where methods are employed which a trained hypnotist might well eschew, but it is unfair to class all conversions as revival conversions, or all revival conversions as of this objectionable stamp. Even admitting the hypnotic and suggestive element in most alcoholic conversions, for undoubtedly it is there, it is not the use of it, but the abuse of it that is objectionable. The same thing can be said of many other forces that at times are abused. For instance, there is a certain authority which religion can justly claim on account of its nature. The use of this is justifiable, but oh, what abuses have been wrought in its name, Mr. Granger says concerning hypnotism and conversion. We are now prepared to take up a topic referred to before conversion by hypnotic suggestion. The reader will perhaps remember that in other kinds of conversion, there was a more or less prolonged period of preparation for the change as the soul came to harmony of intellectual judgment or to peace after stress. As against these modes, instantaneous conversion seems explicable by saying that the mind is occupied by suggestion when it is in a suggestible state, when, that is, it is subject to neurasthenia. It is fortunate, of course, that the same nervous weakness which lays a man open to control by passing impulses should now and then subject him to a good impulse. But this weakness is not a normal state, and there is something inexpressibly repulsive in the idea that the religious life should necessarily begin in this way. Jesus did not so view conversion. The writer does not feel the same repulsion concerning the matter, which Mr. Granger apparently does. If, as some would have it, the hypnotic or suggestive element were eliminated, religion would lose thereby. We do not recognize the part that the subconscious plays in our everyday life, or we would see to eliminate this would be to confine religion necessarily to a lesser part of man's nature, instead of holding its present important position of affecting the whole man, conscious and subconscious. If this is a weakness, Mr. Granger says, it is a weakness that he shares with the rest of mankind, for no one is free from it, and however much it may be deprecated, its importance in the mental processes is profound. If it is true, as was said above, when God works in man, he works through the subconscious. These subconscious factors should be lauded rather than deprecated. Further, the wisdom of having these subconscious factors so prominent in conversion is apparent because the greater stability of the change thereby. Were it in the mental and not deeply rooted in the physical, the passing change of circumstances would bring about a corresponding change in the desires, and what promised to become a permanent change would be temporarily only. Here is to be found the distinction between the purely hypnotic and pseudo-conversion and the real conversion. When the subject awake, he wonders what it all meant, and laughs at the thought of the part he played in the revival. Or else it may last for a week or a month, and then fade away, but the true conversion takes a permanent hold of the whole man. With cases like the alcoholics, the fact that the conversion has roots in the physical is doubly fortunate, insomuch that the disease to be cured has its hold in the same part of our being, as here we have perhaps a further reason why conversion has been so successful as a cure. 
Nor can the writer agree with Mr. Granger that Jesus did not recognize and use the subconscious element in conversion. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the voice thereof, but canst thou not tell whence it cometh, and whither it goeth? So is every one that is born of the Spirit. Canst not tell whence it cometh, because it enters through the subconscious. It is certain that most of the conversions of Jesus were instantaneous, and most of his cures were of the same kind. To say that both of these were of divine origin par excellence does not explain how they worked in the human mind, or contrarywise, to say that they were of subconscious character does not detract in the least from their divine significance. The same can be said of the apostles who followed Jesus. Peter, who knew well the methods of Jesus, gives us one of the best examples of healing of a suggestive or hypnotic character which we have anywhere. Peter fastens his eyes on a lame man and demands that the man look at him, and his companion, Peter being the spokesman, the man not being able to look at both at once, must have looked at him. Here is the first condition of hypnotic suggestion, fixation of attention, and it is aided by that most powerful ally, the fixation of the eyes. We are told that the man gave heed unto them. Peter begins to speak and ends by commanding abruptly, walk, following up this verbal suggestion with a dramatic one, he takes the man by the right hand and lifts him up. Could any trained hypnotist have done it better? Yet this does not explain the power at the back of it, giving the suggestive treatment all its due. We have yet to explain how the congenitally lame, grown to manhood, could be cured. For this exceeds all feats of suggestive treatment known to science. And even supposing that we have some functional disease, which easily yields to hypnotic treatment. The divine element is none the more eliminated. Paul's work at Paphos was evidently of a similar character. This is sufficient to show that the disciples, and Jesus also, did not deny the employment of the subconscious elements and methods which might be considered of a partially hypnotic character, so much as some of the followers today. They use them, not abuse them. Now the altruism, which is thus seen to be the gist of all mental healing, is the very essence of Christianity. Religion has in it all there is in mental therapeutics, and has in its best form. It teaches temperance in the broadest sense, high ideals and dependence upon the highest alone. This preserves those who know it, by practice as well as by precept, from most of the ills that make up the list of those curable by mental methods. But further, it teaches a wise submission to the inevitable, a freedom from care and worry, and a spirit of hopefulness. And these are the exact conditions aimed at by all mental practices. Living up to these ideals will do everything for us that can be done. The cure of the drunkard in conversion is one peculiar to itself but which contains elements found in hypnotic and allied practices, and it necessarily must if it embraces the whole man in its scope. The manner of the conversion we can partially describe and explain, but the power at the back of it remains a mystery. Those who claim it is divine have much, both a philosophical and theological nature, to warrant them in their contention, and from a psychological standpoint it is admissible. Conversion is not alone of religious experiences to use the subconscious, for it is employed in such experiences as inspiration and revelation. In religious conversion, then, we have the most efficacious cure of alcoholism. This is scientifically established. The reasons for this are that, apart from the divine element, there is instilled a desire for reform, and a change of associations and an emotional substitute are provided. Different from other cures, religion is concerned with the whole man, and thus is capable of reaching a deep-seated trouble. The escape from physical misery is a powerful motive, greater than that of escape from sin or future punishment. When self-surrender places the charge of the self and the power of the best impulses, 
the subconsciousness works a wonderful change in the entire system, and frequently there is never a desire for another drink. The divine element, although inexplicable, is clearly established and cannot be explained away. End of chapter 10, part 2「ピコピコピコピコピコピコピコピコピコピコピコピコピコピコピコピコピコピコピコピコピコピコピコピコピコピコピコピコピコピコピコピコピコピコピコピコピコピコピコピコピコピコピコピコピコピコピコピコピコピコピコピコピコピコピコピコピコピコピコピコピコピコピコピコピコピコピコピコピコピコピコピコピコピコピコピ This is undoubtedly so, but it may also be true that the nervous system of the patient was such that, prior to his first glass, this same condition was present to a less degree, and this may partially account for his alcoholism. This claim of no cure, however, is an extreme view. Those who believe in physical rather than mental treatment object to the use of this term in cases where the drink impulse is annihilated, but no further treatment has been given. They claim that the drink impulse is only a symptom, and to eradicate the symptom is not to cure the disease. It seems as though here the disease theory is being exaggerated so that the term cure can only be pertinent in cases where certain remedies have been used. For example, it is asserted that such methods as religion, temperance pledges and hypnotism do not cure. They simply remove the symptom, the drink craze or impulse. The writer believes in the disease theory of alcohol as surely as its most ardent devotee, but in all that he has read on the subject, he has been unable to find any other symptom of the disease than this. In fact, as far as he can understand, this is the whole disease. And when this is eliminated, the disease as such is cured. There is in many cases a certain condition of the nervous system due to heredity, traumatism, or a variety of causes. Which is favorable to the development of the disease, but this is the case in all diseases. A person must be in a certain bodily state before even a cold can be contracted. But this bodily state is not the cold. Notwithstanding all that had been said concerning the disease of inebriety or alcoholism, and the drink craze or impulse only as a symptom, no one has been bold enough to assert that a person had alcoholism who had never drunk alcohol or experienced this impulse. On the other hand, it is claimed that the disease continues after the symptom. The drink impulse is removed. The cessation of the drink impulse is not the cure. It is only a half, and remission in the progress of the disease, which will return or appear in some other states of degeneration and disease. Here is a confusion. There are some mental diseases of which the drink impulse is only a symptom, but these diseases are not or should not be called inebriety or alcoholism. If we are speaking of the latter, the above quotation in the opinion of the writer is overstated. The ravages of alcoholism upon the nervous system are fully recognized. This can be seen from chapter 2. But the results of the disease are not the disease. If deafness or blindness results from a case of fever, 20 years after the fever disappears, shall we say that the patient still has the disease because he continues to be blind or deaf? No one would say that a person is completely normal. The instant the drink impulse is removed, the degeneration of body and mind is clearly seen, and the need of recuperation is very apparent. Nothing that can be done to restore the diseased tissue to the normal condition should be neglected. Yet let us distinguish between the disease and the results of the disease, and let us recognize that the disease can be cured while the results may never all be remedied. In fact, this is the case, for the results of alcoholism are never wholly repaired. Because the dire effects of alcohol excess are recognized, the benefits of the physical treatment are apparent. The patient needs medical treatment, as other organs besides those of the nervous system are diseased, the stomach and liver being most likely to suffer. The nourishment for which the nerve cells have so long been in need can only be furnished when these organs are restored to their normal function. The assistance of bath, massage, electricity, rest, outdoor recreation, and a few drugs have proved. Of great benefit in eliminating the effects of the disease. 
after the disease itself has been cured. Sometimes it has been found that local irritation, especially of the rectum, pelvis, or sexual organs, has produced a profound nervous depression, which in persons predisposed to alcoholism causes excess. The value of surgery in these cases has been fully proved as complete recovery from inebriety has followed the operations. Any treatment which is found remedial in allowing nervous irritation or depression will be beneficial in the treatment of alcoholism, as the endeavor to relieve mental or physical pain frequently causes alcoholic excess. Other remedies for pain are recommended. It is rarely, if ever necessary, to try to rid the patient of his liking for the taste of alcohol, for this the alcoholic seldom has. The writer has met only one man who affirmed that he liked the taste of alcohol. Sometimes alcoholic beverages are absolutely distasteful, but the effect on the nervous system is what is desired. However great the nervous craving may be, it seldom lasts longer than ten days after the indulgence is discontinued, and never more than twenty days. Of course, under certain conditions, it may return again, and this is what it is necessary to prevent in trying to cure alcoholism. On account of the short duration of the craving, except in cases which are very severe, or where there is no desire for reform, it is not necessary to keep the alcoholic under restraint for a great length of time, but it is frequently advisable for the first few days. This largely depends on the amount of cooperation given by the patient. Restraint alone is not sufficient for a cure, but it may be a necessary prerequisite. Many institutions depend upon moral influence, social environment, and a few tonics administered to assist in building up the body during the period of rest. In a few cases, the drink impulse stops suddenly, without any apparent cause. It seems to just die out. Some patients, after they have been treated by every method, and all has been done to cure them without avail, suddenly recover. This is often concomitant with some bodily change which reacts on the nervous system, such as the climatic change in women between the ages of 40 and 50, but more frequently not even remote causes like this can be posited. Apart from the suggestive influence which they may have, the numerous specifics advertised for the cure of alcoholism are largely valueless. Besides some tonic, most of them contain a drug which produces the same stimulating feeling as that of alcohol, and may be even more harmful. As long as this is taken, alcohol is not needed, but as soon as this is discontinued, the patient again resorts to his former indulgence. As in some cases of morphinism, the remedy is simply opium in another form, and thus does away with the customary portion of the morphine. These specifics are largely substitutes, not remedies. There have lately appeared some cures of a secret character, administered by selected physicians or at certain institutions, which have had some success in curing alcohol and drug addictions. Chief among these is the Keeley cure. It has been supposed that the cure was of a suggestive character, and the physician in charge of one of the Keeley Institutes admitted this to the writer. The cure is, of course, secret, and only a surmise can be made regarding it. The following quotation may give a more accurate account of the supposed treatment. The lawyer frankly gave the details of his experience to all inquirers, and to many who did not inquire. When he first arrived at the Institute, Keeley asked him if he had in his satchel any whiskey or brandy. The answer was, I have both. Give them to me, responded the doctor. I wish you to keep on drinking as usual, but I will empty your bottles and fill them with a pure article. The bottles were filled and refilled by Keeley as fast as emptied. The craving for drink disappeared in a short time, but the orders of the doctor to keep on drinking were strictly followed, notwithstanding that nausea which attended every swallow became so severe that the very thought of the custom intoxicant excited it. The patients who, after a longer or shorter period, were dismissed from the institute were exhorted to continue taking a certain liquid tonic which Keeley furnished, to avoid visiting saloons, and to abstain entirely from even tasting an intoxicating beverage. Keeley forewarned them that a return to their drinking habits within a week would be fatal, and that if the resumption did not take place till after a month's abstinence, their condition would be worse than before. The treatment commenced. Not a few heeded the admonition, and their reformation has continued with scarcely a lapse 
up to the present time that a double chloride of gold if there be such an orous salt was the sole or chief drug employed by keeley or his disciples to produce certain conditions is open to very grave suspicions why did he demand that the lawyer should surrender the whiskey and brandy in his possession and drink a pure article which he claimed to possess the attorney might have told him but curiously enough he did not that his own whiskey and brandy were the best which money could buy in the market but the shrewd keeley knew that neither these nor the combination with the gold chloride would remove the crave nor produce the desirable nausea a sensation as hayden calls it akin to seasickness he must add to the pure substitute increasing quantities of apomorphine or some other nauseant which would cause an abhorrence delightfully overwhelming that the frequent hypodermic use of strychnine with some other tonic auriferous or not kept up the strength of the patients during their three weeks treatment at the institute is highly probable that the disgust at the very thought of whiskey was not permanent is evident from the fact that when one of the reformed alcoholics ventured in a saloon and tasted an intoxicating liquor not the slightest nausea ensued and the lost crave soon returned dr thatcher in 1826 mentioned several methods which have been employed successfully to overcome the love of strong drink one of these seems to have anticipated the keeley cure he says i once tempted a negro man who was habitually fond of ardent spirits to drink some rum which i had placed in his way and into which i had put a few grains of tartar emetic the tartar sickened and puked him to such a degree that he supposed himself to be poisoned i was much gratified by observing that he could not bear the sight nor smell of spirits for two years afterwards if this account of the cure is correct and the conclusions well drawn and there seems no reason to doubt whether the cure is a suggestive one and in so far is related to hypnotic treatment the suggestion that the whiskey will nauseate the alcoholic is frequently well received and proves effective this is a rather heroic method of receiving suggestions but if it is successful in curing the alcoholic it is probably worthwhile if we receive this as an adequate account of dr keeley's methods it is amusing to read his arrangement of hypnotism and suggestion but this is necessary for the protection of his business personally the writer accepts the keeley cure as he does other cures he has known cases of complete recovery of long standing where this method has been used and although there are more pleasant ways of getting suggestions the cure is the main point the efficacy of any method or of combined methods commends them for the disease has reached such serious proportions that we cannot afford to reject or discourage any method of cure because it is not our cure but cheerfully receive all the assistance regardless of the source it has not been directly within the province of this book to discuss the physical cures we are concerned with those only which we may call mental hence the inadequate treatment of the former the testimony concerning the efficacy of physical remedies is convincing the best result should come from a combination of moral mental and physical treatment there are undoubtedly some cases which are comparatively hopeless and no treatment can help them dr crowther speaks of one class very pertinently as follows another class of cases come under medical care that are still more difficult to treat they are generally young men sons of wealthy parents and men who from bad mental surroundings bad company ignorance and neglect are periodic or continuous drinkers further some cases are almost hopeless on account of the attitude of the parents and friends the kindest wife and most indulgent parents are very much in the way of numerous cures and prove to be instead of the best friends the worst enemies the alcoholic has as palmer so well says it is often said of an inebriate in a tone of wonder and reproach that he has so good a wife one who loved and indulged him the universality of good wives to intemperate husbands suggests an inquiry into the connection they may bear and the influence they may exercise however innocently in the downfall of their husbands a good woman is not necessarily a good wife on the contrary she may be without meaning it and in spite of her conscious efforts to be otherwise a very bad wife to her husband and that in spite of her gentleness docility piety and excessive love of him 
and it is possible that he might not be in the position he occupies today if, instead of possessing these qualities, she had developed stronger, even more selfish traits of character. The continued exercise of the spirit of unselfishness on the wife's part has helped in no small degree to restrain the husband from denying himself in a hundred ways, and all innocently, but not less fatally, has fanned the flames of self-indulgence until his power of resistance, insidiously encroached upon by loving hands, has finally succumbed to her persistency and his great preservative against any strong temptation to which he may be constitutionally inclined has become so weakened that he is unable to cope with the strong desire for drink when it manifests itself. The subject of hypnotism and its relation to alcoholism is one which has for the past few years attracted considerable attention on account of its value in this disease, which has proved so difficult for treatment by the medical profession. In a meeting of the New York Academy of Medicine, referred to in the last chapter, among all the experienced and prominent physicians present, there was no one who had any kind of medicine to suggest as a cure. On the contrary, two other forms of cure were recommended. One of these, conversion, we have already discussed. The other, hypnotism, we will take up now. In the account of the meeting, one address is reported as follows. As to the treatment of inebriates, the speaker, Dr. S. A. Knopf, said that he approved of moral suasion, arguments, and hypnotic suggestion. Knowing the terrible ravages of alcoholism, and hearing this testimony from men, some of whom witness in alcoholic wards thousands of cases a year, if hypnotism holds out a hope, which medicine does not, it is not strange that attention has been attracted to hypnotism in these cases. In Europe, many successful cases are reported by eminent and trustworthy men. Boysen, Tucky, Ledame, Forel, Aiden, Nielsen, von Rentergen, Widmer, Korval, Wetterstrand, Schrenk, Natzing, Bernheim, and others have reported many cures of all kinds of alcoholic diseases and vices. We have also good reports from Mason, Quackenboss, and others in this country. The experience of the writer confirms this. For in cases of dipsomania and chronic alcoholism, which he has treated 80%, have been helped. And if the time of abstinence were long enough to warrant the statement, it could also be said that many of these had been complete cures. The subjects treated have been almost without exception those who had tried other methods without avail. They wished to be treated by hypnotism, not because they had much faith in the remedial value of this method, but because it was the last resort they might be classed as hopeless cases. It might be stated in this connection that hypnotism is not the grand panacea which some persons suppose. It will not cure regardless of circumstances. It is not a super mundane prohibitive. The experience of the writer with hundreds of persons who were sufferers, directly or indirectly, from alcoholism shows the current mistaken ideas on the subject by the most intelligent people. A lady may call and desire her husband treated without his knowledge or presence. Men come of their own volition and wish to be compelled to stop drinking. They attend that it shall be a battle royal, their appetite on one side, the power of the rider on the other. Their part will be that of the spectators of the fray. They hope that the power will win, providing it does not cause them any inconvenience. Or another may be willing to come once submit to the force, and leave the house entirely cured. He expects a habit which has been continued for twenty to fifty years to be cured in from ten to fifteen minutes. Hypnotism is only a help to the patient. In very few, if any cases, can the patient be forced to renounce alcohol. Cases to be quoted later will show this. A person must wish to be cured to get the best and most frequently any result. This is the almost universal testimony of all persons who have had any experience with alcoholics, regardless of the method of treatment. Nothing that the patient or his friends can do to help should be despised, for all means possible should be used. But, as Forel says, hypnotism enables the drunkard to take the first step towards reformation and cure, and this is most frequently the difficult part of the process. In what seems the greatest drawback to the cure of alcoholism by hypnotism, in all of the cures except that by religious conversion, is the fact that the patient is surrounded by the same environment after he has been treated. Even the strongest form of suggestion of a hypnotic nature 
when given for a few minutes daily or weekly, can hardly hope to complete with the legion of suggestions which the environment inevitably gives. Here is one way in which religious conversion excels hypnotism as a method of treatment. It gives a new environment, different companions, a place to spend a portion at least of the spare time, and a new train of thoughts. The life changed in other respects must inevitably carry with it a change in respect to environment also. Notwithstanding the great disadvantage under which hypnotism works, the number and character of the cures by this method are really marvelous. Quotations like the following are testimony to the efficacy of this method of treatment. I have treated during the last 12 years nearly 200 cases of chronic alcoholism and found hypnotic suggestion has proved completely curative in about one-third of these. This is a good result, considering that in no case was the patient confined in a retreat or kept away from his home or business longer than a month. In nearly all cases I have seen partial or temporary success, and in many instances where there was relapse, cure would, I think, have resulted had circumstances been more favorable. Since I came to London about ten years ago, I have treated 76 cases of dipsomania and chronic alcoholism by means of hypnotic suggestion. A. Recoveries. 28 cases recovered. By this, I mean that the patient ceased drinking during treatment, and that, as far as I have been able to learn, they have remained total abstainers to the present date, or to that of the last report received, although the earliest of these cases has now passed nearly ten years without relapse, I should not describe the patient as cured, for it is possible the disease might return. One of my patients relapsed after eight years total abstinence. Of the above twenty-eight cases, seventeen were males, eleven females. The average age was forty. Average number of hypnotic treatments, thirty. Average length of time since recovery, three years. All the patients in this class, as well as in the two other groups, belong to the educated classes. B. Cases improved. These numbered 36, 26 males and 10 females. Average age 39. Average number of hypnotic treatments 32. Average length of time since treatment three and a half years. The results obtained in this class varied widely. The best case abstained for eight years, then relapsed, but has now again abstained for six months. In a considerable proportion of the remainder of the improvement has been marked and valuable. Several other patients who formerly lived lives of drunkenness are now engaged in useful work and only drink at rare intervals. C. Failures. These numbered 12, 10 males and 2 females, average age 43, average number of hypnotic treatments 20. In the majority of the above cases, it was impossible to get patients to cease drinking during treatment which in six out of twelve was very short. In more than one instance, however, although the treatment was prolonged and carried out under the favorable conditions, no benefit was obtained. The conditions necessary for cures are two in number. First, a willing subject, and second, a subject susceptible to hypnotic suggestions. By the first condition is not meant a passively willing subject, but an actively willing subject. One who is desirous of being cured, and who will do all that he can to further the cure. Two cases, by the way of example, may be cited. D.F., a brass worker, age 39, parents both have stainers, knew nothing of grandparents. He began drinking at the age of 23, and after one year of moderate drinking began to drink heavily, and continued to do so until he entered New Haven as a tramp. Not having anywhere to sleep, he applied to Calvary Industry Home, and was there given assistance. He was brought to the writer for treatment after being without alcohol for eight days. He proved to be an excellent subject, and went into deep sleep in four minutes. After watching one other subject, who was hypnotized, appropriate suggestions were given regarding alcohol and also tobacco, the latter being freely used by the patient. A post-hypnotic suggestion was given to the effect that he would give his pipe and tobacco to the superintendent of the home. The suggestion was carried out as directed. It should be taken into consideration that, although the patient did not object to coming for treatment, yet he consented largely on account of the solicitations of the superintendent, with whom it was desirable for all the inmates of the home to be on good terms. From this time, August 6th, 
until November 13th. He was hypnotized 29 times, and during that time did not touch alcohol or tobacco, although he had ample opportunity to obtain both. One of the suggestions given most frequently was that alcohol in any form would nauseate him. Not long after this treatment was stopped, he went to a neighboring town where he had lived for some years, during which time he had had most of his drinking experience. Here he met a number of his boon companions, whom he had not seen for some time, and the only way for them to show him their joy in his return was to treat him to beer. He drank some and became violently sick, vomiting in an alarming manner. This, however, did not prevent his taking more. The more he drank, the more sick he became, until he was taken home and the physician summoned. He was in bed for four days, not able to retain either food or drink until, as he told the writer, he thought he was going to die. He did not repeat the experiment for some time, but finally, after several unsuccessful attempts, he was able to drink again. He had no craving for alcohol, but simply wished to be sociable when invited to drink. He learned in the same way as a boy learns to smoke, smoking and vomiting. But being determined to learn, he overcomes the nausea, and by continued attempts he is able to indulge freely. Another case somewhat similar shows the same phenomena. T.H., 29 years of age, a laborer, both parents living and healthy, neither of whom had drank. He began drinking when he was 14 years of age, for the last 10 years had been drinking to excess. He drank any kind of alcoholic liquor but preferred whiskey. He went on a spree as often as he had money, and stopped drinking only when he could not get anything more to drink. At the solicitation of Mr. Butterfield, superintendent of Calvary Industrial Home, he consented to be treated, and Mr. Butterfield brought him to the writer first on August 10th. He was a good subject, going into deep sleep in 14 minutes the first attempt. He was hypnotized 18 times before October 6th. Both alcohol and tobacco were renounced during this time, and for a few succeeding weeks. He then went to work in a hotel where he was surrounded by alcohol all the time, and started to drink again. He met with the same success as the former patient. He became very sick and vomited severely. Again and again he tried, until he finally succeeded in getting drunk enough to be arrested and committed to prison on the charge of drunkenness and disorderly conduct. These seem to be test cases regarding the necessity of a desire for a cure, for both men were good subjects. They performed post-hypnotic feats according to the suggestions given during hypnosis, and received suggestions which produce negative hallucinations as well as positive ones, both hypnotically and post-hypnotically. The hypnosis was followed by complete amnesia. There was no craving for drink at any time after the first treatment, and even after they started to drink, had either of them had a desire to stop drinking, nothing would have been easier. It was far easier to stop than to begin again. Notwithstanding the terrible vomiting and nausea, while they were yet sober and able to appreciate the full effect, they preserved until they were able to drink. And from there it was an easy stage to the old condition of continued drunkenness. If anyone is determined to drink, he will do so regardless of the means used to prevent him, providing he can get access to alcohol in any way. This, then, is laid down as principle, in order to be able to effect a permanent cure. The subject must be actively willing. He must want to be cured enough to help himself. The other requisite stated was that he must be hypnotizable. There is a number of persons, both temperate and intemperate, who are refractory to hypnotism, and it is still a mute question whether the inebriate is more or less susceptible to its influence on account of his alcoholism. Alcohol no doubt lessens self-control and makes men weak-minded, and so some have thought that inebriates must be more easy to hypnotize. But this may not be so, because it is not a general fact, so far as I know, that the weak-minded are the most easy to hypnotize, nor that women are more easy to succeed with than men. Fortunately, we do not have to depend upon a priori reasoning to determine that whether the alcoholic is more easily hypnotized. We have the facts of experience to resort to. Alcoholized persons are generally good subjects for treatment, but I have never succeeded in hypnotizing a person for the first time in a state of intoxication. It is necessary to wait until the first effect of the stimulant has passed off. Drunkards are fortunately easy to hypnotize. We, Wyametsky, 
has found that these patients, alcoholics, are easily hypnotized. Besides these statements, many others speak in the same way, and the experience of the writer is very decided and substantiated the statement that alcoholics are easier to hypnotize than persons generally. Only one dissenting voice has been noticed. Unfortunately, chronic alcoholism renders its victim very hard to hypnotize. We know not how it happened that Mr. Myers has had this experience, for it seems to the writer to lead undoubtedly to a mistaken conclusion. It is necessary, of course, to distinguish, as Mr. Tucky does, between the intoxicated person and the chronic alcoholic. It is generally admitted that intoxicated persons are difficult to hypnotize, but quite as generally, with this one exception, that alcoholics are good subjects. There is one further statement which the writer has not been able to verify, but which would seem very true, viz. I have noticed in more than one case that the best time to make an attempt to hypnotize is very shortly after a bout of drunkenness, and that the patient is less easily hypnotized the longer he is kept sober. This may be true for two reasons, not only because he is organically in a more favorable condition for hypnosis, but because at this time he has a period of remorse and is much ashamed of his conduct. He submits readily to any suggestion, is willing and may be anxious to be cured. Thus he fulfills the conditions for hypnosis better. Two psychological questions arise here. First, why should it be difficult to hypnotize a person who is in a state of intoxication? And second, why should an alcoholic be easily hypnotized? The answers to both of these questions will be determined by our ideas of the nature of hypnotism, both psychically and physically. Before trying to answer these questions, two cases with which the writer has experience will be given. These cases are interesting because of the success attending the efforts of the writer when such an experienced operator as Mr. Tucky has failed. Reference is made of two cases of persons who were hypnotized while in a state of intoxication. Although Mr. Tucky distinctly states twice in his book, one quotation of which is given above, that he has never been able to hypnotize a person who was intoxicated at the time, if he had not previously been hypnotized. The reader is already acquainted with the first case, as he appears in the experiments recorded in chapter on will, and there his records can be consulted. The subject, Thomas Duck, was known as Jim the Penman, because he went from house to house selling pens, and in the days when his hand was more steady, he earned considerable money by writing names on visiting cards, for he was an excellent penman. The writer met him on Sunday evening, March twenty fifth, 1900, at the Yale Mission. He looked very badly and was partially intoxicated. He said that he had been on a spree for three weeks, and for the previous two nights, I've had him, referring to delirium tremens. The writer was on his guard concerning the trustworthiness and truthfulness of alcoholics in general, and mission frequenters in particular, but his appearance testified to the truth of his statements, and they were partially confirmed by others. Arrangements were made to meet the next day at a designated place but he was warned to be sure to come sober. As soon as he appeared on the following day, his intoxication was noticeable, and on his being accused of not being sober, he finally admitted to having taken eight drinks of whiskey. This was probably an understatement, and it was then only half past one o'clock in the afternoon. He said he had him again the night previous, and had to take a drink or two to brace up. And further, as election was coming on, the ward politicians were all treating, and he was a voter. The writer had difficulty in getting him to make the experiments. Once he disarranged and disconnected the apparatus, so by his violent movements that the experiments had to be repeated. He was taken to the office of Dr. W. G. Anderson, where he was examined. His heart was very irregular, his pulse at 112, and he was exceedingly nervous. He was placed in an easy chair and told, to look at a bright blue marble. He did so, and after considerable twitching of the muscles all over his body, he slept. He was not very suggestible, and principally on account of his nervous condition, he awoke easily. He was allowed to sleep for fifteen minutes. Some post-hypnotic suggestions were given to him, and he was awakened. His heart was then quite regular, and his pulse registered eighty, a decrease of thirty-two beats. 
He said that he felt much better. He was then allowed to go, but the post-hypnotic suggestions were not carried out. The other case was that a man of 28 years of age, a laborer, his father, who had been a heavy drinker, was dead. He had eight brothers, all of whom drank. He began drinking when 13 years old and had been drinking ever since, with the exception of three years when he was converted and joined the church. He drank mostly whiskey and absinthe. He had just started on a spree and had been drinking all the morning. A friend found him and took him riding around town for a while, trying to get him sober and to keep him from drinking. When he came to the house of the rider, he was in great distress because of his intense desire for drink. He was seated comfortably and went into a sound sleep in three minutes. It was suggested to him that he would feel hungry instead of thirsty, and that on awakening there would be no desire for drink. It was also suggested that he would not drink any more. After he was awakened, he was asked how he felt, to which he replied, I feel much better. Do you feel like having a drink? No, but I feel awful hungry. I haven't had anything to eat today. He was then supplied with some food, which he ate with apparent relish and went away. That afternoon he succeeded in continuing his spree, so that he was completely intoxicated by evening, and drank until some misdemeanor committed. During intoxication, he is now serving a term in prison. These cases are interesting for two reasons. They show that occasionally a person can be hypnotized when intoxicated, and further, they show that the suggestions given under such conditions are of little or no value. With these two exceptions, the writer has no better success than Mr. Tucky, one glass of beer frequently interfering with the attempt so that the person was not the least affected. The instructions invariably given by the writer are as follows. Come without having taken either alcohol or coffee, for the inhibitory effect of either is recognized. We must now return to the answer of the two questions which was deferred in order to give these two cases. The answer, as was said, would depend upon our idea of the nature of hypnosis. Most answers which have been given are descriptive rather than explanatory. Supposing that the quite popular theory of Mr. Myers is accepted and hypnosis is considered a disseverance of consciousness, the consciousness giving place to the subconscious, the question naturally arises, why does the mind so function? It may be said, again, that it is a disseverance of consciousness, and that memory is the factor which makes the trouble. But again the question, why does memory behave thus? We may dally with the word suggestion until we make suggestion its own progenitor, but the question still comes, why does suggestion cause these phenomena? Giving the phenomena another name does not help us in the explanation. Let us consider the common analogy of natural sleep. The conditions both psychically and physically are very similar. We can find a very common example of hypnotism in natural sleep, in the mother and the child. The mother goes to sleep in rapport with the child. The most severe thunderstorm does not affect her in the least. Through the slamming of doors and the trampling of feet, she sleeps deeply and serenely. Let the baby breathe hard or make the least sound and she is awake instantly. Or if the child is in her arms, she draws it to her. To a limited extent, she tends it and never injures it in any way. She is conscious as a hypnotized person is conscious of certain things, although both will probably forget them when they awake. Certain drugs which induce sleep will also induce hypnosis, as example given. Chloroform, passiflora, etc., and the conditions favorable for sleep are also favorable for hypnotism. Further, one can frequently be changed into the other. Physically, it seems as though there is a great similarity, and to the physical we go for the explanation of the phenomena of hypnotism, at least in part. The phase of the physical which throws on hypnotism the most light, at least according to the judgment of the writer, is the blood supply. It is not contended that hypnotism is going to be fully explained by the change in the encephalic circulation, but it is believed that this change in the circulation can help to clear up the difficulty. We know that the change of blood supply is very necessary in normal sleep, and this suggests the explanation. Wundt suggests the blood supply is a factor in the phenomena. Also Sully, Carpenter, Tuke, and Lehman agree that this is the solution of the riddle. Not unlikely, some of these investigators claim too much for this one factor, failing to recognize its limitations and difficulties. Heidenhain at first accepted this explanation, but later rejected it for the following reasons. 1. Hypnotism appeared in spite of the inhalation of nitrite of a meal, which causes hyperemia. 
two there are no changes in the vessels in the back of the eyes during hypnosis three salvioli and bouchut found cerebral hyperemia during hypnosis these reasons are sufficient to cause us to reject the theory of total anemia of the brain if anyone claimed that but hardly sufficient to reject the theory of partial anemia no doubt some portions of the brain are in a condition of hyperemia while the other portions are anemic the supply of blood being less than ordinary if what remains is taken to one portion of the brain the other parts have less so much less as to force the anemic parts into a condition of inactivity in hypnotism the condition of the encephalic circulation may now be considered analogous to that of the atmosphere with a low baromic pressure it is mobile and disposed to storms if attracted in one direction it is determined strongly then the very momentum with which the blood surges in that special direction reacts on and strengthens function if it be toward an ideation center some particular idea may so monopolize the consciousness that the judging faculty is almost as completely in abeyance as in ordinary dreaming this would partially at least explain the disseverance of consciousness and if the theory of subconscious is accepted this would be an important element in the explanation also further it would tend to explain the anemia which most frequently follows hypnotism it is on this basis that an attempt will be made to show why the chronic alcoholic is easily hypnotized and the intoxicated person difficult to hypnotize it was shown when dealing with the physiological part of the discussion that on account of the growth of the arteries the normal amount of blood does not reach the brain this would keep it an anemic condition and thus make it favorable to hypnosis on the other hand intoxication causes an increased circulation and sending more blood to the brain would cause hyperemia this would be unfavorable to hypnosis and therefore make the intoxicated person difficult to hypnotize this is only one factor but an important factor even accepting james theory that the change in the circulation is the result not the cause of the altered activity of the nervous matter it would make little difference in the relation of alcoholism to hypnotism if the effect were easily obtained there would be less trouble in furnishing the cause in fact the effect would suggest the cause those who hold to the chemical theory of sleep could also apply it to hypnotism and could assist us in our explanation there is nothing to prevent the two theories that of change in the circulation and that of change in the chemical constitution of the blood going side by side in alcoholism the subject has as we know the quality as well as the quantity changed so that this would be favorable to hypnotism if hypnotism and sleep are allied conditions the increased circulation of intoxication would tend to the purification of the blood by removing the waste products and thereby prevent hypnosis in certain emotional states when the circulation is very active both hypnosis and sleep are impossible as was said when dealing with the subject of alterations of personality the alcoholic has the consciousness dissevered so frequently in so much of his time that when disseverance comes in another way example given when hypnotism is suggested it is readily induced on account of his habit there is considerable resemblance between the drunkard and the hypnotic they will both personify some character both are suggestible both are hyperesthetic and a small thing may be exaggerated by both they are both lower states of being and both are easily deluded the resemblance is so great that some opponents of hypnotism have termed it teetotal intoxication there is noticeable difference however in intoxication we have the nervous system involved in the inverse order of its evolution but in the lighter grades of hypnotism we do not find that the higher psychical functions are so much affected as of motion and sensation with all the agreement between the two states it is not strange that a person used to one could easily acquire the other the method used by the writer to induce hypnosis is not different enough from those of other operators to require more than passing notice every operator has some special factors in his methods of which he must also have a variety seating the subject comfortably in his chair the attention is directed to some object which is bright and causes a slight strain on the eyes usually there is used a piece of apparatus similar to that employed by some european operators which has been improved by the writer a piece of tin or zinc covered with velvet fits over the forehead to which is fashioned at one end a piece of elastic to the other a hook 
at the other end of the elastic are several eyes so that the elastic can be shortened or lengthened according to the size of the head the zinc is thus kept in place by the elastic in the middle of the zinc is placed vertically a square socket into which fits a short piece of brass which is joined to the end of a piece of fuse wire on the other end of which is a nickel ball this wire can be bent into any position and the ball adjusted so as to be of the most use in tiring the eyes the piece of brass can be removed from the socket so that the apparatus is in two pieces and thus more easily carried in the pocket after this apparatus is in place the subject is told to look at the ball which will soon make him sleepy and in the manner so familiar to all he soon goes to sleep methods are varied with different subjects and frequently no apparatus is used the suggestions are of three different classes destructive constructive and physiological the destructive suggestions are to effect that he must not drink any more that alcoholic drinks are harmful to him that he does not care for either the taste or effects of the liquor and that he has given up drinking altogether drinking is ruining his family his health and his business and he must not continue it he must keep away from the persons who drink liquor and the places where it is kept as alcohol is a poison anyone offering to him is his enemy and is doing him injury these and any other suggestions which will destroy his desire for alcohol may be used many of which may be invented for the particular case if the house is left empty it may become so filled as to leave the last state of the man worse than the first we must therefore make constructive suggestions of which the following are examples he is very much engrossed with his family and business he has developed a great fondness for reading or attending church he likes to associate with persons who do not drink he attends the baseball games or rides in the park he is now happy and cheerful and has attained control over himself he is no longer the slave but the master his ideals are higher now he wants to set a good example and help everyone to do right he is confident in his power to continue in the way he has started etc any suggestion which will assist him to construct a new line of thought in a new environment so as to prevent his thinking about drinking by doing something else should be used the physiological suggestions are very important the suggestion of nausea if any alcohol is drunk and that the taste of all alcoholic drinks will be like wormwood or castor oil or anything that is known to be obnoxious to the subject a suggestion of the paralysis of the arm if the patient tries to convey a glass of liquor to his mouth or an inability to swallow liquor may be helpful auxiliary suggestions to improve the general health are also beneficial such as those regarding digestion appetite action of the bowels immunity from headache or any other ailment which hypnosis can aid all three classes of suggestions should be continued for a few weeks regularly so as to help the patient to get accustomed to the new surroundings if there is a craving as in the case of the regular drinker suggestions regarding this should be given but at most this lasts not more than ten days in a severe form after regular treatment has been stopped occasional treatments are no doubt beneficial in addition to the suggestions given by the operator it has been found advantageous to have the patient give himself suggestions mason and quackenboss have both used auto suggestion in their cases with considerable success the patient should give himself suggestions similar to those given by the operator just as he was going to sleep at night and in this way much the same result will follow as in hypnotism if it is correct that hypnotism is closely allied to natural sleep we can well see the benefit of such a course this is generally used as an auxiliary to hypnotism but in cases where hypnosis is not practical it has proved effective at times the writer has tried auto suggestion on himself in minor difficulties with considerable success Two made the unpleasant operation of having a tooth extracted almost painless by mentally repeating how delightful and lebo cured himself of facial neuralgia by auto suggestion this is the principle of christian science and other faith cures it is one characteristic of hypnotism which is very valuable in cases of the nature of alcoholism that it is much easier to reform persons and lead them than it is to debase them and lead them to do evil it is much easier to restore moral rectitude to a somnambulist who has fallen therefrom than to pervert the integrity of character of a woman of high moral standing 
One reason for this is that the hypnotized person is never devoid of will. Hypnotic actions are always voluntary actions in the wider sense of the word. Mr. Gurney reports a case which clearly shows this. I was recently experimenting with a youth who had formerly been a telegraph boy and who had taken a strong dislike for the metier. When hypnotized, he was at the mercy of any suggestion or command except one. Nothing would induce him to carry a telegram. The refusal was unaffected by considerations which would certainly have reversed it in his normal state. Example given. When he was told that the matter was one of life and death and that he should have 20 pounds for the job. The will that remains in hypnosis, being directed in the best ways, receives an environment from suggestion and is strengthened. The patient is thus enabled to overcome the force of habit and external suggestion. Dr. A. Forel gives a case which was of such long standing and so unpromising, and yet resulted so successfully that an epitome of it will be given. The man, who was confirmed in alcoholism, was brought to him. He was seventeen years old, having spent nine years in an asylum, and had twice tried to commit suicide. Whenever he had an opportunity, he would drink to madness while in the asylum, was a great care, always making trouble for himself and inciting other inmates to acts of violence and rebellion. After Dr. Forel had hypnotized him a few times, he seemed like another person. He became quiet and tractable. He gave up his allowance of wine, and to crown all, united with the temperance society, which he had hitherto opposed and condemned. Three cases of the writer's experience will close the chapter. The first one is the case of the longest standing, which the writer has treated. The second is the case of alcoholism of longest standing, which the writer has stopped. And the third is a case which has value in itself, worthy of recitation. Mr. X, 36 years old, father and mother both drank, the former very hard. Patients started drinking when 12 years of age, and when 24, drank very heavily. Drank beer mostly, but usually finished the day on whiskey. Drank regularly every day. About one year and a half before applying for treatment, he had taken the Keeley cure and remained sober afterwards for four months. At the time of coming for treatment, he was drinking about two quarts of beer and whiskey every day, taking about an equal number of drinks of each. Every inducement was offered on the other hand, and threats of various kinds were made on the other hand to compel him to stop drinking, but they were powerless to help him. Early in September 1900, he came to the writer in the evening partially intoxicated. He became a little drowsy, and his eyes were closed by the writer. Appropriate suggestions were made, and he went away. He was hypnotized every day for two weeks, then every other day for about the same length of time. At no time did he get beyond a light sleep, and most of the time it was a little more than drowsiness. At the ninth day, all craving and taste for liquor was gone, and from the first day he did not taste a drop of any kind of alcoholic liquors. He had twenty treatments in all. He seems hardly to have been more deeply hypnotized than Mrs. C. in the case quoted by Bramwell but the effect was all that could be desired. Mr. K., aged 59, father and mother both drank, and his father's relatives drank. Mr. K.'s children drank also. His father kept a tavern, and the patient started drinking when 10 years old, and has been drinking ever since. With the exception of five years, beginning 20 years ago, he drinks whiskey. Here is a case of 49 years standing. The first time he came, he went into a deep sleep, and after that all desire was gone. After the second visit, he went into saloons while about his business, but had not the least desire for alcohol in any form. Scratch. This was three years ago, and when last heard of was abstemious. Many other cases equally successful could be given, but these will suffice as examples to show the value of hypnotism to alcoholism. The following case is one of special interest and value from a psychological point of view. A very meager outline of the case will be given, except in so far as it deals directly with dipsomania. John Kinzel was born on a farm in central New England in 1873. The family history, as far as alcoholism is concerned, is as follows. Maternal grandfather, great-grandfather, great-uncles all drank heavily, but neither his mother nor any of her brothers or sisters drank. All the Kinsels, his fathers, drank, and do yet. Only two, however, drank to excess. 
viz john's uncle and cousin mr kinsel the father makes about twelve barrels of cider every fall and uses it regularly toward spring it gets pretty hard he drinks about eight or ten glasses per day but he was never intoxicated in his life in the summer at hang time cider brandy augments the stock of cider his drinking is like that of the new england farmer of fifty or one hundred years ago john drank cider at home when a boy but was never intoxicated except once when seven years of age his mother being away he climbed up in the pantry took from the shelf some cider brandy and drank enough to intoxicate him he never drank anything but cider and this cider brandy until he was fourteen when he had a glass of beer when twenty-one years old being in the sophomore class in college he drank on one occasion beer and wine and on another occasion claret lemonade on the former of these occasions he became happy the following summer he drank cider at home during his sophomore year he developed a double personality he would pass into an abnormal state during which he would remember all of his normal state and all previous experiences in the abnormal state that is in the abnormal state he would remember all his life but when he returned to the normal state again the abnormal state would be a blank to him while in these abnormal states his character was much changed showing itself in no way more prominently than in his appetite for alcoholic drinks in his junior year he only drank when in these abnormal states he drank mostly beer very little of which would intoxicate him in the summer vacation between his junior and senior years he drank nothing not even the cider at home in the senior year the abnormal states became more frequent and lasted longer during this year he drank a great deal but only in the abnormal states except that sometimes he would come out of the abnormal state into the normal partially intoxicated then he would continue drinking in the normal state never was the drinking initiated in the normal state he smoked much when normal and nearly constantly when abnormal during the summer vacation following graduation he drank twice both times during his abnormal state and both times he was very much intoxicated in the autumn following his graduation he entered a divinity school and there drank some when abnormal not sufficient to get intoxicated but enough to smell it after he came to himself after leaving the divinity school in january the following year he drank cider somewhat while normal as well as during the abnormal state and this is the first of a desire to drink when normal this desire was gratified by cider he also smoked very heavily during this time in april of that year in 1898 he went fishing with some men who had wine and whiskey and here we have his first voluntary intoxication he drank cider all that summer and autumn but not to intoxication and continued very light or no drinking during the following winter spring and summer the following autumn 1899 he drank considerable cider becoming once intoxicated and also became intoxicated on beer the next winter he became happy several times on cider drank cider all the spring and summer and in the early fall developed a true dipsomania with monthly periods which continued all the fall and winter the last one being on march nineteenth nineteen o one on march twentieth he came to the rider for treatment he had had two drinks that morning but as he had previously been hypnotized and was an excellent subject no difficulty was experienced in inducing hypnosis he slept deeply and appropriate suggestions were given he came again the following day and on april sixteenth seventeenth and eighteenth the last three being just previous to the time for his next outbreak he went away and the next day the craving appeared on time contrary to suggestion he went to a saloon and procured a glass of beer went to another and got another glass he went into a third saloon purchased and drank a third glass of beer when he began to know he expressed it here feel or remember i can't tell which it seemed like all three what had been suggested to him the following day he sent a letter to the writer containing the exact words of the suggestions given to him showing that they all came back to him as soon as he began to hear apparently away off in the distance the words of the suggestions to him he became very sick and vomited violently he was sick the whole day and could not take anything more to drink nor did he want it he disliked alcohol in any form on june 2nd again he came and was hypnotized from that time until november for six months he did not touch any kind of intoxicating liquors 
but then he got a quart of whiskey and became intoxicated. For three years he had no desire for alcohol, and where the smell of liquor used to engender a great desire for drink, it later had no effect, or if any, it was distasteful. When examining him in the hypnotic condition after this, he said that the reason he drank when he was in the abnormal state was that it seemed all right for him to do so. He had had none of the scruples which were ever present in the normal state. When these monthly dipsomaniacal spells would come on, the identical feeling reappeared. So he went and drank because it seemed the right thing for him to do. In, in the case of Louis V., Mr. Meyer says, though he had before the attack of double personality been a total abstainer, he now not only drank his own wine, but stole the wine of other patients. This shows a common tendency in the abnormal states of these two persons. Thus the double personality and alcoholism interact. Not only does alcoholism cause the phenomenon of double personality, as shown in a previous chapter, but the double personality causes alcoholism or dipsomania, as shown by the case cited here. Perhaps it might be a better statement to say that they are both expressions of a common disorder. This case also shows the value of hypnotism and dipsomania. Something else is very interesting and well worthy of notice in the reappearance of the suggestions. Usually the alcoholic becomes sick, and if the hypnosis has been deep enough to cause amnesia, he does not know why he is sick. But although in this case there was complete amnesia after hypnosis, the exact words of the suggestions were sent to the writer by the subject, being remembered during the sickness and afterwards. The physical treatment given by some sanitaria has proved very beneficial to a great number of alcoholics. Rest, a little medication, and even surgery have helped in restoring almost hopeless inebriates. Any method which is beneficial is welcome. Hypnotism as a promising field has been much used during the past half century with considerable success, but it is only a help and not a prohibitive. The two conditions of success in this form of treatment are active cooperation on the part of the subject and a hypnotizable person with which to deal. The alcoholic is usually easily hypnotized on account of the frequent disseverance of consciousness when drunk and the condition of the blood. Various methods of hypnotizing are used and suggestions given, all tending to destroy the old conditions and implant new associations. End of chapter 11. End of the Psychology of Alcoholism by George Barton Cuton.